January of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664, by Samuel Pepys. January, 1664. January 1st. Went to bed between four and five in the morning, with my mind in good temper of satisfaction, and slept till about eight, that many people came to speak with me. Among others, one came with the best New Year's gift that ever I had, namely from Mr. Deering, with a bill of exchange drawn upon himself for the payment of fifty pounds to Mr. Llewellyn, it being for my use with a letter of compliment. I am not resolved what or how to do in this business, but I conclude it is an extraordinary good New Year's gift, though I do not take the whole, or if I do, then give some of it to Llewellyn. By and by comes Captain Allen and his son, Joles, and his wife, who continues pretty still. They would have had me set my hand to a certificate for his loyalty, and I know not what his ability for any employment, but I did not think it fit, but did give them a pleasing denial, and after sitting with me an hour, they went away. Several others came to me about business, and then being to dine at my uncle White's, I went to the coffee-house, sending my wife by will, and there stayed talking an hour with Cole Middleton and others, and among other things about a very rich widow, young and handsome, of one Sir Nicholas Gold's, a merchant, lately fallen, and of great courtiers that already look after her. Her husband not dead a week yet. She is reckoned worth eighty thousand pounds. Thence to my uncle White's, where doctor of, among others, dined, and his wife, a seeming proud, conceited woman, I know not what to make of her, but the doctor's discourse did please me very well about the disease of the stone, above all things extolling turpentine, which he told me how it may be taken in pills with great ease. There was brought to table a hot pie made of a swan I sent them yesterday, given me by Mr. Howe, but we did not eat any of it, but my wife and I rose from table, pretending business, and went to the Duke's house, the first play I have been at these six months, according to my last vow, and here saw the so much cried up play of Henry the Eighth, which though I went with resolution to like it, is so simple a thing made up of a great many patches, that, besides the shows and processions in it, there is nothing in the world good or well done. Thence mightily dissatisfied, back at night to my uncle White's, and supped with them, but against my stomach, out of the offence the sight of my aunt's hands gives me, and ending supper with a mighty laugh, the greatest I have had these many months, at my uncle's being out in his grace after meat. We rose and broke up, and my wife and I home and to bed, being sleepy since last night. Second. Up and to the office, and there sitting all the morning, and at noon to the change, in my going, met with Llewellyn, and told him how I had received a letter and bill for fifty pounds from Mr. Deering, and delivered it to him, which he told me he would receive for me, to which I consented, though professed not to desire it, if he do not consider himself sufficiently able by the service I have done, and that it is rather my desire to have nothing till he be further sensible of my service. From the change I brought him home and dined with us, and after dinner I took my wife out, for I do find that I am not able to conquer myself as to go into plays till I come to some new vow concerning it, and that I am now come, that is to say, that I will not see above one in a month at any of the public theatres till the sum of fifty shillings be spent, and then none before New Year's Day next, unless that I do become worth one thousand pounds sooner than then, and then am free to come to some other terms. And so leaving him in Lombard Street, I took her to the King's house, and there met Mr. Nicholson, my old colleague, and saw the usurper, which is no good play, though better than what I saw yesterday. However, we rose unsatisfied, and took coach and home, and I to the office late, writing letters, and so to supper, and to bed. Third, Lord's Day. Lay long in bed, and then rose, and with a fire in my chamber, stayed within all day, looking over and settling my accounts in good order, by examining all my books and the kitchen books, and I find that though the proper profit of my last year was but three hundred and five pounds, Yet I did by other gain make it up four hundred and forty-four pounds, which in every part of it was unforeseen of me, and therefore it was a strange oversight for lack of examining my expenses that I should spend six hundred and ninety pounds this year. But for the time to come I have so distinctly settled all my accounts in writing, and the particulars of all my several layings out, that I do hope I shall hereafter make a better judgment of my spendings than ever. I dined with my wife in her chamber, she in bed, and then down again until eleven at night, and broke up and to bed with great content, but could not make an end of writing over my vows as I purposed. But I am agreed in everything how to order myself for the year to come, which I trust in God will be much for my good. So up to prayers and to bed. This evening Sir W. Penn came to invite me against next Wednesday, being twelfth day, to his usual feast, his wedding day. 
Fourth, up betimes, and my wife being ready, and her maid Bess and the girl, I carried them by coach, and set them all down in Covent Garden, and there left them, and I to my Lord Sandwich's lodgings. But he not being up, I to the Duke's chamber, and there by and by to his closet, where since his lady was ill, a little red bed of velvet is brought for him to lie alone, which is a very pretty one. After doing business here, I to my Lord's again, and there spoke with him, and he seems now almost friends again, as he used to be. Here meeting Mr. Pierce, the surgeon, he told me, among other court news, how the Queen is very well again, and the King lay with her on Saturday night last, and that she speaks now very pretty English, and makes her sense out now and then with pretty phrases, as among others this is mightily cried up, that meaning to say that she did not like such a horse so well as the rest, he being too prancing and full of tricks, she said he did make too much vanity. Thence to the tennis court, after I had spent a little time in Westminster Hall, thinking to have met with Mrs. Lane, but I could not, and am glad of it, and there saw the king play at tennis and others. But to see how the king's play was extolled without any cause at all was a loathsome sight, though sometimes, indeed, he did play very well, and deserved to be commended, but such open flattery is beastly. Afterwards to St. James's Park, being unwilling to go to spend money at the ordinary, and there spent an hour or two, it being a pleasant day, seeing people play at Pell-Mell, where it pleased me mightily to hear a gallant lately come from France swear at one of his companions for suffering his man, a spruce-blade, to be so saucy as to strike a ball while his master was playing on the mall. Thence took coach at Whitehall, and took up my wife, who is mighty sad to think of her father, who is going into Germany against the Turks. But what will become of her brother I know not. He is so idle, and out of all capacity, I think, to earn his bread. Home and at my office till ten at night, making my solemn vows for the next year, which I trust in the Lord I shall keep. But I fear I have a little too severely bound myself in some things, and in too many, for I fear I may forget some. But however I know the worst, and shall by the blessing of God observe to perform or pay my forfeits punctually. So home and to bed with my mind at rest. Fifth. Up and to our office, where we sat all the morning, where my head being willing to take in all business whatever, I am afraid I shall overclog myself with it. But however it is my desire to do my duty, and shall the willinger bear it. At noon home and to the change, where I met with Llewellyn, who went off with me and parted to meet again at the coffee-house, but missed. So home and found him there, and Mr. Barrow came to speak with me, so they both dined with me alone, my wife not being ready. And after dinner I up in my chamber with Barrow to discourse about matters of the yard with him, and his design of leaving the place, which I am sorry for, and will prevent if I can. He being gone, then Llewellyn did give me the fifty pounds from Mr. Deering, which he do give me for my pains in his business, and what I may hereafter take for him, though there is not the least word or deed I have yet been guilty of in his behalf, but what I am sure has been to the king's advantage, and the profit of the service, nor ever will. And for this money I never did condition with him, or expected a farthing at the time when I did do him the service, nor have given any receipt for it, it being brought me by Llewellyn, nor do purpose to give him any thanks for it, but will wherein I can faithfully endeavour to see him have the privilege of his patent as the king's merchant. I did give Llewellyn two pieces in gold for a pair of gloves for his kindness herein. Then he being gone, I to my office, were busy till late at night, that through my room being over-confounded in business, I could stay there no longer, but went home, and after a little supper, to bed. Sixth, twelfth day. Up into my office, were very busy all the morning, being indeed overloaded with it through my own desire of doing all I can. At noon to the change, but did little, and so home to dinner with my poor wife, and after dinner read a lecture to her in geography, which she takes very prettily, and with great pleasure to her and me to teach her. And so to the office again, where as busy as ever in my life, one thing after another, and answering people's business, particularly drawing up things about Mr. Wood's masts, which I expect to have a quarrel about with Sir W. Batten before it be ended, but I care not. At night home to my wife, to supper, discourse, prayers, and to bed. This morning I began a practice, which I find by the ease I do it with, that I shall continue, it saving me money and time, that is, to trim myself with a razor, which pleases me mightily. Seventh. Up, putting on my best clothes, and to the office, where all the morning we sat busy, among other things upon Mr. Wood's performance of his contract for masts, wherein I was mightily concerned, but I think was found all along in the right, and shall have my desire in it to the king's advantage. At noon all of us to dinner, to Sir W. Penn's, where a very handsome dinner, Sir J. Lawson, among others, and his lady, and his daughter, a very pretty lady, and of good deportment, with looking upon whom I was greatly pleased. The rest of the company of the women were all of our own house, of no satisfaction or pleasure at all. 
My wife was not there, being not well enough, nor had any great mind. But to see how Sir W. Penn imitates me in everything, even in his having his chimney-piece in his dining-room, the same with that in my wife's closet, and in everything else I perceive wherein he can, but to see again how he was out in one compliment, he lets alone drinking any of the ladies' healths that were there, my Lady Batten and Lawson, till he had begun with my Lady Carteret, who was absent, and that was well enough, and then Mr. Coventry's mistress, of which he was ashamed, and would not have had him have drunk it, at least before the ladies present, but his policy, as he thought, was such that he would do it. After dinner by coach with Sir G. Carteret and Sir J. Minnes, by appointment to Auditor Beales in Salisbury Court, and there we did with great content look over some old ledgers to see in what manner they were kept, and indeed it was in an extraordinary good method, and such as, at least out of design to keep them employed, I do persuade Sir J. Minnes to go upon, which will at least do as much good it may be to keep them for want of something to do from envying those that do something. Thence calling to see whether Mrs. Turner was returned, which she is, and I spoke one word only to her, and away again by coach home and to my office, where late, and then home to supper and bed. Eighth. Up and all the morning at my office, and with Sir J. Minnes, directing him and Mr. Turner about keeping of their books according to yesterday's work, wherein I shall make them work enough. At noon to the change, and there long, and from thence by appointment took Llewellyn, Mount, and W. Simons, and Mr. Pierce, the surgeon, home to dinner with me, and were merry. But, Lord, to hear how W. Simons do commend and look sadly, and then talk borderly and merrily, though his wife was dead but the other day, would make a dog laugh. After dinner I did go in further part of kindness to Llewellyn, for his kindness about Deering's fifty pounds, which he procured me the other day of him. We spent all the afternoon together, and then they took cards with my wife, who this day put on her Indian blue gown, which is very pretty, where I left them for an hour, and to my office, and then to them again, and by and by they went away at night, and so I again to my office, to perfect a letter to Mr. Coventry about department treasurers, wherein I please myself, and hope to give him content, and do the king's service therein. So having done, I home, and to teach my wife a new lesson in the globes, and to supper, and to bed. We had great pleasure this afternoon, among other things, to talk of our old passages together in Cromwell's time, and how W. Simons did make me laugh and wonder to-day, when he told me how he had made shift to keep in, in good esteem and employment, through eight governments in one year, the year 1659, which were indeed, and he did name them all, and then failed unhappy in the ninth, viz. that of the king's coming in. He made good to me the story which Llewellyn did tell me the other day, of his wife upon her deathbed, how she dreamt of her uncle Scoble, and did foretell, from some discourse she had with him, that she should die four days thence, and not sooner, and did all along say so, and did so. Upon the change a great talk there was of one Mr. Tryan, an old man, a merchant in Lime Street, robbed last night, his man and maid being gone out after he was abed, and gagged and robbed of one thousand and fifty pounds in money, and about four thousand pounds in jewels, which he had in his house as security for money. It is believed by many circumstances that his man is guilty of confederacy, by the already going to his secret till in his desk, wherein the key of his cash-chest lay. Ninth. Up, my underlip being mightily swelled, I know not how, but by over-rubbing it, it itching, and to the office, where we sat all the morning, and at noon I home to dinner, and by discourse with my wife thought upon inviting my Lord Sandwich to a dinner shortly. It will cost me at least ten or twelve pounds, but, however, some arguments of prudence I have, which, however, I shall think again upon before I proceed to that expense. After dinner by coach, I carried my wife and Jane to Westminster, leaving her at Mr. Hunt's, and I to Westminster Hall, and there visited Mrs. Lane, and by appointment went out and met her at the trumpet, Mrs. Hare's, but the room being damp we went to the Bell Tavern, and there I had her company, but could not do as I used to do, yet nothing but what was honest. So I to talk about her having Hawley, she told me flatly no, she could not love him. I took occasion to inquire of Howlett's daughter, with whom I have a mind to meet a little, to see what metal the young wench is made of, being very pretty. But she tells me she is already betrothed to Mrs. Mitchell's son, and she in discourse tells me more, that Mrs. Mitchell herself had a daughter before marriage, which is now near thirty years old, a thing I could not have believed. Thence, leading her to the hall, I took coach and called my wife and her maid, and so to the new exchange, where we bought several things of our pretty Mrs. Dorothy Stacy, a pretty woman, and has the modestest look that ever I saw in my life, a man of speech. Thence called at Tom's, and saw him pretty well again, but has not been current. So homeward, and called at Ludgate, at Ashwell's uncle's, but she was not within, to have spoke to her, to have come to dress my wife at the time my lord dines here. 
So straight home, calling for Walsingham's manuals at my booksellers to read but not to buy, recommended for a pretty book by Sir W. Warren, whose warrant, however, I do not much take till I do read it. So home to supper and to bed, my wife not being very well since she came home, being troubled with a fainting fit, which she never yet had before since she was my wife. 10th. Lord's Day. Lay in bed with my wife till ten or eleven o'clock, having been very sleepy all night. So up, and my brother Tom being come to see me, we to dinner, he telling me how Mrs. Turner found herself discontented with her late bad journey, and not well taken by them in the country, they not desiring her coming down, nor the barrels of Mr. Edward Pepys's corpse there. After dinner I to the office, where all the afternoon, and at night my wife and I to my uncle White's, and there eat some of their swan pie, which was good and I invited them to my house to eat a roasted swan on Tuesday next, which after I was come home did make her quarrels between my wife and I, because she had appointed a wish to-morrow. But, however, we were friends again quickly. So to bed. All our discourse to-night was Mr. Tryon's late being robbed, and that Colonel Turner, a mad, swearing, confident fellow, well known by all, and by me, one much indebted to this man for his very livelihood, was the man that either did or plotted it, and the money and things are found in his hand, and he and his wife now in Newgate for it, of which we are all glad, so very a known rogue he was. 11th. Wake this morning by four o'clock by my wife to call the maids to their wash, and what through my sleeping so long last night, and vexation for the lazy sluts lying so long again in their great wash, neither my wife nor I could sleep one wink after that time till day. And then I rose and by coach, taking Captain Grove with me, and three bottles of tent, which I sent to Mrs. Lane by my promise on Saturday night last, to Whitehall, and there with the rest of our company to the Duke, and did our business, and thence to the tennis court till noon, and there saw several great matches played, and so by invitation to St. James's, where at Mr. Coventry's chamber I dined with my Lord Barclay, Sir G. Carteret, Sir Edward Turner, Sir Ellis Leighton, and one Mr. Seymour, a fine gentleman, were admirable good discourse of all sorts, pleasant and serious. Thence after dinner to Whitehall, where the Duke being busy at the guinea business, the Duke of Albemarle, Sir W. Ryder, Povey, Sir J. Lawson, and I, to the Duke of Albemarle's lodgings, and there did some business, and so to the court again, and I to the Duke of York's lodgings, where the guinea company are choosing their assistance for the next year by balloting. Thence by coach with Sir J. Robinson, Lieutenant of the Tower, he set me down at Cornhill, but, Lord, a simple discourse at all the way we had! he magnifying his great undertakings and cares that have been upon him for these last two years, and how he commanded the city to the content of all parties, when the loggerhead knows nothing almost that is sense. Thence to the coffee-house, whither come Sir W. Petty and Captain Grant, and we fell in talk. Besides a young gentleman, I suppose a merchant, his name Mr. Hill, that has travelled, and I perceive is a master in most sorts of music and other things, of music, the universal character, art of memory, Granger's counterfeiting of hands, and other most excellent discourses to my great content, having not been in so good company a great while, and had I time I should covet the acquaintance of that Mr. Hill. This morning I stood by the king arguing with a pretty Quaker woman that delivered to him a desire of hers in writing. The king showed her Sir J. Minnes as a man the fittest for her quaking religion, saying that his beard was the stiffest thing about him, and again merrily said, looking upon the length of her paper, that if all she desired was of that length, she might lose her desires, she modestly saying nothing till he began seriously to discourse with her, arguing the truth of his spirit against hers, she replying still with these words, O King, and thou'd him all along. The general talk of the town still is of Colonel Turner about the robbery, who it is thought will be hanged. I heard the Duke of York tell to-night how letters are come that fifteen are condemned for the late plot by the judges at York, and among others Captain Oates, against whom it was proved that he drew his sword at his going out, and flinging away the scabbard, said that he would either return victor or be hanged. So home, where I found the house full of the washing, and my wife mighty angry about Will's being here to-day, talking with her maids, which she overheard, idling of their time, and he telling what a good maid my old Jane was, and that she would never have her like again, at which I was angry, and after directing her to beat at least the little girl, I went to the office, and there reproved Will, who told me that he went thither by my wife's order, she having commanded him to come thither on Monday morning. Now, God forgive me, how apt I am to be jealous of her as to this fellow, and that she must needs take this time when she knows I must be gone out to the Duke, though methinks had she that mind she would never think it discretion to tell me the story of him, to let me know that he was there, much less to make me offended with him, to forbid him coming again. But this cursed humour I cannot cool in myself by all the reason I have, which God forgive me for, and convince me of the folly of it, and the disquiet it brings me. 
So home, where God be thanked, when I came to speak to my wife, my trouble of mind soon vanished, and to bed. The house foul with the washing and quite out of order against tomorrow's dinner. Twelfth. Up into the office, where we sat all the morning, and at noon to the change a while, and so home, getting things against dinner ready, and anon comes my uncle White and my aunt, with their cousins Mary and Robert, and by chance my uncle Thomas Pepys. We had a good dinner, the chief dish a swan roasted, and that excellent meat. At dinner, and all day, very merry. After dinner to cards, where till evening, then to the office a little, and to cards again with them, and lost half a crown. They being gone, my wife did tell me how my uncle did this day accost her alone, and spoke of his hoping she was with child, and kissing her earnestly, told her he should be very glad of it. And from all circumstances, methinks he do seem to have some intention of good to us, which I shall endeavour to continue more than ever I did yet. So to my office till late, and then home to bed, after being at prayers, which is the first time after my late vow to say prayers in my family twice in every week. Thirteenth. Up into my office a little, and then abroad to many several places about business, among others to the geometrical instrument makers, and through Bedlam, calling by the way at an old bookseller's, and there fell into looking over Spanish books and pitched upon some, till I thought of my oath when I was going to agree for them, and so with much ado got myself out of the shop, glad at my heart, and so away, to the African house to look upon their book of contracts for several commodities, for my information in the prices we give in the navy, so to the coffee-house, where extraordinary good discourse of Dr. Whistler's, upon my question concerning the keeping of masts, he arguing against keeping them dry, by showing the nature of corruption in bodies, and the several ways thereof. So to the change, and thence with Sir W. Ryder to the Trinity House to dinner, and then home into my office till night, and then with Mr. Bland to Sir T. Vinus about pieces of eight for Sir J. Lawson, and so back to my office, and there late upon business, and so home to supper, and to bed. Fourteenth. Up into the office, where all the morning, and at noon all of us, viz. Sir G. Carteret and Sir W. Batten at one end, and Mr. Coventry, Sir J. Minnes, and I, in the middle at the other end, being taught how to sit there all three by my sitting so much the backwarder, at the other end, to Sir G. Carteret's, and there dined well. Here I saw Mr. Scott, the bastard that married his youngest daughter, much pleasant talk at table, and then up into the office, where we sat long upon our design of dividing the controller's work into some of the rest of our hands for the better doing of it. But he would not yield to it, though the simple man knows in his heart that he do not do one part of it. So he, taking upon him to do it all, be rose, I vexed at the heart to see the king's service run after this manner, but it cannot be helped. Thence to the old James, to the reference about Mr. Bland's business, Sir W. Ryder being now added to us, and I believe we shall soon come to some determination in it. So home and to my office, did business, and then up to Sir W. Penn, and did express my trouble about this day's business, he not being there and plainly told him what I thought of it, and though I know him a false fellow, yet I adventured, as I have done often, to tell him clearly my opinion of Sir W. Batten and his design in this business, which is very bad. Hence home, and after a lecture to my wife in her globes, to prayers, and to bed. Fifteenth. Up into my office, where all the morning, and among other things Mr. Turner with me, and I did tell him my mind about the controller, his master, and all the office, and my mind touching himself too, as he did carry himself either well or ill to me and my clerks, which I doubt not, but it will operate well. Thence to the change, and there met my uncle White, who was very kind to me, and would have had me home with him, and so kind that I begin to wonder, and think something of it of good to me. Thence home to dinner, and after dinner with Mr. Hater by water, and walked thither and back again from Deptford, where I did do something checking the iron business, but my chief business was my discourse with Mr. Hater about what had passed last night, and to-day about the office business, and my resolution to do him all the good I can therein. So home, and my wife tells me that my uncle White hath been with her, and played at cards with her, and is mighty inquisitive to know whether she is with child or no, which makes me wonder what his meaning is, and after all my thoughts I cannot think, unless it be in order to the making his will, that he might know how to do by me, and I would to God my wife had told him that she was. Sixteenth. Up, and having paid some money in the morning to my uncle Thomas on his yearly annuity, to the office, where we sat all the morning. At noon, I to the change about some pieces of eight for Sir J. Lawson. There I hear that Colonel Turner is found guilty of felony at the sessions in Mr. Tryon's business, which will save his life. So home and met there J. Hasper, come to see his kinswoman, our Jane. I made much of him and made him dine with us, he talking after the old simple manner that he used to do. He being gone, I by water to Westminster Hall, and there did see Mrs. Lane. 
so by coach home and to my office where brown of the minories brought me an instrument made of a spiral line very pretty for all questions in arithmetic almost but it must be some use that must make me perfect in it so home to supper and to bed with my mind unper troubled poor sir cafe to-day but i hope it will be la dernière de toute ma vie seventeenth lord's day up and i and my wife to church where pembleton appeared which god forgive me did vex me but i made nothing of it so home to dinner and betimes my wife and i to the french church and there heard a good sermon the first time my wife and i were there ever together we sat by three sisters all pretty women it was pleasant to hear the reader give notice to them that the children to be catechized next sunday were them of houndsditch and blanche chopiton thence home and there found ashwell come to see my wife we having called at her lodging the other day to speak with her about dressing my wife when my lord sandwich dines here and is as merry as ever and speaks as disconcerned for any difference between us on her going away as ever she being gone my wife and i to see sir w pen and there supped with him much against my stomach for the dishes were so deadly foul that i could not endure to look upon them so after supper home to prayers and to bed eighteenth up being troubled to find my wife so ready to have me go out of doors god forgive me for my jealousy but i cannot forbear though god knows i have no reason to do so or to expect her being so true to me as i would have her i abroad to whitehall where the court all in mourning for the duchess of savoy we did our business with the duke and so i to w howe at my lord's lodgings not seeing my lord he being abroad and there i advised with w howe about my having my lord to dinner at my house who likes it well though it troubles me that i should come to need the advice of such a boy but for the present it is necessary here i found mr mallard and had from him a common tune set by my desire to the lyre vile which goes most admirably thence home by coach to the change after having been at the coffee-house where i hear turner is found guilty of felony and burglary and strange stories of his confidence at the bar but yet great indiscretion in his arguing all desirous of his being hanged so home and found that will had been with my wife but lord why should I think any evil of that, and yet I cannot forbear it? But upon inquiry, though I found no reason for doubtfulness, yet I could not bring my nature to any quiet or content in my wife all day and night, nor though I went with her to divert myself at my uncle White's, and there we played at cards till twelve at night, and went home in a great shower of rain, it having not rained a great while before. Here was one Mr. Benson, a Dutchman, played and supped with us, that pretends to sing well, and I expected great matters, but found nothing to be pleased with at all. So home and to bed, yet troubled in my mind. Nineteenth. Up, without any kindness to my wife, and so to the office, where we sat all the morning, and at noon I to the change, and thence to Mr. Cutler's with Sir W. Ryder to dinner, and after dinner with him to the old James upon our reference of Mr. Bland's. And having sat there upon the business half an hour, broke up, and I home, and there found Madame Turner and her sister Dyke come to see us, and stayed chatting till night, and so away, and I to my office till very late, and my eyes began to fail me, and be in pain, which I never felt to nowadays, which I impute to sitting up late writing and reading by candlelight, so home to supper and to bed. 20th. Up and by coach to my Lord Sandwich's, and after long staying till his coming down, he not sending for me up, but it may be he did not know I was there, he came down, and I walked with him to the tennis-court, and there left him, seeing the king play. At his lodgings this morning there came to him Mr. W. Montague's fine lady, which occasioned my lord's calling me to her about some business for a friend of hers preferred to be a midshipman at sea. My lord recommended the whole matter to me. She is a fine, confident lady, I think, but not so pretty as I once thought her. My lord did also seal a lease for the house he is now taking in Lincoln's Inn Fields, which stands him in two hundred and fifty per annum rent thence by water to my brother's whom i find not well in bed sick they think of a consumption and i fear he is not well but do not complain nor desire to take anything from him i visited mr honeywood who is lame and to thank him for his visit to me the other day but we were both abroad so to mr commanders in warwick lane to speak to him about drawing up my will which he will meet me about in a day or two so to the change and walked home thence with sir richard ford who told me that turner is to be hanged to-morrow and with what impudence he hath carried out his trial but that last night when he brought him news of his death he began to be sober and shed some tears and he hopes will die a penitent he having already confessed all the thing but says it was partly done for a joke 
and partly to get an occasion of obliging the old man by his care in getting him his things again, he having some hopes of being the better by him in his estate at his death. Home to dinner, and after dinner my wife and I by water, which we have not done together many a day, that is not since last summer. But the weather is now very warm, and left her at Axe Yard, and I to Whitehall, and meeting Mr. Pierce, walked with him an hour in the matted gallery. Among other things, he tells me that my Lady Castlemaine is not at all set by by the King, but that he do dote upon Mrs. Stuart only, and that to the leaving of all business in the world, and to the open slighting of the Queen, that he values not who sees him or stands by him, while he dallies with her openly, and then privately in her chamber below, where the very sentries observe his going in and out, and that so commonly, that the Duke or any of the nobles, when they would ask where the King is, they will ordinarily say, Is the King above or below? meaning with Mrs. Stuart, that the king do not openly disown my Lady Castlemaine, but that she comes to court, but that my Lord Fitzharding and the Hambletons, and sometimes my Lord Sandwich, they say, have their snaps at her. But he says my Lord Sandwich will lead her from her lodgings in the darkest and obscurest manner, and leave her at the entrance into the Queen's lodgings, that he might be the least observed, that the Duke of Monmouth the king do still dote on beyond measure, insomuch that the king only, the Duke of York and Prince Rupert, and the Duke of Monmouth, do now wear deep mourning, that is, long cloaks, for the Duchess of Savoy, so that he mourns as a prince of the blood, while the Duke of York do no more, and all the nobles of the land not so much, which gives great offence, and he says the Duke of York do consider, but that the Duke of York do give himself up to business, and is like to prove a noble prince, and so indeed I do from my heart think he will. He says that it is believed, as well as hoped, that care is taken to lay up a hidden treasure of money by the king against a bad day, pray God it be so. But I should be more glad that the king himself would look after business, which it seems he do not in the least. By and by came Mr. Coventry, and so we broke off, and he and I took a turn or two, and so parted. And then my Lord Sandwich came upon me, to speak with whom my business of coming again to-night to this end of the town chiefly was, in order to the seeing in what manner he received me, in order to my inviting him to dinner to my house, but as well in the morning as now, though I did wait upon him home, and there offered occasion of talk with him, yet he treated me, though with respect, yet as a stranger, without any of the intimacy of friendship which he used to do, and which I fear he will never, through his consciousness of his faults, ever do again, which I must confess to trouble me above anything in the world almost, though I neither do need at present nor fear to need to be so troubled, nay, and more, though I do not think that he would deny me any friendship now if I did need it, but only that he has not the face to be free with me, but do look upon me as a remembrancer of his former vanity, and an espy upon his present practices, for I perceive that Pickering to-day is great with him again, and that he has done a great courtesy for Mr. Pierce, the surgeon, to a good value, though both these, and none but these, did I mention by name to my lord in the business which has caused all this difference between my lord and me. However, I am resolved to forbear my laying out money upon a dinner, till I see him in a better posture, and by grave and humble, though high deportment, to make him think I do not want him, and that will make him the readier to admit me to his friendship again. I believe the soonest of anything but downright impudence, and thrusting myself as others do upon him, which yet I cannot do, nor will not endeavour. So home, calling with my wife to see my brother again, who was up, and walks up and down the house pretty well, but I do think he is in a consumption. Home, troubled in mind for these passages with my lord, but I am resolved to better my case in my business, to make my stand upon my own legs the better and to lay up as well as to get money, and, among other ways, I will have a good fleece out of Creed's coat, ere it be long, or I will have a fall. So to my office, and did some business, and then home to supper and to bed. After I had my candlelight shaved myself, and cut off all my beard clear, which will make my work a great deal the less in shaving. 21st. Up, and after sending my wife to my Aunt White's, to get a place to see Turner hanged, I to the office, where we sat all the morning and at noon going to the change, and seeing people flock in the city, I inquired and found that Turner was not yet hanged, and so I went among them to Leadenhall Street, at the end of Lime Street, near where the robbery was done, and to St. Mary Axe, where he lived, and there I got four shilling to stand upon the wheel of a cart in great pain, above an hour before the execution was done, he delaying the time by long discourses and prayers one after another, in hopes of a reprieve, but none came, and at last was flung off the ladder in his cloak." A comely-looked man he was, and kept his countenance to the end. I was sorry to see him. It was believed there were at least twelve or fourteen thousand people in the street. So I home, all in a sweat, and dined by myself, and after dinner to the old James. And there found Sir W. Ryder and Mr. Cutler at dinner, and made a second dinner with them, 
and anon came Mr. Bland and Custos and Clark, and so we fell to the business of reference, and upon a letter from Mr. Povey to Sir W. Ryder and I, telling us that the King is concerned in it, we took occasion to fling off the business from off of our shoulders, and would have nothing to do with it, unless we had power from the King or Commissioners of Tangier, and I think it would be best for us to continue of that mind, and to have no hand, it being likely to go against the King. Thence to the coffee-house, and heard the full of Turner's discourse on the cart, which was chiefly to clear himself of all things laid to his charge, but this fault, for which he now suffers, which he confesses. He deplored the condition of his family, but his chief design was to lengthen time, believing still a reprieve would come, though the sheriff advised him to expect no such thing, for the king was resolved to grant none. After that I had good discourse with a pretty young merchant, with mighty content. So to my office, and did a little business, and then to my aunt White's, to fetch my wife home, where Dr. Burnett did tell me how poorly the sheriffs did endeavour to get one jewel returned by Turner after he was convicted, as a due to them, and not to give it to Mr. Tryon, the true owner, but ruled against them, to their great dishonour. Though they plead it might be another jewel, for aught they know, and not Tryon's. After supper home, and my wife tells me mighty stories of my uncle's fond and kind discourses to her to-day, which makes me confident that he has thoughts of kindness for us, he repeating his desire for her to be with child, for it cannot enter into my head that he should have any unworthy thoughts concerning her. After doing some business at my office, I home to supper, prayers, and to bed. 22nd. Up, and it being a brave morning, with a galley to Woolwich, and there both at the rope-yard and the other yard did much business, and thence to Greenwich, to see Mr. Pett and others, value the carved work of the Henrietta, God knows in an ill manner for the king, and so to Deptford, and there viewed Sir W. Petty's vessel, which hath an odd appearance, but not such as people do make of it, for I am of the opinion that he would never have discoursed so much of it, if it were not better than other vessels, and so I believe that he was abused the other day, as he is now, by tongues that I am sure speak before they know anything good or bad of her. I am sorry to find his ingenuity discouraged so. So home, reading all the way a good book, and so home to dinner, and after dinner a lesson on the globes to my wife, and so to my office till ten or eleven o'clock at night, and so home to supper, and to bed. 23rd. Up into the office where we sat all the morning, at noon home to dinner, where Mr. Hawley came to see us, and dined with us, and after we had dined came Mr. Mallard, and after he had eat something, I brought down my vial, which he played on, the first master that ever touched her yet, and she proves very well, and will be, I think, an admirable instrument. He played some very fine things of his own, but I was afeard to enter too far in their commendation, for fear he should offer to copy them for me out, and so I be forced to give or lend him something. So to the office in the evening, whither Mr. Commander came to me, and we discoursed about my will, which I am resolved to perfect the next week, by the grace of God. He being gone, I to write letters and other business late, and so home to supper and to bed. 24th, Lord's Day. Lay long in bed and then up, and being desirous to perform my vows that I lately made, among others, to be performed this month, I did go to my office, and there fell on entering, out of a by-book, part of my second journal-book, which hath lain these two years and more unentered. Upon this work till dinner, and after dinner to it again till night, and then home to supper, and after supper to read a lecture to my wife upon the globes, and so to prayers and to bed. This evening also I drew up a rough draught of my last will to my mind. 25th. Up and by coach to Whitehall to my lord's lodgings, and seeing that, knowing that I was in the house, my lord did not nevertheless send for me up, I did go to the duke's lodgings, and there stayed while he was making ready, in which time my lord Sandwich came, and so all into his closet, and did our common business, and so broke up. And I homeward by coach with Sir W. Batten, and stayed at Warwick Lane, and there called upon Mr. Commander, and did give him my last will and testament to write over and form, and so to the change, where I did several businesses. So home to dinner, and after I had dined, Llewellyn came, and we set him something to eat, and I left him there with my wife, and to the office upon a particular meeting of the East India Company, where I think I did the king good service against the company, in the business of their sending our ships home empty from the Indies, contrary to their contract, and yet, God forgive me, I found that I could be willing to receive a bribe, if it were offered me, to conceal my arguments that I found against them, in consideration that none of my fellow officers, whose duty it is more than mine, had ever studied the case, or at this hour do understand it, and myself alone must do it. That being done, Mr. Povey and Bland came to speak with me about their business of the reference, wherein I shall have some more trouble, but cannot help it. Besides, I hope to make some good use of Mr. Povey to my advantage. So home after business done at my office, to supper, and then to the Globes with my wife, and so to bed. Troubled a little in mind, 
that my Lord Sandwich should continue this strangeness to me that methinks he shows me nowadays more than while the thing was fresh. 26th. Up and to the office, where we sat all the morning, at noon to the change, after being at the coffee-house, where I sat by Tom Killigrew, who told us of a fire last night in my Lady Castlemaine's lodging, where she bid forty pounds for one to adventure the fetching of a cabinet out, which at last was got to be done, and the fire at last quenched, without doing much wrong. To change, and there did much business, so home to dinner, and then to the office all the afternoon. And so at night my Aunt White and Mrs. Buggin came to sit with my wife, and I into them all the evening, my uncle coming after it, and after him Mr. Benson the Dutchman, a frank, merry man. We were very merry, and played at cards till late, and so broke up, and to bed in good hopes that this my friendship with my uncle and aunt will end well. 27th. Up and to the office, and at noon to the coffee-house, where I sat with Sir G. Askew, and Sir William Petty, who in discourses methinks one of the most rational men that ever I heard speak with a tongue, having all his notions the most distinct and clear, and among other things, saying that in all his life these three books were the most esteemed and generally cried up for wit in the world, Religio Medici, Osborne's Advice to a Son, and Hudibras, did say that in these, in the two first principally, the wit lies, and confirming some pretty sayings, which are generally like paradoxes, by some argument smartly and pleasantly urged, which takes with people who do not trouble themselves to examine the force of an argument, which pleases them in the delivery, upon a subject which they like, whereas, as by many particular instances of mine and others out of Osborne, he did really find fault and weaken the strength of many of Osborne's arguments, so as that in downright disputation they would not bear weight, at least so far but that they might be weakened, and better found in their rooms to confirm what is there said. He shewed finally whence it happens that good writers are not admired by the present age, because there are but few in any age that do mind anything that is abstruse and curious, and so longer before anybody do put the true praise and set it on foot in the world, the generality of mankind pleasing themselves in the easy delights of the world, as eating, drinking, dancing, hunting, fencing, which we see the meanest men do the best, those that profess it. A gentleman never dances so well as the dancing-master, and an ordinary fiddler makes better music for a shilling than a gentleman will do after spending forty, and so in all the delights of the world almost. Thence to the change, and after doing much business, home, taking Commissioner Pet with me, and all alone dined together. He told me many stories of the yard, but I do know him so well, and had his character given me this morning by Hempson, as well as my own two of him before, that I shall know how to value anything he says either of friendship or other business. He was mighty serious with me in discourse about the consequence of Sir W. Petty's boat, as the most dangerous thing in the world, if it should be practised by endangering our loss of the command of the seas and our trade, while the Turks and others shall get the use of them which, without doubt, by bearing more sail will go faster than any other ships, and not being of burden, our merchants cannot have the use of them, and so will be at the mercy of their enemies, so that I perceive he is afeard that the honour of his trade will down, though, which is a truth, he pretends this consideration to hinder the growth of this invention. He being gone, my wife and I took coach and to Covent Garden, to buy a mask at the French house, Madame Charette's for my wife, in the way observing the street full of coaches at the new play, The Indian Queen, which for show, they say, exceeds Henry the Eighth. Thence back to Mrs. Turner's, and sat a while with them, talking of plays, and I know not what, and so called to see Tom, but not at home, though they say he is in a deep consumption, and Mrs. Turner and Dyke, and they say he will not live two months to an end. So home and to the office, and then to supper and to bed. 28th. Up and to the office, where all the morning sitting, and at noon upon several things to the change, and thence to Sir G. Carteret's to dinner of my own accord, and after dinner with Mr. Waith down to Deptford doing several businesses, and by land back again, it being very cold, the boat meeting me after my staying a while for him at an alehouse by Redriff Stairs. So home, and took Will coming out of my doors, at which I was a little moved, and told my wife of her keeping him from the office, though God knows my base jealous head was the cause of it, which she seemed troubled at, and that it was only to discourse with her about finding a place for her brother. So I to my office late, Mr. Commander coming to read over my will in order to the engrossing it, and so he being gone, I to other business, among others chiefly upon preparing matters against creed for my profit, and so home to supper and bed, being mightily troubled with my left eye all this evening from some dirt that is got into it. Twenty-ninth. Up, and after shaving myself, wherein twice now, one after another, I have cut myself much, but I think it is from the bluntness of the razor. There came Mr. Dean to me, and stayed with me a while, talking about masts, wherein he prepared me in several things against Mr. Wood, and also about Sir W. Petty's boat, which he says must needs prove a folly, 
though I do not think so, unless it be that the king will not have it encouraged. At noon by appointment comes Mr. Hartlib and his wife, and a little before them Messrs. Langley and Bostock, old acquaintances of mine at Westminster, clerks, and after showing them my house and drinking, they set out by water, my wife and I with them, down to Wapping on board the Crown, a merchantman, Captain Floyd, a civil person. Here was Vice Admiral Goodson, whom the more I know, the more I value for a serious man and staunch. Here was Whistler, the flag-maker, which vexed me, but it mattered not. Here was other sorry company, and the discourse poor, so that we had no pleasure there at all, but only to see and bless God, to find the difference that is now between our condition and that heretofore, when we were not only much below Hartlib in all respects, but even these two fellows above named, of whom I am now quite ashamed that ever my education should lead me to such low company. But it is God's goodness only, for which let him be praised. After dinner, I broke up and with my wife home, and thence to the fleece in Cornhill by appointment, to meet my Lord Marlborough, a serious and worthy gentleman, who, after doing our business about the company, he and they began to talk of the state of the Dutch in India, which is like to be in a little time without any control, for we are lost there, and the Portuguese as bad. Thence to the coffee-house, where good discourse, especially of Lieutenant Colonel Barron touching the manners of the Turks' government among whom he lived long. So to my uncle White's, where late playing at cards, and so home. Thirtieth. Up, and a sorry sermon of a young fellow I knew at Cambridge, but the day kept solemnly for the King's murder, and all day within doors making up my Brampton papers, and in the evening Mr. Commander came, and we made perfect and signed and sealed my last will and testament, which is so to my mind, and I hope to the liking of God Almighty, that I take great joy in myself that it is done, and by that means my mind in a good condition of quiet. At night to supper and to bed. This evening, being in a humour of making all things even and clear in the world, I tore some old papers, among others a romance which, under the title of Love a Cheat, I begun ten years ago at Cambridge, and at this time reading it over to-night I liked it very well, and wondered a little at myself at my vein at that time when I wrote it, doubting that I cannot do so well now if I would try. 31st, Lord's Day. Our pen in my chamber all day long, but a little at dinner, settling all my Brampton accounts to this day in very good order, I having obliged myself by oath to do that and some other things within this month, and did also perfectly prepare a state of my estate and annexed it to my last will and testament, which now is perfect, and lastly I did make up my monthly accounts, and find that I have gained above fifty pounds this month clear, and so am worth eight hundred and fifty-eight pounds clear, which is the greatest sum I ever yet was master of, and also read over my usual vows, as I do every Lord's Day, but with greater seriousness than ordinary, and I do hope that every day I shall see more and more the pleasure of looking after my business and laying up of money, and blessed be God for what I have already been enabled by His grace to do. So it is supper and to bed with my mind in mighty great ease and content, but my head very full of thoughts and business to dispatch this next month also, and among others to provide for answering to the exchequer for my uncle's being general receiver in the year 1647, which I am at present wholly unable to do, but I must find time to look over all his papers. End of January February of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664, by Samuel Pepys. February, 1664. February 1st. Up, my maids rising early this morning to washing, and being ready, I found Mr. Strutt the purser below with twelve bottles of sack, and tells me, which from Sir W. Batten I had heard before, how young Jack Davis has railed against Sir W. Batten for his endeavouring to turn him out of his place, at which, for the fellow's sake, because it will likely prove his ruin, I am sorry, though I do believe he is a very arch rogue. I took Strutt by coach with me to Whitehall, where I set him down, and I to my lord's, but found him gone out betimes to the wardrobe, which I am glad to see that he so attends his business, though it troubles me that my counsel to my prejudice must be the cause of it. They tell me that he goes into the country next week, and that the young ladies come up this week before the old lady. Here I hear how two men last night, jostling for the wall about the new exchange, did kill one another, each thrusting the other through, one of them of the King's Chapel, one cave, and the other a retainer of my Lord General Middleton's. Thence to Whitehall, where in the Duke's chamber the King came and stayed an hour or two, laughing at Sir W. Petty, who was there about his boat, and at Gresham College in general, 
at which poor Petty was, I perceive, at some loss, but did argue discreetly, and bear the unreasonable follies of the king's objections and other bystanders with great discretion, and offered to take odds against the king's best boats. But the king would not lay, but cried him down with words only. Gresham College he mightily laughed at, for spending time only in weighing of air, and doing nothing else since they sat. Thence to Westminster Hall, and there met with diverse people, it being term time. Among others I spoke with Mrs. Lane, of whom I doubted to hear something of the effects of our last meeting about a fortnight or three weeks ago, but to my content did not. Here I met with Mr. Pierce, who tells me of several passages at court, among others how the king, coming the other day to his theatre to see the Indian Queen, which he commends for a very fine thing. My Lady Castlemaine was in the next box before he came, and leaning over other ladies a while to whisper to the king, she rose out of the box and went into the king's, and set herself on the king's right hand between the king and the Duke of York, which she swears put the king himself as well as everybody else out of countenance, and believes that she did it only to show the world that she is not out of favour yet, as was believed. Thence with Alderman Maynell by his coach to the change, and there with several people busy, and so home to dinner, and took my wife out immediately to the king's theatre, it being a new month, and once a month I may go, and there saw the Indian Queen acted, which indeed is a most pleasant show, and beyond my expectation, the play good, but spoiled with the rhyme which breaks the sense. But above my expectation most, the eldest marshal did do her part most excellently well as I ever heard woman in my life, but her voice not so sweet as Ianthe's. But, however, we came home mightily contented. Here we met Mr. Pickering and his mistress, Mrs. Doll Wilde. He tells me that the business runs high between the Chancellor and my Lord Bristol against the Parliament, and that my Lord Lauderdale and Cooper open high against the Chancellor, which I am sorry for. In my way home I light and to the coffee-house, where I hear Lieutenant Colonel Barron tell very good stories of his travels over the high hills in Asia above the clouds, how clear the heaven is above them, how thick like a mist the way is through the cloud that wets like a sponge one's clothes, the ground above the clouds all dry and parched, nothing in the world growing, it being only a dry earth, yet not so hot above as below the clouds. The stars at night most delicate, bright, and a fine clear blue sky, but cannot see the earth at any time through the clouds, but the clouds look like a world below you. Thence home and to supper, being hungry, and so to the office, did business, especially about Creed, for whom I am now pretty well fitted, and so home to bed. This day in Westminster Hall, W. Bowyer told me that his father is dead lately, and died by being drowned in the river, coming over in the night. But he says he had not been drinking. He was taken with his stick in his hand and cloak over his shoulder, as ruddy as before he died. His horse was taken overnight in the water, hampered in the bridle, but they were so silly as not to look for his master till the next morning, that he was found drowned. Second. Up and to the office, where, though Candlemas day, Mr. Coventry and Sir W. Penn and I all the morning, the others being at a survey at Deptford. At noon by coach to the change with Mr. Coventry, thence to the coffee-house with Captain Cook, who discoursed well of the good effects in some kind, of a Dutch war and conquest, which I did not consider before, but the contrary that is, that the trade of the world is too little for us two, therefore one must down. Secondly, that though our merchants will not be the better husbands by all this, yet our wool will bear a better price by vaunting of our cloths, and by that our tenants will be better able to pay rents, and our lands will be more worth, and all our own manufactures, which now the Dutch outvie us in. That he thinks the Dutch are not in so good a condition as heretofore, because of want of men always, and now from the wars against the Turk more than ever. Then to the change again, and thence off to the Sun Tavern with Sir W. Warren, and with him discoursed long, and had good advice and hints from him, and among other things he did give me a pair of gloves for my wife wrapped up in paper, which I would not open, feeling it hard, but did tell him that my wife should thank him, and so went on in discourse. When I came home, Lord, in what pain I was to get my wife out of the room without bidding her go, that I might see what these gloves were, and by and by, she being gone, it proves a pair of white gloves for her, and forty pieces in good gold, which did so cheer my heart that I could eat no victuals almost for dinner for joy, to think how God do bless us every day more and more, and more yet I hope he will, upon the increase of my duty and endeavours. I was at great loss what to do, whether tell my wife of it or no, which I could hardly forbear, but yet I did, and will think of it first before I do, for fear of making her think me to be in a better condition, or in a better way of getting money, than yet I am. After dinner to the office, where doing infinite of business till past two at night, to the comfort of my mind, and so home with joy to supper and to bed. This evening Mr. Hempson came and told me how Sir W. Batten, his master, will not hear of continuing him in his employment as clerk of the survey at Chatham, 
from whence of a sudden he has removed him without any new or extraordinary cause, and I believe, as he himself do in part right, and J. Norman do confess, for nothing but for that he was twice with me the other day, and did not wait upon him. So much he fears me, and all that have to do with me. Of this more in the memorandum book of my office upon this day, there I shall find it. Third. Up, and after a long discourse with my cousin Thomas Pepys, the executor, I with my wife by coach to Hoban, where I light, and she to her father's, I to the temple and several places, and so to the change, where much business, and then home to dinner alone, and so to the mitre tavern, by appointment, and there met by chance with W. Howe, come to buy wine for my lord against his going down to Hinchingbrook, and I private with him a great while, discoursing of my lord's strangeness to me. But he answers that I have no reason to think any such thing, but that my lord is only in general a more reserved man than he was before to meet Sir W. Ryder and Mr. Clark, and there, after much ado, made an end, giving Mr. Custos two hundred and two pounds against Mr. Bland, which I endeavoured to bring down, but could not, and think it is well enough ended for Mr. Bland for all that. Thence by coach to fetch my wife from her brother's, and found her gone home, called at Sir Robert Bernard's about surrendering my estate and reversion to the use of my life, which will be done, and at Roger Pepys, who was gone to bed in pain of a boil that he could not sit or stand. So home, where my wife is full of sad stories of her good-natured father and roguish brother, who is going for Holland and his wife to be a soldier. And so, after a little, at the office to bed. This night, late coming in my coach, coming up Ludgate Hill, I saw two gallants and their footmen taking a pretty wench, which I have much eyed, lately set up shop upon the hill, a cell of ribbon and gloves. They seek to drag her by some force, but the wench went, and I believe had her turn served, but God forgive me what thoughts and wishes I had of being in their place. In Covent Garden to-night, going to fetch home my wife, I stopped at the great coffee-house there, where I never was before, where Dryden the poet I knew at Cambridge, and all the wits of the town, and Harris the player, and Mr. Hoole of our college. And had I had time then, or could at other times, it would be good coming thither, for there I perceive is very witty and pleasant discourse. But I could not tarry, and as it was late, they were all ready to go away. Fourth. Up into the office, where, after a while sitting, I left the board upon pretence of serious business, and by coach to Paul's school, where I heard some good speeches of the boys that were to be elected this year. Thence by and by, with Mr. Pullen and Barnes, a great nonconformist, with several others of my old acquaintance, to the Nags Head Tavern, and there did give them a bottle of sack, and away again, and I to the school, and up to hear the upper form examined, and there was kept by very many of the Mercers, Clutterbuck, Abarker, Harrington, and others and with great respect used by them all, and had a noble dinner. Here they tell me, that in Dr. Collette's will he says that he would have a master found for the school that hath good skill in Latin, and if it could be, one that had some knowledge of the Greek. So little was Greek known here at that time. Dr. Wilkins and one Mr. Smallwood, posers. After great pleasure there, and specially to Mr. Crumlum, so often to tell of my being a benefactor to the school, I to my booksellers, and there spent an hour looking over Theatrum Urbium and Flandria Illustrata, with excellent cuts, with great content. So homeward, and called at my little milliner's, where I chatted with her, her husband out of the way, and a mad merry slut she is. So home to the office, and by and by comes my wife home from the burial of Captain Grove's wife at Wapping, she telling me a story how her maid Jane going into the boat did fall down, and show her arse in the boat. And alone comes my Uncle White and Mr. Mays with the state of their case, which he told me very discreetly, and I believe is a very hard one. And so after drinking a bottle of ale or two, they gone, and I a little more to the office, and so home to prayers and to bed. This evening I made an end of my letter to Creed about his pieces of eight, and sent it away to him. I pray God give good end to it to bring me some money, and that duly as from him. Fifth. Up and down by water, a brave morning, to Woolwich and there spent an hour or two to good purpose, and so walked to Greenwich, and thence to Deptford, where I found, with Sir W. Batten upon a survey, Sir J. Minnes, Sir W. Penn, and my Lady Batten, come down and going to dinner. I dined with them, and so after dinner by water home, all the way going and coming reading Faber Fortunae, which I can never read too often. At home a while with my wife, and so to my office, where till eight o'clock, and then home to look over some Brampton papers, and my uncle's accounts, as general receiver of the county for 1647, of our monthly assessment, which, contrary to my expectation, I found in such good order, and so thoroughly, that I did not expect, nor could have thought, and that being done, having seen discharges for every farthing of money he received, 
I went to bed late with great quiet. Sixth, up and to the office, where we sat all the morning, and so at noon to the change, where I met Mr. Coventry, the first time I ever saw him there, and after a little talk with him and other merchants, I up and down about several businesses, and so home, where there came one Father Fogarty, an Irish priest, of my wife's and her mother's acquaintance in France, a sober, discreet person, but one that I would not have converse with my wife, for fear of meddling with her religion, but I like the man well. Thence with my wife abroad, and left her at Tom's, while I abroad about several businesses, and so back to her, myself being vexed to find at my first coming Tom abroad, and all his books, papers, and bills loose upon the open table in the parlour, and he abroad, which I ranted at him for when he came in. Then by coach home, calling at my cousin Scott, who she lies dying, they say, upon a miscarriage. My wife could not be admitted to see her, nor anybody. At home to the office late writing letters, and then home to supper and to bed. Father Fogarty confirms to me the news that for certain there is peace between the Pope and King of France. 7th. Lord's Day. Up into church, and thence home, my wife being ill, kept her bed all day, and I up and dined by her bedside, and then all the afternoon till late at night, writing some letters of business to my father, stating of matters to him in general of great import, and other letters to ease my mind in the weekdays, that I have not time to think of. And so up to my wife, and with great mirth read Sir W. Davenant's two speeches, in dispraise of London and Paris, by way of reproach one to another, and so to prayers and to bed. Eighth. Up and by coach called upon Mr. Phillips, and after a little talk with him away to my Lord Sandwich's, but he being gone abroad, I stayed a little, and talked with Mr. Howe, and so to Westminster in term time, and there met Mr. Pierce, who told me largely how the king still do dote upon his women, even beyond all shame, and that the good queen will of herself stop before she goes sometimes into her dressing-room, till she knows whether the king be there, for fear he should be, as she hath sometimes taken him, with Mrs. Stuart, and that some of the best parts of the queen's jointure are, contrary to faith, and against the opinion of my lord treasurer and his council, bestowed or rented, I know not how, to my lord Fitzharding and Mrs. Stuart, and others of that crew that the king do dote infinitely upon the Duke of Monmouth, apparently as one that he intends to have succeed him. God knows what will be the end of it. After he was gone, I went and talked with Mrs. Lane about persuading her to Hawley, and think she will come on, which I wish were done, and so to Mr. Howlett and his wife, and talked about the same, and they are mightily for it, and I bid them promote it, for I think it will be for both their goods and my content. But I was much pleased to look upon their pretty daughter, which is grown a pretty maid, and will make a fine, modest woman. Thence to the change by coach, and after some business done, home to dinner, and thence to Guildhall, thinking to have heard some pleading, but there were no courts, and so to Cades, the stationer, and there did look upon some pictures which he promised to give me the buying of, but I found he would have played the jack with me. But at last he did proffer me what I expected, and I have laid aside ten or twelve pounds worth, and will think of it, but I am loath to lay out so much money upon them. So home a little vexed in my mind to think how to-day I was forced to compliment W. Howe, and admit myself to an equality with Mr. Moore, which has come to challenge in his discourse with me. But I will admit it no more, but let me stand off all. I will show myself as strange to them as my lord do himself to me. After at the office till nine o'clock, I home in fear of some pain by taking cold, and so to supper and to bed. Ninth. Up and to the office, where sat all the morning. At noon by coach with Mr. Coventry to the change, where busy with several people. Great talk of the Dutch proclaiming themselves in India lords of the southern seas, and deny traffic there to all ships but their own, upon pain of confiscation, which makes our merchants mad. Great doubt of two ships of ours, the Greyhound and another very rich, coming from the Straits, for fear of the Turks. Matters are made up between the Pope and the King of France, so that now all the doubt is what the French will do with their armies. Thence home, and there found Captain Grove in mourning for his wife, and Hawley, and they dined with me. After dinner, and Grove gone, Hawley and I talked of his mistress, Mrs. Lane, and I seriously advising him, and inquiring his condition, and do believe that I shall bring them together. By and by comes Mr. Moore, with whom much good discourse of my lord, and among other things told me that my lord is mightily altered, that is, grown very high and stately, and do not admit of any to come into his chamber to him as heretofore, and that I must not think much of his strangeness to me, for it was the same he do to everybody, and that he would not have me be solicitous in the matter, but keep off and give him now and then a visit and no more, for he says he himself do not go to him nowadays, but when he sends for him, nor then do not stay for him if he be not there at the hour appointed. For, says he, 
I do find that I can stand upon my own legs, and I will not by any over-submission make myself cheap to anybody and contemptible, which was the doctrine of the world that I lacked most, and shall follow it. I discourse with him about my money that my lord hath, and the thousand pounds that I stand bound with him in, to my cousin Thomas Pepys, in both which I will get myself at liberty as soon as I can, for I do not like his being angry and in debt both together to me. And besides, I do not perceive he looks after paying his debts, but runs further and further in. He being gone, my wife and I did walk an hour or two above in our chamber, seriously talking of businesses. I told her my lord owed me seven hundred pounds, and shewed her the bond, and how I intended to carry myself to my lord. She and I did cast about how to get Captain Grove for my sister, in which we are mighty earnest at present, and I think it would be a good match, and will endeavour it. So to my office a while, then home to supper, and to bed. 10th. Up and by coach to my Lord Sandwich, to his new house, a fine house, but deadly dear, in Lincoln's Inn Fields, where I found and spoke a little to him. He is high and strange still, but did ask me how my wife did, and at parting remembered him to his cousin, which I thought was pretty well, being willing to flatter myself that in time he will be well again. Thence home straight and busy all the forenoon, and at noon with Mr. Bland to Mr. Povey's, but he being at dinner and full of company, we retreated, and went into Fleet Street to a friend of his, and after a long stay, he telling me the long and most perplexed story of Coronel and Bushel's business of sugars, wherein Park and Green and Mr. Bland and forty more have been so concerned about the King of Portugal's duties, wherein every party has laboured to cheat another, a most pleasant and profitable story to hear, and in the close made me understand Mr. May's business better than I did before. By and by dinner came, and after dinner in good discourse, that, and such as I was willing for improvement's sake to hear, I went away too to Whitehall to a committee of Tangier, where I took occasion to demand of Creed whether he had received my letter, and he told me yes, and that he would answer it, which makes me much wonder what he means to do with me, but I will be even with him before I have done, let him make as light of it as he will. Thence to the temple, where my cousin Roger Pepys did show me a letter my father wrote to him last term to shew me, proposing such things about Sturtlow and a portion for Paul, and I know not what, that vexes me to see him plotting how to put me to trouble and charge, and not thinking to pay our debts and legacies. But I will write him a letter, will persuade him to be wiser. So home, and finding my wife abroad, after her coming home from being with my aunt White to-day to buy Lent provisions, gone with Will to my brother's, I followed them by coach, but found them not, for they were newly gone home from thence, which troubled me. I to Sir Robert Bernard's chamber, and there did surrender my reversion in Brampton lands, to the use of my will, which I was glad to have done, my will being now good in all parts. Thence homewards, calling a little at the coffee-house, where a little merry discourse, and so home, where I found my wife, who says she went to her father's to be satisfied about her brother, who I found at my house with her. He is going this next tide with his wife into Holland to seek his fortune. He had taken his leave of us this morning. I did give my wife ten shillings to give him, and a coat that I had by me, a close-bodied light-coloured cloth coat, with a gold edging in each seam, that was the lace of my wife's best petticoat that she had when I married her. I stayed not there, but to my office, where Staines Iglesia was with me till two at night, making up his contract, and poor man, I made him almost mad through a mistake of mine, but did afterwards reconcile all, for I would not have the man that labours to serve the king so cheap above others suffer too much. He gone, I did a little business more, and so home to supper and to bed, being now pretty well again, the weather being warm. My pain do leave me without coming to any great excess, but my cold that I had got, I suppose, was not very great, it being only the leaving of my waistcoat unbuttoned one morning. 11th. Up, and after much pleasant discourse with my wife, and to the office, where we sat all the morning and did much business, and some much to my content by prevailing against Sir W. Batten for the king's profit. At noon home to dinner, my wife and I hand to fist to a very fine pig. This noon Mr. Falconer came and visited my wife and brought her a present, a silver steak cup and cover, value about three or four pounds, for the courtesy I did him the other day. He did not stay dinner with me. I am almost sorry for this present, because I would have reserved him for a place to go in summer a visiting at Woolwich with my wife. Twelfth. Up and ready, did find below Mr. Creed's boy with a letter from his master for me. So I fell to reading it, and it is by way of stating the case between S. Pepys and J. Creed, most excellently writ, both showing his stoutness and yet willingness to peace, reproaching me, yet flattering me again, and in a word, in as good a manner as I think the world could have wrote, and indeed put me to a greater stand than ever I thought I could have been in this matter. 
all the morning thinking how to behave myself in the business, and at noon to the coffee-house, thence by his appointment met him upon the change, and with him back to the coffee-house, where with great seriousness and strangeness on both sides, he said his part, and I mine, he sometimes owning my favour and assistance, yet endeavouring to lessen it, as that the success of his business was not wholly or very much to be imputed to that assistance. I to allege the contrary, and plainly to tell him that from the beginning I never had it in my mind to do him all that kindness for nothing, but he gaining five or six hundred pounds, I did expect a share of it, at least a real and not a complimentary acknowledgement of it. In fine, I said nothing all the while that I need fear he can do me more hurt with them than before I spoke them. The most I told him was after we were come to a peace, which he asked me whether he should answer the board's letter or no. I told him he might forbear it a while and no more. Then he asked how the letter could be signed by them without their much inquiry. I told him it was as I worded it, and nothing at all else of any moment, whether my words be ever hereafter spoken of again or no, so that I have the same, neither better nor worse force over him, that I had before, if he should not do his part. And the peace between us was this. Says he after all, well, says he, I know you will expect, since there must be some condescension, that it do become me to begin it, and therefore, says he, I do propose, just like the interstice between the death of the old and the coming in of the present king, all the time is swallowed up as if it had never been. So our breach of friendship may be as if it had never been, that I should lay aside all misapprehensions of him or his first letter, and that he would reckon himself obliged to show the same ingenuous acknowledgement of my love and service to him as at the beginning he ought to have done, before by my first letter I did, as he well observed, put him out of a capacity of doing it, without seeming to do it servilely, and so it rests, and I shall expect how he will deal with me. After that I began to be free, and both of us to discourse of other things, and he went home with me, and dined with me and my wife, and very pleasant, having a good dinner, and the opening of my lamprey, cutting a notch on one side, which proved very good. After dinner he and I to Deptford, walking all the way, where we met Sir W. Petty, and I took him back, and I got him to go with me to his vessel, and discourse it over to me, which he did very well, and then walked back together to the waterside at Redriff, with good discourse all the way. So Creed and I by boat to my house, and thence to coach with my wife, and called at Alderman Backwell's, and there changed Mr. Falconer's state cup, that he did give us the other day, for a fair tankard. The cup weighed with the fashion five pounds sixteen shillings, and another little cup that Joyce Norton did give us seventeen shillings, both six pounds thirteen shillings, for which we had the tankard, which came to six pounds ten shillings, at five shillings seven pence per ounce, and three shillings in money, and with great content away thence to my brother's, Creed going away there, and my brother bringing me the old silk standard that I lodged there long ago, and then back again home, and thence, hearing that my uncle White had been at my house, I went to him to the mitre, and there with him and Mace Norbury and Mr. Rawlinson till late, eating some pot venison, where the crown earthen pot pleased me mightily and then homewards and met Mr. Barrow, so back with him to the mitre, and sat talking about his business of his discontent in the yard, wherein sometimes he was very foolish and pettish, till twelve at night, and so went away, and I home and up to my wife a bed, with my mind ill at ease whether I should think that I had by this made myself a bad end by missing the certainty of a hundred pounds, which I proposed to myself so much, or a good one by easing myself of the uncertain good effect." but the certain trouble and reflection which must have fallen on me if we had proceeded to a public dispute, ended besides embarking myself against my lord who, which I had forgot, had given him his hand for the value of the pieces of eight at his rates which were all false, which, by the way, I shall take heed to the giving of my lord notice of it hereafter, whenever he goes out again. Thirteenth. Up, and after I had told my wife in the morning in bed the passages yesterday, with creed, my head and heart was mightily lighter than they were before, and so up into the office, and thence, after sitting, at eleven o'clock with Mr. Coventry to the African house, and there with Sir W. Ryder, by agreement, we looked over part of my Lord Peterborough's accounts, these being by Creed and Vernati, and on down to dinner to a table which Mr. Coventry keeps here, out of his three hundred pounds per annum as one of the assistants to the royal company, a very pretty dinner and good company, an excellent discourse, and so up again to our work for an hour till the company came to having a meeting of their own, and so we broke up and Creed and I took coach and to Reeves, the perspective glass-maker, and there did indeed see very excellent microscopes, which did discover a louse or mite or sand most perfectly and largely. Being sated with that we went away, yet with a good will were it not for my obligation to have bought one, and walked to the new exchange, and after a turn or two and talked I took coach and home, and so to my office, after I had been with my wife and saw her day's work in ripping the silk standard, which we brought home last night, 
and it will serve to line a bed, or for twenty uses, to our great content. And there wrote fair my angry letter to my father, upon that that he wrote to my cousin Roger Pepys, which I hope will make him the more careful to trust to my advice for the time to come, without so many needless complaints and jealousies, which are troublesome to me, because without reason. Fourteenth, Lord's Day. Up and to church alone, where a lazy sermon of Mr. Mills, upon a text to introduce catechizing in his parish, which I perceive he intends to begin. So home, and very pleasant with my wife at dinner. All the afternoon at my office alone, doing business, and then in the evening, after a walk with my wife in the garden, she and I to my uncle White's to supper, where Mr. Norbury, but my uncle out of tune, and after supper he seemed displeased mightily on my aunt's desiring to put off a copper kettle, which it seems with great study he had provided to boil meat in, and now she is put in the head that it is not wholesome, which vexed him. But we were very merry about it, and by and by home, and after prayers to bed. Fifteenth. Up, and carrying my wife to my lord's lodgings, left her, and I to Whitehall to the duke, where he first put on a periwig to-day, but methought his hair cut short in order thereto did look very prettily of itself, before he put on his periwig. Thence to his closet, and there did our business, and thence Mr. Coventry and I down to his chamber, and spent a little time, and so parted, and I took my wife homeward, I stopping at the coffee-house, and thence a while to the change, where great news of the arrival of two rich ships, the Greyhound, and another, which they were mightily afeard of, and great insurance given, and so home to dinner, and after an hour with my wife at her globes, I to the office, were very busy till eleven at night, and so home to supper and to bed. This afternoon Sir Thomas Chamberlain came to the office to me, and showed me several letters from the East Indies, showing the height that the Dutch are come to there, showing scorn to all the English, even in our only factory there of Surat, beating several men, and hanging the English standard St. George under the Dutch flag in scorn, saying that whatever their masters do or say at home, they will do what they list, and will be masters of all the world there, and have so proclaimed themselves sovereign of all the South Seas, which certainly our king cannot endure, if the Parliament will give him money, but I doubt and yet do hope they will not yet, till we are more ready for it. Sixteenth. Up into the office, we are very busy all the morning, and most with Mr. Wood, I vexing him about his masts. At noon to the change a little, and thence brought Mr. Barrow to dinner with me, where I had a haunch of venison roasted, given me yesterday, and so had a pretty dinner, full of discourse of his business, wherein the poor man is mightily troubled. And I pity him in it, but hope to get him some ease. He being gone, I to the office, were very busy till night, that my uncle White and Mr. Mace came to me, and after discourse about Mace's business, to supper very merry. But my mind upon my business, and so they being gone, I to my vial a little, which I have not done some months, I think, before, and then a little to my office at eleven at night, and so home, and to bed. Seventeenth. Up and with my wife, setting her down by her father's in Long Acre, in so ill-looked a place among all the whorehouses, that I was troubled at it to see her go thither. Then I to Whitehall, and there walked up and down, talking with Mr. Pierce, who tells me of the king's giving of my lord Fitzharding two leases, which belong indeed to the queen, worth twenty thousand pounds to him, and how people do talk of it, and other things of that nature which I am sorry to hear. He and I walked round the park with great pleasure and back again, and finding no time to speak with my lord of Albemarle, I walked to the change, and there met my wife at our pretty dolls, and so took her home, and Creed also whom I met there, and sent her hose. While Creed and I stayed on the change, and by and by home and dined, where I found an excellent mastiff, his name Towser, sent me by a surgeon. After dinner I took my wife again by coach, leaving Creed by the way going to Gresham College, of which he is now become one of the virtuosos, and to Whitehall, where I delivered a paper about Tangier to my Lord Duke of Albemarle in the council chamber, and so to Mrs. Hunt's to call my wife, and so by coach straight home, and at my office till three o'clock in the morning, having spent much time this evening in discourse with Mr. Cutler, who tells me how the Dutch deal with us abroad and do not value us anywhere, and how he and Sir W. Ryder have found reason to lay aside Captain Cock in their company, he having played some indiscreet and unfair tricks with them, and has lost himself everywhere by his imposing upon all the world, with the conceit he has of his own wit, and so has, he tells me, Sir R. Ford also, both of whom are very witty men. He being gone, Sir W. Ryder came and stayed with me till about twelve at night, having found ourselves work till that time, about understanding the measuring of Mr. Wood's masts, which though I did so well before as to be thought to deal very hardly against Wood, yet I am ashamed I understand it no better, and do hope yet, whatever be thought of me, to save the king some more money, and out of an impatience to break up with my head full of confused, confounded notions, but nothing brought to a clear comprehension. I was resolved to sit up, and did, till now it is ready to strike four o'clock, 
all alone, cold, and my candle not enough left to light me to my own house, and so with my business, however, brought to some good understanding, and set it down pretty clear, I went home to bed with my mind at good quiet, and the girl sitting up for me, the rest all abed. I eat and drank a little, and to bed, weary, sleepy, cold, and my head aching. 18th. Called up to the office, and much against my will I rose, my head aching mightily, and to the office, where I did argue to good purpose for the king, which I have been fitting myself for the last night against Mr. Wood about his masts, but brought it to no issue, very full of business till noon, and then with Mr. Coventry to the African house, and there fell to my Lord Peterborough's accounts, and by and by to dinner, where excellent discourse, Sir G. Carteret and others of the African company with us, and then up to the accounts again, which were by and by done, and then I straight home, my head in great pain, and drowsy. So after doing a little business at the office, I wrote to my father about sending him the mastiff was given me yesterday. I home, and by daylight to bed about six o'clock, and fell to sleep, wakened about twelve, when my wife came to bed, and then to sleep again, and so till morning, and then... 19th. Up in good order, in my head again, and shaved myself, and then to the office, whither Mr. Cutler came, and walked and talked with me a great while, and then to the change together, and it being early, did tell me several excellent examples of men raised upon the change by their great diligence and saving, as also his own fortune, and how credit grew upon him, that when he was not really worth eleven hundred pounds, he had credit for a hundred thousand pounds, of Sir W. Ryder, how he rose, and others. By and by joined with us Sir John Banks, who told us several passages of the East India Company, and how in his very case, when there was due to him and Alderman Miko sixty-four thousand pounds from the Dutch for injury done to them in the East Indies, Oliver presently after the peace, they delaying to pay them the money, sent them word that if they did not pay them by such a day, he would grant letters of mark to those merchants against them, by which they were so fearful of him they did presently pay the money every farthing. By and by the change filling, I did many businesses, and about two o'clock went off with my uncle White to his house. Thence by appointment we took our wives, they by coach with Mr. Moores, and we on foot to Mr. Jaggard, a salter in Thames Street, for whom I did a courtesy among the poor victuallers. His wife, whom long ago I had seen, being daughter to old day, my uncle White's master, is a very plain woman, but pretty children they have. They live, methought, at first in but a plain way, but afterward I saw their dinner, all fish, brought in very neatly, but the company being but bad, I had no great pleasure in it. After dinner I to the office, where we should have met upon business extraordinary, but business not coming, we broke up, and I thither again and took my wife, and taking a coach went to visit my ladies Jemima and Paulina Montague and Mrs. Elizabeth Dickering, whom we find at their father's new house, in Lincoln's Inn Fields, but the house all in dirt. They received us well enough, but I did not endeavour to carry myself over familiarly with them, and so after a little stay, there coming in presently after us, my lady Abergavenny and other ladies, we back again by coach, and visited, my wife did, my she-cousin Scott, who is very ill still, and thence to Jaggard's again, where a very good supper and great store of plate, and above all after supper Mrs. Jaggard did at my entreaty play on the viol, but so well as I did not think any woman in England could, and but few masters. I must confess it did mightily surprise me, though I knew heretofore that she could play, but little thought so well. After her I set Mace to singing, but he did it so like a coxcomb that I was sick of him. About eleven at night I carried my aunt home by coach, and then home myself, having set my wife down at home by the way. My aunt tells me they are counted very rich people, worth at least ten or twelve thousand pounds, and their country house all the year long, and all things livable which mightily surprises me to think for how poor a man I took him when I did him the courtesy at our office. So after prayers to bed, pleased at nothing all the day but Mrs. Jaggard playing on the viol, and that was enough to make me bear with all the rest that did not content me. Twentieth. Up and to the office, where we sat all the morning, and at noon to the change with Mr. Coventry, and thence home to dinner. After dinner, by a galley, down to Woolwich, where with Mr. Faulkner, and then at the other yard doing some business, to my content, and so walked to Greenwich, it being a very fine evening, and brought right home with me by water, and so to my office, where late doing business, and then home to supper, and to bed. 21st. Lord's Day. Up, and having many businesses at the office to-day, I spent all the morning there drawing up a letter to Mr. Coventry, about preserving of masts, being collections of my own, and at noon home to dinner, whither my brother Tom comes, and after dinner I took him up and read my letter lately of discontent to my father, and he is seemingly pleased at it, and cries out of my sister's ill nature and lazy life there. He being gone, I to my office again, and there made an end of my morning's work, and then, after reading my vows, of course, home and back again with Mr. Mace, and walked with him, talking of his business in the garden, 
and he being gone my wife and i walked a turn or two also and then my uncle wight fetching of us she and i to his house to supper and by the way calling on sir g carteret to desire his consent to my bringing mace to him which he agreed to so i to my uncle's but stayed a great while vexed both of us for mace not coming in and soon he came and i with him from supper to sir g carteret and there did largely discourse of the business and i believe he may expect as much favour as he can do him though i fear that will not be much so back and after sitting there a good while we home and going my wife told me how my uncle when he had her alone did tell her that he did love her as well as ever he did though he did not find it convenient to show it publicly for reasons on both sides seeming to mean as well to prevent my jealousy as his wife's but i am apt to think that he do mean as well and to give us something if he should die without children so home to prayers and to bed my wife called up the people to washing by four o'clock in the morning and our little girl susan is a most admirable slut and pleases us mightily doing more service than both the others and deserves wages better twenty second up and shaved myself and then my wife and i by coach out and i set her down by her father's being vexed in my mind and angry with her for the ill-favoured place among or near the whorehouses that she is forced to come to him so left her there and i to sir t warwick's but did not speak with him thence to take a turn in st james's park and meeting with aunt joyce walked with him a turn in the pell-mell and so parted he st james's ward and i out to whitehall ward and so to a picture-seller's by the half-moon in the street over against the exchange and there looked over the maps of several cities and did buy two books of cities stitched together cost me nine shillings sixpence and when i came home thought of my vow and paid five shillings into my poor box for it hoping in god that i shall forfeit no more in that kind thence meeting mr moore into the exchange and there found my wife at pretty dolls and thence by coach set at my uncle white's to go with my aunt to market once more against lent and i to the coffee-house and thence to the change my chief business being to inquire about the manner of other countries keeping of their masts wet or dry and got good advice about it and so home and alone ate a bad cold dinner my people being at their washing all day and so to the office and all the afternoon upon my letter to mr coventry about keeping of masts and ended it very well at night and wrote it fair over this evening came mr alsop the king's brewer with whom i spent an hour talking and bewailing the posture of things at present the king led away by half a dozen men that none of his serious servants and friends can come at him these are lauderdale buckingham hamilton fitzharding to whom he hath it seems given two thousand pounds per annum in the best part of the king's estate and that that the old duke of buckingham could never get of the king progress is another and sir h bennet he loves not the queen at all but is rather sullen to her and she by all reports incapable of children he is so fond of the duke of monmouth that everybody admires it and he says the duke hath said that he would be the death of any man that says the king was not married to his mother though alsop says it is well known that she was a common whore before the king lay with her but it seems he says that the king is mighty kind to these his bastard children and at this day will go at midnight to my lady castlemaine's nurses and take the child and dance it in his arms that he is not likely to have his tables up again in his house for the crew that are about him will not have him come to common view again but keep him obscurely among themselves he hath this night it seems ordered that the hall which there is a ball to be in to-night before the king be guarded as the queen mother says by his horse guards whereas heretofore they were by the lord chamberlain or steward and their people but it is feared they will reduce all to the soldiery and all other places taken away and what is worst of all that he will alter the present militia and bring all to a flying army that my lord lauderdale being middleton's enemy and one that scorns her chancellor even to open affronts before the king hath got the whole power of scotland into his hand whereas the other day he was in a fair way to have had his whole estate and honour and life voted away from him that the king hath done himself all imaginable wrong in the business of my lord antrim in ireland who though he was the head of rebels yet he by his letter owns to have acted by his father's and mother's and his commissions but it seems the truth is he hath obliged himself upon the clearing of his estate to settle it upon a daughter of the queen mother's by my lord german i suppose in marriage be it to whom the queen pleases which is a sad story it seems a daughter of the duke of lennox's was by force going to be married the other day at somerset house to harry german but she got away and run to the king and he says he will protect her she is it seems very near akin to the king such mad doings there are every day among them the rape upon a woman at turnstile the other day her husband being bound in his shirt they both being in bed together it being night by two frenchmen who did not only lie with her but abused her with a link is hushed up for three hundred pounds being the queen-mother's servants 
There was a French book in verse the other day translated and presented to the Duke of Monmouth in such a high style that the Duke of York, he tells me, was mightily offended at it. The Duke of Monmouth's mother's brother hath a place at court, and being a Welshman, I think he told me, will talk very broad of the king's being married to his sister. The king did the other day at the council commit my lord Digby's chaplain and steward and another servant, who went upon the process begun there against their lord, to swear that they saw him at church, and received the sacrament as a Protestant, which, the judges said, was sufficient to prove him such in the eye of the law. The king, I say, did commit them all to the gatehouse, notwithstanding their pleading their dependence upon him, and the faith they owed him as their lord whose bread they eat, and that the king should say that he would soon see whether he was king or Digby, that the queen mother hath outrun herself in her expenses, and is now come to pay very ill, or run in debt, the money being spent that she received for leases. He believes there is not any money laid up in bank, as I told him some did hope, but he says from the best informers he can assure me there is no such thing nor anybody that should look after such a thing, and that there is not now above eighty thousand pounds of the Dunkirk money left in stock, that Oliver, in the year when he spent one million four hundred thousand pounds in the navy, did spend in the whole expense of the kingdom two million six hundred thousand pounds, that all the court are mad for a Dutch war, but both he and I did concur that it was a thing rather to be dreaded than hoped for, unless by the French kings falling upon Flanders, they and the Dutch should be divided." that our ambassador had, it is true, an audience, but in the most dishonourable way that could be, for the princess of the blood, though invited by our ambassador, which was the greatest absurdity that ever ambassador committed these four hundred years, were not there, and so were not said to give place to our king's ambassador, and that our king did openly say, the other day in the privy chamber, that he would not be hectored out of his right and pre-eminences by the king of France, as great as he was, that the Pope is glad to yield to a peace with the French, as the news-book says, upon the basest terms that ever was, that the talk which these people about our king that I name before have, is to tell him how neither privilege of parliament nor city is anything, but his will is all, and ought to be so, and their discourse it seems when they are alone is so base and sordid, that it makes the ears of the very gentlemen of the back stairs, I think he called them, to tingle to hear it spoke in the king's hearing, and that must be very bad indeed, that my lord Digby did send to Lisbon a couple of priests to search up what they could against the Chancellor concerning the match, as to the point of his knowing beforehand that the Queen was not capable of bearing children, and that something was given her to make her so. But as private as they were, when they came thither, they were clapped up prisoners. That my lord Digby endeavours what he can to bring the business into the House of Commons, hoping there to master the Chancellor, there being many enemies of his there, but I hope the contrary that whereas the late king did mortgage Clarendon to somebody for twenty thousand pounds, and this to have given it to the Duke of Albemarle, and he sold it to my Lord Chancellor, whose title of earldom is fetched from thence, the king hath this day sent his order to the privy seal for the payment of this twenty thousand pounds to my Lord Chancellor, to clear the mortgage. Ireland, in a very distracted condition about the hard usage which the Protestants meet with, and the too good which the Catholics, and from altogether... God knows my heart, I expect nothing but ruin can follow, unless things are better ordered, in a little time. He being gone, my wife came, and told me how kind my uncle White had been to her to-day, and that though she says that all his kindness comes from respect to her, she discovers nothing but great civility from him. Yet but what she says he otherwise will tell me, but to-day he told her plainly that had she a child it should be his heir, and that should I or she want, he would be a good friend to us, and did give my wife instructions to consent to all his wife says at any time, she being a pettish woman, which argues the design I think he has of keeping us in with his wife in order to our good sure, and he declaring her jealous of him, that so he dares not come to see my wife as otherwise he would do, and will endeavour to do. It looks strange putting all together, but yet I am in hopes he means well. My aunt also is mighty open to my wife, and tells her mighty plain how her husband did intend to double her portion to her at his death as a jointure, that he will give presently one hundred pounds to her niece Mary, and a good legacy at his death, and it seems did as much to the other sister, which vex me, to think that he should bestow so much upon his wife's friends daily as he do. But it cannot be helped for the time past, and I will endeavour to remedy it for the time to come. After all this discourse with my wife at my office alone, she home to see how the wash goes on, and I to make an end of my work, and so home to supper, and to bed. 23rd. Up, it being Shrove Tuesday, and at the office sat all the morning, at noon to the change, and there met with Sir W. Ryder, and of a sudden knowing what I had at home, brought him and Mr. Cutler and Mr. Cook, clerk to Mr. Secretary Morris, a sober and pleasant man, and one that I knew heretofore, when he was my Lord Secretary at Dunkirk. I made much of them, and had a pretty dinner for a sudden. We talked very pleasantly, and they many good discourses of their travels abroad. 
After dinner they gone, I to my office, where doing many businesses very late, but to my good content, to see how I grow in estimation every day more and more, and have things given more oftener than I used to have formerly, as to have a case of very pretty knives with agate shafts by Mrs. Russell. So home and to bed. This day, by the blessing of God, I have lived thirty-one years in the world, and by the grace of God, I find myself not only in good health in everything, and particularly as to the stone, but only pain upon taking cold, and also in a fair way of coming to a better esteem and estate in the world than ever I expected. But I pray God give me a heart to fear a fall, and to prepare for it. 24th. Ash Wednesday. Up and by water, it being a very fine morning, to Whitehall, and there to speak with Sir P. Warwick, but he was gone out to chapel, so I spent much of the morning walking in the park, and going to the Queen's Chapel, where I stayed and saw their mass, till a man came and bid me go out or kneel down, so I did go out, and thence to Somerset House, and there into the chapel, where Monsieur d'Espagne used to preach. But now it is made very fine, and was ten times more crowded than the Queen's Chapel at St. James, which I wonder at. Thence down to the garden of Somerset House, and up and down the new building, which in every respect will be mighty magnificent and costly. I stayed a great while talking with a man in the garden that was sawing of a piece of marble, and did give him sixpence to drink. He told me much of the nature and labour of the work, how he could not saw above four inches of the stone in a day, and of a greater not above one or two, and after it is sawed, then it is rubbed with coarse, and then with finer and finer sand, till they come to putty, and so polish it as smooth as glass. Their saws have no teeth, but it is the sand only which the saw rubs up and down that do the thing. Thence by water to the coffee-house, and there sat with Alderman Barker talking of him and the trade, and thence to the change a little, and so home and dined with my wife, and then to the office till the evening, and then walked a while merrily with my wife in the garden, and so she gone, I to work again till late, and so home to supper, and to bed. 25th. Up into the office where we sat, and thence with Mr. Coventry by coach to the glass-house, and there dined, and both before and after did my Lord Peterborough's accounts. Thence home to the office, and there did business till called by Creed, and with him by coach, setting my wife at my brother's, to my lord's, and saw the young ladies, and talked a little with them, and thence to Whitehall, a while talking, but doing no business, but resolved of going to meet my lord to-morrow, having got a horse of Mr. Coventry to-day. So home, taking up my wife, and after doing something at my office, home, God forgive me, disturbed in my mind out of my jealousy of my wife to-morrow when I am out of town, which is a hell to my mind, and yet without all reason. God forgive me for it, and mend me. So home, and getting my things ready for me, weary to bed. 26th. Up, and after dressing myself handsomely for riding, I out, and by water to Westminster, to Mr. Creed's chamber, and after drinking some chocolate and playing on the vial, Mr. Mallard being there, upon Creed's new vial, which proves, methinks, much worse than mine, and looking upon his new contrivance of a desk and shelves for books, we set out from an inn hard by, whither Mr. Coventry's horse was carried, and round about the bush through bad ways to Highgate. Good discourse in the way had between us, and it being all day a most admirable pleasant day, we, upon consultation, had stopped at the cock, a mile on this side Barnet, being unwilling to put ourselves to the charge or doubtful acceptance of any provision against my lord's coming by, and there got something and dined, setting a boy to look towards Barnet Hill against their coming, and after two or three false alarms they come, and we met the coach very gracefully, and I had a kind receipt from both Lord and Lady as I could wish, and some kind discourse, and then rode by the coach a good way, and so fell to discoursing with several of the people, there being a dozen attending the coach, and another for the maids and parson. Among others talking with W. Howe, he told me how my Lord, in his hearing the other day, did largely tell my Lord Peter Bram Povey, who went with them down to Hinchingbrook, how and when he discarded Creed, and took me to him, and that, since the Duke of York has several times thanked him for me, which did not a little please me. And anon, I desiring Mr. Howe to tell me upon what occasion this discourse happened, he desired me to say nothing of it now, for he would not have my lord to take notice of our being together, but he would tell me another time, which put me into some trouble to think what he meant by it. But when we came to my lord's house, I went in, and whether it was my lord's neglect or general indifference, I know not, but he made me no kind of compliment there, and methinks the young ladies look somewhat highly upon me. So I went away without bidding adieu to anybody, being desirous not to be thought too servile. But I do hope and believe that my lord do yet value me as high as ever, though he dare not admit me to the freedom he once did, and that my lady is still the same woman. So rode home, and there found my uncle White. Tis an odd thing, as my wife tells me, his caressing her and coming on purpose to give her visits. But I do not trouble myself for him at all, but hope the best and very good effects of it. 
He being gone, I eat something, and my wife. I told all this day's passages, and she to give me very good and rational advice how to behave myself to my lord and his family, by slighting everybody but my lord and lady, and not to seem to have the least society or fellowship with them, which I am resolved to do, knowing that it is my high carriage that must do me good there, and to appear in good clothes and garb. To the office, and being weary, early home to bed. 27th. Up but weary, and to the office, where we sat all the morning. Before I went to the office, there came Bagwell's wife to me to speak for her husband. I liked the woman very well, and stroked her under the chin, but could not find in my heart to offer anything uncivil to her, she being, I believe, a very modest woman. At noon with Mr. Coventry to the African house, and to my Lord Peterborough's business again, and then to dinner, where before dinner we had the best oysters I have seen this year, and I think as good in all respects as ever I eat in my life. I eat a great many. Great good company at dinner, among others, Sir Martin Noel, who told us the dispute between him as farmer of the additional duty, and the East India Company, whether calicoes be linen or no, which he says it is, having been ever esteemed so. They say it is made of cotton wool and grows upon trees, not like flax or hemp, but it was carried against the company, though they stand out against the verdict. Thence home and to the office were late, and so home to supper and to bed, and had a very pleasing and condescending answer from my poor father to-day, in answer to my angry, discontentful letter to him the other day, which pleases me mightily. 28. Lord's Day. Up and walked to Paul's, and by chance it was an extraordinary day for the readers of the Inns of Court and all the students to come to church, it being an old ceremony not used these twenty-five years upon the first Sunday in Lent. Abundance there was of students, more than there was room to seat but upon forms, and the church mighty full. One Hawkins preached, an Oxford man, a good sermon upon these words, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable. Both before and after sermon I was most impatiently troubled at the choir, the worst that ever I heard. But what was extraordinary, the Bishop of London, who sat there in a pew, made a purpose for him by the pulpit, to give the last blessing to the congregation, which was, he being a comely old man, a very decent thing, methought. The lieutenant of the tower, Sir J. Robinson, would needs have me by coach home with him, and sending word home to my house, I did go and dine with him, his ordinary table being very good, and his lady a very high carriaged but comely big woman. I was mightily pleased with her. His officers of his regiment dined with him. No discourse at table to any purpose. Only after dinner my lady would need see a boy which was represented to her to be an innocent country boy brought up to town a day or two ago, and left here to the wide world. And he, losing his way, fell into the tower, which my lady believes, and takes pity on him, and will keep him. But though a little boy and but young, yet he tells his tale so readily, and answers all questions so wittily, that for certain he is an arch rogue and bred in this town. But my lady will not believe it, but ordered victuals to be given him, and I think will keep him as a footboy for their eldest son. After dinner to chapel in the tower with the lieutenant, with the keys carried before us, and the warders and gentlemen porter going before us, and I sat with the lieutenant in his pew in great state, but slept all the sermon. None, it seems, of the prisoners in the tower that are there now, though they may, will come to the prayers there. Church being done, I back to Sir John's house, and there left him and home and by and by to Sir W. Penn, and stayed a while talking with him about Sir J. Minnes, his folly, in his office, of which I am sick and weary to speak of it, and how the king is abused in it, though Penn, I know, offers the discourse only like a rogue to get it out of me, but I am very free to tell my mind to him, in that case being not unwilling, he should tell him again, if he will, or anybody else. Then to home and walked in the garden by brave moonshine with my wife above two hours, till past eight o'clock, then to supper, and after prayers to bed. Twenty ninth. Up and by coach with Sir W. Penn to Charing Cross, and there I light, and to Sir Philip Warwick to visit him and discourse with him about navy business, which I did at large, and he most largely with me, not only about the navy, but about the general revenue of England, above two hours, I think, many staying all the while without, but he seemed to take pains to let me either understand the affairs of the revenue, or else to be a witness of his pains and care in stating it. He showed me indeed many excellent collections of the state of the revenue in former kings, and the late times, and the present. He showed me how the very assessments between 1643 and 1659, which were taxes, besides excise, customs, sequestrations, decimations, king and queens and church lands, or anything else but just the assessments, come to about fifteen millions. He showed me a discourse of his concerning the revenues of this and foreign states, how that of Spain was great, but divided with his kingdoms, and so came to little, how that of France did, and do much exceed ours before for quantity, and that it is at the will of the prince to tax what he will upon his people, which is not here. That the Hollanders have the best manner of tax, 
which is only upon the expense of provisions, by an excise, and do conclude that no other tax is proper for England but a pound rate, or excise upon the expense of provisions. He showed me every particular sort of payment away of money, since the king's coming in, to this day, and told me from one to one how little he hath received of profit from most of them, and I believe him truly, that the one million two hundred thousand pounds which the Parliament with so much ado did first vote to give the King, and since hath been re-examined by several committees of the present Parliament, is yet above three hundred thousand pounds short of making up really to the King the one million two hundred thousand pounds, as by particulars he showed me. And in my Lord Treasurer's excellent letter to the King upon this subject, he tells the King how it was suspending more than the revenue that did give the first occasion of his father's ruin, and did since to the rebels, who, he says, just like Henry the Eighth, had great and sudden increase of wealth, but yet by overspending both died poor. And further tells the King how much of this one million two hundred thousand pounds depends upon the life of the Prince, and so must be renewed by Parliament again to his successor, which is seldom done without parting with some of the prerogatives of the Crown, or if he denied and he persists to take it of the people, it gives occasion to a civil war, which may, as it did in the late business of tonnage and poundage, prove fatal to the Crown. He showed me how many ways the Lord Treasurer did take before he moved the King to farm the customs in the manner he do, and the reasons that moved him to do it. He showed me a very excellent argument to prove that our importing less than we export do not impoverish the Kingdom, according to the received opinion, which though it be a paradox, and that I do not remember the argument, yet methought there was a great deal in what he said. And upon the whole I find him a most exact and methodical man, and of great industry, and very glad that he thought fit to show me all this though I cannot easily guess a reason why he should do it to me, unless from the plainness that he sees I used to him, in telling him how much the king may suffer for our want of understanding the case of our treasury. Thence to Whitehall, where my Lord Sandwich was, and gave me a good countenance, I thought, and before the Duke did our usual business, and so I about several businesses in the house, and then out to the mews with Sir W. Penn. But in my way first did meet with W. Howe, who did of himself advise me to appear more free with my Lord, and to come to him, for my own strangeness, he tells me, he thinks to make my lord the worse. At the mews, Sir W. Penn and Mr. Baxter did shew me several good horses, but Penn, which Sir W. Penn did give the Duke of York, was given away by the Duke the other day to a Frenchman, which Baxter is cruelly vexed at, saying that he was the best horse that he expects a great while to have to do with. Then I to the change, and thence to a coffee-house with Sir W. Warren, and did talk much about his and Wood's business, and thence homewards, and in my way did stay to look upon a fire in an inn-yard in Lombard Street. But, Lord, how the mercers and merchants who had warehouses there did carry away their cloths and silks! But at last it was quenched, and I home to dinner, and after dinner carried my wife and set her and her two maids in Fleet Street to buy things, and I to Whitehall to little purpose, and so to Westminster Hall, and there talked with Mrs. Lane and Howlett. But the match with Hawley, I perceive, will not take, and so I am resolved wholly to avoid occasion of further ill with her. Thence by water to Salisbury Court, and found my wife by agreement at Mrs. Turner's, and after a little stay and chat set her and young Armiger down in Cheapside, and so my wife and I home. Got home before our maids, who by and by came with a great cry and fright, that they had like to have been killed by a coach. But, Lord, to see how Jane did tell the story like a fool and a dissembling fanatic like her grandmother, but so like a changeling, would make a man laugh to death almost, and yet be vexed to hear her. By and by to the office to make up my monthly accounts, which I make up to-night, and to my great content find myself worth eight hundred and ninety and odd pounds, the greatest sum I ever yet knew, and so with a heart at great ease to bed. End of February March of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664, by Samuel Pepys, March, 1664. March 1st. Up and to the office, where we sat all the morning, and at noon to the change, and after much business and meeting my Uncle White, who told me how Mr. Mace had liked to have been trepanned yesterday, but was forced to run for it, so with Creed and Mr. Hunt home to dinner and after a good and pleasant dinner Mr. Hunt parted, and I took Mr. Creed and my wife, and down to Deptford, it being most pleasant weather, and there till night discoursing with the officers there about several things, and so walked home by moonshine, it being mighty pleasant, and so home, and I to my office, where late about getting myself a thorough understanding in the business of masts, and so home to bed, my left eye being mightily troubled with room. Second. Up, my eye mightily out of order with the room that is fallen down into it, 
However, I by coach endeavoured to have waited on my Lord Sandwich, but meeting him in Chancery Lane going towards the city, I stopped and so fairly walked home again, calling at St. Paul's Churchyard, and there looked upon a pretty burlesque poem called Scaronides or Virgil Travesty. Extraordinary good. At home to the office till dinner, and after dinner my wife cut my hair short, which is growing pretty long again, and then to the office, and there till nine at night doing business. This afternoon we had a good present of tongues and bacon from Mr. Shales of Portsmouth, so at night home to supper, and being troubled with my eye to bed. This morning Mr. Bergby, one of the writing clerks belonging to the council, was with me about business, a knowing man. He complains how most of the lords of the council do look after themselves and their own ends, and none the public, unless Sir Edward Nicholas. Sir G. Carteret is diligent, but all for his own ends and profit. My Lord Privy Seal, a destroyer of everybody's business, and do no good at all to the public. The Archbishop of Canterbury speaks very little, nor do much, being now come to the highest pitch that he can expect. He tells me he believes that things will go very high against the Chancellor by Digby, and that bad things will be proved. Talks much of his neglecting the King, and making the King to trot every day to him, when he is well enough to go to visit his cousin Chief Justice Hyde, but not to the Council or King. He commends my Lord of Ormond mightily in Ireland, but cries out cruelly of Sir G. Lane for his corruption, and that he hath done my Lord great dishonour by selling of places here, which are now all taken away, and the poor wretches ready to starve. That nobody almost understands or judges of business better than the King, if he would not be guilty of his father's fault to be doubtful of himself, and easily be removed from his own opinion. That my Lord Lauderdale is never from the King's care nor counsel, and that he is a most cunning fellow, upon the whole that he finds things go very bad everywhere, and even in the council nobody minds the public. Third. Up pretty early, and so to the office, where we sat all the morning making a very great contract with Sir W. Warren for provisions for the year coming, and so home to dinner, and there was W. Howe come to dine with me, and before dinner he and I walked in the garden, and we did discourse together, he assuring me of what he told me the other day of my lord speaking so highly in my commendation to my lord Peterborough and Povey, which speaks my lord having yet a good opinion of me, and also how well my lord and lady both are pleased with their children's being at my father's, and when the bigger ladies were there a little while ago, at which I am very glad. After dinner he went away, I having discoursed with him about his own proceedings in his studies, and I observed him to be very considerate and to mind his book in order to preferring himself by my lord's favour to something, and I hope to the outing of Creed in his secretaryship. For he tells me that he is confident my lord do not love him, nor will trust him in any secret matter. He is so cunning and crafty in all he do. So my wife and I out of doors, thinking to have gone to have seen a play. But when we came to take coach, they tell us there are none this week, being the first of Lent. But lord, to see how impatient I found myself within to see a play, I being at liberty once a month to see one, and I think it is the best method I could have taken. But to my office, did very much business with several people till night, and so home being unwilling to stay late because of my eye, which is not yet well of the room that has fallen down into it, but to supper and to bed. Fourth. Up, my eye being pretty well, and then my coach to my Lord Sandwich, with whom I spoke, walking a good while with him in his garden, which, and the house is very fine, talking of my Lord Peterborough's accounts, wherein he is concerned both for the foolery as also inconvenience which may happen upon my Lord Peterborough's ill-stating of his matters, so as to have his gain discovered unnecessarily. We did talk long and freely, that I hope the worst is past, and all will be well. There were several people by, trying a new fashion gun brought by my lord this morning, to shoot off often, one after another, without trouble or danger. Very pretty. Thence to the temple, and there taking White's boat down to Woolwich, taking Mr. Shish at Deptford in my way, with whom I had some good discourse of the navy business. At Woolwich discoursed with him and Mr. Pett about ironwork and other businesses, and then walked home, and at Greenwich did observe the foundation laying of a very great house for the king, which will cost a great deal of money. So home to dinner, and my uncle White coming in, he along with my wife and I by coach, and setting him down by the way, going to Mr. May's, we two to my Lord Sandwich's to visit my lady, with whom I left my wife discoursing, and I to Whitehall, and there being met by the Duke of York, he called me to him, and discoursed a pretty while with me about the new ship's dispatch, building at Woolwich. And talking of the charge, did say that he finds always the best the most cheap, instancing in French guns, which in France you may buy for four pistols, as good to look to as others of sixteen, but not the service. I never had so much discourse with the Duke before, until now did ever fear to meet him. He found me and Mr. Prynne together talking of the chess money, which we are to blame not to look after. 
thence to my lord's and took up my wife whom my lady hath received with her all good nature and kindness and so homewards and she home i lighting by the way and upon the change met my uncle white and told him my discourse this afternoon with sir g carteret in may's business but much to his discomfort and after a dish of coffee home and at my office a good while with sir w warren talking with great pleasure of many businesses and then home to supper my wife and i had a good fowl to supper and then i to the office again and so home my mind in great ease to think of our coming to so good a respect with my lord again and my lady and that my lady do so much cry out my father's usage of her children and the goodness of the air there found in the young ladies faces at their return then so she says as also my being put into the commission of the fishery for which I must give my lord thanks, and so home to bed, having a great cold in my head and throat to-night, from my late cutting my hair so close to my head. But I hope it will be soon gone again. Fifth, up into the office, where, though I had a great cold, I was forced to speak much upon a public meeting of the East India Company at our office, where our own company was full, and there was also my lord George Barclay, in behalf of the company of merchants, I suppose he is on that company, who, hearing my name, took notice of me, and condoled my cousin Edward Pepys's death, not knowing whose son I was, nor did demand it of me. We broke up without coming to any conclusion, for want of my Lord Marlborough. We broke up, and I to the change, where with several people and my uncle White to drink a dish of coffee, and so home to dinner, and then to the office all the afternoon, my eye and my throat being very bad, and my cold increasing, so as I could not speak almost at all at night. So at night, home to supper, that is a posset, and to bed. Sixth, Lord's Day up and my cold continuing in great extremity i could not go out to church but sat all day a little time at dinner excepted in my closet at the office till night drawing up a second letter to mr coventry about the measure of masts to my great satisfaction and so in the evening home and my uncle and aunt white came to us and supped with us were pretty merry but that my cold put me out of humour at night with my cold and my eye also sore still to bed seventh up betimes and the duke being gone abroad to-day as we heard by a messenger I spent the morning at my office, writing fair my yesterday's work till almost two o'clock. Only Sir G. Carteret coming, I went down a little way by water towards Deptford. But having more mind to have my business done, I pretended business at the change, and so went into another boat. And then, eating a bit, my wife and I by coach to the Duke's house, where we saw the unfortunate lovers. But I know not whether I am grown more curious than I was or no, but I was not much pleased with it, though I know not where to lay the fault, unless it was that the house was very empty, by reason of a new play at the other house. Yet here was my Lady Castlemaine in a box, and it was pleasant to hear an ordinary lady hard by us, that it seems did not know her before, say, being told who she was, that she was well enough. Thence home, and I ended and sent away my letter to Mr. Coventry, having first read it and had the opinion of Sir W. Warren in the case and so home to supper and to bed, my cold being pretty well gone, but my eye remaining still snare and roomy, which I wonder at, my right eye ailing nothing. Eighth, up with some little discontent with my wife upon her saying that she had gotten and used some puppy-dog water, being put upon it by a desire of my aunt White to get some for her, who hath a mind unknown to her husband to get some for her ugly face. I to the office, where we sat all the morning, doing not much business through the multitude of counsellors, one hindering another. It was Mr. Coventry's own saying to me in his coach, going to the change, but I wonder that he did give me no thanks for my letter last night, but I believe he did only forget it. Thence home, with their Llewellyn came and dined with me, but we made no long stay at dinner, for Heraclius being acted, which my wife and I have a mighty mind to see, we do resolve, though not exactly agreeing with the letter of my vow, yet altogether with the sentence, to see another this month, by going hither instead of that at court there having been none conveniently since i made my vow for us to see there nor like to be this lent and besides we did walk home on purpose to make this going as cheap as that would have been to have seen one at court and my conscience knows that it is only this saving of money and the time also that i intend by my oaths and this has cost no more of either so that my conscience before god do after good consultation and resolution of paying my forfeit did my conscience accuse me of breaking my vow I do not find myself in the least apprehensive that I have done any violence to my oaths. The play hath one very good passage well managed in it, about two persons pretending and yet denying themselves to be son to the tyrant Phocas, and yet heir of Mauritius to the crown. The garments like Romans very well. The little girl is come to act very prettily, and spoke the epilogue most admirably. But at the beginning, at the drawing up of the curtain, there was the finest scene of the emperor and his people about him, standing in their fixed and different postures in their Roman habits, above all that ever I yet saw at any of the theatres. Walked home, calling to see my brother Tom, who is in bed, and I doubt very ill of a consumption. 
to the office a while, and so home to supper, and to bed. Ninth, up pretty betimes to my office, where all day long, but a little at home at dinner, at my office finishing all things about Mr. Wood's contract for masts, wherein I am sure I shall save the king four hundred pounds before I have done. At night, home to supper, and to bed. Tenth, up and to the office, where all the morning doing business, and at noon to the change, and there very busy, and so home to dinner with my wife, to a good hog's harslet, a piece of meat I love, but have not eat of, I think, these seven years, and after dinner, abroad by coach, set her Mrs. Hunt's and I to Whitehall, and at the privy seal I inquired, and found the bill come for the corporation of the royal fishery, whereof the Duke of York is made present governor, and several other very great persons, to the number thirty-two, made his assistance for their lives, whereof by my Lord Sandwich's favour I am one, and take it not only as a matter of honour, but that that may come to be of profit to me, and so with great content went and called my wife, and so home and to the office, were busy late, and so home to supper and to bed. Eleventh. Up and by coach to my Lord Sandwich's, who not being up, I stayed talking with Mr. Moore till my Lord was ready and come down, and went directly out without calling for me or seeing anybody. I know not whether he knew I was there, but I am apt to think not, because if he would have given me that slighting, yet he would not have done it to others that were there. So I went back again doing nothing but discoursing with Mr. Moore, who I find by discourse to be grown rich, and indeed not to use me at all with the respect he used to do, but as his equal. He made me known to their chaplain, who is a worthy, able man. Thence home, and by and by to the coffee-house, and thence to the change, and so home to dinner, and after a little chat with my wife, to the office. We all the afternoon, till very late, at the office busy, and so home to supper and to bed, hoping in God that my diligence, as it is really very useful for the king, so it will end in profit to myself. In the meantime, I have good content in mind to see myself improve every day in knowledge and being known. Twelfth. Lay long, pleasantly entertaining myself with my wife, and then up into the office, where busy till noon, vexed to see how Sir J. Minister deserves rather to be pitied for his dotage and folly than employed at a great salary to ruin the king's business. At noon to the change, and thence home to dinner, and then down to Deptford, where busy a while, and then walking home it fell hard a raining. So at halfway house put in, and there meeting Mr. Stacy with some company of pretty women, I took him aside to a room by ourselves, and there talked with him about the several sorts of tars, and so by and by parted, and I walked home, and there late at the office, and so home to supper, and to bed. Thirteenth, Lord's Day, lay long in bed, talking with my wife, and then up in great doubt whether I should not go see Mr. Coventry or no, who hath not been well these two or three days, but it being foul weather I stayed within, and so to my office, and there all the morning reading some common law, to which I will allot a little time now and then, for I much want it. At noon, home to dinner, and then after some discourse with my wife, to the office again, and by and by Sir W. Penn came to me after sermon, and walked with me in the garden, and then one comes to tell me that Antony and Will Joyce were come to see me. So I in to them, and made mighty much of them, and very pleasant we were. And most of their business I find to be to advise about getting some woman to attend my brother Tom, whom they say is very ill, and seems much to want one. To which I agreed, and desired them to get their wives to inquire out one. By and by they bid me good night, but immediately as they were gone out of doors comes Mrs. Turner's boy with a note to me, to tell me that my brother Tom was so ill as they feared he would not long live, and that it would be fit I should come and see him. So I sent for them back, and they came, and Will Joyce desiring to speak with me alone, I took him up, and there he did plainly tell me to my great astonishment that my brother is deadly ill, and that their chief business of coming was to tell me so, and what is worse that his disease is the pox, which he hath here to forgot, and hath not been cured, but is come to this, and that this is certain, though a secret told his father Fenner by the doctor, which he helped my brother to. This troubled me mightily, but however I thought fit to go see him, for speech of people's sake, and so walked along with them, and in our way called on my uncle Fenner, where I have not been these twelve months and more, and advised with him, and then to my brother, who lies in bed talking idle. He could only say that he knew me, and then fell to other discourse, and his face like a dying man, which Mrs. Turner, who was here, and others, conclude he is. The company being gone, I took the maid, which seems a very grave and serious woman, and in W. Joyce's company did inquire how things are with her master. She told me many things very discreetly, and said she had all his papers and books and key of his cutting-house, and showed me a bag which I and William Joyce told, coming to five pounds fourteen shillings naught pence, which we left with her again, after giving her good counsel, and the boys, and seeing a nurse there of Mrs. Holden's choosing, I left them, and so walked home greatly troubled, to think of my brother's condition, and the trouble that would arise to me by his death or continuing sick. So at home, my mind troubled, to bed. 
Fourteenth. Up and walk to my brother's, where I find he hath continued talking idly all night, and now knows me not, which troubles me mightily. So I walked down and discoursed a great while alone with the maid, who tells me many passages of her master's practices, and how she concludes that he has run behind hand a great while and owes money, and has been done by several people, among others by one cave, both husband and wife, but whether it was for money or something worse she knows not. But there is one Cranburn, I think she called him, in Fleet Lane, with whom he hath many times been mighty private, but what their dealings have been she knows not, but believes these were naught, and then is sitting up two Saturday nights one after another, when all were abed doing something to himself, which she now suspects what it was, but did not before, but tells me that he hath been a very bad husband as to spending his time, and hath often told him of it, so that upon the whole I do find he is, whether he lives or dies, a ruined man, and what trouble will befall me by it I know not. Thence to Whitehall, and in the Duke's chamber, while he was dressing, two persons of quality that were there, did tell His Royal Highness how the other night in Hoban, about midnight, being at cards, a link boy come by and run into the house, and told the people the house was a-falling. Upon this the whole family was frighted, concluding that the boy had said that the house was a-fire. So they deft their cards above, and one would have got out of the balcony, but it was not open. The other went up to fetch down his children that were in bed, so all got clear out of the house, and no sooner so, but the house fell down indeed from top to bottom. It seems my lord Southampton's canai did come too near their foundation, and so weaken the house, and down it came, which in every respect is a most extraordinary passage. By and by into his closet, and did our business with him. But I did not speed as I expected in a business about the manner of buying hemp for this year, which troubled me. But it proceeds only from my pride, that I must needs expect everything to be ordered just as I apprehend, though it was not, I think, from my error, but their not being willing to hear and consider all that I had to propose. Being broke up, I followed my Lord Sandwich, and thanked him for his putting me into the fishery, which I perceive he expected, and cried, Oh, says he, in the fishery, you mean, I told you I would remember you in it, but offered no other discourse. But demanding whether he had any commands for me, methought he cried, No, as if he had no more mind to discourse with me, which still troubles me, and hath done all the day though I think I am a fool for it, in not pursuing my resolution of going handsome in clothes and looking high, for that must do it when all is done with my lord. Thence by coach with Sir W. Batten to the city, and his son Castle, who talks mighty highly against Captain Taylor, calling him knave, and I find that the old boating father is led, and talks just as the son do, or the son as the father would have him. Light turned to Mr. Moxon's, and there saw our office globes in doing, which will be very handsome, but cost money. So to the coffee-house, and there a very fine discourse with Mr. Hill the merchant, a pretty, gentle, young, and sober man. So to the change, and thence home, where my wife and I fell out about my not being willing to have her have her gown laced, but would lay out the same money or more on a plain new one. At this she flounced away in a manner I never saw her, nor which I could ever endure. So I away to the office, though she addressed herself to go see my lady sandwich. She, by and by, in a rage, follows me and coming to me tells me in spiteful manner like a vixen, and with a look full of rancour, that she would go buy a new one and lace it and make me pay for it, and then let me burn it if I would after she had done it, and so went away in a fury. This vexed me cruelly, but being very busy I had not hand to give myself up to consult what to do in it, but anon, I suppose after she saw that I did not follow her, she came again to the office where I made her stay, being busy with another, half an hour, and her stomach coming down, we were presently friends. And so after my business being over at the office, we out and by coach to my lady sandwiches, with whom I left my wife and I to Whitehall, where I met Mr. Delcity, and after an hour's discourse with him met with nobody to do other business with, but back again to my lady, and after half an hour's discourse with her to my brothers, who I find in the same or worse condition. The doctors give him over, and so do all that see him. He talks no sense two words together now, and I confess it made me weep to see that he should not be able when I asked him to say who I was. I went to Mrs. Turner's, and by her discourse with my brother's doctor, Mr. Powell, I find that she is full now of the disease which my brother is troubled with, and talks of it mightily, which I am sorry for, there being other company. But methinks it should be for her honour to forbear talking of it. The shame of this very thing, I confess, troubles me as much as anything. Back to my brother's, and took my wife, and carried her to my uncle Fenner's, and there had much private discourse with him. He tells me of the doctor's thoughts of my brother's little hopes of recovery and from that to tell me his thoughts long of my brother's bad husbandry, and from that to say that he believes he owes a great deal of money, as to my cousin Scott I know not how much, and Dr. Tom Pepys, thirty pounds, but that the doctor confesses that he's paid twenty pounds of it, and what with that and what he owes my father and me, I doubt he's in a very sad condition, 
that if he lives he will not be able to show his head, which will be a very great shame to me. After this I went into my aunt and my wife and Anthony Joyce and his wife, who were by chance there, and drank, and so home, my mind and head troubled. But I hope it will be over in a little time, one way or other. After doing a little at my office of business, I home to supper and to bed. From notice that my uncle Fenner did give my father the last week of my brother's condition, my mother is coming up to town, which also do trouble me. The business between my Lord's Chancellor and Bristol, they say, is hushed up, and the latter gone, or going, by the King's license, to France. 15th. Up and to the office, where we sat all the morning, and at noon comes Madame Turner and her daughter Thee, her chief errand to tell me that she had got Dr. Wyverley, her doctor, to search my brother's mouth, where Mr. Powell says there is an ulcer, from thence he concludes that he hath had the pox, but the doctor swears that there is not, nor ever was any, and my brother being very sensible, which I was glad to hear, he did talk with him about it, and he did wholly disclaim that ever he had the disease, or that ever he said to Powell that he had it, all which did put me into great comfort as to the reproach which was spread against him. So I sent for a barrel of oysters, and they dined, and we were very merry, I being willing to be so upon this news. After dinner we took coach and to my brother's, where, contrary to my expectation, he continues as bad or worse, talking idle, and now not at all knowing any of us as before. Here we stayed a great while, I going up and down the house looking after things. In the evening Dr. Wyverley came again, and I sent for Mr. Powell, the doctor and I having first by ourselves searched my brother again at his privacies, where he was as clear as ever he was born, and in the doctor's opinion had been ever so, and we three alone discoursed the business, where the coxcomb did give us his simple reasons for what he had said, which the doctor fully confuted, and left the fellow only saying that he should cease to report any such thing, and that what he had said was the best of his judgment from my brother's words, and a uh, ulcer, as he supposed, in his mouth. I threatened him that I would have satisfaction if I heard any more such discourse, and so good night to them too, giving the doctor a piece for his fee, but the other nothing. I to my brother again, where Madame Turner and her company, and Mrs. Croxton, my wife, and Mrs. Holding. About eight o'clock my brother began to fetch his spittle with more pain, and to speak as much but not so distinctly, till at last the phlegm getting the mastery of him, and he beginning as we thought to rattle, I had no mind to see him die, as we thought he presently would, and so withdrew and led Mrs. Turner home. But before I came back, which was in half a quarter of an hour, my brother was dead. I went up and found the nurse holding his eyes shut, and he poor wretch lying with his chops fallen, a most sad sight, and that which put me into a present very great transport of grief and cries, and indeed it was a most sad sight to see the poor wretch lie now still and dead, and pale like a stone. I stayed till he was almost cold, while Mrs. Croxton, Holden, and the rest did strip and lay him out, they observing his corpse, as they told me afterwards, to be as clear as any they ever saw, and so this was the end of my poor brother, continuing talking idle, and his lips working even to his last that his phlegm hindered his breathing, and at last his breath broke out, bringing a flood of phlegm and stuff out with it, and so he died. This evening he talked among other talk a great deal of French, very plain and good, as among others, quand un homme boit, quand il n'a point d'inclination à boire, il ne lui fait jamais de bien. I once begun to tell him something of his condition, and asked him whither he thought he should go. He, in distracted manner, answered me, why, whither should I go? There are but two ways. If I go to the bad way, I must give God thanks for it, and if I go the other way, I must give God the more thanks for it. And I hope I have not been so undutiful and unthankful in my life, but I hope I shall go that way. This was all the sense, good or bad, that I could get of him this day. I left my wife to see him laid out, and I by coach home, carrying my brother's papers, all I could find with me and having wrote a letter to my father telling him what hath been said, I returned by coach, it being very late and dark, to my brother's. But all being gone, the corpse laid out, and my wife at Mrs. Turner's, I thither, and there, after an hour's talk, we up to bed, my wife and I, in the little blue chamber. And I lay close to my wife, being full of disorder and grief for my brother, that I could not sleep nor wake with satisfaction. At last I slept till five or six o'clock. Sixteenth. And then I rose and up, leaving my wife in bed, and to my brother's, where I set them on cleaning the house. And my wife coming anon to look after things, I up and down to my cousin Stradwick's and Uncle Fenner's about discoursing for the funeral, which I am resolved to put off till Friday next. Then so home and trim myself, and then to the change, and told my Uncle White of my brother's death. And so by coach to my cousin Turner's, and there dined very well, but my wife in great pain, we were forced to rise in some disorder, and in Mrs. Turner's coach carried her home and put her to bed. 
Then back again with my cousin Norton to Mrs. Turner's, and there stayed a while talking with Dr. Pepys, the puppy, whom I had no patience to hear. So I left them, and to my brother's to look after things, and saw the coffin brought. And by and by Mrs. Holden came, and saw him nailed up. Then came W. Joyce to me, half drunk, and much ado I had to tell him the story of my brother's being found clear of what was said, but he would interrupt me by some idle discourse or other, of his crying what a good man, and a good speaker my brother was, and God knows what. At last, weary of him, I got him away, and I to Mrs. Turner's, and there, though my heart is still heavy to think of my poor brother, yet I could give way to my fancy to hear Mrs. Thee play upon the harpsichord, though the music did not please me neither. Thence to my brother's, and found them with my maid Elizabeth, taking an inventory of the goods of the house, which I was well pleased at, and am much beholden to Mr. Honeywood's man in doing of it. His name is Herbert, one that says he knew me when he lived with Sir Samuel Morland, but I have forgot him. So I left the matter, and by coach home and to my office, there to do a little business, but God knows my heart and head is so full of my brother's death and the consequences of it, that I can do very little or understand it. So home to supper, and after looking over some business in my chamber, I to bed to my wife, who continues in bed in some pain still. This day I have a great barrel of oysters given me by Mr. Barrow, as big as sixteen of others, and I took it in the coach with me to Mrs. Turner's and give them to her. This day the Parliament met again, after a long prorogation, but what they have done I have not been in the way to hear. 17th. Up into my brother's, where all the morning doing business against to-morrow, and so to my cousin Stradwick's about the same business, and to the change, and thence home to dinner, where my wife in bed sick still, but not so bad as yesterday. I dine by her, and so to the office, where we sat this afternoon, having changed this day our sittings from morning to afternoons, because of the Parliament which returned yesterday, but was adjourned till Monday next, upon pretence that many of the members were said to be upon the road, and also the king had other affairs, and so desired them to adjourn till then. But the truth is, the king is offended at my lord of Bristol, as they say, whom he hath found to have been all this while, pretending a desire of leave to go into France, and to have all the difference between him and the Chancellor made up, endeavouring to make factions in both houses to the Chancellor. So the king did this to keep the houses from meeting, and in the meanwhile sent a guard and a herald last night to have taken him at Wimbledon, where he was in the morning, but could not find him at which the king was and is still mightily concerned, and runs up and down to and from the chancellors like a boy, and it seems would make Digby's articles against the chancellor to be treasonable reflections against his majesty, so that the king is very high, as they say, and God knows what will follow upon it. After office I to my brother's again, and thence to Madame Turner's, in both places preparing things against to-morrow, and this night I have altered my resolution of burying him in the churchyard among my young brothers and sisters, and bury him in the church, in the middle aisle, as near as I can to my mother's pew. This cost me twenty shillings more. This being all, home by coach, bringing my brother's silver tankard for safety along with me, and so to supper, after writing to my father, and so to bed. 18th. Up betimes, and walked to my brother's, where a great while putting things in order against anon. Then to Madame Turner's, and eat a breakfast there, and so to Watton, my shoemaker, and there got a pair of shoes blacked on the soles against and on for me. So to my brother's, and to church, and with the grave-maker chose a place for my brother to lie in just under my mother's pew. But to see how a man's tombs are at the mercy of such a fellow, that for sixpence he would, as his own words were, I will jostle them together, but I will make room for him, speaking of the fullness of the middle aisle where he was to lie, and that he would, for my father's sake, do my brother that is dead all the civility he can, which was to disturb other corpse that are not quite rotten to make room for him. And methought his manner of speaking it was very remarkable, as of a thing that now was in his power to do a man a courtesy or not. At noon my wife, though in pain, comes, but I being forced to go home, she went back with me, where I dressed myself, and so did Bess. And so to my brother's again, whither, though invited, as the custom is, at one or two o'clock, they came not till four or five. But at last, one after another, they come, many more than I bid, and my reckoning that I bid was one hundred and twenty, but I believe there was nearer one hundred and fifty. Their service was six biscuits apiece, and what they pleased of burnt claret. My cousin Joyce Norton kept the wine and cakes above, and did give out to them that served, who had white gloves given them. But above all I am beholden to Mrs. Holden, who was most kind, and did take mighty pains not only in getting the house and everything else ready, but this day in going up and down to see the house filled and served, in order to mine and their great content, I think the men sitting by themselves in some rooms, and women by themselves in others, very close, but yet room enough. And on to church, walking out into the street to the conduit, and so across the street, and had a very good company along with the corpse. 
I had been come to the grave as above, Dr. Pearson, the minister of the parish, did read the service for burial, and so I saw my poor brother laid into the grave, and so all broke up, and I and my wife and Madam Turner and her family to my brother's, and by and by fell to a barrel of oysters, cake and cheese of Mr. Honeywood's with him, in his chamber and below, being too merry for so late a sad work. But, Lord, to see how the world makes nothing of the memory of a man, an hour after he is dead. And indeed I must blame myself, for though at the sight of him dead and dying I had real grief for a while, while he was in my sight, yet presently after and ever since I have had very little grief indeed for him. By and by, it beginning to be late, I put things in some order in the house, and so took my wife and Bess, who had done me very good service in cleaning and getting ready everything and serving the wine and things to-day, and is indeed a most excellent, good-natured and faithful wench, and I love her mightily, by coach home, and so, after being at the office to set down the day's work, home to supper and to bed. Nineteenth, up and to the office, where all the morning, and at noon my wife and I alone, having a good hen with eggs to dinner, with great content. Then by coach to my brother's, where I spent the afternoon in paying some of the charges of the burial, and in looking over his papers, among which I find several letters of my brother John's to him, speaking very foul words of me and my deportment to him here, and very crafty designs about Sturtlow land and God knows what, which I am very glad to know, and shall make him repent them. Anon my father and my brother John came to town by coach. I sat till night with him, giving him an account of things, he poor man, very sad and sickly, I in great pain by a simple compressing of my cods to-day, by putting one leg over another, as I have formerly done, which made me hasten home, and after a little at the office, in great disorder, home to bed. Twentieth. Lord's Day. Kept my bed all the morning, having laid a poultice to my cods last night, to take down the tumour there, which I got yesterday, which it did do, being applied pretty warm, and soon after the beginning of the swelling, and the pain was gone also. We lay talking all the while, among other things of religion, wherein I am sorry so often to hear my wife talk of her being and resolving to die a Catholic. And indeed a small matter, I believe, would absolutely turn her, which I am sorry for. Up at noon to dinner, and then to my chamber with a fire till late at night, looking over my brother Thomas's papers, sorting of them, among which I find many base letters of my brother John's to him against me, and carrying on plots against me to promote Tom's having of his Banbury mistress, in base slighting terms, and in worse of my sister Paul such as I shall take a convenient time to make my father know, and him also to his sorrow. So, after supper to bed, our people rising to wash to-morrow. 21st. Up, and it snowing this morning a little, which from the mildness of the winter, and the weather beginning to be hot, and the summer to come on apace, is a little strange to us. I did not go abroad for fear of my tumour, for fear it shall rise again, but stayed within, and by and by my father came, poor man, to me, and my brother John. After much talk and taking them up to my chamber, I did there, after some discourse, bring in my business of anger with John, and did before my father read all his roguish letters, which trouble my father mightily, especially to hear me say what I did, against my allowing anything for the time to come to him out of my own purse, and other words very severe, while he, like a simple rogue, made very silly and churlish answers to me, not like a man of any goodness or wit, at which I was as much disturbed as the other, and will be as good as my word in making him to his cost know that I will remember his carriage to me in this particular the longest day I live. It troubled me to see my poor father so troubled, whose good nature did make him poor wretch to yield, I believe, to comply with my brother Tom and him in part of their designs, but without any ill intent to me, or doubt of me or my good intentions to him or them, though it do trouble me a little that he should in any manner do it. They dined with me, and after dinner abroad with my wife to buy some things for her, and I to the office, where we sat till night, and then, after doing some business at my closet, I home, and to supper, and to bed. This day the Houses of Parliament met, and the King met them, with the Queen with him, and he made a speech to them, among other things discoursing largely of the plots abroad against him and the peace of the kingdom, and among other things that the dissatisfied party had great hopes upon the effect of the act for a triennial Parliament granted by his father, which he desired them to peruse, and I think repeal. So the houses did retire to their own house, and did order the act to be read to-morrow before them, and I suppose it will be repealed, though I believe much against the will of a good many that sit there. 22nd. Up and spent the whole morning and afternoon at my office. Only in the evening, my wife being at my Aunt White's, I went thither, calling at my own house. Going out found the parlour curtains drawn, and inquiring the reason of it, they told me that their mistress had got Mrs. Buggins' fine little dog and our little bitch, 
which is proud at this time, and I am apt to think that she was helping him to line her, for going afterwards to my uncle White's, and supping there with her, were very merry with Mr. Willie's drollery, and going home I found the little dog so little that of himself he could not reach our bitch, which I am sorry for, for it is the finest dog that ever I saw in my life, as if he were painted, the colours are so finely mixed and shaded. God forgive me, it went against me to have my wife and servants look upon them while they endeavoured to do something. 23rd. Up, and going out, saw Mrs. Buggin's dog, which proves, as I thought last night, so pretty, that I took him and the bitch into my closet below, and by holding down the bitch helped him to line her, which he did very stoutly, so as I hope it will take, for it is the prettiest dog that ever I saw. So to the office, we are very busy all the morning, and so to the change, and off hence with Sir W. Ryder to the Trinity House, and there dined very well, and good discourse among the old men, of islands now and then rising and falling again in the sea, and that there is many dangers of grounds and rocks that come just up to the edge almost of the sea, that is never discovered, and ships perish without the world's knowing the reason of it. Among other things they observed, that there are but two seamen in the Parliament House, viz. Sir W. Batten and Sir W. Penn, and not above twenty or thirty merchants, which is a strange thing in an island, and no wonder that things of trade go no better, nor are better understood. Thence home, and all the afternoon at the office. Only for an hour in the evening my Lady Jemima, Paulina, and Madame Pickering come to see us, but my wife would not be seen, being unready. Very merry with them, they mightily talking of their thrifty living for a fortnight before their mother came to town, and other such simple talk, and of their merry life at Brampton and my father's this winter. So they being gone to the office again till late, and so home and to supper and to bed. 24th. Called up by my father, poor man, coming to advise with me about Tom's house and other matters, and he being gone, I down by water to Greenwich, it being very foggy, and I walked very finely to Woolwich, and there did very much business at both yards, and thence walked back, Captain Grove with me talking, and so to Deptford, and did the like there, and then walked to Redriff, calling and eating a bit of collops and eggs at Halfway House, and so home to the office, where we sat late, and home, weary, to supper and to bed. 25th. Lady Day. Up and by water to Whitehall, and there to chapel, where it was most infinite full to hear Dr. Crichton. Being not known, some great persons in the pew I pretended to, and went in, did question my coming in. I told them my pretence, so they turned to the orders of the chapel, which hung behind upon the wall, and read it, and were satisfied, but they did not demand whether I was in waiting or no, and so I was in some fear lest he that was in waiting might come and betray me. The doctor preached upon the thirty-first of Jeremy, and the twenty-first and twenty-second verses, about a woman compassing a man, meaning the virgin conceiving and bearing our Saviour. It was the worst sermon I ever heard him make, I must confess. And yet it was good, and in two places very bitter, advising the king to do as the Emperor Severus did, to hang up a presbyter John, a short coat and a long gown interchangeably, in all the courts of England. But the story of Severus was pretty, that he hanged up forty senators before the Senate House, and then made a speech presently to the Senate in praise of his own lenity, and then decreed that never any senator after that time should suffer in the same manner without consent of the Senate, which he compared to the proceeding of the Long Parliament against my Lord Strafford. He said the greatest part of the lay magistrates in England were Puritans, and would not do justice, and the bishops, their powers were so taken away and lessened, that they could not exercise the power they ought. He told the king and the ladies plainly, speaking of death and of the skulls and bones of dead men and women, how there is no difference, that nobody could tell that of the great Marius or Alexander from a pioneer, nor for all the pains the ladies take with their faces, he that should look in a charnel's house could not distinguish which was Cleopatra's or Fair Rosamond's or Jane Shaw's. Thence by water home. After dinner to the office, thence with my wife to see my father and discourse how he finds Tom's matters, which he do very ill, and that he finds him to have been so negligent that he used to trust his servants with cutting out of clothes, never hardly cutting out anything himself, and by the abstract of his accounts we find him to owe above two hundred and ninety pounds, and to be coming to him under two hundred pounds. Thence home with my wife, it being very dirty on foot, and bought some fowl in gracious streets, and some oysters against our feast to-morrow. So home, and after at the office a while, home to supper, and to bed. 26th. Up very betimes and to my office, and there read over some papers against a meeting by and by at this office, of Mr. Povey, Sir W. Ryder, Creed, and Vernati, and Mr. Garden, about my Lord Peterborough's accounts for Tangier, wherein we proceeded a good way. But, Lord, to see how ridiculous Mr. Povey is in all he says or do, like a man not more fit for to be in such employments as he is, and particularly that of treasurer, 
paying many and very great sums without the least written order, as he is to be king of England, and seems but this day, after much discourse of mine, to be sensible of that part of his folly, besides a great deal more in other things. This morning in discourse Sir W. Ryder said that he hath kept a journals of his life for almost these forty years, even to this day, and still do, which pleases me mightily. That being done, Sir J. Minnes and I sat all the morning, and then I to the change, and there got away by pretence of business with my uncle White to put off Creed, whom I had invited to dinner, and so home, and there found Madame Turner, her daughter Thee, Joyce Norton, my father, Mr. Honeywood, and by and by come my uncle White and aunt. This being my solemn feast for my cutting of the stone, it being now, blessed be God, this day six years since the time, and I bless God I do in all respects find myself free from that disease or any signs of it, more than that upon the least cold I continue to have pain in making water, by gathering of wind and growing costive, till which be removed I am at no ease, but without that I am very well. One evil more I have, which is that upon the least squeeze almost, my cods begin to swell and come to great pain, which is very strange and troublesome to me, though upon the speedy applying of a poultice it goes down again, and in two days I am well again. Dinner not being presently ready, I spent some time myself and shewed them a map of Tangier left this morning at my house by Creed, cut by our order, the commissioners, and drawn by Jonas Moore, which is very pleasant, and I purpose to have it finally set out and hung up. Mrs. Hunt, coming to see my wife by chance, dined here with us. After dinner, Sir W. Batten sent to speak with me, and told me that he had proffered our bill to-day in the house, and that it was read without any dissenters, and he fears not but will pass very well, which I shall be glad of. He told me also how Sir Richard Temple hath spoke very discontentful words in the house about the triennial bill, but it hath been read the second time to-day and committed, and he believes will go on without more ado, though there are many in the house are displeased at it, though they dare not say much. But above all expectation, Mr. Prynne is the man against it, comparing it to the idol whose head was of gold and his body and legs and feet of different metal. So this bill had several degrees of calling of parliaments, in case the king, and then the council, and then the lord chancellor, and then the sheriffs, should fail to do it. He tells me also how, upon occasion of some prentices being put in the pillory to-day for beating of their masters, or some such like thing, in Cheapside, a company of prentices came and rescued them, and pulled down the pillory, and they being set up again, did the like again, so that the lord mayor and major general Brown was fain to come and stay there to keep the peace, and drums all up and down the city was beat to raise the train bands, for to quiet the town, and by and by, going out with my uncle and Aunt White by coach with my wife through Cheapside, the rest of the company, after much content and mirth, being broke up, we saw train bands stand in Cheapside upon their guard. We went much against my uncle's will, as far almost as Hyde Park, he and my aunt falling out all the way about it, which vexed me. But by this I understand my uncle more than ever I did, for he was mighty soon angry, and wished a pox take her, which I was sorry to hear. The weather, I confess, turning on a sudden to rain, did make it very unpleasant, but yet there was no occasion in the world for his being so angry. But she bore herself very discreetly, and I must confess she proves to me much another woman than I thought her. But all was peace again presently, and so it raining very fast, we met many brave coaches coming from the park, and so we turned and set them down at home, and so we home ourselves, and ended the day with great content to think how it hath pleased the Lord in six years' time, to raise me from a condition of constant and dangerous and most painful sickness and low condition and poverty, to a state of constant health almost, great honour and plenty, for which the Lord God of heaven make me truly thankful. My wife found her gown come home laced, which is indeed very handsome, but will cost me a great deal of money, more than ever I intended, but it is but for once. So to the office and did business, and then home and to bed. 27th, Lord's Day lay long in bed, wrangling with my wife about the charge she puts me to at this time for clothes, more than I intended, and very angry we were, but quickly friends again. And so rising and ready, I to my office, and there fell upon business, and then to dinner, and then to my office again, to my business, and by and by in the afternoon walked forth towards my father's, but it being church time, walked to St. James's, to try if I could see the bell butler, but could not, only saw her sister, who indeed is pretty, with a fine Roman nose. Thence walked through the ducking-pond fields, but they are so altered since my father used to carry us to Islington to the old man's at the king's head to eat cakes and ale, his name was Pitts, that I did not know which was the ducking-pond nor where I was. So through Fleet Lane to my father's, and there met Mr. Moore, and discoursed with him and my father about who should administer for my brother Tom, and I find we shall have trouble in it, but I will clear my hands of it, and what vex me, 
My father seemed troubled that I should seem to rely so wholly upon the advice of Mr. Moore, and take nobody else. But I satisfied him, and so home. And in Cheapside, both coming and going, it was full of apprentices, who have been here all this day, and have done violence, I think, to the master of the boys that were put in the pillory yesterday. But, Lord, to see how the train bands are raised upon this, the drums beating everywhere, as if an enemy were upon them, so much as this city subject to be put into disarray upon very small occasions. But it was pleasant to hear the boys, and particularly one little one, that I demanded the business. He told me that that had never been done in the city since it was a city, two prentices put in the pillory, and that it ought not to be so. So I walked home, and then it being fine moonshine, with my wife an hour in the garden, talking of her clothes against Easter, and about her maids, Jane being to be gone, and the great dispute whether Bess, whom we both love, should be raised to be chambermaid or no. We have both a mind to it, but know not whether we should venture the making her proud, and so make a bad chambermaid, of a very good-natured and sufficient cookmaid. So to my office a little, and then to supper, prayers, and to bed. 28th. This is the first morning that I have begun, and I hope shall continue to rise betimes in the morning, and so up into my office, and thence about seven o'clock to tea trice, and advised with him about our administering to my brother Tom, and I went to my father and told him what to do, which was to administer, and to let my cousin Scott have a letter of attorney, to follow the business here in his absence for him, who by that means will have the power of paying himself, which we cannot however hinder, and do us a kindness, we think, too. But, Lord, what a shame, methinks, to me, that in this condition, and at this age, I should know no better the laws of my own country. Thence to Westminster Hall, and spent till noon, it being Parliament time, and at noon walked with Creed into St. James's Park, talking of many things, particularly of the poor parts and great unfitness for business of Mr. Povey, and yet what a show he makes in the world. Mr. Coventry not being come to his chamber, I walked through the house with him for an hour in St. James's Fields, talking of the same subject, and then parted and back, and with great impatience, sometimes reading, sometimes walking, sometimes thinking that Mr. Coventry, though he invited us to dinner with him, was gone with the rest of the office without a dinner. At last, at past four o'clock, I heard that the Parliament was not up yet, and so walked to Westminster Hall, and there found it so, and meeting with Sir J. Minnes, and being very hungry, went over with him to the leg, and before we had cut a bit, the house rises. However, we eat a bit, and away to St. James's, and there eat a second part of our dinner with Mr. Coventry and his brother Harry, Sir W. Batten and Sir W. Penn. The great matter to-day in the house hath been that Mr. Vaughan, the great speaker, is this day come to town, and hath declared himself in a speech of an hour and a half with great reason and eloquence, against the repealing of the bill for triennial parliaments, but with no success. But the house have carried it that there shall be such parliaments, but without any coercive power upon the king, if he will bring this act. But, Lord, to see how the best things are not done without some design, for I perceive all these gentlemen that I was with to-day were against it, though there was reason enough on their side, yet purely I could perceive, because it was the king's mind to have it. And should he demand anything else, I believe they would give it him. But this the discontented presbyters and the faction of the house will be highly displeased with, but it was carried clearly against them in the house. We had excellent good table-talk, some of which I have entered in my book of stories, so with them by coach home, and there find, by my wife, that Father Fogarty hath been with her to-day, and she is mightily far going to hear a famous rule preach at the French ambassador's house. I pray God he do not tempt her in any matters of religion, which troubles me. And also she had messages from her mother to-day, who sent for her old morning gown, which was almost past wearing, and I used to call it her kingdom, from the ease and content she used to have in the wearing of it. I am glad I do not hear of her begging anything of more value, but I do not like that these messages should now come all upon Monday morning, when my wife expects of course I should be abroad at the Duke's. To the office, where Mr. Norman came, and showed me a design of his for the storekeeper's books, for the keeping of them regular in order to a balance, which I am mightily satisfied to see, and shall love the fellow the better, as he is in all things sober, so particularly for his endeavour to do something in this thing so much wanted. So late home to supper and to bed, weary with walking so long to no purpose in the park to-day. Twenty-ninth. Was called up this morning by a messenger from Sir G. Carteret to come to him to Sir W. Batten's, and so I rose and thither to him, and with him and Sir J. Minnes to Sir G. Carteret's to examine his accounts, and there we sat at it all the morning. About noon Sir W. Batten came from the House of Parliament, and told us our bill for our office was read the second time to-day with great applause, and is committed. By and by to dinner, where good cheer, and Sir G. Carteret in his humour, a very good man, 
and the most kind father and pleased father and his children that ever I saw. Here is now hung up a picture of my Lady Carteret, drawn by Lily, a very fine picture, but yet not so good as I have seen of his doing. After dinner to the business again without any intermission till almost night, and then home, and took coach to my father to see and discourse with him, and so home again and to my office, where late, and then home to bed. Thirtieth, up very betimes to my office, and thence at seven o'clock to Sir G. Carteret, and there with Sir J. Minnes made an end of his accounts, but stayed not dinner, my lady having made us drink our morning draught there of several wines, but I drank nothing but some of her coffee, which was poorly made, with a little sugar in it. Thence to the change a great while, and had good discourse with Captain Cock at the coffee-house about a Dutch war, and it seems the king's design is by getting underhand the merchants to bring in their complaints to the Parliament, to make them in honour begin a war, which he cannot in honour declare first, for fear they should not second him with money. Thence homewards, staying a pretty while with my little she-milliner at the end of Birchin Lane, talking and buying gloves of her, and then home to dinner, and in the afternoon had a meeting upon the chest business, but I fear unless I have time to look after it nothing will be done, and that I fear I shall not. In the evening comes Sir W. Batten, who tells us that the committee have approved of our bill with very few amendments in words, not in matter. So to my office, where late with Sir W. Warren, and so home to supper, and to bed. 31st. Up betimes, and to my office, where by and by comes Povey, Sir W. Ryder, Mr. Bland, Creed, and Vernatti, about my Lord Peterborough's accounts, which we now went through, but with great difficulty, and many high words between Mr. Povey and I. For I could not endure to see so many things extraordinary put in, against truth and reason. He was very angry, but I endeavoured all I could to profess my satisfaction in my lord's part of the accounts, but not in those foolish idle things, they say I said, that others had put in. Anon we rose and parted, both of us angry, but I contented, because I knew all of them must know I was in the right. Then with Creed to Deptford, where I did a great deal of business inquiring into the business of canvas and other things with great content, and so walked back again, good discourse between Creed and I by the way, but most upon the folly of Povey. And at home found Llewellyn, and so we to dinner, and then I to the office, where we sat all the afternoon late, and being up and my head mightily crowded with business, I took my wife by coach to see my father. I left her at his house, and went to him to an alehouse hard by, where my cousin Scott was, and my father's new tenant, Langford, a tailor, to whom I have promised my custom, and he seems a very modest, careful young man." Then my wife coming with the coach to the alley end, I home, and after supper to the making up my monthly accounts, and to my great content find myself worth above nine hundred pounds, the greatest sum I ever yet had. Having done my accounts, late to bed, my head of late mighty full of business, and with good content to myself in it, though sometimes it troubles me that nobody else but I should bend themselves to serve the king with that diligence, whereby much of my pains proves ineffectual. End of March April of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664 by Samuel Pepys. April, 1664. April 1st. Up into my office, where busy till noon, and then to the change where I found all the merchants concerned with the presenting their complaints to the Committee of Parliament appointed to receive them this afternoon against the Dutch. So home to dinner, and thence by coach, setting my wife down at the new exchange, I to Whitehall, and coming too soon for the Tangier Committee, walked to Mr. Blagray for a song. I left long ago there, and here I spoke with his kinswoman, he not being within, but did not hear her sing, being not enough acquainted with her, but would be glad to have her to come and be at my house a week now and then back to Whitehall, and in the gallery met the Duke of York. I also saw the Queen going to the park, and her maids of honour. She herself looks ill, and methinks Mrs. Stewart is grown fatter and not so fair as she was. And he called me to him, and discoursed a good while with me. And after he was gone, twice or thrice stayed, and called me again to him, the whole length of the house. And at last talked of the Dutch, and I perceived you much wish that the Parliament will find reason to fall out with them. He gone, I by and by found that the committee of Tangier met at the Duke of Albemarle's, and so I have lost my labour. So with Creed to the change, and there took up my wife, and left him, and we two home, and I to walk in the garden with W. Howe, whom we took up, he having been to see us. He tells me how Creed has been questioned before the council about a letter that has been met with, 
wherein he is mentioned by some fanatics as a serviceable friend to them, but he says he acquitted himself well in it. But, however, something sticks against him, he says, with my lord, at which I am not very sorry, for I believe he is a false fellow. I walked with him to Paul's, he telling me how my lord is little at home, minds his carding and little else, takes little notice of anybody, but that he do not think he is displeased, as I fear, with me, but is strange to all, which makes me the less troubled. So walk back home, and late at the office, so home and to bed. This day Mrs. Turner did lend me, as a rarity, a manuscript of one Mr. Wells, writ long ago, teaching the method of building a ship, which pleases me mightily. I was at it to-night, but durst not stay long at it, I being come to have a great pain and water in my eyes, after candlelight. Second. Up into my office, and afterwards sat, where great contests with Sir W. Batten and Mr. Wood, and that doting fool Sir J. Minnes, that says whatever Sir W. Batten says, though never minding whether to the King's profit or not. At noon to the coffee-house, where excellent discourse with Sir W. Petty, who proposed it as a thing that is truly questionable, whether there really be any difference between waking and dreaming, that it is hard not only to tell how we know when we do a thing really, or in a dream, but also to know what the difference is between one and the other. Thence to the change, but having at this discourse long afterwards with Sir Thomas Chamberlain, who tells me what I heard from others, that the complaints of most companies were yesterday presented to the Committee of Parliament against the Dutch, excepting that of the East India, which he tells me was because they would not be said to be the first and only cause of a war with Holland, and that it is very probable, as well as most necessary, that we fall out with that people. I went to the change, and there found most people gone, and so home to dinner, and thence to Sir W. Warren's, and with him passed the whole afternoon, first looking over two ships of Captain Taylor's and Finn Pett's now in building, and I am resolved to learn something of the art, for I find it is not hard and very useful, and thence to Woolwich, and after seeing Mr. Falconer, who is very ill, I to the yard, and there heard Mr. Pett tell me several things of Sir W. Batten's ill managements, and so with Sir W. Warren walked to Greenwich, having good discourse, and thence by water, it being now moonshine and nine or ten o'clock at night, and landed at Wapping, and by him and his man safely brought to my door, and so he home, having spent the day with him very well. So home and eat something, and then to my office a while, and so home to prayers, and to bed. Third, Lord's Day. Being weary last night, lay long, and called up by W. Joyce, so I rose, and his business was to ask advice of me, he being summoned to the House of Lords to-morrow, for endeavouring to arrest my Lady Peters for a debt. I did give him advice, and will assist him. He stayed all the morning, but would not dine with me, so to my office and did business. At noon home to dinner, and being set with my wife in the kitchen, my father comes, and sat down there, and dined with us. After dinner gives me an account of what he had done in his business of his house and goods, which is almost finished, and he the next week expects to be going down to Brampton again, which I am glad of, because I fear the children of my lord that are there for fear of any discontent. He being gone, I to my office, and there very busy, setting papers in order till late at night, only in the afternoon my wife sent for me home to see her new laced gown, that is her gown that is new laced, and indeed it becomes her very nobly and is well made. I am much pleased with it. At night to supper, prayers, and to bed. Fourth. Up and walked to my Lord Sandwiches, and there spoke with him about W. Joyce, who told me he would do what was fit in so tender a point. I can yet discern a coldness in him to admit me to any discourse with him. Thence to Westminster, to the painted chamber, and there met the two Joyces, Will in a very melancholy taking. After a little discourse, I to the Lord's house, before they sat, and stood within it a good while, while the Duke of York came to me and spoke to me a good while about the new ship at Woolwich. Afterwards I spoke with my Lord Barclay and my Lord Peterborough about it, and so stayed without a good while and saw my Lady Peters, an impudent jade, soliciting all the Lords on her behalf. And at last W. Joyce was called in, and by the consequences, and what my Lord Peterborough told me, I find that he did speak all he said to his disadvantage, and so was committed to the black rod, which is very hard, he doing what he did by the advice of my Lord Peter's own steward. But the sergeant of the black rod did direct one of his messengers to take him in custody, and so he was peaceably conducted to the swan with two necks in Tuttle Street, to a handsome dining-room, and there was most civilly used, my uncle Fenner and his brother Antony, and some other friends being with him. But who would have thought that the fellow that I should have sworn could have spoken before all the world, should in this be so daunted, as not to know what he said, and now to cry like a child? I protest, it is very strange to observe. I left them providing for his stay there to-night, and getting a petition against to-morrow, 
and so away to Westminster Hall, and meeting Mr. Coventry, he took me to his chamber, with Sir William Hickman, a member of their house, and a very civil gentleman. Here we dined very plentifully, and thence to Whitehall to the Duke's, where we all met, and after some discourse of the condition of the fleet in order to a Dutch war, for that I perceive the Duke hath a mind it should come to, we away to the office where we sat, and I took care to rise betimes, and so by water to Halfway House, talking all the way good discourse with Mr. Waith, and therefore my wife, who was gone with her maid best to have a walk. But, Lord, how my jealous mind did make me suspect that she might have some appointment to meet somebody. But I found the poor souls coming away then, so I took them back, and eat and drank, and then home, and after at the office a while I home to supper and to bed. It was a sad sight, methought, to-day, to see my Lord Peters coming out of the house, fall out with his lady from whom he is parted, about this business, saying that she disgraced him. But she hath been a handsome woman, and is, it seems, not only a lewd woman, but very high-spirited. Fifth. Up very betimes, and walked to my cousin Anthony Joyce's, and thence with him to his brother Will, in Tuttle Street, where I find him pretty cheery over what he was yesterday, like a coxcomb, his wife being come to him, and having had his boy with him last night. Here I stayed an hour or two, and wrote over a fresh petition, that which was drawn by their solicitor not pleasing me, and thence to the painted chamber, and by and by away by coach to my lord Peterborough's, and there delivered the petition into his hand, which he promised most readily to deliver to the house to-day. Thence back, and there spoke to several lords, and so did his solicitor, one that W. Joyce hath promised five pounds to, if he be released. Lord Peterborough presented a petition to the house from W. Joyce, and a great dispute we hear there was in the house for and against it. At last it was carried that he should be bail till the house meets again after Easter, he giving bond for his appearance. This was not so good as we hoped, but as good as we could well expect. And on comes the king, and passed the bill for repealing the triennial act, and another about writs of error. I crowded in, and heard the king's speech to them. But he speaks the worst that ever I heard man in my life, worse than if you read it all, and he had it in writing in his hand. Thence, after the house was up, and I inquired what the order of the house was, I to W. Joyce, with his brother, and told them all. Here was Kate come, and is a comely fat woman. I would not stay dinner, thinking to go home to dinner, and did go by water as far as the bridge, but thinking that they would take it kindly my being there, to be bailed for him if there was need, I returned. But finding them gone out to look after it, only Will and his wife and sister left, and some friends that came to visit him, I to Westminster Hall, and by and by, by agreement, to Mrs. Lane's lodging, whither I sent for a lobster, and with Mr. Swain and his wife eat it, and argued before them mightily for Hawley, but all would not do, although I made her angry by calling her old, and making her know what herself is. Her body was out of temper for any dalliance, and so after staying there three or four hours, but yet taking care to have my oath safe of not staying a quarter of an hour together with her, I went to W. Joyce, where I find the order come, and bail, his father and brother, given, and he paying his fees, which come to above two pounds, besides five pounds he is to give one man, and his charges of eating and drinking here, and ten shillings a day as many days as he stands under bail, which, I hope, will teach him hereafter to hold his tongue better than he used to do. Thence with Aunt Joyce's wife alone home, talking of Will's folly, and having sat her down, home myself, where I find my wife dressed as if she had been abroad, but I think she was not. But she answering me some way that I did not like, I pulled her by the nose, indeed to offend her, though afterwards to appease her I denied it, but only it was done in haste. The poor wretch took it mighty ill, and I believe besides wringing her nose she did feel pain, and so cried a great while. But by and by I made her friends, and so after supper to my office a while, and then home to bed. This day great numbers of merchants came to a grand committee of the house to bring in their claims against the Dutch. I pray God guide the issue to our good. Sixth. Up into my office. Whither by and by came John Noble, my father's old servant, to speak with me. I, smelling the business, took him home, and there, all alone, he told me how he had been serviceable to my brother Tom, in the business of his getting his servant, an ugly jade, Margaret, with child. She was brought to bed in St. Sepulchre's parish of two children. One is dead, the other is alive, her name Elizabeth, and goes by the name of Taylor, daughter to John Taylor. It seems Tom did a great while trust one Crawley with the business, who daily got money of him, and at last finding himself abused, he broke the matter to J. Noble upon a vow of secrecy. Tom's first plot was to go on the other side the water, and give a beggar woman something to take the child. They did once go, but did nothing, J. Noble saying that seven years hence the mother might come to demand the child and force him to produce it, or to be suspected of murder. 
Then I think it was that they consulted and got one cave, a poor pensioner in St. Bride's parish, to take it, giving him five pounds, he thereby promising to keep it forever without more charge to them. The parish hereupon indict the man cave for bringing this child upon the parish, and by Sir Richard Brown he is sent to the counter. Cave thence writes to Tom to get him out. Tom answers him in a letter of his own hand, which J. Noble shewed me, but not signed by him, wherein he speaks of freeing him and getting security for him, but nothing as to the business of the child or anything like it, so that for as much as I could guess, there is nothing therein to my brother's prejudice as to the main point, and therefore I did not labour to tear or take away the paper. Cave being released demands five pounds more to secure my brother for ever against the child, and he was forced to give it him and took bond of Cave in one hundred pounds, made at a scrivener's, one Hudson, I think, in the old bailey, to secure John Taylor and his assigns, etc., in consideration of ten pounds paid him, from all trouble, or charge of meat, drink, clothes, and breeding of Elizabeth Taylor. And it seems in the doing of it, J. Noble was looked upon as the assignee of this John Taylor. Noble says that he furnished Tom with his money, and is also bound by another bond, to pay him twenty shillings more this next Easter Monday. But nothing for either sum appears under Tom's hand. I told him how I am like to lose a great sum by his death, and would not pay any more myself, but I would speak to my father about it against the afternoon. So away he went, and I all the morning in my office busy, and at noon home to dinner mightily oppressed with wind, and after dinner took coach and to Paternoster Row, and there bought a pretty silk for a petticoat for my wife, and then set her down at the new exchange, and I leaving the coat at Unthanks, went to Whitehall. But the council meeting at Worcester House I went thither, and there delivered to the Duke of Albemarle a paper touching some Tangier business, and thence to the change for my wife and walked to my father's, who was packing up some things for the country. I took him up and told him this business of Tom, at which the poor wretch was much troubled, and desired me that I would speak with J. Noble, and do what I could, and thought fit in it, without concerning him in it. So I went to Noble, and saw the bond that Cave did give, and also Tom's letter that I mentioned above, and upon the whole I think some shame may come, but that it will be hard from anything I see there to prove the child to be his. Thence to my father, and told what I had done, and how I had quieted Noble by telling him that, though we are resolved to part with no more money out of our own purses, yet if he can make it appear a true debt that it may be justifiable for us to pay it, we will do our part to get it paid, and said that I would have it paid before my own debt. So my father and I both a little satisfied, though vexed to think what a rogue my brother was in all respects. I took my wife by coach home and to my office, where late with Sir W. Warren, and so home to supper and to bed. I heard to-day that the Dutch have begun with us by granting letters of mark against us, but I believe it not. 7th. Up into my office, we're busy, and by and by comes Sir W. Warren and old Mr. Bond, in order to the resolving me some questions about masks and their proportions, but he could say little to me to my satisfaction, and so I held him not long, but parted. So to my office, busy till noon, and then to the change, where high talk of the Dutch's protest against our royal company in Guinea, and their granting letters of mark against us there, and everybody expects a war, but I hope it will not yet be so, nor that this is true. Thence to dinner, where my wife got me a pleasant French fricassee of veal for dinner, and thence to the office, where vexed to see how Sir W. Batten ordered things this afternoon, vide my office book, for about this time I have begun, my notions and informations increasing now greatly every day, to enter all occurrences extraordinary in my office in a book by themselves, and so in the evening, after long discourse, and ease my mind by discourse with Sir W. Warren, I to my business late, and so home to supper, and to bed. 8th. Up betimes and to the office, and anon it begun to be fair, after a great shower this morning, Sir W. Batten and I by water, calling his son Castle by the way, between whom and I, no notice at all of his letter the other day to me, to Deptford, and after a turn in the yard I went with him to the almshouse, to see the new building, which he, with some ambition, is building of there, during his being master of Trinity House, and a good work it is, but to see how simply he answered somebody concerning setting up the arms of the corporation upon the door, that and anything else he did not deny it, but said he would leave that to the master that comes after him. There I left him, and to the king's yard again, and there made good inquiry into the business of the poop lanterns, wherein I found occasion to correct myself mightily for what I have done in the contract with the platerer, and am resolved, though I know not how, to make them to alter it, though they signed it last night. And so I took Staines home with me by boat, and discoursed it, 
and he will come to reason when I can make him to understand it. No sooner landed, but it fell a mighty storm of rain and hail, so I put into a cane shop and bought one to walk with, cost me four shilling sixpence, all of one joint. So home to dinner, and had an excellent good Friday dinner of peas porridge and apple pie. So to the office all the afternoon, preparing a new book for my contracts, and this afternoon come home, the office globes done to my great content. In the evening, a little to visit Sir W. Penn, who hath a feeling this day or two of his old pain. Then to walk in the garden with my wife, and so to my office a while, and then home to the only Lenten supper I have had of wigs and ale, and so to bed. This morning betimes came to my office to me, Boson Smith of Woolwich, telling me a notable piece of knavery of the officers of the yard and Mr. Gold, in behalf of a contract made for some old ropes by Mr. Wood, and I believe I shall find Sir W. Batten of the plot. Vide my office day-book. Ninth. The last night, whether it was from cold I got to-day upon the water I know not, or whether it was from my mind being over-concerned with Staines's business of the platery of the navy, for my mind was mighty troubled with the business all night long, I did wake about one o'clock in the morning, a thing I most rarely do, and pissed a little with great pain, continued sleepy, but in a high fever all night, fiery hot, and in some pain. Towards morning I slept a little, and waking found myself better, but with some pain and rose, I confess, with my clothes sweating, and it was somewhat cold, too, which I believe might do me more hurt, for I continued cold and apt to shake all the morning, but that some trouble with Sir J. Minnes and Sir W. Batten kept me warm. At noon home to dinner upon tripes, and so, though not well, abroad with my wife by coach to her tailor's and the new exchange, and thence to my father's and spoke one word with him, and thence home, where I found myself sick in my stomach and vomited, which I do not use to do. Then I drank a glass or two of Hippocras, and to the office to dispatch some business necessary, and so home and to bed, and by the help of Mithridate slept very well. 10th. Lord's Day. Lay long in bed, and then up, and my wife dressed herself, it being Easter Day, but I not being so well as to go out, she, though much against her will, stayed at home with me, for she had put on her new best gowns, which indeed is very fine now with the lace, and this morning her tailor brought home her other new lace silk gowns, with a smaller lace and new petticoats I bought the other day, both very pretty. We spent the day in pleasant talks and company one with another, reading in Dr. Fuller's book what he says of the family of the Cliffords and Kingsmills, and at night being myself better than I was by taking a glister, which did carry away a great deal of wind, I after supper at night went to bed and slept well. Eleventh lay long talking with my wife then up into my chamber preparing papers against my father comes to lie here for discourse about country business dined well with my wife at home being myself not yet thorough well making water with some pain but better than i was and all my fear of an ague gone away in the afternoon my father came to see us and he gone i up to my morning's work again and so in the evening a little to the office and to see sir w batten who is ill again and so home to supper and to bed Twelfth, up, and after my wife had dressed herself very fine in her new laced gown, and very handsome indeed, W. Howe also coming to see us, I carried her by coach to my uncle White's and set her down there, and W. Howe and I to the coffee-house, where we sat talking about getting of him some place under my lord of advantage, if he should go to sea, and I would be glad to get him secretary, and to out creed if I can, for he is a crafty and false rogue. Thence a little to the change, and thence took him to my uncle White's, where dined my father, poor melancholy man, that used to be as full of life as anybody, and also my aunt's brother, Mr. Sutton, a merchant in Flanders, a very sober fine man, and Mr. Cole and his lady. But, Lord, how I used to adore that man's talk, and now methinks he is but an ordinary man, his son a pretty boy indeed, but his nose unhappily awry. Other good company, and an indifferent, and um, but indifferent dinner for so much company, and after dinner got a coach, very dear, it being Easter time and very foul weather, to my lord's, and there visited my lady, and leaving my wife there, I and W. Howe, to Mr. Paget's, and there heard some music, not very good, but only one Dr. Walgrave, an Englishman bred at Rome, who plays the best upon the lute that I ever heard man. Here I also met Mr. Hill, the little merchant, and after all was done, we sung. I did well enough a psalm or two of laws. He, I perceive, has good skill, and sings well, and a friend of his sings a good bass. Then Slate walked with them too as far as my lord's, thinking to take up my wife and carry them home. But there being no coach to be got, away they went, and I stayed a great while, it being very late, about ten o'clock, before a coach could be got. 
I found my lord and ladies and my wife at supper. My lord seems very kind, but I am apt to think still the worst, and that it is only in show, my wife and lady being there. So home, and find my father come to lie at our house, and so supped, and saw him, poor man, to bed, my heart never being fuller of love to him, nor admiration of his prudence and pains heretofore in the world than now, to see how Tom hath carried himself in his trade, and how the poor man hath his thoughts going to provide for his younger children and my mother. But I hope they shall never want. So myself and wife, to bed. Thirteenth. Though late, past twelve, before we went to bed. Yet I heard my poor father up, and so I rang up my people, and I rose and got something to eat and drink for him, and so abroad, it being a mighty foul day, by coach, setting my father down in Fleet Street, and I to St. James's, where I found Mr. Coventry, the Duke being now come thither for the summer, with a goldsmith, sorting out his old plate to change for new. But, Lord, what a deal he hath! I stayed and had two or three hours' discourse with him, talking about the disorders of our office, and I largely to tell him how things are carried by Sir W. Batten and Sir J. Minnes to my great grief. He seems much concerned also, and for all the King's matters that are done after the same rate everywhere else, and even the Duke's household matters too, generally with corruption, but most indeed with neglect and indifferency. I spoke very loud and clear to him my thoughts of Sir J. Minnes and the other, and trust him with the using of them. Then to talk of our business with the Dutch, he tells me fully that he believes it will not come to a war, for first he showed me a letter from Sir George Downing, his own hand, where he assures him that the Dutch themselves do not desire, but above all things fear it, and that they neither have given letters of mark against our ships in Guinea, nor did Reuter stay at home with his fleet with an eye to any such thing, but for want of a wind, and is now come out and is going to the straits. He tells me also that the most he expects is that, upon the merchant's complaints, the Parliament will represent them to the King desiring his securing of his subjects against them, and though perhaps they may not directly see fit, yet even this will be enough to let the Dutch know that the Parliament do not oppose the King, and by that means take away their hopes, which was that the King of England could not get money or do anything towards a war with them, and so thought themselves free from making any restitution, which by this they will be deceived in. He tells me also that the Dutch states are in no good condition themselves, differing one with another, and that for certain none but the states of Holland and Zealand will contribute towards a war, the others reckoning themselves being inland, not concerned in the profits of war or peace. But it is pretty to see what he says, that those here that are forward for a war at court, they are reported in the world to be only designers of getting money into the king's hands. They that elsewhere are for it have a design to trouble the kingdom, and to give the fanatics an opportunity of doing hurt, and lastly those that are against it, as he himself for one is very cold therein, are said to be bribed by the Dutch. After all this discourse he carried me in his coach, it raining still, to Charing Cross, and there put me into another, and I calling my father and brother carried them to my house to dinner, my wife keeping bed all day. All the afternoon at the office with W. Bottom looking over his particulars about the chest of Chatham, which shows enough what a knave Commissioner Pett hath been all along, and how Sir W. Batten hath gone on in getting good allowance to himself and others out of the poor's money. Time will show all. So in the evening to see Sir W. Penn, and then home to my father to keep him company, he being to go out of town, and up late with him and my brother John till past twelve at night, to make up papers of Tom's accounts fit to leave with my cousin Scott. At last we did make an end of them, and so after supper, all to bed. Fourteenth. Up betimes, and after my father's eating something, I walked out with him as far as Milk Street, he turning down to Cripplegate to take coach, and at the end of the street I took leave, being much afeard I shall not see him here any more, he do decay so much every day. And so I walked on, there being never a coach to be had till I came to Charing Cross, and there Colonel Froud took me up and carried me to St. James's, where with Mr. Coventry and Povey, etc., about my Lord Peterborough's accounts, but Lord! to see still what a puppy that Povey is with all his show, is very strange. Thence to Whitehall, and W. C. and I, and Sir W. Ryder, resolved upon a day to meet and make an end of all the business. Thence walked with Creed to the coffee-house in Covent Garden, where no company, but he told me many fine experiments at Gresham College, and some demonstration that the heat and cold of the weather do rarefy and condense the very body of glass, as in a bolt-head, with cold water in it put into hot water, shall first by rarefying the glass make the water sink, and then, when the heat comes to the water, makes that rise again, and then put into cold water, makes the water by condensing the glass to rise, and then when the coal comes to the water, makes it sink, which is very pretty and true, he saw it tried. Thence by coach home, and dined above with my wife by her bedside, she keeping her bed. So to the office, where a great conflict with Wood and Castle about their New England masts, 
so in the evening my mind a little vexed but yet without reason for i shall prevail i hope for the king's profit and so home to supper and to bed fifteenth up and all the morning with captain taylor at my house talking about things of the navy and among other things i showed him my letters to mr coventry wherein he acknowledges that nobody to this day did ever understand so much as i have done and i believe him for i perceive he did very much listen to every article as things new to him and is contented to abide by my opinion therein in his great contest with us about his and mr wood's masts at noon to the change where i met with mr hill the little merchant with whom i perceive i shall contract a musical acquaintance but i will make it as little troublesome as i can home and dined and then with my wife by coach to the duke's house and there saw the german princess acted by the woman herself but never was anything so well done in earnest worse performed in jest upon the stage and indeed the whole play abating the drollery of him that acts her husband is very simple unless here and there a witty sprinkle or two we met and sat by dr clark thence homewards calling at madame turner's and then set my wife down at my aunt white's and i to my office till late and then at two at night fetched her home and so again to my office a little and then to supper and to bed sixteenth up into the office where all the morning upon the dispute of mr wood's masts and at noon with mr coventry to the african house and after a good and pleasant dinner up with him sir w rider the simple povey of all the most ridiculous fool that ever i knew to attend to business and creed and vernati about my lord peterborough's accounts but the more we look into them the more we see of them that makes dispute which made us break off and so i home and there found my wife and bess gone over the water to halfway house and after them thinking to have gone to woolwich but it was too late so eat a cake and home and thence by coach to have spoke with tom trice about a letter i met with this afternoon from my cousin scott wherein he seems to deny proceeding as my father's attorney in administering for him in my brother tom's estate but i find him gone out of town and so returned vexed home and to the office where late writing a letter to him and so home and to bed seventeen lord's day up oh, and i put on my best cloth black suit and my velvet cloak and with my wife in her best lace suit to church where we have not been these nine or ten weeks the truth is my jealousy hath hindered it for fear she should see pembleton he was here to-day but i think sat so as he could not see her which did please me god help me mightily though i know well enough that in reason this is nothing but my ridiculous folly home to dinner and in the afternoon after long consulting whether to go to woolwich or no to see mr falkner but indeed to prevent my wife going to church i did however go to church with her where a young simple fellow did preach i slept soundly all the sermon and thence to sir w penn's my wife and i there she talking with him and his daughter and thence with my wife walked to my uncle white's and there supped where very merry but i vexed to see what charges the vanity of my aunt puts her husband to among her friends and nothing at all among ours home and to bed our parson mr mills his own mistake in reading of the service was very remarkable that instead of saying we beseech thee to preserve to our use the kindly fruits of the earth he cries preserve to our use our gracious queen catherine eighteenth up and by coach to westminster and there solicited w joyce's business again and did speak to the duke of york about it who did understand it very well i afterwards did without the house fall in company with my lady peters and endeavoured to mollify her but she told me she would not to redeem her from hell do anything to release him but would be revenged while she lived if she lived the age of methuselah i made many friends and so did others at last it was ordered by the lords that it should be referred to the committee of privileges to consider so i after discoursing with the joyces away by coach to the change and there among other things to hear that a jew hath put in a policy of four per cent to any man to insure him against the dutch war for four months i could find in my heart to take him at this offer but however will advise first and to that end took coach to st james's but mr coventry was gone forth and i thence to westminster hall where mrs lane was gone forth and so i missed of my intent to be with her this afternoon and therefore meeting mr blagrave went home with him and there he and his kinswoman sang but i was not pleased with it they singing me thought very ill or else i am grown worse to please than heretofore thence to the hall again and after meeting with several persons and talking there i to mrs hunt's where i knew my wife and my aunt white were about business and they being gone to walk in the park i went after them with mrs hunt who stayed at home for me and finding them did by coach which i had agreed to wait for me go with them all and mrs hunt and a kinswoman of theirs mrs steward to hyde park where i have not been since last year where i saw the king with his periwig but not altered at all 
and my lady castlemaine in a coach by herself in yellow satin and a pinner on and many brave persons and myself being in a hackney and full of people was ashamed to be seen by the world many of them knowing me thence in the evening home setting my aunt at home and thence we sent for a joint of meat to supper and thence to the office at eleven o'clock at night and so home to bed nineteenth up and to st james's where along with mr coventry povey etc in their tangier accounts but such the folly of that coxcomb povey that we could do little in it and so parted for the time and i to walk with creed and vernati in the physic garden in st james's park where i first saw orange trees and other fine trees so to westminster hall and thence by water to the temple and so walked to the change and there find the change full of news from guinea some say the dutch have sunk our ships and taken our fort and others say we have done the same to them but i find by our merchants that something is done but is yet a secret among them so home to dinner and then to the office and at night with captain taylor consulting how to get a little money by letting him the elias to fetch masts from new england so home to supper and to bed twentieth up and by coach to westminster and there solicited w joyce's business all the morning and meeting in the hall with mr coventry he told me how the committee for trade have received now all the complaints of the merchants against the dutch and were resolved to report very highly the wrongs they have done us when god knows it is only our own negligence and laziness that hath done us the wrong and this to be made to the house to-morrow i went also out of the hall with mrs lane to the swan at mrs herbert's in the palace yard to try a couple of bands and did though i had a mind to be playing the fool with her purposely stay but a little while and kept the door open and called the master and mistress of the house one after another to drink and talk with me and showed them both my old and new bands so that as i did nothing so they are able to bear witness that i had no opportunity there to do anything thence by coach with sir w pen home calling at the temple for law psalms which i did not so much by being against my oath buy as only lay down money till others be bound better for me and by that time i hope to get money of the treasure of the navy by bills which according to my oath shall make me able to do it at home dined and all the afternoon at a committee of the chest and at night comes my aunt and uncle white and nan ferrers and sup merrily with me my uncle coming in an hour after them almost foxed great pleasure by discourse with them and so they gone late to bed twenty first up pretty betimes and to my office and thither came by and by mr vernati and stayed two hours with me but mr gordon did not come and so he went away to meet again and on then comes mr creed and after some discourse he and i and my wife by coach to westminster leaving her at unthanks her tailor's hall and there at the lord's house heard that it is ordered that upon submission upon the knee both to the house and my lady peters w joyce shall be released i forthwith made him submit and asked pardon upon his knees which he did before several lords but my lady would not hear it but swore she would post the lords that the world might know what pitiful lords the king hath and that revenge was sweeter to her than milk and that she would never be satisfied unless he stood in a pillory and demand pardon there but i perceive the lords are ashamed of her and so i away calling with my wife at a place or two to inquire after a couple of maids recommended to us but we found both of them bad so set my wife and my uncle white's and i home and presently to the change where i did some business and thence to my uncle's and there dined very well and so to the office we sat all the afternoon but no sooner sat but news comes my lady sandwich was come to see us so i went out and running up her friend however before me i perceived by my dear lady blushing that in my dining-room she was doing something upon the pot which i also was ashamed of and so fell to some discourse but without pleasure through very pity to my lady she tells me and i find true since that the house this day have voted that the king be desired to demand right for the wrong done us by the dutch and that they will stand by him with their lives fortunes which is a very high vote and more than i expected what the issue will be god knows my lady my wife not being at home did not stay but poor good woman went away i be mightily taken with her dear visit and so to the office where all the afternoon till late and so to my office and then to supper and to bed thinking to rise betimes to-morrow twenty-second having directed it last night i was called up this morning before four o'clock it was full light enough to dress myself and so by water against tide it being a little cool to greenwich and thence only that it was somewhat foggy till the sun got to some height walked with great pleasure to woolwich in my way staying several times to listen to the nightingales i did much business both at the rope-yard and the other and on float i discovered a plain cheat which in time i shall publish of mr ackworth's thence having visited mr falconer also who lies still sick but hopes to be better i walked to greenwich mr dean with me 
much good discourse, and I think him a very just man, only a little conceited, but yet very able in his way. And so he by water also with me, also to town. I home, and immediately dressing myself, by coach with my wife, to my Lord Sandwich's. But they having dined, we would not light, but went to Mrs. Turner's, and there got something to eat, and thence after reading part of a good play, Mrs. Thee, my wife, and I, in their coach to Hyde Park, where great plenty of gallants, and pleasant it was, only for the dust. Here I saw Mrs. Bendy, my Lady Spillman's fair daughter, that was, who continues yet very handsome. Many others I saw with great content, and so back again to Mrs. Turner's, and then took a coach and home. I did also carry them into St. James's Park, and shewed them the garden. To my office a while, while supper was making ready, and so home to supper, and to bed. 23rd. Coronation Day. Up, and after doing something at my office, and it being a holiday, no sitting likely to be, I down by water to Sir W. Warren's, who hath been ill. And there talked long with him, good discourse, especially about Sir W. Batten's knavery, and his son Castle's ill language of me behind my back, saying that I favour my fellow traitors, but I shall be even with him. So home into the change, where I met with Mr. Coventry, who himself is now full of talk of a Dutch war, for it seems the lords have concurred in the commons vote about it, and so the next week it will be presented to the king, insomuch that he do desire we would look about to see what stores we lack, and buy what we can. Home to dinner, where I and my wife much troubled about my money that is in my lord Sandwich's hand, for fear of his going to sea and be killed, but I will get what of it out I can. All the afternoon not being well at my office, and there doing much business, my thoughts still running upon a war and my money. At night, home to supper, and to bed. 24th, Lord's Day. Up, and all the morning in my chamber, setting some of my private papers in order, for I perceive that now public business takes up so much of my time, that I must get time a Sundays, or a nights, to look after my own matters. Dined, and spent all the afternoon talking with my wife, at night a little to the office, and so home to supper, and to bed. 25th. Up and with Sir W. Penn by coach to St. James's, and there up to the Duke, and after he was ready to his closet, where most of our talk about a Dutch war, and discoursing of things indeed now for it. The Duke, which gives me great good hopes, do talk of setting up a good discipline in the fleet. In the Duke's chamber there is a bird, given him by Mr. Pierce, the surgeon, comes from the East Indies, black the greatest part, with the finest collar of white about the neck, but talks many things, and neighs like the horse, and other things, the best almost that ever I heard bird in my life. Thence down with Mr. Coventry and Sir W. Ryder, who was there, going along with us from the East India House to-day, to discourse of my Lord Peterborough's accounts, and then walked over the park, and in Mr. Cutler's coach with him and Ryder as far as the Strand, and thence I walked to my Lord Sandwich's, where by agreement I met my wife, and there dined with the young ladies, my lady being not well, kept her chamber. Much simple discourse at table among the young ladies. After dinner walked in the garden, talking with Mr. Moore about my lord's business. He told me my lord runs in debt every day more and more, and takes little care how to come out of it. He counted to me how my lord pays use now for above nine thousand pounds, which is a sad thing, especially considering the probability of his going to sea in great danger of his life, and his children, many of them, to provide for. Thence the young ladies going out to visit, I took my wife by coach out through the city, discoursing how to spend the afternoon, and conquered with much ado, a desire of going to a play, but took her out at Whitechapel, and to Bethnal Green, so to Hackney, where I have not been many a year, since a little child I boarded there, thence to Kingsland, by my nurse's house, Goody Lawrence, where my brother Tom and I was kept when young, then to Newington Green, and saw the outside of Mrs. Herbert's house, where she lived, and my aunt Ellen with her, but, Lord, how in every point I find myself to overvalue things when a child, Thence to Islington, and so to St. John's, to the Red Bull, and there saw the latter part of a rude prize fought, but with good pleasure enough, and thence back to Islington, and at the King's Head, where Pitts lived, we light and eat and drunk for remembrance of the old house sake, and so through Kingsland again, and so to Bishopsgate, and so home with great pleasure. The country mighty pleasant, and we with great content home, and after supper to bed, only a little troubled at the young ladies leaving my wife so to-day and from some passages, fearing my lady might be offended. But I hope the best. 26th. Up into my Lord Sandwich's, and coming a little too early, I went and saw W. Joyce, and by and by comes in Antony, they both owning a great deal of kindness received from me in their late business, and indeed I did what I could, and yet less I could not do. It has cost the poor man above forty pounds, besides he is likely to lose his debt. Thence to my Lord's, and by and by he comes down, 
and with him, queed with us, I rode in his coach to St. James's, talking about W. Joyce's business, mighty merry, and my lady Peters, he says, is a drunken jade, he himself having seen her drunk in the lobby of their house. I went up with him to the Duke, where methought the Duke did not shew him any so great fondness as he was wont, and methought my lord was not pleased that I should see the Duke made no more of him, not that I know anything of any unkindness, but I think verily he is not as he was with him in his esteem. By and by the Duke went out, and we with him through the park, and there I left him going into Whitehall, and Creed and I walked round the park, a pleasant walk, observing the birds, which is very pleasant, and so walked to the new exchange, and there had a most delicate dish of curds and cream, and discourse with the good woman of the house, a discreet, well-bred woman, and a place with great delight I shall make it now and then to go thither. Thence up, and after a turn or two in the change, home to the old exchange by coach, where great news and true I saw by written letters, of strange fires seen at Amsterdam in the air, and not only there, but in other places thereabout. The talk of a Dutch war is not so hot, but yet I fear it will come to it at last. So home and to the office, where we sat late. My wife gone this afternoon to the burial of my she-cousin Scott, a good woman, and it is a sad consideration how the peepses decay, and nobody almost that I know in a present way of increasing them. At night, late at my office, and so home to my wife, to supper, and to bed. 27th. Up and all the morning very busy with multitude of clients, till my head began to be overloaded. Towards noon I took coach and to the Parliament House door, and there stayed the rising of the house, and with Sir G. Carteret and Mr. Coventry discoursed of some tar that I have been endeavouring to buy, for the market begins apace to rise upon us, and I would be glad first to serve the king well, and next, if I could, I find myself now begin to cast how to get a penny myself. Home by coach with Alderman Backwell in his coach, whose opinion is that the Dutch will not give over the business without putting us to some trouble to set out a fleet. And then, if they see we go on well, we'll seek to solve up the matter. Upon the change, busy, thence home to dinner, and thence to the office till my head was ready to burst with business. And so with my wife by coach, I sent her to my lady Sandwich and myself to my cousin Roger Peep's chamber, and there he did advise me about our exchequer business, and also about my brother John. He is put by my father upon interceding for him. But I will not yet seem the least to pardon him, nor can I in my heart. However, he and I did talk how to get him a mandamus for a fellowship, which I will endeavour. Thence to my lady's, and in my way met Mr. Sanchi of Cambridge, whom I have not met a great while. He seems a simple fellow, and tells me their master, Dr. Rainbow, is newly made Bishop of Carlisle. To my ladies, and she not being well, did not see her, but straight home with my wife, and late to my office, concluding in the business of Wood's masts, which I have now done, and I believe taken more pains in it than ever any principal officer in this world ever did in anything to no profit to this day. So weary, sleepy, and hungry, home, and to bed. This day the houses attended the king, and delivered their votes to him, upon the business of the Dutch. And he thanks them, and promises an answer in writing. 28th. Up and close at my office all the morning. To the change, busy at noon, and so home to dinner. And then in the afternoon, at the office till night, and so late home, quite tired with business, and without joy in myself otherwise, and that I am by God's grace, and able to go through it, and one day, hope to have benefit by it. So home to supper, and to bed. Twenty-ninth, up betimes, and with Sir W. Ryder and Cutler to Whitehall. Ryder and I to St. James's, and there with Mr. Coventry did proceed strictly upon some fulleries of Mr. Povis in my Lord Peterborough's accounts, which will touch him home, and I am glad of it, for he is the most troublesome, impertinent man that ever I met with. Thence to the change, and there, after some business, home to dinner, where Llewellyn and Mount came to me and dined, and after dinner my wife and I by coach to see my lady Sandwich, where we find all the children and my lord removed, and the house so melancholy that I thought my lady had been dead, knowing that she was not well. But it seems she hath the measles, and I fear the smallpox, poor lady. It grieves me mightily, for it will be a sad hour to the family should she miscarry. Then straight home and to the office, and in the evening comes Mr. Hill the merchant, and another with him that sings well, and we sung some things, and good music it seemed to me, only my mind too full of business to have much pleasure in it. But I will have more of it. They gone, and I having paid Mr. Moxon for the work he has done for the office upon the King's Globes, I to my office, where very late busy upon Captain Taylor's bills for his masts, which I think will never off my hand. Home to supper and to bed. Thirtieth. Up and all the morning at the office, at noon to the change, where, after business done, 
Sir so W. Ryder and Cutler took me to the old James, and there did give me a good dish of mackerel, the first I have seen this year, very good, and good discourse. After dinner we fell to business about their contract for tar, in which, and in another business of Sir W. Ryder's canvas, wherein I got him to contract with me, I held them to some terms against their wills, to the king's advantage, which I believe they will take notice of to my credit. Thence home, and by water, by a galley down to Woolwich, and there a good while with Mr. Pett upon the new ship discoursing and learning of him. Thence with Mr. Dean to see Mr. Faulkner, and there find him in a way to be well. So to the water, after much discourse with great content with Mr. Dean, and home late, and so to the office, wrote to my father, among other things, my continued displeasure against my brother John, so that I will give him nothing more out of my own purse, which will trouble the poor man, but however it is fit that I should take notice of my brother's ill carriage to me. Then home, until twelve at night, about my month's accounts, wherein I have just kept within compass, this having been a spending month. So my people being all abed, I put myself to bed very sleepy. All the news now is what will become of the Dutch business, whether war or peace. We all seem to desire it, as thinking ourselves to have advantages at present over them. For my part, I dread it. The Parliament promises to assist the King with lives and fortunes, and he receives it with thanks and promises to demand satisfaction of the Dutch. My poor Lady Sandwich has fallen sick three days since of the measles. My Lord Digby's business is hushed up and nothing made of it. He is gone and the discourse quite ended. Never more quiet in my family all the days of my life than now, there being only my wife and I and Bess and the little girl Susan, the best wenches to our content that we can ever expect. End of April May of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664, by Samuel Pepys. May, 1664. May 1st, Lord's Day. Lay long in bed. Went not to church, but stayed at home to examine my last night's accounts, which I find right, and that I am nine hundred and eight pounds creditor in the world, the same I was last month. Dined, and after dinner down by water with my wife and Bess, with great pleasure, as low as Greenwich, and so back, playing, as it were, leisurely upon the water to Deptford, where I landed, and sent my wife up higher to land below halfway house. I to the King's Yard, and there spoke about several businesses with the officers, and so with Mr. Waith, consulting about canvas, to halfway house, where my wife was, and after eating there we broke and walked home before quite dark. So to supper, prayers, and to bed. Second, lay pretty long in bed, so up and by water to St. James's, and there attended the Duke with Sir W. Batten and Sir J. Minnes, and having done our work with him, walked to Westminster Hall, and after walking there and talking of business, met Mr. Rawlinson, and by coach to the change, where I did some business, and home to dinner, and presently by coach to the King's Playhouse to see the labyrinth, but coming too soon, walked to my lord's to hear how my lady do, who is pretty well, at least past all fear. There, by Captain Ferris meeting with an opportunity of my lord's coach to carry us to the park anon, we directed it to come to the playhouse door, and so we walked, my wife and I, and Mademoiselle. I paid for her going in, and there saw the labyrinth, the poorest play, methinks, that ever I saw, there being nothing in it but the odd accidents that fell out, by a lady's being bred up in man's apparel, and a man in a woman's. Here was Mrs. Stewart, who is indeed very pretty, but not like my Lady Castlemaine for all that. Thence in the coach to the park, where no pleasure, there being much dust, little company, and one of our horses almost spoiled by falling down, and getting his leg over the pole, but all mended presently, and after riding up and down, home. Set Mademoiselle at home, and we home, and to my office, whither comes Mr. Bland, and pays me the debt he acknowledged he owed me for my service in his business of the Tangier merchant, twenty pieces of new gold, a pleasant sight. It cheered my heart, and he being gone, I home to supper, and shewed them my wife, and she, poor wretch, would fain have kept them to look on, without any other design but a simple love to them, but I thought it not convenient, and so took them into my own hand. So after supper, to bed. Third, up, and being ready, went by agreement to Mr. Bland's, and there drank my morning draught in good chocolate, and slabbering my bands sent home for another, and so he and I by water to Whitehall, and walked to St. James's, where met Creed and Vernati, and by and by Sir W. Ryder, and so to Mr. Coventry's chamber, and there upon my Lord Peterborough's accounts, where I endeavoured to shew the folly and punish it as much as I could of Mr. Povey, for of all the men in the world, 
I never knew any man of his degree so great a coxcomb in such employments. I see I have lost him for ever, but I value it not, for he is a coxcomb, and I doubt not over-honest by some things which I see. And yet for all his folly he hath the good luck now and then to speak his follies in as good words and with as good a show, as if it were reason, and to the purpose, which is really one of the wonders of my life. Thence walked to Westminster Hall, and there in the Lord's house, did in a great crowd from ten o'clock till almost three, hear the cause of Mr. Roberts, my Lord Privy Seal's son, against Wynne, who by false ways did get the father of Mr. Roberts' wife, Mr. Bodville, to give him the estate and disinherit his daughter. The cause was managed for my Lord Privy Seal by Finch, the Solicitor General, but I do really think that he is truly a man of as great eloquence as ever I heard, or ever hoped to hear in all my life. Thence, after long staying to speak with my Lord Sandwich, at last he coming out to me and speaking with me about business of my Lord Peterborough, I by coach home to the office, where all the afternoon, only stepped home to eat one bit and to the office again, having eaten nothing before, to-day. My wife abroad with my aunt White and Norbury, I in the evening to my uncle White's, and not finding them come home, they being gone to the park and the mulberry garden, I went to the change, and there meeting with Mr. Hempson, whom Sir W. Batten has lately turned out of his place, merely because of his coming to me when he came to town, before he went to him, and there he told me many rogueries of Sir W. Batten, how he knows and is able to prove that Captain Cox of Chatham did give him ten pounds in gold to get him to certify for him at the king's coming in, and that Tom Newborn did make the poor men give him three pounds to get Sir W. Batten to cause them to be entered in the yard, and that Sir W. Batten had oftentimes said, By God, Tom, you shall get something, and I will have some on it. His present clerk that is come in Norman's room has given him something for his place. That they live high, and, as Sir Francis Clark's lady told his wife, do lack money as well as other people, and have bribes of a piece of satin and cabinets and other things from people that deal with him, and that hardly anybody goes to see or hath anything done by Sir W. Batten, but it comes with a bribe, and that this is publicly true, that his wife was a whore, and that he had libels flung within his doors for a cuckold as soon as he was married, that he received one hundred pounds in money, and in other things to the value of fifty pounds more of Hempson, and that he intends to give him back but fifty pounds, that he hath abused the chest, and hath now some one thousand pounds by him of it. I met also upon the change with Mr. Cutler, and he told me how for certain Lawson hath proclaimed war again with Argier, though they had at his first coming given back the ships which they had taken, and all their men, though they refused afterwards to make him restitution for the goods which they had taken out of them. Thence to my uncle White's, and he not being at home, I went with Mr. Norbury near hand to the Fleece, a mum-house in Leadenhall, and there drunk mum, and by and by broke up, it being about eleven o'clock at night, and so leaving them also at home, went home myself, and to bed. Fourth. Up, and my new tailor, Langford, comes and takes measure of me for a new black cloth suit and cloak, and I think he will prove a very careful fellow, and will please me well. Thence to attend my Lord Peter Bro in bed, and give him an account of yesterday's proceeding with Povey. I perceive I labour in a business will bring me little pleasure, but no matter. I shall do the king some service. To my lord's lodgings, where during my lady's sickness he is, there spoke with him about the same business, back and by water to my cousin Scott's, there condoled with him the loss of my cousin, his wife, and talked about his matters as attorney to my father, in his administering to my brother Tom. He tells me we are like to receive some shame about the business of his bastard with Jack Noble, but no matter, so it cost us no money. Thence to the coffee-house and to the change a while, news uncertain how the Dutch proceed, some say for, some against a war, the plague increases at Amsterdam, so home to dinner, and after dinner to my office, where very late, till my eyes, which begin to fail me nowadays by candlelight, begin to trouble me. Only in the afternoon comes Mr. Peter Honeywood to see me and gives me twenty shillings, his and his friend's pence for my brother John, which, God forgive my pride, methinks I think myself too high to take of him, but it is an ungrateful pitch of pride in me which God forgive. Home at night to supper and to bed. Fifth, up betimes to my office, busy, and so abroad to change some plate for my father to send to-day by the carrier to Brampton, but I observe and do fear it may be to my wrong that I change spoons of my uncle Robert's into new, and set a pea upon them that thereby I cannot claim them hereafter, as it was my brother Tom's practice. However, the matter of this is not great, and so I did it. So to the change, and meeting Sir W. Warren with him to a tavern, and there talked, as we used to do, of the evils the king suffers in our ordering of business in the navy, as Sir W. Batten now forces us by his knavery. So home to dinner and to the office, where all the afternoon, 
and thence betimes home, my eyes beginning every day to grow less and less able to bear with long reading or writing, though it be by daylight, which I never observed till now. So home to my wife, and after supper, to bed. Sixth. This morning up and to my office, where Simpson, my joiner, came to work upon altering my closet, which I alter by setting the door in another place, and several other things to my great content. Busy at it all day, only in the afternoon home, and there, my books at the office being out of order, wrote letters and other businesses. So at night, with my head full of the business of my closet, home to bed. And strange it is to think how building do fill my mind, and put out all other things out of my thoughts. 7th. Betimes at my office with the joiners, and giving order for other things about it. By and by we sat all the morning, at noon to dinner, and after dinner comes Dean of Woolwich, and I spent, as I had appointed, all the afternoon with him about instructions which he gives me to understand the building of a ship, and I think I shall soon understand it. In the evening a little to my office to see how the work goes forward there, and then home and spent the evening also with Mr. Dean, and had a good supper, and then to bed, he lying at my house. 8th. Lord's Day. This day my new tailor, Mr. Langford, brought me home a new black cloth suit and cloak lined with silk moire, and he being gone, who pleases me very well with his work, and I hope will use me pretty well, then Dean and I to my chamber. And there we repeated my yesterday's lesson about ships all the morning, and I hope I shall soon understand it. At noon to dinner, and strange how in discourse he cries up chemistry from some talk he has had with an acquaintance of his, a chemist, when, poor man, he understands not one word of it. But I discern very well that it is only his good nature, but in this of building ships he hath taken great pains, more than most builders, I believe, have. After dinner he went away, and my wife and I to church, and after church to Sir W. Penn, and there sat and talked with him, and the perfidious rogue seems, as he do always, mightily civil to us, though I know he hates and envies us. So home to supper, prayers, and to bed. Ninth. Up into my office all the morning, and there saw several things done in my work to my great content and at noon home to dinner, and after dinner, in Sir W. Penn's coach, he sent my wife and I down at the new exchange, and after buying some things we walked to my lady Sandwiches, who, good lady, is now, thanks be to God, so well as to sit up, and sent to us, if we were not afeard, to come up to her. So we did, but she was mightily against my wife's coming so near her, though, poor wretch, she is as well as ever she was, as to the measles, and nothing can I see upon her face. There we sat talking with her above three hours till six o'clock, of several things with great pleasure, and so away, and home by coach, buying several things for my wife in our way, and so after looking what had been done in my office to-day, with good content, home to supper, and to bed. But strange, how I cannot get anything to take place in my mind while my work lasts at my office. This day my wife and I, in our way to Paternoster Row, to buy things, called upon Mr. Holyard to advise upon her drying up her issue in her leg, which inclines of itself to dry up, and he admits of it that it should be dried up. Tenth, up and at my office, looking after my workmen all the morning, and after the office was done, did the same at night, and so home to supper, and to bed. Eleventh, up and all day, both forenoon and afternoon, at my office, to see it finished by the joiners, and washed, and everything in order, and indeed now my closet is very convenient and pleasant for me. My uncle White came to me to my office this afternoon, to speak with me about Mr. Mays's business again, and from me went to my house to see my wife, and strange to think that my wife should by and by send for me, after he was gone, to tell me that he should begin discourse of her want of children, and his also, and how he thought it would be best for him and her to have one between them, and he would give her five hundred pounds either in money or jewels beforehand, and make the child his heir. He commended her body, and discoursed that for all he knew the thing was lawful. She says she did give him a very warm answer, such as he did not excuse himself by saying that he said this in jest, but told her that, since he saw what her mind was, he would say no more to her of it, and desired her to make no words of it. It seemed he did say all this in a kind of counterfeit laugh, but by all words that passed, which I cannot now so well set down, it is plain to me that he was in good earnest, and that I fear all his kindness is but only his lust to her. What to think of it of a sudden I know not, but I think not to take notice yet of it to him till I have thought better of it. So, with my mind and head a little troubled, I received a letter from Mr. Coventry about a mast for the Duke's yacht, which, with other business, makes me resolve to go betimes to Woolwich to-morrow. So to supper, and to bed. Twelfth. Up by four o'clock, and by water to Woolwich, where did some business, and walked to Greenwich. Good discourse with Mr. Dean, best part of the way. There met by appointment Commissioner Pett, and with him to Deptford, 
where did also some business, and so home to my office, and at noon Mrs. Hunt and her cousin's child and maid came and dined with me, my wife sick in bed. I was troubled with it, but, however, could not help it, but attended them till after dinner, and then to the office, and there sat all the afternoon, and by a letter to me this afternoon from Mr. Coventry, I saw the first appearance of a war with Holland. So home, and betimes to bed, because of rising to-morrow. Thirteenth. Up before three o'clock, and a little after upon the water, it being very light, as at noon, and a bright sun rising. But by and by a rainbow appeared, the first that ever in a morning I saw, and then it fell a-raining a little, but held up again, and I to Woolwich, where, before the men came to work, I with Mr. Dean spent two hours upon the new ship, informing myself in the names and natures of many parts of her to my great content, and so back again, without doing anything else, and after shifting myself away to Westminster, looking after Mr. Mazer's business and others. In the painted chamber I heard a fine conference between some of the two houses upon the bill for conventicles. The lords would be freed from having their houses searched by any but the Lord Lieutenant of the county, and upon being found guilty to be tried only by their peers, and thirdly would have it added, that whereas the bill says, that that, among other things, shall be a conventicle, wherein any such meeting is found doing anything contrary to the liturgy of the Church of England, they would have it added, or practice. The commons to the Lord said that they knew not what might hereafter be found out which might be called the practice of the Church of England, for there many things may be said to be the practice of the Church, which were never established by any law, either common, statute, or canon, as singing of psalms, binding up prayers at the end of the Bible, and praying extempore before and after sermon, and though these are things indifferent, yet things for aught they at present know may be started, which may be said to be the practice of the church, which would not be fit to allow. For the Lord's privileges, Mr. Walter told them how tender their predecessors had been of the privileges of the Lord's, but however, where the peace of the kingdom stands in competition with them, they apprehend those privileges must give place. He told them that he thought if they should own all to be the privileges of the Lord's which might be demanded, they should be led like the man who granted leave to his neighbour to pull off his horse's tail, meaning that he could not do it at once, that hair by hair had his horse's tail pulled off indeed. So the commons, by granting one thing after another, might be so served by the lords. Mr. Vaughan, whom I could not to my grief perfectly hear, did say, if that they should be obliged in this manner to exempt the lords from everything, it would in time come to pass that whatever, be it never so great, should be voted by the commons as a thing penal for a commoner, the contrary should be thought a privilege to the lords, that also in this business, the work of a conventicle being but the work of an hour, the cause of a search would be over before a lord lieutenant, who may be many miles off, can be sent for, and that all this dispute is but about one hundred pounds, for it is said in the act that it shall be banishment or payment of one hundred pounds. I thereupon heard the Duke of Lennox say that there might be lords who could not always be ready to lose a hundred pounds, or some such thing. They broke up without coming to any end in it. There was also in the Commons House a great quarrel about Mr. Prynne, and it was believed that he should have been sent to the tower for adding something to a bill, after it was ordered to be engrossed, off his own head, a bill for measures for wine and other things of that sort, and a bill of his own bringing in, but it appeared he could not mean any hurt in it. But, however, the King was fain to write in his behalf, and all was passed over. But it is worth my remembrance that I saw old Riley the Herald and his son, and spoke to his son, who told me in very bad words concerning Mr. Prynne, that the king had given him an office of keeping the records, but that he never comes thither, nor had been there these six months, so that I perceive they expect to get his employment from him. Thus everybody is liable to be envied and supplanted. At noon over to the lake, where Sir G. Askew, Sir Robert Parkhurst, and Sir W. Penn dined, a good dinner and merry. Thence to Whitehall, walking up and down a great while, but the council not meeting soon enough, I went homeward, calling upon my cousin Roger Pepys, with whom I talked and heard so much from him of his desire that I would see my brother's debts paid, and things still of that nature tending to my parting with what I get with pain to serve others' expenses, that I was cruelly vexed. Thence to Sir R. Bernard, and there heard something of Piggott's delay of paying our money, that that also vexed me mightily. So home and there met with a letter from my cousin Scott, which tells me that he is resolved to meddle no more with our business of administering for my father, which altogether makes me almost distracted to think of the trouble that I am like to meet with by other folks' business more than ever I hope to have by my own. So with great trouble of mind, to bed. 14. Up, full of pain, I believe by cold got yesterday. 
so to the office where we sat and after office home to dinner being in extraordinary pain after dinner my pain increasing i was forced to go to bed and by and by my pain rose to be as great for an hour or two as ever i remember it was in any fit of the stone both in the lower part of my belly and in my back also no wind could i break i took a glister but it brought away but a little and my height of pain followed it at last after two hours lying thus in most extraordinary anguish crying and roaring i know not what whether it was my great sweating that may do it but upon getting by chance among my other tumblings upon my knees in bed my pain began to grow less and less till in an hour after i was in very little pain but could break no wind nor make any water and so continued and slept well all night fifteenth lord's day rose and as i had intended without reference to this pain took physic and it wrought well with me my wife lying from me to-night the first time she did in the same house ever since we were married i think unless while my father was in town that he lay with me she took physic also to-day and both of our physics wrought well so we passed our time to-day our physic having done working with some pleasure talking but i was not well for i could make no water yet but a drop or two with great pain nor break any wind in the evening came mr vernati to see me and discourse about my lord peterborough's business and also my uncle white and norbury but i took no notice nor showed any different countenance to my uncle white or he to me for all that he carried himself so basely to my wife the last week but will take time to make my use of it so being exceeding hot to bed and slept well sixteenth forced to rise because of going to the duke to st james's where we did our usual business and thence by invitation to mr pierces the surgeon where i saw his wife whom i had not seen in many months before she holds her complexion still but in everything else even in this her new house and the best rooms in it and her closet which her husband with some vain glory took me to show me she continues the eeriest slattern that ever i knew in my life by and by we to see an experiment of killing a dog by letting opium into his hind leg he and dr clark did fail mightily in hitting the vein and in effect did not do the business after many trials but with the little they got in the dog did presently fall asleep and so lay till we cut him up and a little dog also which they put it down his throat he also staggered first and then fell asleep and so continued whether he recovered or no after i was gone i know not but it is a strange and sudden effect thence walked to westminster hall where the king was expected to come to prorogue the house but it seems afterwards i hear he did not come i promised to go again to mr pierce's but my pain grew so great besides a bruise i got to-day in my right testicle which now vexes me as much as the other that i was mighty melancholy and so by coach home and there took another glister but find little good by it but by sitting still my pain of my bruise went away and so after supper to bed my wife and i having talked and concluded upon sending my father an offer of having paul come to us to be with us for her preferment if by any means i can get her a husband here which though it be some trouble to us yet it will be better than to have her stay there till nobody will have her and then be flung upon my hands seventeenth slept well all night and lay long then rose and wrote my letter to my father about paul as we had resolved last night so to dinner and then to the office finding myself better than i was and making a little water but not yet breaking any great store of wind which i wonder at for i cannot be well till i do do it after office home and to supper and with good ease to bed and endeavoured to tie my hands that i might not lay them out of bed by which i believe i have got cold but i could not endure it eighteenth up and within all the morning being willing to keep as much as i could within doors but receiving a very wakening letter from mr coventry about fitting of ships which speaks something like to be done i went forth to the office there to take order in things and after dinner to whitehall to a committee of tangier but did little so home again and to sir w pen who among other things of haste in this new order for ships is ordered to be gone presently to portsmouth to look after the work there i stayed to discourse with him and so home to supper where upon a fine couple of pigeons a good supper and here i met a pretty cabinet sent me by mr shales which i give my wife the first of that sort of goods i ever had yet and very conveniently it comes for her closet i stayed up late finding out the private boxes but could not do some of them and so to bed afraid that i have been too bold to-day in venturing in the cold this day i begun to drink buttermilk and whey and i hope to find great good by it nineteenth up and it being very rainy weather 
which makes it cooler than it was, by coach to Charing Cross with Sir W. Penn, who is going to Portsmouth this day, and left him going to St. James's to take leave of the Duke, and I to Whitehall to a committee of Tangier, where God forgive how our report of my Lord Peterborough's accounts was read over and agreed to by the Lords without one of them understanding it, and had it been what it would, it had got, and besides, not one thing touching the King's profit in it minded or hit upon. Thence my coach home again, and all the morning at the office sat, and all the afternoon till nine at night, being fallen again to business, and I hope my health will give me leave to follow it. So home to supper and to bed, finding myself pretty well, a pretty good stool, which I impute to my way to-day, and broke wind also. Twentieth. Up into my office, whither by and by comes Mr. Chumley, and staying till the rest of the company come, he told me how Mr. Edward Montague is turned out of the court not to return again. His fault, I perceive, was his pride, and most of all his affecting to seem great with the Queen, and it seems indeed had more of her ear than anybody else, and would be with her talking alone two or three hours together, insomuch that the lords about the King, when he would be jesting with them about their wives, would tell the King that he must have a care of his wife too, for she hath now the gallant. And they say the king himself did once ask Montague how his mistress, meaning the queen, did. He grew so proud and despised everybody, besides suffering nobody, he or she, to get or do anything about the queen, that they all laboured to do him a good turn. They also say that he did give some affront to the Duke of Monmouth, which the king himself did speak to him of. But strange it is that this man should, from the greatest negligence in the world, come to be the miracle of attendance, so as to take all officers from everybody, either men or women, about the queen insomuch that he was observed as a miracle, but that which is the worst, that which in a wise manner performed would turn to his greatest advantage, was by being so observed employed to his greatest wrong, the world concluding that there must be something more than ordinary to cause him to do this. So he is gone, nobody pitying but laughing at him, and he pretends only that he is gone to his father that is sick in the country. By and by comes Povey, Creed, and Vernati, and so to their accounts, wherein more trouble and vexation with Povey, that being done, I sent them going, and myself fell to business till dinner. So home to dinner, very pleasant. In the afternoon to my office, very busy again, and by and by came a letter from my father so full of trouble for discontents there between my mother and servants, and such troubles to my father from hence from cave that hath my brother's bastard, that I know not what in the world to do, but with great trouble, it growing night, spent some time walking, and putting care as much as I could out of my head with my wife in the garden, and so home to supper, and to bed. 21st. Up, called by Mr. Chumley, and walked with him in the garden, till others came to another committee of Tangier, as we did meet, as we did used to do, to see more of Povey's folly, and so broke up, and at the office sat all the morning, Mr. Coventry with us, and very hot we are getting out some ships. At noon to the change, and there did some business, and thence home to dinner, and so abroad with my wife by coach to the new exchange, and there laid out almost forty shillings upon her, and so called to see my lady Sandwich, whom we found in her dining-room, which joyed us mightily, but she looks very thin, poor woman, being mightily broke. She told us that Mr. Montague is to return to court, as she hears, which I wonder at, and do hardly believe. So home and to my office, where late, and so home to supper, and to bed. 22nd. Lord's Day. Up and by water to Whitehall to my lord's lodgings, and with him walk to Whitehall without any great discourse, nor do I find that he do my business at all. Here the Duke of York called me to him, to ask me whether I did intend to go with him to Chatham or no. I told him if he commanded, but I did believe there would be business here for me, and so he told me then it would be better to stay, which I suppose he will take better than if I had been forward to go. Thence, after staying and seeing the throng of people to attend the King to chapel, but Lord, what a company of sad, idle people they are, I walked to St. James's with Colonel Reams, where stayed a good while and then walked to Whitehall with Mr. Coventry, talking about business. So meeting Creed, took him with me home and to dinner, a good dinner, and thence by water to Woolwich, where mighty kindly received by Mrs. Faulkner and her husband, who is now pretty well again, this being the first time I ever carried my wife thither. I walked to the dock, where I met Mrs. Ackworth alone at home, and God forgive me, what thoughts I had, but I had not the courage to stay, but went to Mr. Pett's and walked up and down the yard with him and Dean, talking about the dispatch of the ships now in haste and by and by Creed and my wife and a friend of Mr. Faulkner's came with the boat and called me, and so by water to Deptford, where I landed, and after talking with others, walked to Halfway House with Mr. Waith, talking about the business of his supplying us with canvas. 
and he told me in discourse several instances of Sir W. Batten's cheats. So to Halfway House, whither my wife and them were gone before, and after drinking there we walked, and by water home, sending Creed and the other with the boat home. Then wrote a letter to Mr. Coventry, and so a good supper of peas, the first I eat this year, and so to bed. 23rd. Up and to the office, where Sir J. Minnes, Sir W. Batten, and myself met and did business, we being in a mighty hurry. The king is gone down with the duke and a great crew this morning, by break of day, to Chatham. Towards noon, I and my wife by water to Woolwich, leaving my wife at Mr. Faulkner's, and Mr. Hayter and I, with some officers of the yard on board, to see several ships how ready they are. Then to Mr. Faulkner's, to a good dinner, having myself carried them a vessel of sturgeon and a lamprey pie, and then to the yard again, and among other things did at Mr. Ackworth's obtain a demonstration of his being a knave, but I did not discover it till it be a little more seasonable. So back to the rope yard and took my wife and Mr. Hayter back, it raining mighty hard of a sudden, but we with the tilt kept ourselves dry. So to Deptford, did some business there, but Lord, to see how in both places the king's business, if ever it should come to a war, is likely to be done, there not being a man that looks or speaks like a man that will take pains, or use any forecast to serve the king, at which I am heartily troubled. So home, it raining terribly, but we still dry, and at the office late discoursing with Sir J. Minnes and Sir W. Batten, who, like a couple of sots, receive all I say but to little purpose. So late home to supper and to bed. 24th. Up and to the office, where Sir J. Minnes and I sat all the morning, and after dinner thither again, and all the afternoon hard at the office till night, and so tired home to supper and to bed. This day I heard that my uncle Fenner is dead, which makes me a little sad, to see with what speed a great many of my friends are gone, and more, I fear, for my father's sake, are going. 25th. Took physic betimes, and to sleep, then up, it working all the morning. At noon dine, and in the afternoon in my chamber, spending two or three hours to look over some unpleasant letters, and things of trouble to answer my father in, about Tom's business and others that vexed me. But I did go through it, and by that means ease my mind very much. This afternoon also came Tom and Charles Pepys, by my sending for, and received of me forty pounds in part towards their seventy pound legacy of my uncle's. Spent the evening talking with my wife, and so to bed. 26th. Up to the office where we sat, and I had some high words with Sir W. Batten about canvas, wherein I opposed him and all his experience about seams in the middle, and the profit of having many breadths and narrow, which I opposed to good purpose, to the rejecting of the whole business. At noon home to dinner, and thence took my wife by coach, and she to my lady sandwich to see her, I to Tom Trice to discourse about my father's giving over his administration to my brother, and thence to Sir R. Bernard, and there received nineteen pounds in money, and took up my father's bond of twenty-one pounds, that is forty pounds in part of Pickett's two hundred and nine pounds due to us, which forty pounds he pays for seven roods of meadow in Porthole. Thence to my wife and carried her to the old bailey, and there we were led to the quest-house by the church, where all the kindred were by themselves at the burial of my uncle Fenner. But, Lord, what a pitiful rout of people there was of them! But very good service, and great company the whole was. And so in on to church, and a good sermon, and so home, having for ease put my nineteen pounds into W. Joyce's hand, where I left it. So to supper and to bed, being in a little pain from some cold got last night lying without anything upon my feet. 27th. Up, not without some pain by cold, which makes me mighty melancholy, to think of the ill state of my health. To the office, where busy, till my brain's ready to drop with variety of business, and vexed for all that to see the service like to suffer by other people's neglect. Vexed also at a letter from my father, with two troublesome ones enclosed from Cave and Noble, so that I know not what to do therein. At home to dinner at noon. But to comfort my heart, Captain Taylor this day brought me twenty pounds he promised me for my assistance to him about his masts. After dinner to the office again, and thence with Mr. Waith to St. Catherine's, to see some variety of canvases, which indeed was worth my seeing, but only I was in some pain, and so took not the delight I should otherwise have done. So home to the office, and there busy till late at night, and so home to supper and to bed. This morning my tailor brought me a very tall maid to be my cookmaid. She asked five pounds, but my wife offered her but three pounds ten shillings, whether she will take it or no, I know not till to-morrow but I am afeard she will be over high for us, she having last been a chambermaid, and holds up her head, as my little girl Sue observed. 28th. 
up pretty well as to pain and wind, and to the office, where we sat close and did much business. At noon I to the change, and thence to Mr. Cutler's, where I heard Sir W. Ryder was, where I found them at dinner, and dined with them, he having yesterday and to-day a fit of a pain like the gout, the first time he ever had it. A good dinner, good discourse, Sir W. Ryder especially much fearing the issue of a Dutch war, wherein I very highly commend him, thence home, and at the office a while, and then with Mr. Dean to a second lesson upon my shipwrightry, wherein I go on with great pleasure. He being gone, I to the office late, and so home to supper and to bed. But, Lord, to see how my very going to the change, and being without my gown, presently brought me wind and pain, till I came home and was well again. But I am come to such a pass that I shall not know what to do with myself. But I am apt to think that it is only my legs that I take hold in, from my having so long worn a gown constantly. 29th. Whit Sunday. King's birth and restoration day. Up, and having received a letter last night desiring it from Mr. Coventry, I walked to St. James's, and there he and I did long discourse together of the business of the office and the war with the Dutch, and he seemed to argue mightily with the little reason there that is for all this. For first, as to the wrong we pretend they have done us, that of these dindies, for they are not delivering a polaron, it is not yet known whether they have failed or no. That of their hindering the leopard cannot amount to above three thousand pounds if true. That of the guinea company... All they had done us did not amount to above two hundred or three hundred pounds, he told me truly, and that now, from what Holmes, without any commission, hath done in taking an island and two forts, hath set us much in debt to them, and he believes that Holmes will have been so puffed up with this, that he by this time hath been enforced with more strength than he had then, hath, I say, done a great deal more wrong to them. He do, as to the effect of the war, tell me clearly that it is not any skill of the Dutch that can hinder our trade if we will, we having so many advantages over them of winds, good ports, and men. But it is our pride and the laziness of the merchant. He seems to think that there may be some negotiation which may hinder a war this year, but that he speaks doubtfully, as unwilling I perceive to be thought to discourse any such thing. The main thing he desired to speak with me about was to know whether I do understand my Lord Sandwich's intentions, as to going to sea with this fleet, saying that the Duke, if he desires it, is most willing to it, but thinking that twelve ships is not a fleet fit for my lord to be troubled to go out with, he is not willing to offer it to him till he hath some intimations of his mind to go or not. He spoke this with very great respect as to my lord, though methinks it is strange they should not understand one another better at this time than to need another's mediation. Thence walked over the park to Whitehall, Mr. Povey with me, and was taken in a very great shower in the middle of the park that we were very wet. So up into the house and with him to the king's closet, whither by and by the king came, my lord Sandwich carrying the sword. A bishop preached, but he speaking too low for me to hear behind the king's closet, I went forth and walked and discoursed with Colonel Reams, who seems a very willing man to be informed in his business of canvas, which he is undertaking to strike him with us to serve the navy. By and by my lord Sandwich came forth and called me to him, and we fell into discourse a great while about his business, wherein he seems to be very open with me, and to receive my opinion as he used to do and I hope I shall become necessary to him again. He desired me to think of the fitness or not for him to offer himself to go to sea, and to give him my thoughts in a day or two. Thence after sermon among the ladies on the Queen's side, where I saw Mrs. Stewart, very fine and pretty, but far beneath my Lady Castlemaine. Thence with Mr. Povey home to dinner, where extraordinary cheer, and after dinner up and down to see his house, and in a word methinks, for his perspective upon his wall in his garden, and the springs rising up with the perspective in the little closet, his room floored above with woods of several colours, like but above the best cabinet work I ever saw, his grotto and vault with his bottles of wine, and a well therein to keep them cool, his furniture of all sorts, his bath at the top of his house, good pictures, and his manner of eating and drinking, do surpass all that ever I did see of one man in all my life. Thence walked home and found my uncle White and Mr. Rawlinson, who supped with me, they being gone, I to bed, being in some pain from my being so much abroad to-day, which is a most strange thing, that in such warm weather the least air should get cold and wind in me. I confess it makes me mighty sad, and out of all content in the world. 30th. Lay long, the bells ringing, it being holiday, and then up and all the day long in my study at home, studying of shipmaking with great content till the evening, and then came Mr. Howe, and sat, and then supped with me, he is a little conceited, but will make a discreet man. He being gone, a little to my office, and then home to bed, being in much pain from yesterday's being abroad, which is a consideration of mighty sorrow to me. 31st. 
up and called upon Mr. Holyard, with whom I advised, and shall fall upon some course of doing something for my disease of the wind, which grows upon me every day more and more. Thence to my Lord Sandwich's, and while he was dressing, I below discoursed with Captain Cook, and I think if I do find it fit to keep a boy at all, I had as good be supplied from him with one as anybody. By and by up to my Lord, and to discourse about his going to sea, and the message I had from Mr. Coventry to him. He wonders, as he well may, that this course should be taken, and he every day with the Duke, who nevertheless seems most friendly to him, who hath not yet spoke one word to my Lord of his desire to have him go to sea. My Lord did tell me clearly that were it not that he, as all other men that were of the Parliament side, are obnoxious to reproach, and so is forced to bear what otherwise he would not, he would never suffer everything to be done in the Navy, and he never be consulted, and it seems, in the naming of all these commanders for this fleet, he hath never been asked one question. But we concluded it wholly inconsistent with his honour not to go with this fleet, nor with the reputation which the world hath of his interest at court, and so he did give me commission to tell Mr. Coventry that he is most willing to receive any commands from the Duke in this fleet, were it less than it is, and that particularly in this service. With this message I parted, and by coach to the office, where I found Mr. Coventry and told him this. Methinks, I confess, he did not seem so pleased with it as I expected, or at least could have wished, and asked me whether I had told my lord that the duke do not expect his going, which I told him I had. But now whether he means really that the duke, as he told me the other day, do think the fleet too small for him to take, or that he would not have him go, I swear I cannot tell. But methinks other ways might have been used to put him by, without going in this manner about it, and so I hope it is out of kindness indeed. Dined at home, and so to the office, where a great while alone in my office, nobody near, with Bagwell's wife of Deptford. But the woman seemed so modest that I durst not offer any courtship to her, though I had it in my mind when I brought her in to me. But I am resolved to do her husband a courtesy, for I think he is a man that deserves very well. So abroad with my wife by coach to St. James's, to one Lady Poultney's, where I found my lord, I doubt, at some vain pleasure or other. I did give him a short account of what I had done with Mr. Coventry, and so left him, and to my wife again in the coach, and with her to the park. But the Queen being gone by the park to Kensington, we stayed not, but straight home, and to supper. The first time I have done so this summer. And so to my office doing business, and then to my monthly accounts, where to my great comfort I find myself better than I was still the last month, and now come to nine hundred and thirty pounds. I was told to-day that upon Sunday night last, being the King's birthday, the king was at my lady Castlemaine's lodgings, over the hither gates at Lambert's lodgings, dancing with fiddlers all night almost, and all the world coming by taking notice of it, which I am sorry to hear. The discourse of the town is only whether a war with Holland or no, and we are preparing for it all we can, which is but little. Myself subject more than ordinary to pain by wind, which makes me very sad, together with the trouble which at present lies upon me in my father's behalf, rising from the death of my brother, which are many and great." Would to God they were over. End of May. June of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664, by Samuel Pepys, June 1664. June 1st. Up, uh, having lain long, going to bed very late after the ending of my accounts. Being up, Mr. Holyard came to me, and to my great sorrow, after his great assuring me that I could not possibly have the stone again, he tells me that he do verily fear that I have it again, and has brought me something to dissolve it, which do make me very much troubled, and pray to God to ease me. He gone, I down by water to Woolwich and Deptford, to look after the dispatch of the ships, all the way reading Mr. Spencer's book of prodigies, which is most ingeniously writ, both for matter and style. Home at noon, and my little girl got me my dinner, and I presently out by water and landed at Somerset Stairs, and thence through Covent Garden, where I met with Mr. Southwell, Sir W. Penn's friend, who tells me the very sad news of my Lord Tiviot's and nineteen more commission officers being killed at Tangier by the Moors, by an ambush of the enemy upon them, while they were surveying their lines, which is very sad, and he says afflicts the king much. Thence to W. Joyce's, where by appointment I met my wife, but neither of them at home, and she and I to the king's house, and saw the silent woman. But methought not so well done or so good a play as I formerly thought it to be, or else I am nowadays out of humour. Before the play was done it fell such a storm of hail, that we in the middle of the pit were fain to rise. 
and all the house in a disorder, and so my wife and I out and got into a little alehouse, and stayed there an hour after the play was done, before we could get a coach, which at last we did, and by chance took up Joyce Norton and Mrs. Bowles and set them at home, and so home ourselves, and I, after a little to my office, so home to supper, and to bed. Second, up and to the office, where we sat all the morning, and then to the change, where after some stay, by coach with Sir J. Minnes and Mr. Coventry, to St. James's, and there dined with Mr. Coventry very finely, and so over the park to Whitehall to a committee of Tangier about providing provisions, money and men, for Tangier, at it all the afternoon. But it is strange to see how poorly and brokenly things are done of the greatest consequence, and how soon the memory of this great man is gone, or at least out of mind, by the thoughts of who goes next, which is not yet known. My Lord of Oxford, Muscarry, and several others are discoursed of. It seems my Lord Tiviot's design was to go a mile and a half out of the town, to cut down a wood in which the enemy did use to lie in ambush. He had sent several spies, but all brought word that the way was clear, and so might be for anybody's discovery of an enemy before you are upon them. There they were all snapped, he and all his officers, and about two hundred men, as they say, there being left now in the garrison but four captains. This happened the third of May last, being not before that day twelve month of his entering into his government there. But at his going out in the morning he said to some of his officers, Gentlemen, let us look to ourselves, for it was this day three years that so many brave Englishmen were knocked on the head by the moors, when Fines made his sally out. Here till almost night, and then home with Sir J. Minnes by coach, and so to my office a while, and home to supper and to bed, being now in constant pain in my back, but whether it be only wind or what it is the Lord knows, but I fear the worst. Third, up, still in a constant pain in my back, which much afflicts me with fear of the consequence of it. All the morning at the office, we sat at the office extraordinary upon the business of our stores, but, Lord, what a pitiful account the surveyor makes of it grieves my heart. This morning, before I came out, I made a bargain with Captain Taylor for a ship for the commissioners for Tangier, wherein I hope to get forty or fifty pounds, to the change, and thence home and dine, and then by coach to Whitehall, sending my wife to Mrs. Hunt's, at the committee for Tangier all the afternoon, where a sad consideration to see things of so great weight managed in so confused a manner as it is, so as I would not have the buying of an acre of land bought by the Duke of York and Mr. Coventry, for what I see, being the only two that do anything like men. Prince Rupert do nothing but swear and laugh a little, with an oath or two, and that's all he do. Thence call my wife and home, and I late at my office, and so home to supper and to bed, pleased at my hopes of gains by to-day's work, but very sad to think of the state of my health. Fourth, up and to St. James's by coach, after a good deal of talk, before I went forth with J. Noble, who tells me that he will secure us against Cave, that though he knows, and can prove it, yet nobody else can prove it, to be Tom's child, that the bond was made by one Hudson, a scrivener, next to the Fountain Tavern, in the Old Bailey, that the children were born and christened and entered in the parish book of St. Sepulchre's, by the name of Anne and Elizabeth Taylor, and he will give us security against Cave if we pay him the money. And then up to the Duke, and was with him giving him an account how matters go, and of the necessity there is of a power to press seamen, without which we cannot really raise men for this fleet of twelve sail, besides that it will assert the King's power of pressing, which at present is somewhat doubted, and will make the Dutch believe that we are in earnest. Then by water to the office, where we sat till almost two o'clock. This morning Captain Ferrer came to the office to tell me that my lord hath given him a promise of Young's place in the wardrobe, and hearing that I pretend a promise to it, he comes to ask my consent, which I denied him, and told him my lord may do what he pleases with his promise to me, but my father's condition is not so as that I should let it go, if my lord will stand to his word, and so I sent him going, myself being troubled a little at it. After office I with Mr. Coventry by water to St. James's and dined with him, and had excellent discourse from him so to the committee for Tangier all afternoon, where still the same confused doings, and my lord Fitzharding now added to the committee, which will signify much. It grieves me to see how brokenly things are ordered. So by coach home, and at my office late, and so to supper and to bed, my body by plenty of breaking of wind being just now pretty well again, having had a constant aching in my back these five or six days. Mr. Coventry discoursing this noon about Sir W. Batten, what a sad fellow he is, told me how the king told him the other day how Sir W. Batten, being in the ship with him and Prince Rupert, when they expected to fight with Warwick, did walk up and down sweating with a napkin under his throat to dry up his sweat, and that Prince Rupert, being a most jealous man, and particularly of Batten, do walk up and down swearing bloodily to the king, 
that Baden had a mind to betray them to-day, and that the napkin was a signal. But by God, says he, if things go ill, the first thing I will do is to shoot him. He discoursed largely and bravely to me concerning the different sort of valours, the active and passive valour. For the latter, he brought as an instance General Blake, who, in the defending of Taunton and Lyme for the Parliament, did through his stubborn sort of valour defend it the most opiniastrement that ever any man did anything, and yet never was the man that ever made any attack by land or sea, but rather avoided it on all, even fair occasions. On the other side, Prince Rupert, the boldest attacker in the world for personal courage, and yet in the defending of Bristol no man ever did anything worse, he wanting the patience and seasoned head to consult and advise for defence, and to bear with the evils of a siege. The like, he says, is said of my Lord Tivet, who was the boldest adventurer of his person in the world, and from a mean man in few years was come to this greatness of command and repute, only by the death of all his officers, he many times having the luck of being the only survivor of them all, by venturing upon services for the King of France that nobody else would, and yet no man upon a defence, he being all fury and no judgment in a fight. He tells me above all of the Duke of York, that he is more himself and more of judgment is at hand in him in the middle of a desperate service than at other times, as appeared in the business of Dunkirk, wherein no man ever did braver things, or was in hotter service in the close of that day, being surrounded with enemies. And then contrary to the advice of all about him, his counsel carried himself and the rest through them safe, by advising that he might make his passage with but a dozen with him. For, says he, the enemy cannot move after me so fast with a great body, and with a small one we shall be enough to deal with them. And though he is a man naturally martial to the highest degree, yet a man that never in his life talks one word of himself or service of his own, but only that he saw such or such a thing, and lays it down for a maxim that a Hector can have no courage. He told me also, as a great instance of some men, that the Prince of Condo's excellence is, that there not being a more furious man in the world, danger and fight never disturbs him more than just to make him civil, and to command him words of great obligation to his officers and men, but without any the least disturbance in his judgment or spirit. Fifth, Lord's Day. About one in the morning I was knocked up by my maids to come to my wife, who is very ill. I rose, and from some cold she got to-day, or from something else, she is taken with great gripings, a looseness, and vomiting. I lay a while by her upon the bed, she being in great pain, poor wretch, but that being a little over, I to bed again, and lay, and then up into my office all the morning, setting matters to rights in some accounts and papers, and then to dinner, whither Mr. Shepley, late come to town, came to me, and after dinner and some pleasant discourse he went his way, being to go out of town to Huntington again to-morrow. So all the afternoon with my wife discoursing and talking, and in the evening to my office doing business, and then home to supper and to bed. Sixth, up and found my wife very ill again, which troubles me, but I was forced to go forth. So by water with Mr. Gordon and others to see a ship hired by me for the commissioners of Tangier, and to give order therein. So back to the office, and by coach with Mr. Gordon to Whitehall, and there to my Lord Sandwich, and here I met Mr. Townsend very opportunely, and Captain Ferrer, and after some discourse we did accommodate the business of the wardrobe place, that he shall have the reversion if he will take it out by giving a covenant that if Mr. Young dies before my father, my father shall have the benefit of it for his life. So home, and thence by water to Deptford, and there found our Trinity brethren come from their election to church, where Dr. Britton made, me thought, an indifferent sermon, touching the decency that we ought to observe in God's house, the church, but yet to see how ridiculously some men will carry themselves, Sir W. Batten did at open table anon in the name of the whole society desire him to print his sermon, as if the doctor could think that they were fit judges of a good sermon. Then by barge with Sir W. Batten to Trinity House. It seems they have with much ado carried it for Sir G. Carteret against Captain Harrison, poor man, who by succession ought to have been it, and most hands were for him, but only they were forced to fright the younger brethren by requiring them to set their hands, which is an ill course and then Sir G. Carteret carried it. Here was at dinner my Lord Sandwich, Mr. Coventry, my Lord Craven, and others. A great dinner, and good company. Mr. Prynne also, who would not drink any health, no, not the King's, but sat down with his hat on all the while. But nobody took notice of it to him at all. But in discourse with the doctor he did declare himself that he ever was, and has expressed himself in all his books for mixed communion against the Presbyterian examination. Thence after dinner by water, my Lord Sandwich and all us Tangier men, where at the committee busy till night with great confusion, and then by coach home, with this content, however, that I find myself every day become more and more known, and shall one day hope to have benefit by it. I found my wife a little better, a little to my office, then home to supper, and to bed. Seventh. 
up into the office, having by my going by water without anything upon my legs yesterday got some pain upon me again, where all the morning, at noon a little to the change, and thence home to dinner, my wife being ill still in bed, thence to the office, where busy all the afternoon till nine at night, and so home to my wife, to supper, and to bed. 8th. All day before dinner with Creed, talking of many things, among others, of my lord's going so often to Chelsea, and he, without my speaking much, do tell me that his daughters do perceive all, and do hate the place, and the young woman there, Mrs. Betty Beck. For my lord, who sent them thither only for a disguise for his going thither, will come under pretence to see them, and pack them out of doors to the park, and stay behind with her. But now the young ladies are gone to their mother to Kensington. To dinner, and after dinner, till ten at night in my study, writing of my old broken office notes in shorthand all in one book, till my eyes did ache ready to drop out so home to supper and to bed. Ninth. Up and at my office all the morning. At noon dined at home, Mr. Hunt and his kinswoman, wife in the country. After dinner I to the office, where we sat all the afternoon. Then at night by coach to attend the Duke of Albemarle about the Tangier ship. Coming back my wife spied me going home by coach from Mr. Hunt's, with whom she hath gained much in discourse to-day concerning W. Howe's discourse of me to him that he was the man that got me to be secretary to my lord, and all that I have thereby, and that for all this I never did give him sixpence in my life. Which makes me wonder that this rogue dare talk after this manner, and I think all the world is grown false, but I hope I shall make good use of it. So home to supper and to bed, my eyes aching mightily since last night. Tenth. Up and by water to Whitehall, and there to a committee of Tangier, and had occasion to see how my lord Ashworth deports himself, which is very fine indeed, and it joys my heart to see that there's anybody looks so near into the king's business as I perceive he do in this business of my lord Peterborough's accounts. Thence into the park, and met and walked with Captain Silas Taylor, my old acquaintance, while I was of the Exchequer, and Dr. Hoare, talking of music, and particularly of Mr. Birkinshaw's way, which Taylor magnifies mightily, and perhaps but what it deserves, but not so easily to be understood as he and others make of it. Thence home by water, and after dinner abroad to buy several things, as a map and powder and other small things, and so home to my office, and in the evening with Captain Taylor by water to our Tangier ship, and so home, well pleased, having received twenty-six pounds profit to-day of my bargain for this ship, which comforts me mightily, though I confess my heart, what with my being out of order as to my health, and the fear I have of the money my lord oweth me, and I stand indebted to him in, is much cast down of late." In the evening, home to supper, and to bed. Eleventh. Up and to the office, where we sat all the morning, where some discourse arose from Sir G. Carteret and Mr. Coventry, which gives me occasion to think that something like a war is expected now indeed, though upon the change afterwards I hear too that an ambassador is landed from Holland, and one from the East India Company, to treat with ours about the wrongs we pretend to. Mr. Creed dined with me, and thence after dinner by coach with my wife only, to take the air, it being very warm and pleasant, to Bow and Old Ford, and thence to Hackney. There light and played at shuffleboard, eat cream and good cherries, and so with good refreshment home. Then to my office vexed with Captain Taylor about the delay of carrying down the ship hired by me for Tangier, and late about that and other things at the office. So home to supper, and to bed. Twelfth, Lord's Day. All the morning in my chamber consulting my lesson of shipbuilding, and at noon Mr. Creed by appointment came and dined with us, and sat talking all the afternoon till, about church time, my wife and I began our great dispute about going to Griffin's child's christening, where I was to have been godfather, but Sir J. Minnes refusing, he wanted an equal for me and my Lady Batten, and so sought for other. Then the question was whether my wife should go, and she, having dressed herself on purpose, was very angry, and began to talk openly of my keeping her within doors before Creed, which vexed me to the guts, but I had the discretion to keep myself without passion, and so resolved at last not to go, but to go down by water, which we did by H. Russell, to the halfway house, and there eat and drank, and upon a very small occasion had a difference again broke out, where without any the least cause she had the cunning to cry a great while and talk and blubber, which made me mighty angry in mind, but said nothing to provoke her because Creed was there, but walked home, being troubled in my mind also about the knavery and neglect of Captain Fudge and Taylor, who were to have had their ship for Tangier ready by Thursday last, and now the men by a mistake are come on board, and not any master or man or boy of the ship's company on board with them, when we came by her side this afternoon, and also received a letter from Mr. Coventry this day in complaint of it. We came home, and after supper Creed went home, and I to bed. My wife made great means to be friends, coming to my bedside, and doing all things to please me, 
and at last I could not hold out, but seemed pleased, and so parted. And I, with much ado, to sleep, but was easily wakened by extraordinary great rain, and my mind troubled the more to think what the soldiers would do on board to-night in all this weather. Thirteenth. So up at five o'clock, and with Captain Taylor on board her at Deptford, and found all out of order, only the soldier civil, and Sir Arthur Bassett a civil person, I rated at Captain Taylor, whom, contrary to my expectation, I found a lying and a very stupid blundering fellow, good for nothing, and yet we talk of him in the navy as if he had been an excellent officer, but I find him a lying knave, and of no judgment or dispatch at all. After finding the condition of the ship, no master, not above four men, and many ship's provisions, sails, and other things wanting, I went back and called upon Fudge, whom I found like a lying rogue, unready to go on board, but I did so jeer him that I made him get everything ready, and left Taylor and H. Russell to quicken him, and so away, and I by water, on to Whitehall, where I met His Royal Highness, at a Tangier committee, about this very thing, and did there satisfy him how things are, at which all was pacified without any trouble, and I hope may end well, but I confess I am at a real trouble for fear the rogue should not do his work, and I come to shame and loss of the money I did hope justly to have got by it. Thence walked with Mr. Coventry to St. James's, and there spent by his desire the whole morning reading of some old navy books given him of old Sir John Cook's by the Archbishop of Canterbury that now is, wherein the order that was observed in the navy then, above what it is now, is very observable, and fine things we did observe in our reading. And on to dinner, after dinner to discourse of the business of the Dutch war, wherein he tells me the Dutch do in every particular, which are but few and small things that we can demand of them, whatever cry we unjustly make, do seem to offer at an accommodation, for they do own that it is not for their profit to have war with England. We did also talk of a history of the navy of England, how fit it were to be writ, and he did say that it hath been in his mind to propose to me the writing of the history of the late Dutch war, which I am glad to hear, it being a thing I much desire, and sought mightily with my genius, and if well done, may recommend me much. So he says he'll get me an order for making of searches to all records, etc., in order thereto, and I shall take great delight in doing of it. Thence by water down to the tower, and thither sent for Mr. Creed to my house, where he promised to be, and he and I down to the ship, and find all things in pretty good order, and I hope will end to my mind. Thence having a galley down to Greenwich, and there saw the king's works, which are great, are doing there, and so to the cherry garden, and so carried some cherries home, and after supper to bed, my wife lying with me, which from my not being thoroughly well, nor she, we have not done above once these two or three weeks. Fourteenth. Up into the office, where we sat all the morning, and had great conflict about the flags again, and am vexed, methought, to see how my Lord Barclay not satisfied with what I said. But, however, I stopped the King's being abused by the flag-makers for the present. I do not know how it may end, but I will do my best to preserve it. So home to dinner, and after dinner by coach to Kensington, in the way overtaking Mr. Laxton, the apothecary, with his wife and daughters, very fine young lasses, in a coach. And so both of us to my lady Sandwich, who hath lain this fortnight here at Dean Hodges. Much company came hither to-day, my lady Carteret, etc., Sir William Wheeler and his lady, and above all Mr. Beck of Chelsea, and wife and daughter, my lord's mistress, and one that hath not one good feature in her face, and yet is a fine lady, of a fine tie, and very well carriaged, and mighty discreet. I took all the occasion I could to discourse with the young ladies in her company, to give occasion to her to talk, which now and then she did, and that mighty finely, and is, I perceive, a woman of such an air, as I wonder the less at my lord's favour to her, and I dare warrant him she hath brains enough to entangle him. Two or three hours we were in her company, going into Sir H. Finch's garden, and seeing the fountain, and singing there with the ladies, and a mighty fine, cool place it is, with a great laver of water in the middle, and the bravest place for music I ever heard. After much mirth, discoursing to the ladies in defence of the city against the country or court, and giving them occasion to invite themselves to-morrow to me to dinner, to my venison pasty, I got their mother's leave, and so good night, very well pleased with my day's work, and above all, that I have seen my lord's mistress. So home to supper, and a little at my office, and to bed. Fifteenth. Up and by appointment with Captain Witham, the captain that brought the news of the disaster at Tangier, where my lord Tiviot was slain, and Mr. Tooker to Bear's Key, and there saw, and more afterward, at the several granaries, several parcels of oats, and strange it is to hear how it will heat itself if laid up green, and not often turned. We came not to any agreement, but did cheapen several parcels, and thence away, promising to send again to them. So to the victualling office, and then home. And in our garden I got Captain Witham to tell me the whole story of my Lord Tiviot's misfortune, 
for he was upon the guard with his horse near the town, when at a distance he saw the enemy appear upon a hill a mile and a half off, and made up to them, and with much ado escaped himself. But what became of my lord he neither knows nor thinks that anybody but the enemy can tell. Our loss was about four hundred. But he tells me that the greater wonder is that my lord Tiviot met no sooner with such a disaster. For every day he did commit himself to more probable danger than this, for now he had the assurance of all his scouts that there was no enemy thereabouts, whereas he used every day to go out with two or three with him to make his discoveries in greater danger, and yet the man that could not endure to have anybody else to go a step out of order to endanger himself. He concludes him to be the man of the hardest fate to lose so much honour at one blow that ever was. His relation being done, he parted, and so I home to look after things for dinner, and anon at noon comes Mr. Creed by chance, and by and by the three young ladies, and very merry we were with our pasty very well baked, and a good dish of roasted chickens, peas, lobsters, strawberries, and after dinner to cards, and about five o'clock by water down to Greenwich, and up to the top of the hill, and there played upon the ground at cards, and so to the cherry garden, and then by water singing finely to the bridge, and there landed, and so took boat again, and to Somerset House. And by this time, the tide being against us, it was past ten of the clock, and such a troublesome passage, in regard of my lady Paulina's fearfulness, that in all my life I never did see any poor wretch in that condition. Being come hither, there waited for them their coach, but it being so late, I doubted what to do how to get them home. After half an hour's stay in the street, I sent my wife home by coach with Mr. Creed's boy, and myself and Creed in the coach home with them. But, Lord, the fear that my lady Paulina was in every step of the way, and indeed at this time of the night it was no safe thing to go that road, so that I was even afeard myself, though I appeared otherwise. We came safe, however, to their house, where all were abed, we knocked them up, my lady and all the family being in bed, so put them into doors, and leaving them with the maids, bade them good night, and then into the town, Creed and I, it being about twelve o'clock and past, and to several houses, inns, but could get no lodging, all being in bed. At the last house, at last, we found some people drinking and roaring, and there got in, and after drinking, got an ill bed, where, sixteenth, I lay in my drawers and stockings and waistcoat till five of the clock, and so up, and being well pleased with our frolic, walked to Knightsbridge, and there eat a mess of cream, and so to St. James's, and there walked a little, and so I to Whitehall, and took coach, and found my wife well got home last night, and now in bed. So I to the office, where all the morning, and at noon to the change, so home and to my office, when Mr. Ackworth came to me, though he knows himself, and I know him, to be a very knave, Yet he came to me to discover the knavery of other people, like the most honest man in the world. However, good use I shall make of his discourse, for in this he is much in the right. He being gone, I to the change, Mr. Creed with me, after we had been by water to see a vessel we have hired to carry more soldiers to Tangier, and also visited a rope-ground, wherein I learnt several useful things. The talk upon the change is that de Reuter is dead, with fifty men of his own ship, of the plague at Kales that the Holland ambassador here do endeavour to sweeten us with fair words, and things likely to be peaceable. Home, after I had spoke with my cousin Richard Pepys upon the change, about supplying us with bupers from Norwich, which I should be glad of, if cheap. So home to supper, and bed. 17th. Up and to my office, where I dispatch much business, and then down by water to Woolwich, to make a discovery of a cheat providing for us in the working of some of our own ground toes into new cordage, to be sold to us for Riga cordage. Thence to Mr. Faulkner's, where I met Sir W. Batten and Lady and Captain Tinker, and there dined with them, and so to the dockyard and to Deptford by water, and there very long informing myself in the business of flags and bupers and other things, and so home late, being weary, and full of good information to-day. But I perceive the corruptions of the navy are of so many kinds that it is endless to look after them, especially while such a one as Sir W. Batten discourages every man that is honest. So home to my office, there very late, and then to supper and to bed, mightily troubled in my mind, to hear how Sir W. Batten and Sir J. Minnes do labour all they can to abuse, or enable others to abuse the king. Eighteenth. From morning till eleven at night, only a little dinner at home, at my office, very busy, setting many businesses in order to my great trouble, but great content in the end. So home to supper and to bed, Strange to see how pert Sir W. Penn is to-day, newly come from Portsmouth, with his head full of great reports of his service, and the state of the ships there. When that is over, he will be just as another man again, or worse. But I wonder whence Mr. Coventry should take all this care for him, to send for him up only to look after his Irish business with my Lord Ormond, and to get the Duke's leave for him to come with so much officiousness, 
when I am sure he knows him as well as I do, as to his little service he do. 19. Lord's Day. Up, and all the morning and afternoon, only at dinner at home, at my office, doing many businesses for want of time on the weekdays. In the afternoon the greatest shower of rain of a sudden, and the greatest and most continued thunder that ever I heard, I think, in my life. In the evening home to my wife, and there talk seriously of several of our family concernments, and among others of bringing Paul out of the country to us here, to try to put her off, which I am very desirous, and my wife also of. So to supper, prayers, which I have of late too much omitted, so to bed. 20th. It having been a very cold night last night, I had got some cold, and so in pain by wind, and a sure precursor of pain is sudden letting off farts, and when that stops, then my passages stop, and my pain begins. Up and did several businesses, and so with my wife by water to Whitehall, she to her father's, I to the duke, where we did our usual business. And among other discourse of the Dutch, he was merrily saying, how they print that Prince Rupert, Duke of Albemarle, and my Lord Sandwich, are to be generals, and soon after is to follow them via pen, and so the duke called him in mirth old pen. They have, it seems, lately wrote to the king to assure him that their setting out ships were only to defend their fishing trade, and to stay near home, not to annoy the king's subjects, and to desire that he would do the like with his ships, which the king laughs at, but yet is troubled they should think him such a child, to suffer them to bring home their fish and East India Company ships, and then they will not care a fart for us. Thence to Westminster Hall, it being term time, meeting Mr. Dickering, he tells me how my lady last week went to see Mrs. Beck, the mother, and by and by the daughter came in, but that my lady do say herself, as he says, that she knew not for what reason, for she never knew they had a daughter, which I do not believe. She was troubled, and her heart did rise as soon as she appeared, and seems the most ugly woman that ever she saw. This, if true, was strange, but I believe it is not. Thence to my lord's lodgings, and were merry with the young ladies, who make a great story of their appearing before their mother the morning after we carried them, the last week, home so late, and that their mother took it very well, at least without any anger. Here I heard how the rich widow, my lady Gold, is married to one Neil, after he had received a box on the ear by her brother, who was there a sentinel in behalf of some courtier, at the door, but made him draw, and wounded him. She called Neil up to her, and sent for a priest, married presently, and went to bed. The brother sent to the court, and had a sergeant sent for Neil, but Neil sent for him up to be seen in bed, and she owned him for her husband, and so all is past. It seems Sir H. Bennet did look after her. My lady very pleasant. After dinner came in Sir Thomas Crewe and Mr. Sidney, lately come from France, who is grown a little, and a pretty youth he is, but not so improved as they did give him out to be, but like a child still. But yet I can perceive he hath good parts and good inclinations. Thence with Creed, who dined here, to Westminster to find out Mr. Hawley, and did, but he did not accept of my offer of his being steward to my lord at sea. Thence alone to several places about my law businesses, and with good success. At last I to Mr. Townsend at the wardrobe, and received kind words from him to be true to me against Captain Ferris his endeavours to get the place from my father, as my lord hath promised him. Here met Will Howe, and he went forth with me, and by water back to Whitehall to wait on my lord, who is come back from Hinchinbrook, where he has been about four or five days. But I was never more vexed to see how an over-officious visit is received, for he received me with as little concernment as in the middle of his discontent, and a fool I am to be of so servile a humour, and vexed with that consideration I took coach home, and could not get it off my mind all night. To supper and to bed, my wife finding fault with Bess for her calling upon Jane that lived with us, and there heard Mrs. Harper and her talk ill of us, and not told us of it, with which I was also vexed, and told her soundly of it till she cried, poor wench, and I hope without dissimulation, and yet I cannot tell. However, I was glad to see in what manner she received it, and so to sleep. 21st. Being weary yesterday with walking, I sleep long, and at last up and to the office, where all the morning. At home to dinner, Mr. Dean with me. After dinner I to Whitehall, setting down my wife by the way, to a committee of Tangier, where the Duke of York, I perceive, do attend the business very well, much better than any man there, or most of them, and my mind eased of some trouble I lay under for fear of his thinking ill of me, from the bad success in the setting forth of these crewmen to Tangier. Thence with Mr. Creed, and walked in the park, and so to the new exchange, meeting Mr. Moore, and he with us. I shewed him no friendly look, but he took no notice to me of the wardrobe business, which vexes me. I perceive by him my lord's business of his family and estate goes very ill, and runs in debt mightily. 
I would to God I were clear of it, both as to my own money and the bond of a thousand pounds, which I stand debtor for him in to my cousin Thomas Pepys. Thence my coach home, and to my office a little, and so to supper, and to bed. 22nd. Up, and I found Mr. Creed below, who stayed with me a while, and then I to business all the morning. At noon to the change and coffee-house, where great talk of the Dutch preparing of sixty sail of ships. The plague grows mightily among them, both at sea and land. From the change to dinner, to Trinity House, with Sir W. Ryder and Cutler, where a very good dinner. Here Sir G. Askew dined also, who I perceived desires to make himself known among the seamen. Thence home, there coming to me my Lord Peterborough's solicitor, with a letter from him to desire present dispatch in his business of freight, and promises me fifty pounds, which is good news, and I hope to do his business readily for him. This much rejoiced me. All the afternoon at his business, and late at night comes the solicitor again, and I with him at nine o'clock to Mr. Povey's, and there acquainted him with the business. The money he won't pay without warrant, but that will be got done in a few days. So home by coach and to bed. 23rd. Up and to the office, and there we sat all the morning. So to the change, and then home to dinner and to my office, where till ten at night very busy, and so home to supper and to bed. My cousin Thomas Pepys was with me yesterday, and I took occasion to speak to him about the bond I stand bound for my Lord Sandwich to him in a thousand pounds. I did very plainly, obliging him to secrecy, tell him how the matter stands, yet with all duty to my lord my resolution to be bound for whatever he desires me for him, yet that I would be glad he had any other security. I perceive by Mr. Moore to-day that he hath been with my lord, and my lord how he takes it I know not, but he's looking after other security, and I am mighty glad of it. W. Howe was with me this afternoon to desire some things to be got ready for my lord against his going down to his ship, which will be soon, for it seems the king and both the queens intend to visit him. The Lord knows how my Lord will get out of this charge, for Mr. Moore tells me to-day that he is ten thousand pounds in debt, and this will, with many other things that daily will grow upon him, while he minds his pleasure as he do, set him further backward. But it was pretty this afternoon to hear W. Howe mince the matter, and say that he do believe that my Lord is in debt two thousand or three thousand pounds, and then corrected himself and said, No, not so, but I am afraid he is in debt one thousand pounds. I pray God gets me well rid of his lordship as to his debt, and I care not. 24th. Up and out with Captain Witham in several places again to look for oats for Tangier, and among other places to the city granaries, where it seems every company have their granary, and obliged to keep such a quantity of corn always there, or at a time of scarcity to issue so much at so much a bushel, and a fine thing it is to see their stores of all sorts, for piles for the bridge, and for pipes, a thing I never saw before thence to the office, and there busy all the morning. At noon to my uncle White's, and there dined, my wife being there all the morning. After dinner to Whitehall, and there met with Mr. Pierce, and he showed me the Queen's bedchamber, and her closet, where she had nothing but some pretty pious pictures, and books of devotion, and her holy water at her head as she sleeps, with her clock by her bedside, wherein a lamp burns that tells her the time of the night at any time. Thence with him to the park, and there met the Queen coming from chapel, with her maids of honour, all in silver lace gowns again, which is new to me, and that which I did not think would have been brought up again. Thence he carried me to the king's closet, where such variety of pictures and other things of value and rarity, that I was properly confounded and enjoyed no pleasure in the sight of them, which is the only time in my life that ever I was so at a loss for pleasure in the greatest plenty of objects to give it me. Thence home, calling in many places and doing abundance of errands to my great content, and at night weary home, where Mr. Creed waited for me, and he and I walked in the garden, where he told me he is now in a hurry fitting himself for sea, and that it remains that he deals as an ingenuous man with me in the business I wot of, which he will do before he goes. But I perceive he will have me do many good turns for him first, both as to his bills coming to him in this office, and also in his absence at the committee of Tangier, which I promise, and as he acquits himself to me, I will willingly do. I would I knew the worst of it, what it is he intends, that's how I may either quit my hands of him, or continue my kindness still to him. 25th. We stayed late, and he lay with me all night, and rose very merry talking. An excellent company he is, that is the truth of it, and a most cunning man. He being gone, I to the office, where we sat all the morning. At noon to dinner, and then to my office busy, and by and by home with Mr. Dean, to a lesson upon raising a bend of timbers. And he being gone, I to the office, and there came Captain Taylor, and he and I home, and I have done all very well with him as to the business of the last trouble, 
so that come what will come, my name will be clear of any false dealing with him. So to my office again late, and then to bed. 26th, Lord's Day. Up, oh, and Sir J. Minnes set me down at my Lord Sandwich's, where I waited till his coming down. When he came to, could find little to say to me, but only a general question or two, and so good-bye. Here his little daughter, my Lady Catherine, was brought, who is lately come from my father's at Brampton, to have her cheek looked after, which is and hath long been sore. But my lord will rather have it be as it is, with a scar in her face, than endanger it being worse by tampering. He being gone, I went home, a little troubled to see he minds me no more, and with creed called at several churches, which, God knows, are supplied with very young men, and the churches very empty. So home, and at our own church looked in, and there heard one preach whom Sir W. Penn brought, which he desired us yesterday to hear, that had been his chaplain in Ireland, a very silly fellow. So home and to dinner, and after dinner a frolic took us, we would go this afternoon to the Hope. So my wife dressed herself, and with good victuals and drink we took boat presently, and the tide with us got down, but it was night, and the tide spent by the time we got to Gravesend. So there we stopped, but went not on shore, only creed to get some cherries, and send a letter to the Hope where the fleet lies, and so, it being rainy and thundering mightily and lightning, we returned. By and by the evening turned mighty clear and moonshine. We got with great pleasure home about twelve o'clock, which did much please us, Creed telling pretty stories in the boat. He lay with me all night. 27th. Up, and he and I walked to Paul's churchyard, and there saw Sir Harry Spillman's book, and I bespoke it and others, and thence we took coach, and he to my lord's, and I to St. James's, where we did our usual business, and thence I home and dined, and then by water to Woolwich, and there spent the afternoon till night under pretence of buying Captain Blackman's house and grounds, and viewing the ground took notice of Clothier's cordage with which she, I believe, thinks to cheat the king. That being done, I by water home, it being night first, and there I find our new maid Jane come, a cookmaid. So to bed. 28th. Up, and this day put on a half-shirt first this summer, it being very hot and yet so ill-tempered I am grown, that I am afeard I shall catch cold, while all the world is ready to melt away. To the office all the morning, at noon to dinner at home, then to my office till the evening, then out about several businesses, and then by appointment to the change, and thence with my uncle White to the mum-house, and there drinking, he do complain of his wife most cruel as the most troublesome woman in the world, and how she will have her will, saying she brought him a portion, and God knows what by which, with many instances more, I perceive they do live a sad life together. Thence to the mitre, and there comes Dr. Burnett to us, and Mr. Mays, but the meeting was chiefly to bring the doctor and me together. And there I began to have his advice about my disease, and then invited him to my house, and I am resolved to put myself into his hands. Here very late, but I drank nothing, nor will, though he do advise me to take care of cold drinks. So home, and to bed. 29th. Up, and Mr. Shepley came to me, who is lately come to town. Among other things I hear by him how the children are sent for away from my father's, but he says without any great discontent. I am troubled there should be this occasion of difference, and yet I am glad they are gone, lest it should have come to worse. He tells me how my brave dog I did give him, going out betimes one morning to Huntington, was set upon by five other dogs and worried to pieces, of which I am a little and he the most sorry I ever saw a man for such a thing. Forth with him, and walked a good way talking, then parted, and I to the temple, and to my cousin Roger Pepys, and thence by water to Westminster to see Dean Honeywood, whom I had not visited a great while. He is a good-natured, but a very weak man, yet a dean, and a man in great esteem. Thence walked to my Lord Sandwich's, and there dined, my Lord there. He was pleasant enough at table with me, but yet without any discourse of business, or any regard to me when dinner was over but fell to cards, and my lady and I sat two hours alone, talking of the condition of her family as being greatly in debt, and many children now coming up to provide for. I did give her my sense very plain of it, which she took well, and carried further than myself, to the bemoaning their condition, and remembering how finely things were ordered about six years ago, when I lived there, and my lord at sea every year. Thence home, doing several errands by the way, so to my office, and there till late at night, Mr. Commander coming to me for me to sign and seal the new draft of my will, which I did do, I having altered something upon the death of my brother Tom. So home to supper, and to bed. 30th. Up and to the office, where we sat all the morning. At noon, home to dinner, Mr. Waith with me, and by and by comes in Mr. Faulkner and his wife, and dined with us, the first time she was ever here. We had a pretty good dinner, 
very merry in discourse, sat after dinner an hour or two, then down by water to Deptford and Woolwich, about getting of some business done, which I was bound to by my oath this month, and though in some things I have not come to the height of my vow of doing all my business in paying all my petty debts, and receipt of all my petty monies due to me, yet I bless God I am not conscious of any neglect in me that they are not done, having not minded my pleasure at all, and so being resolved to take no manner of pleasure till it be done, I doubt not God will forgive me for not forfeiting the ten pounds promised. Walk back from Woolwich to Greenwich all alone, save a man that had a cudgel in his hand, and though he told me he laboured in the king's yard, and many other good arguments that he is an honest man, yet, God forgive me, I did doubt he might knock me on the head behind with his club. But I got safe home. Then to the making up my month's accounts, and find myself still a gainer, and rose to nine hundred and fifty-one pounds, for which God be blessed. I end the month with my mind full of business, and some sorrow, that I have not exactly performed all my vows, though my not doing is not my fault, and shall be made good out of my first leisure. Great doubts yet whether the Dutch war go on or no. The fleet ready in the hope of twelve sail. The king and queens go on board, they say, on Saturday next. Young children of my Lord Sandwich gone with their maids from my mother's, which troubles me, it being, I hear from Mr. Shepley, with great discontent, saying that though they buy good meat, yet can never have it before it stinks, which I am ashamed of. End of June July of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664, by Samuel Pepys. July, 1664. July 1st. Up and within all the morning, first bringing down my triangle to my chamber below, having a new frame made proper for it to stand on. By and by comes Dr. Burnett, who assures me that I have an ulcer either in the kidneys or bladder, for my water which he saw yesterday, he is sure the sediment is not slime gathered by heat, but is a direct pus. He did write me down some direction what to do for it, but not with the satisfaction I expected. Dr. Burnett's advice to me. The original is filed among my letters. Take of the roots of marshmallows four ounces, of comfrey, of licorice, of each two ounces, of the mowers of St. John's wort two handsful, of the leaves of plantain, of ale hoof, of each three handfuls, of self-heel, of red roses, of each one handful, of cinnamon, of nutmeg, of each half an ounce. Beat them well, then pour upon them one quart of old Rhenish wine, and about six hours after strain it and clarify it with the white of an egg, and with a sufficient quantity of sugar, boil it to the consistence of a syrup, and reserve it for use. Dissolve one spoonful of this syrup in every draught of ale or beer you drink. Morning and evening swallow the quantity of an hazelnut of cypress terebintine. If you are bound or have a fit of the stone, eat an ounce of cassia new drawn from the point of a knife. Old canary or Malaga wine you may drink to three or four glasses, but no new wine, and what wine you drink let it be at meals. I did give him a piece with good hopes, however, that his advice will be of use to me, though it is strange that Mr. Holyard should never say one word of this also in all his life to me. He being gone, I to the change, and thence home to dinner, and so to my office, busy till the evening. And then by agreement came Mr. Hill, and Andrews, and one Cheswick, a master who plays very well upon the spinet. And we sat singing psalms till nine at night, and so broke up with great pleasure, and very good company it is, and I hope I shall now and then have their company." They being gone, I to my office till towards twelve o'clock, and then home and to bed. Upon the change this day I saw how uncertain the temper of the people is, that, from our discharging of about two hundred that lay idle, having nothing to do, upon some of our ships which were ordered to be fitted for service, and their works are now done, the town do talk that the king discharges all his men, two hundred yesterday and eight hundred to-day, and that now he hath got one hundred thousand pounds in his hand, he values not a Dutch war but I undeceived a great many, telling them how it is. Second, up and to the office, where all the morning, at noon to the change, and there, which is strange, I could meet with nobody that I could invite home to my venison pasty, but only Mr. Alsop, and Mr. Lanyon, whom I invited last night, and a friend they brought along with them. So home, and with our venison pasty, we had other good meat and good discourse. After dinner, sat close, to discourse about our business of the victualling of the garrison of Tangier, taking their prices of all provisions, and I do hope to order it so that they and I also may get something by it, 
which do much please me, for I hope I may get nobly and honestly with profit to the king. They being gone, came Sir W. Warren, and he and I discoursed long about the business of masts, and then in the evening to my office, where late writing letters, and then home to look over some Brampton papers, which I am under an oath to dispatch before I spend one half hour in any pleasure, or go to bed before twelve o'clock, to which, by the grace of God, I will be true. Then to bed. When I came home, I found that to-morrow being Sunday, I should gain nothing by doing it to-night, and to-morrow I can do it very well and better than to-night. I went to bed before my time, but with a resolution of doing the thing to better purpose to-morrow. Third, Lord's Day. Up and ready, and all the morning in my chamber looking over and settling some Brampton businesses. At noon to dinner, where the remains of yesterday's venison, and a couple of brave green geese, which we are fain to eat alone because they will not keep, which troubled us. After dinner I closed to my business, and before the evening did end it with great content, and my mind eased by it. Then up and spent the evening walking with my wife, talking, and it thundering and lightning all the evening. And this year have had the most of thunder and lightning, they say, of any in man's memory, and so it is, it seems, in France and everywhere else. So to prayers and to bed. Fourth, up and many people with me about business, and then out to several places, and so at noon to my Lord Cruz, and there dined, and very much made of there, by him. He offered me the selling of some land of his in Cambridgeshire, a purchase of about one thousand pounds, and if I can compass it, I will. After dinner I walked homeward, still doing business by the way, and at home find my wife this day, of her own accord, to have lain out twenty-five shillings upon a pair of pendants for her ears, which did vex me, and brought both me and her to very high and very foul words from her to me, such as trouble me to think she should have in her mouth, and reflecting upon our old differences, which I hate to have remembered. I vowed to break them, or that she should go and get what she could for them again. I went with that resolution out of doors. The poor wretch afterwards in a little while did send out to change them for her money again. I followed Bess her messenger at the change, and there did consult and sent her back. I would not have them changed, being satisfied that she yielded. So went home, and friends again as to that business. But the words I could not get out of my mind, and so went to bed at night discontented, and she came to bed to me, but all would not make me friends, but sleep and rise in the morning angry. This day the king and the queen went to visit my lord Sandwich, and the fleet going forth in the hope. Fifth, up into the office where all the morning. At noon to the change a little, then with W. Howe home and dined. So after dinner to my office, and there busy till late at night, having had, among other things, much discourse with young Gregory about the chest business, wherein Sir W. Batten is so great a knave, and also with Alsop and Lanyon about the Tangier victualling, wherein I hope to get something for myself. Late home to supper and to bed, being full of thoughts of a sudden resolution this day taken upon the change, of going down to-morrow to the hope. Sixth, up very betimes, and my wife also, and got us ready. At about eight o'clock, having got some bottles of wine and beer and neat's tongues, we went to our barge at the tower, where Mr. Pierce and his wife, and a kinswoman and his sister, and Mrs. Clark and her sister and cousin, were to expect us and so set out for the hope, all the way down playing at cards and other sports, spending our time pretty merry. Come to the hope about one, and there showed them all the ships, and had a collation of anchovies, gammon, etc., and after an hour's stay or more embarked again for home. And so to cards and other sports till we came to Greenwich, and there Mrs. Clark and my wife and I on shore to an alehouse for them to do their business, and so to the barge again, having shown them the king's pleasure boat, and so home to the bridge, bringing night home with us, and it rained hard, but we got them on foot to the bear, and there put them into a boat, and I back to my wife in the barge, and so to the tower wharf and home, being very well pleased to-day with the company, especially Mrs. Pierce, who continues her complexion as well as ever, and hath at this day, I think, the best complexion that ever I saw on any woman, young or old, or child either, all days of my life. Also Mrs. Clark's kinswoman sings very prettily, but is very confident in it. Mrs. Clark herself witty, but spoils all in being so conceited and making so great a flutter with a few fine clothes and some bad tawdry things worn with them. But the charge of the barge lies heavy upon me, which troubles me, but it is but once, and I may make Pierce do me some courtesy as great. Being come home, I weary to bed with sitting. The reason of Dr. Clark's not being here was the king's being sick last night and let blood, and so he does not come away to-day. 7th. Up, and this day begun, the first day this year, to put off my linen waistcoat, but it happening to be a cool day, I was afraid of taking cold, which troubles me, and is the greatest pain I have in the world to think of my bad temper of my health. At the office all the morning, dine at home, 
to my office to prepare some things against the committee of Tangier this afternoon, so to Whitehall, and there found the Duke and twenty more reading their commission, of which I am, and was also sent to, to come, for the royal fishery, which is very large, and a very serious charter it is, but the company generally so ill-fitted for so serious a work, that I do much fear it will come to little. That being done, and not being able to do anything for lack of an oath for the governor and assistance to take, we rose. Then our committee for the Tangier Vittling met, and did a little, and so up, and I and Mr. Coventry walked in the garden half an hour, talking of the business of our masts, and thence away, and with Creed walked half an hour or more in the park, and thence to the new exchange, to drink some cream, but missed it, and so parted, and I home, calling by the way for my new books, viz. Sir H. Spillman's whole glossary, Scapulus, Lexicon, and Shakespeare's plays, which I have got money out of my stationer's bills to pay for. So home, and to my office a while, and then home and to bed, finding myself pretty well for all my waistcoat being put off to-day. The king is pretty well to-day, though let blood the night before yesterday. Eighth. Up and called out by my Lord Peterborough's gentleman to Mr. Povey's, to discourse about getting off his money, wherein I am concerned in hopes of the fifty pounds my Lord hath promised me, but I dare not reckon myself sure of it till I have it in my man. For these lords are hard to be trusted. Though I well deserve it. I stayed at Povey's for his coming in, and there looked over his stables and everything, but notwithstanding all the times I have been there, I do yet find many fine things to look on. Thence to Whitehall a little, to hear how the king do, he not having been well these three days. I find that he is pretty well again. So to Paul's churchyard about my books, and to the binders, and directed the doing of my Chaucer. Though they were not full neat enough for me, but pretty well it is. And thence to the class-makers, to have it classed and bossed. So to the change, and home to dinner, and so to my office till five o'clock, and then came Mr. Hill and Andrews, and we sung an hour or two. Then broke up, and Mr. Alsop and his company came, and consulted about our Tangier Vittling, and brought it to a good head. So they parted, and I to supper, and to bed. Ninth. Up and at the office all the morning, in the afternoon by coach with Sir J. Minnes to Whitehall, and there to a committee for fishing. But the first thing was swearing to be true to the company, and we were all sworn, but a great dispute we had, which methought is very ominous to the company, some that we should swear to be true to the best of our power, and others to the best of our understanding, and carried in the last, though in that we are the least able to serve the company, because we would not be obliged to attend the business when we can, but when we list. This consideration did displease me, but it was voted, and so went. We did nothing else, but broke up till a committee of guinea was set and ended, and then met again for Tangier, and there I did my business about my Lord Peterborough's order, and my own for my expenses for the garrison lately. So home, by the way, calling for my Chaucer and other books, and that is well done to my mind, which pleased me well. So to my office till late, writing letters, and so home to my wife to supper and bed, where we have not lain together because of the heat of the weather a good while, but now against her going into the country. 10th. Lord's Day. Up and by water, towards noon, to Somerset House, and walked to my Lord Sandwich's, and there dined with my lady and the children, and after some ordinary discourse with my lady, after dinner took our leaves and my wife hers, in order to her going to the country to-morrow. But my lord took not occasion to speak one word of my father or mother about the children at all, which I wonder at, and begin I will not. Here my lady showed us my lady Castlemaine's picture, finely done, given my lord, and a most beautiful picture it is. Thence with my lady Jemima and Mr. Sidney to St. Giles's Church, and there heard a long, poor sermon, then set them down and in their coach to Kate Joyce's christening, where much company, good service or sweet meats, and after an hour's stay left them, and in my lord's coach, his noble, rich coach, home, and there my wife fell to putting things in order against her going to-morrow, and I to read, and so to bed, where I not well, and so had no pleasure at all with my poor wife. Eleventh. But betimes up this morning, and getting ready, be by coach to Hoven, where at nine o'clock they set out, and I and my man Will, on horseback, by my wife, to Barnet. A very pleasant day, and there dined with her company, which was very good. A pretty gentlewoman with her, that goes but to Huntington, and a neighbour to us in town. Here we stayed two hours, and then parted for all together, and my poor wife, I shall soon want, I am sure. Thence I and Will to see the wells, half a mile off. And there I drank three glasses, and went, and walked, and came back, and drunk two more, the woman would have had me drink three more, but I could not, my belly being full. But this wrought very well, and so we rode home, round by Kingsland, Hackney, and Mile End, till we were quite weary, and my water working at least seven or eight times upon the road, which pleased me well. 
and so home weary and not being very well i betimes to bed and there fell into a most mighty sweat in the night about eleven o'clock and there knowing what money i have in the house and hearing a noise i began to sweat worse and worse till i melted almost to water i rung and could not in half an hour make either of the wenches hear me and this made me fear the more lest they might be gagged and then i began to think that there was some design in a stone being flung at the window over our stairs this evening by which the thieves meant to try what looking there would be after them and know our company these thoughts and fears i had and do hence apprehend the fears of all rich men that are covetous and have much money by them at last jane rose and then i understand it was only the dog once a lodging and so made a noise so to bed but hardly slept at last did and so till morning twelfth and so rose called up by my lord peterborough's gentleman about getting his lord's money to-day of mr povey wherein i took such order that it was paid and i had my fifty pounds brought me which comforts my heart we sat at the office all the morning then at home dined alone sad for want of company and not being very well and know not how to eat alone after dinner down with sir g carteret sir j minnes and sir w batten to view and did like a place by deptford yard to lay masts in by and by comes mr coventry and after a little stay he and i down to blackwall he having a mind to see the yard which we did and find storehouses there are and good docks but of no great profit to him that oweth them for aught we see so home by water with him having good discourse by the way and so i to the office a while and laid home to supper and to bed thirteenth up and to my office at noon after having at an alehouse hard by discourse with one mr tyler a neighbour and one captain sanders about the discovery of some purses that have sold their provisions i to my lord sandwich thinking to have dined there but they not dining at home i with captain ferris to mr barwell the king's squire saddler where about this time twelve months i dined before at a good venison pasty the like we had now and very good company mr tresham and others thence to whitehall to the fishery and there did little so by water home and there met lanyon etc about tangier matters and so late to my office and then to home and to bed mr moore was with me late to desire me to come to my lord sandwich to-morrow morning which i shall but i wonder what my business is fourteenth my mind being doubtful what the business should be i rose a little after four o'clock and abroad walked to my lord's and nobody up but the porter rose out of bed to me so i back again to fleet street and there bought a little book of law and then hearing a psalm sung i went into st dunstan's and there heard prayers read which it seems is done there every morning at six o'clock a thing i never did do at a chapel but the college chapel in all my life thence to my lord's again and my lord being up was sent for up and he and i alone he did begin with the most solemn profession of the same confidence in and love for me that he ever had and then told me what a misfortune was fallen upon me and him in me by a displeasure which my lord chancellor did show to him last night against me in the highest and most passionate manner that ever any man did speak even to the not hearing of anything to be said to him but he told me that he did say all that could be said for a man as to my faithfulness and duty to his lordship and did give me the greatest right imaginable and what should the business be but that i should be forward to have the trees in clarendon park marked and cut down which he it seems hath bought of my lord albemarle when god knows i am the most innocent man in the world in it and did nothing of myself nor knew of his concernment therein but barely obeyed my lord treasurer's warrant for the doing thereof and said that i did most ungentlemanlike with him and had justified the rogues in cutting down a tree of his and that i had sent the various fanatic that is in england to mark them on purpose to nose him all which i did assure my lord was most properly false and nothing like it true and told my lord the whole passage my lord did seem most nearly affected he is partly i believe for me and partly for himself so he advised me to wait presently upon my lord and clear myself in the most perfect manner i could with all submission and assurance that i am his creature both in this and all other things and that i do own that all i have is derived through my lord sandwich from his lordship so full of horror i went and found him busy in trials of law in his great room and it being sitting day does not stay but went to my lord and told him so whereupon he directed me to take him after dinner and so away i home leaving my lord mightily concerned for me i to the office and there sat busy all the morning at noon to the change and from the change over with also and the others to the pope's head tavern and there stayed a quarter of an hour and concluded upon this that in case i got them no more than three shillings per week per man i should have of them but a hundred and fifty pounds per annum but to have it without any adventure or charge but if i got them three shillings tuppence then they would give me three hundred pounds in the like manner so i directed them to draw up their tender in a line or two against the afternoon 
and to meet me at Whitehall. So I left them, and I to my Lord Chancellor's, and there coming out after dinner I accosted him, telling him that I was the unhappy peeps that had fallen into his high displeasure, and come to desire him to give me leave to make myself better understood to his lordship, assuring him of my duty and service. He answered me very pleasingly, that he was confident upon the score of my Lord Sandwich's character of me, but that he had reason to think what he did, and desired me to call upon him some evening. I named to-night, and he accepted of it. So with my heart light, I to Whitehall, and there, after understanding by a stratagem, and yet appearing wholly desirous not to understand Mr. Gordon's price, when he desired to show it me, I went down and ordered matters in our tender so well, that at the meeting by and by I was ready with Mr. Gordon's and his, both directed him a letter to me to give the board their two tenders. But there being none but the General Monk and Mr. Coventry and Povey and I, I did not think fit to expose them to view now, but put it off till Saturday, and so with good content rose. Thence I to the half-moon, against the change, to acquaint Lanyon and his friends, of our proceedings, and thence to my Lord Chancellor's, and there heard several trials, wherein I perceive my Lord is a most able and ready man. After all done, he himself called, Come, Mr. Pepys, you and I will take a turn in the garden. So he was led downstairs, having the gout, and there walked with me, I think, above an hour, talking most friendly, yet cunningly. I told him clearly how things were, how ignorant I was of his lordship's concernment in it, how I did not do nor say one word singly, but what was done was the act of the whole board. He told me by name that he was more angry with Sir G. Carteret than with me, and also with the whole body of the board, but thinking who it was of the board that knew him least, he did place his fear upon me. But he finds that he is indebted to none of his friends there, I think I did thoroughly appease him, till he thanked me for my desire and pains to satisfy him, and upon my desiring to be directed who I should of his servants advise with about this business, he told me nobody, but would be glad to hear from me himself. He told me he would not direct me in anything, that it might not be said that the Lord Chancellor did labour to abuse the King, or, as I offered, direct the suspending the report of the purveyors, but I see what he means, and I will make it my work to do him service in it. But, Lord! to see how he is incensed against poor Dean, as a fanatic rogue, and I know not what, and what he did was done in spite to his lordship among all his friends and tenants. He did plainly say that he would not direct me in anything, for he would not put himself into the power of any man to say that he did so and so, but plainly told me, as if he would be glad I did something. Lord, to see how we poor wretches dare not do the king good service for fear of the greatness of these men. He named Sir G. Carteret and Sir J. Minnes and the rest, and that he was as angry with them all as me. But it was pleasant to think that while he was talking to me, comes into the garden Sir G. Carteret, and my lord avoided speaking with him, and made him and many others stay, expecting him, while I walked up and down above an hour, I think, and would have me walk with my hat on. And yet, after all this, there has been so little ground for this his jealousy of me, that I am sometimes afeard that he do this only in policy to bring me to his side by scaring me, or else which is worse, to try how faithful I would be to the king but I rather think the former of the two. I parted with great assurance how I acknowledged all I had to come from his lordship, which he did not seem to refuse, but with great kindness and respect parted. So I by coach home, calling at my lord's, but he not within, at my office late, and so home to eat something, being almost starved for want of eating my dinner to-day, and so to bed, my head being full of great and many businesses of import to me. 15. Up and to my lord's sandwiches, where he sent for me up, and I did give my lord an account of what had passed with my lord chancellor yesterday, with which he was well pleased, and advised me by all means to study in the best manner I could to serve him in this business. After this discourse ended, he began to tell me that he had now pitched upon his day of going to sea upon Monday next, and that he would now give me an account how matters are with him. He told me that his work now in the world is only to keep up his interest at court, having little hopes to get more considerably, he saying that he hath now about eight thousand pounds per annum. It is true, he says, he oweth about ten thousand pounds, but he hath been at great charges in getting things to this pass in his estate, besides his building and good goods that he hath bought. He says he hath now evened his reckonings at the wardrobe till Michaelmas last, and hopes to finish it to Lady Day before he goes. He says now there is due too seven thousand pounds to him there, if he knew how to get it paid, besides two thousand pounds that Mr. Montague do owe him. As to his interest, he says that he hath had all the injury done him that ever man could have by another bosom friend that knows all his secrets, by Mr. Montague. But he says that the worst of it all is past, and he gone out and hated his very person by the king, and he believes the more upon the score of his carriage to him, nay, that the Duke of York did say a little while since in his closet, that he did hate him because of his ungrateful carriage to my Lord of Sandwich. 
He says that he is as great with the Chancellor, or greater, than ever in his life, that with the King he is the like, and told me an instance that, whereas he formerly was of the private counsel to the King before he was last sick, and that by the sickness an interruption was made in his attendance upon him, the King did not constantly call him, as he used to do, to his private counsel, only in businesses of the sea and the like, but of late the King did send a message to him by Sir Harry Bennet, to excuse the king to my lord that he had not of late sent for him as he used to do to his private counsel for it was not out of any distaste but to avoid giving offence to some others whom he did not name but my lord supposes it might be prince rupert or it may be only that the king would rather pass it by an excuse than be thought unkind but that now he did desire him to attend him constantly which of late he hath done and the king never more kind to him in his life than now the duke of york as much as is possible and in the business of late. When I was to speak to my lord about his going to sea, he says that he finds the duke did it with the greatest ingenuity and love in the world, and whereas, says my lord, he is a wise man hard by that thinks himself so, and would be thought so, and it may be is in a degree so, naming by and by my lord Crewe, would have had me condition with him that neither Prince Rupert nor anybody should come over his head, and I know not what. The Duke himself hath caused in his commission that he be made admiral of this, and what other ships or fleets shall hereafter be put out after these, which is very noble. He tells me in these cases, and that of Mr. Montague's and all others, he finds that bearing of them patiently is his best way, without noise or trouble, and things wear out of themselves and come fair again. But, says he, take it from me, never to trust too much to any man in the world, for you put yourself into his power, and the best-seeming friend and real friend, as to the present, may have or take occasion to fall out with you, and then out comes all. Then he told me of Sir Harry Bennet, though they were always kind, yet now it is become to an acquaintance and familiarity above ordinary, that for these months he hath done no business but with my lord's advice, in his chamber, and promises all faithful love to him and service upon all occasions. My lord says that he hath the advantage of being able by his experience to help and advise him, and he believes that that chiefly do invite Sir Harry to this manner of treating him. Now, says my lord, the only and the greatest embarrass that I have in the world is how to behave myself to Sir H. Bennet and my lord Chancellor, in case that there do lie anything under the embers about my lord Bristol, which nobody can tell, for then, says he, I must appear for one or other, and I will lose all I have in the world rather than desert my lord Chancellor, so that, says he, I know not for my life what to do in that case." For Sir H. Bennet's love is come to the height, and his confidence, that he hath given my lord a character, and will oblige my lord to correspond with him. This, says he, is the whole condition of my estate and interest, which I tell you, because I know not whether I shall see you again or no. Then as to the voyage, he thinks it will be of charge to him, and no profit, but that he must not now look after, nor think to increase, but study to make good what he hath, that what is due to him from the wardrobe or elsewhere may be paid, which otherwise would fail, and all a man hath be but small content to him. So we seem to take leave one of another, my lord of me desiring me that I would write to him and give him information upon all occasions in the matters that concern him, which, put together with what he preambled with yesterday, makes me think that my lord do truly esteem me still, and desires to preserve my service to him, which I do bless God for. In the middle of our discourse my lady Crewe came in to bring my lord word that he hath another son, my lady being brought to bed just now. I did not think her time had been so nigh but she's well brought to bed, for which God be praised, and send my lord to study the laying up of something the more. Then with Creed to St. James's, and missing Mr. Coventry to Whitehall, where staying for him in one of the galleries, there comes out of the chair-room Mrs. Stewart, in a most lovely form, with her hair all about her ears, having her picture taken there. There was the king and twenty more, I think, standing by all the while, and a lovely creature she in this dress seemed to be. Thence to the change by coach, and so home to dinner, and then to my office. In the evening Mr. Hill, Andrews, and I to my chamber to sing, which we did very pleasantly, and then to my office again, where very late, and so home. With my mind I bless God, in good state of ease and body of health, only my head at this juncture very full of business, how to get something. Among others what this rogue creed will do before he goes to sea, for I would fain be rid of him, and see what he means to do, for I will then declare myself his firm friend or enemy. Sixteenth. Up in the morning, my head mightily confounded with the great deal of business I have upon me to do, but to the office, and there dispatched Mr. Creed's business pretty well about his bill. But then there comes W. Howe for my lord's bill of imprest for five hundred pounds to carry with him this voyage, and so I was at a loss how to carry myself in it, Creed being there. 
but there being no help i delivered it to them both and let them contend when i perceived they did both endeavour to have it but w howe took it and the other had the discretion to suffer it but i think i cleared myself to creed that it passed not from any practice of mine at noon rose and did some necessary business at the change thence to trinity house to a dinner which sir g carteret makes there as master this year thence to whitehall to the tangier committee and there above my expectation got the business of our contract for the victualling carried for my people viz alsop lanyon and yeavesley and by their promise i do thereby get three hundred pounds per annum to myself which do overjoy me and the matter is left to me to draw up mr lewis was in the gallery and is mightily amazed at it and i believe mr gordon will make some stir about it for he wrote to mr coventry to-day about it to argue why he should for the king's convenience have it but mr coventry most justly did argue freely for them that served cheapest thence walked a while with mr coventry in the gallery and first find that he is mighty cold in his present opinion of mr peter pett for his flagging and doing things so lazily there and he did also surprise me with a question why dean did not bring in their report of the timber of clarendon what he means thereby i know not but at present put him off nor do i know how to steer myself but i must think of it and advise with my lord sandwich thence with creed by coach to my lord sandwich's and there i got mr moore to give me my lord's hand for my receipt of a hundred and nine pounds more of my money of sir g carteret so that then his debt to me will be under five hundred pounds i think this to ease my mind also thence carried him and w howe into london and set them down at sir g carteret's to receive some money and i home and there busy very late and so home to supper and to bed with my mind in pretty good ease my business being in a pretty good condition everywhere seventeenth lord's day all the morning at my office doing business there it raining hard so dined at home alone after dinner walked to my lord's and there found him and much other guests at table at dinner and it seems they have christened his young son to-day called him james i got a piece of cake i got my lord to sign and seal my business about my selling of brampton land which though not so full as i would yet it is as full as i can at present walked home again and there fell to read and by and by comes my uncle white dr burnett and other gentlemen and talked and drank and the doctor showed me the manner of eating turpentine which pleases me well for it is with great ease so they being gone i to supper and to bed eighteenth up and walked to my lord's and there took my leave of him he seeming very friendly to me in as serious a manner as ever in his life and i believe he is very confident of me he sets out this morning for deal then to st james's to the duke and there did our usual business he discourses very freely of a war with holland to begin about winter so that i believe we shall come to it before we went up to the duke sir g carteret and i did talk together in the park about my lord chancellor's business of the timber he telling me freely that my lord chancellor was never so angry with him in all his life as he was for this business in great passion and that when he saw me there he knew what it was about and plots now with me how we may serve my lord which i am mightily glad of and i hope together we may do it thence to westminster to my barber's to have my periwig he lately made me cleansed of its nits which vexed me cruelly that he should put such a thing into my hands here meeting his maid jane that has lived with them so long i talked with her and sending her of an errand to dr clark's did meet her and took her into a little alehouse in brewer's yard and there did sport with her without any knowledge of her though and a very pretty innocent girl she is thence to my lord chancellor's but he being busy i went away to the change and so home to dinner by and by comes creed and i out with him to fleet street and he to mr povey's i to my lord chancellor's and missing him again walked to povey's and there saw his new perspective in his closet povey to my great surprise and wonder did here attack me in his own and mr bland's behalf that i should do for them both for the new contractors for the victualling of the garrison which i am ashamed that he should ask of me nor did i believe that he was a man that did seek benefit in such poor things besides that he professed that he did not believe that i would have any hand myself in the contract and yet here declares that he himself would have profit by it and himself did move me that sir w rider might join and ford with gordon i told him i had no interest in them but i fear they must do something to him for he told me that those of the mole did promise to consider him thence home and creed with me and there he took occasion to own his obligations to me and did lay down twenty pieces in gold upon my shelf in my closet which i did not refuse but wish and expected should have been more but however this is better than nothing and now i am out of expectation and shall henceforward know how to deal with him after discourse of settling his matters here we went out by coach and he light at the temple and there took final leave of me in order to his following my lord to-morrow i to my lord chancellor and discourse his business with him i perceive and he says plainly 
that he will not have any man to have it in his power to say that my lord chancellor did contrive the wronging the king of his timber but yet i perceive he would be glad to have service done him therein and told me sir g carteret hath told him that he and i would look after his business to see it done in the best manner for him of this i was glad and so away thence home and late with my tangier men about drawing up the agreement with us wherein i find much trouble and after doing as much as we could to-night broke up and i to bed nineteenth up and to the office where we sat all the morning at noon dined alone at home after dinner sir w batten and i down by water to woolwich where coming to the rope-yard we are told that mr falkner who hath been ill of a relapse these two days is just now dead we went up to his widow who is sick in bed also the poor woman in great sorrow and entreats our friendship which we shall i think in everything do for her i am sure i will thence to the dock and there in sheldon's garden eat some fruit so to deptford a little and thence home it raining mightily and being cold i doubted my health after it at the office till nine o'clock about sir w warren's contract for masts and then at home with lanyon and yebsley till twelve and past about their contract for tangier wherein they and i differed for i would have it drawn to the king's advantage as much as might be which they did not like but parted good friends however when they were gone i wished that i had forborne any disagreement till i had had their promise to me in writing they being gone i to bed twentieth up and a while to my office and then home with mr dean till dinner discoursing upon the business of my lord chancellor's timber in clarendon park and how to make a report therein without offending him which at last i drew up and hope it will please him but i would to god neither i nor he ever had had anything to have done with it dined together with a good pig and then out by coach to whitehall to the committee for fishing but nothing done it being a great day to-day there upon drawing at the lottery of sir arthur slingsby i got in and stood by the two queens and the duchess of york and just behind my lady castlemaine whom i do heartily adore and good sport it was to see how most that did give their ten pounds did go away with a pair of globes only for their lot and one gentlewoman one mrs fish with the only blank and one i stayed to see drew a suit of hangings valued at four hundred and thirty pounds and they say are well worth the money or near it one other suit there is better than that but very many lots of three and four score pounds i observe the king and queens did get but as poor lots as any else but the wisest man i met with was mr chumley who insured as many as would from drawing of the one blank for twelve pence in which case there was the whole number of persons to one which i think was three or four hundred and so he insured about two hundred for two hundred shillings so that he could not have lost if one of them had drawn it for there was enough to pay the ten pounds but it happened another drew it and so he got all the money he took i left the lottery and went to a play only a piece of it which was the duke's house worse and worse just the same manner of play and writ i believe by the same man as the adventures of five hours very pleasant it was and i begin to admire harris more than ever thence to westminster to see creed and he and i took a walk in the park he is ill and not able yet to set out after my lord but will do to-morrow so home and late at my office and so home to bed this evening being moonshine i played a little late upon my flageolette in the garden but being at westminster hall i met with great news that mrs lane is married to one martin one that serves captain marsh she is gone abroad with him to-day very fine i must have a bout with her very shortly to see how she finds marriage twenty first up and to the office where we sat all the morning among other things making a contract with sir w warren for almost one thousand gottenberg masts the biggest that ever was made in the navy and wholly of my compassing and a good one i hope it is for the king dined at sir w batten's where i have not eat these many months sir g carteret mr coventry sir j minnes and myself there only and my lady a good venison pasty and very merry and pleasant i made myself with my lady and she as much to me this morning to the office comes nicholas osborne mr gordon's clerk to desire of me what piece of plate i would choose to have a hundred pounds or thereabouts bestowed upon me in he having order to lay out so much and out of his freedom with me do of himself come to make this question i a great while urged my unwillingness to take any not knowing how i could serve mr gordon but left it wholly to himself so at noon i find brought home in fine leather cases a pair of the noblest flagons that ever i saw all the days of my life whether i shall keep them or no i cannot tell for it is to oblige me to him in the business of the tangier victualling wherein i doubt i shall not but glad i am to see that i shall be sure to get something on one side or other have it which will so with a merry heart i looked upon them and locked them up after dinner to give my lord chancellor a good account of his business and he is very well pleased therewith and carries himself with great discretion to me without seeming over glad or beholding to me 
and yet I know that he do think himself very well served by me. Thence to Westminster and to Mrs. Lane's lodgings to give her joy, and there suffered me to deal with her as I hope to do, and by and by her husband comes, a sorry simple fellow, and his letter to her which she proudly showed me a simple nonsensical thing. A man of no discourse, and I fear married her to make a prize of, which he is mistaken in, and a sad wife I believe she will prove to him, for she urged me to appoint a time as soon as he is gone out of town to give her a meeting next week. So by water with a couple of cousins of Mrs. Lane's, and set them down at Queen Hive, and I threw bridge home, and there late at business, and so home to supper, and to bed. 22nd. Up into my office, where busy all the morning, at noon to the change, and so home to dinner, and then down by water to Deptford, where coming too soon, I spent an hour in looking round the yard, and putting Mr. Shish to measure a piece or two of timber, which he did most cruelly wrong, and to the king's loss twelve or thirteen shillings in a piece of twenty-eight feet in contents. Thence to the clerk of the checks, from whose house Mr. Faulkner was buried to-day, Sir J. Minnes and I the only principal officers that were there. We walked to church with him, and then I left them without staying the sermon, and straight home by water, and there find, as I expected, Mr. Hill and Andrews, and one slovenly and ugly fellow, Signor Pedro, who sings Italian songs to the Theorbo most neatly, and they spent the whole evening in singing the best piece of music counted of all hands in the world, made by Signor Carissimi, the famous master in Rome. Fine it was indeed, and too fine for me to judge of. They have spoke to Pedro to meet us every week, and I fear it will grow a trouble to me if we once come to bid judges to meet us, especially idle masters, which do a little displease me to consider. They gone comes Mr. Lanyon, who tells me Mr. Also is now become dangerously ill, and fears his recovery, which shakes my expectation of six hundred and thirty pounds per annum by the business. And therefore, bless God for what Mr. Gordon hath sent me, which, from some discourse to-day with Mr. Osborne, swearing that he knows not anything of this business of the victualling, but the contrary, that it is not that moves Mr. Gordon to send it me, for he hath had order for it any time these two months. Whether this be true or no, I know not, but I shall hence with a more confidence keep it. To supper, and to the office a little, and to walk in the garden, the moon shining bright, and fine, warm, fair weather, and so home to bed. 23rd. Up and all the morning at the office, at noon to the change, where I took occasion to break the business of my Lord Chancellor's timber to Mr. Coventry in the best manner I could. He professed to me that, till Sir G. Carteret did speak of it at the table, after our officers were gone to survey it, he did not know that my Lord Chancellor had anything to do with it, but now he says that he had been told by the Duke that Sir G. Carteret had spoke to him about it, and that he had told the Duke that were he in my Lord Chancellor's case, if he were his father, he would rather fling away the gains of two or three thousand pounds than have it said that the timber, which should have been the king's, if it had continued the Duke of Albemarle's, was concealed by us in favour of my Lord Chancellor. For, says he, he is a great man, and all such as he, and he himself particularly, have a great many enemies that would be glad of such an advantage against him. When I told him it was strange that Sir J. Minnes and Sir G. Carteret, that knew my Lord Chancellor's concernment therein, should not at first inform us, he answered me that for Sir J. Minnes he is looked upon to be an old good companion, but by nobody at the other end of the town as any man of business, and that my Lord Chancellor, he dares say, never did tell him of it. Only Sir G. Carteret, he do believe, must needs know it, for he and Sir J. Shaw are the greatest confidants he hath in the world. So for himself, he said, he would not mince the matter, but was resolved to do what was fit, and stand upon his own legs therein, and that he would speak to the Duke, that he and Sir G. Carteret might be appointed to attend my Lord Chancellor in it. All this disturbs me mightily. I know not what to say to it, nor how to carry myself therein, for compliance will discommend me to Mr. Coventry, and a discompliance to my Lord Chancellor. But I think to let it alone, or at least meddle in it as little more as I can. From thence walked toward Westminster, and being in an idle and wanton humour, walked through Fleet Alley, and there stood a most pretty wench at one of the doors. So I took a turn or two, but what by sense of honour and conscience I would not go in, but much against my will took coach and away, and away to Westminster Hall, and there light of Mrs. Lane, and plotted with her to go over the water. So met her white stairs in Channel Row, and over to the old house at Lambeth Marsh, and there eat and drank, and had my pleasure of her twice, she being the strangest woman in talk of love to her husband sometimes, and sometimes again she do not care for him, and yet willing enough to allow me a liberty of doing what I would with her. So spending five shillings or six shillings upon her, I could do what I would, and after an hour's stay and more back again, and set her ashore there again, and I forward to Fleet Street, and called at Fleet Alley, 
not knowing how to command myself, and went in and there saw what formerly I have been acquainted with, the wickedness of these houses, and the forcing a man to present expense. The woman, indeed, is a most lovely woman, but I had no courage to meddle with her for fear of her not being wholesome, and so counterfeiting that I had not money enough, it was pretty to see how cunning she was, would not suffer me to have to do in any manner with her after she saw I had no money, but told me then I would not come again. But she now was sure I would come again, but I hope in God I shall not, for though she be one of the prettiest women I ever saw, yet I fear her abusing me. So desiring God to forgive me for this vanity, I went home, taking some books from my bookseller, and taking his lad home with me, to whom I paid ten pounds for books I have laid up money for, and laid out within these three weeks, and shall do no more a great while, I hope. So to my office writing letters, and then home and to bed, weary of the pleasure I have had to-day, and ashamed to think of it. 24th. Lord's Day. Up in some pain all day from yesterday's passages, having taken cold, I suppose, so stayed within all day, reading of two or three good plays, at night to my office a little, and so home, after supper, to bed. 25th. Up, and with Sir J. Minnes and Sir W. Batten by coach to St. James's, but there, the Duke being gone out, we to my Lord Barclay's chamber, Mr. Coventry being there, and among other things there met with a printed copy of the King's Commission for the repair of Paul's, which is very large, and large power for collecting money, and recovering of all people that had bought or sold formerly anything belonging to the church. And here I find my Lord Mayor of the city set in order before the Archbishop or any nobleman, though all the greatest officers of state are there. But yet I do not hear by my Lord Barclay, who is one of them, that anything is like to come of it. Thence back again homewards, and Sir W. Batten and I to the coffee-house, but no news, only the plague is very hot still, and increases among the Dutch. Home to dinner, and after dinner walked forth, and do what I could, I could not keep myself from going through Fleet Lane, but had the sense of safety and honour not to go in, and the rather being a holiday, I feared I might meet with some people that might know me. Thence to Charing Cross, and there called at Unthanks to see what I owed, but found nothing, and here being a couple of pretty ladies, lodgers in the kitchen, I stayed a little there. Thence to my barber Jervis, who this day buries his child, which it seems was born without a passage behind, so that it never voided anything in the week or fortnight that it has been born. Thence to Mr. Reeves, it coming just now in my head to buy a microscope, but he was not within. So I walked all round that end of the town among the loathsome people and houses, but God be thanked, had no desire to visit any of them. So home, where I met Mr. Lanyon, who tells me Mr. Alsop is past hopes, which will mightily disappoint me in my hopes there, and yet it may be not. I shall think whether it will be safe for me to venture myself or no, and come in as an adventurer. He gone, Mr. Cole, my old Jack Cole, comes to see and speak with me, and his errand in short to tell me that he is giving over his trade. He can do no good in it, and will turn what he has into money and go to sea, his father being dead and leaving him little, if anything. This I was sorry to hear, he being a man of good parts, but I fear debauched. I promised him all the friendship I can do him, which will end in little, though I truly mean it, and so I made him stay with me till eleven at night, talking of old school stories, and very pleasing ones, and truly I find that we did spend our time and thoughts then otherwise than I think boys do now, and I think as well as me thinks that the best are now. He supped with me, and so away, and I to bed, and strange to see how we are all divided that were bred so long at school together, and what various fortunes we have run, some good, some bad." 26th, all the morning at the office, at noon to Anthony Joyce's, to our gossip's dinner. I had sent a dozen and a half of bottles of wine thither, and paid my double share besides, which is eighteen shillings. Very merry we were, and when the women were merry, and rose from table, I above with them, ne'er a man but I, I began discourse of my not getting of children, and prayed them to give me their opinions and advice, and they freely and merrily did give me these ten among them. One, do not hug my wife too hard nor too much. 2. Eat no late suppers. 3. Drink juice of sage. 4. Tent and toast. 5. Wear cool holland drawers. 6. Keep stomach warm and back cool. 7. Upon query whether it was best to do at night or morn, they answered me neither one nor other, but when we had most mind to it. 8. Wife not to go too straight-laced. 9. Myself to drink mum and sugar. 10. Mrs. Ward did give me to change my place. The 3rd, 4th, 6th, 7th and 10th they all did seriously declare, and lay much stress upon them as rules fit to be observed indeed, and especially the last, to lie with our heads where our heels do, or at least to make the bed high at feet and low at head. Very merry all, as much as I could be in such sorry company. Great discourse of the fray yesterday in Moorfields, how the butchers at first did beat the weavers, 
between whom there hath been ever an old competition for mastery, but at last the weavers rallied and beat them. At first the butchers knocked down all for weavers that had green or blue aprons, till they were fain to pull them off and put them in their breeches. At last the butchers were fain to pull off their sleeves, that they might not be known, and were soundly beaten out of the field, and some deeply wounded and bruised, till at last the weavers went out triumphing, calling a hundred pounds for a butcher. I to Mr. Reeves to see a microscope, he having been with me to-day morning, and there chose one which I will have. Thence back and took up young Mrs. Harmon, a pretty bred and pretty humoured woman, whom I could love well, though not handsome, yet for her person and carriage, and black. By the way, met her husband going for her, and set them both down at home, and so home to my office a while, and so to supper, and bed. 27th. Up, and after some discourse with Mr. Duke, who is to be secretary to the fishery, and is now secretary to the committee for trade, who I find a very ingenious man, I went to Mr. Povey's, and there heard a little of his empty discourse, and fain he would have Mr. Gordon been the victualler for Tangier, which none but a fool would say to me, when he knows he hath made it his request to me, to get him something of these men, that now do it. Thence to St. James's, but Mr. Coventry being ill and in bed, I did not stay, but to Whitehall a little, walked up and down, and so home to fit papers against this afternoon, and after dinner to the change a little, and then to Whitehall, where anon the Duke of York came and a committee we had of Tangier, where I read over my rough draft of the contract for Tangier victualling, and acquainted them with the death of Mr. Alsop, which Mr. Lanyon had told me this morning, which is a sad consideration to see how uncertain a thing our lives are, and how little to be presumed of in our greatest undertakings. The words of the contract approved of, and I home, and there came Mr. Lanyon to me, and brought my neighbour, Mr. Andrews, to me, whom he proposes for his partner in the room of Mr. Alsop, and I like well enough of it. We read over the contract together, and discoursed it well over, and so parted, and I am glad to see it once over in this condition again, for Mr. Lanyon and I had some discourse to-day about my share in it, and I hope if it goes on to have my first hopes of three hundred pounds per annum. They gone, I to supper and to bed. This afternoon came my great store of coals in, being to children, so that I may see how long they will last me. 28th. At the office all the morning, dined, after change, at home, and then abroad, and seeing the bondman upon the posts, I consulted my oaths, and find I make it go safely this time without breaking it. I went thither, notwithstanding my great desire to have gone to Fleet Alley, God forgive me, again. There I saw it acted. It is true for want of practice they had many of them forgot their parts a little, but Betterton and my poor Ianthe outdo all the world. There is nothing more taking in the world with me than that play. Thence to Westminster to my barber's, and strange to think how when I find that Jervis himself did intend to bring home my periwig, and not Jane his maid, I did desire not to have it at all, for I have a mind to have her bring it home. I also went to Mr. Blagraves about speaking to him for his kinswoman to come live with my wife, but they are not come to town. And so I home by coach, and to my office, and then to supper, and to bed. My present posture is thus, my wife in the country, and my maid best with her, and all quiet there. I am endeavouring to find a woman for her to my mind, and above all one that understands music, especially singing. I am the willinger to keep one, because I am in good hopes to get two or three hundred pounds per annum extraordinary by the business of the victualling of Tangier. And yet Mr. Alsop, my chief hopes, is dead since my looking after it, and now Mr. Lanyon, I fear, is falling sick too. I am pretty well in health, only subject to wind upon any cold, and then immediate and great pains. All our discourse is of a Dutch war, and I find it is likely to come to it, for they are very high, and desire not to compliment us at all, as far as I hear, but to send a good fleet to Guinea to oppose us there. My Lord Sandwich newly gone to sea, and I, I think, fallen into his very good opinion again, at least he did before his going, and by his letter since, show me all manner of respect and confidence. I am overjoyed in hopes that upon this month's account I shall find myself worth a thousand pounds, besides the rich present of two silver and gilt flagons which Mr. Gordon did give me the other day. I do now live very prettily at home, being most seriously, quietly, and neatly served by my two maids, Jane and the girl Sue, with both of whom I am mightily well pleased. My greatest trouble is the settling of Brampton estate, that I may know what to expect, and how to be able to leave it when I die, so as to be just to my promise to my uncle Thomas and his son. The next thing is this cursed trouble my brother Tom is likely to put us to by his death, forcing us to law with his creditors, among others Dr. Tom Pepys, and that with some shame as trouble and the last how to know in what manner as to saving or spending my father lives, lest they should run me in debt as one of my uncle's executors, and I never the wiser nor better for it. But in all this I hope shortly to be at leisure to consider and inform myself well. 29th. At the office all the morning, dispatching of business, at noon to the change after dinner, 
and thence to Tom Trice about Dr. Pepys's business, and thence it raining turned into Fleet Alley, and there was with cock an hour or so. The jade, whether I would not give her money or not enough, she would not offer to invite to do anything, but on the contrary, saying she had no time, which I was glad of, for I had no mind to meddle with her, but had my end to see what a cunning jade she was to see her impudent tricks and ways of getting money, and raising the reckoning by still calling for things, that it come to six or seven shillings presently. So away home, glad I escaped without any inconvenience, and there came Mr. Hill, Andrews, and Signor Pedro, and great store of music we had. But I begin to be weary of having a master with us, for it spoils me, thinks, the ingenuity of our practice. After they were gone comes Mr. Bland to me, sat till eleven at night with me, talking of the garrison of Tangier, and serving them with pieces of eight. A mind he hath to be employed there, but dares not desire any courtesy of me, and yet would fain engage me to be for him, for I perceive they do all find that I am the busy man to see the king have right done him by inquiring out other bidders. Being quite tired with him, I got him gone, and so to bed. Thirtieth. All the morning at the office, at noon to the change, where great talk of a rich present brought by an East India ship from some of the princes of India, worth to the king seventy thousand pounds in two precious stones. After dinner to the office, and there all the afternoon, making an end of several things against the end of the month, that I may clear all my reckonings to-morrow. Also this afternoon, with great content, I finished the contracts for victualling of Tangier with Mr. Lanyon and the rest, and to my comfort got him and Andrews to sign to the giving me three hundred pounds per annum, by which at least I hope to be a hundred pounds or two the better. Wrote many letters by the post to ease my mind of business, and to clear my paper of minutes, as I did lately oblige myself to clear everything against the end of the month. So at night, with my mind quiet and contented to bed, this day I sent a side of venison and six bottles of wine to Kate Joyce. 31st, Lord's Day, up into church, where I have not been these many weeks. So home and thither, inviting him yesterday, comes Mr. Hill, at which I was a little troubled, but made up all very well, carrying him with me to Sir J. Minnes, where I was invited, and all our families, to a venison pasty. Here good cheer and good discourse. After dinner, Mr. Hill and I to my house, and there to music all the afternoon. He being gone, in the evening I to my accounts, and to my great joy, and with great thanks to Almighty God, I do find myself most clearly worth a thousand and fourteen pounds, the first time that ever I was worth a thousand pounds before, which is the height of all that ever I have for a long time pretended to. But by the blessing of God upon my care, I hope to lay up something more in a little time, if this business of the victualling of Tangier goes on as I hope it will. So with praise to God for this state of fortune that I am brought to as to wealth, and my condition being as I have at large set it down two days ago in this book, I home to supper and to bed, desiring God to give me the grace to make good use of what I have, and continue my care and diligence to gain more. End of July August of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664, by Samuel Pepys. August, 1664. August 1st. Up, my mind very light from my last night's accounts, and so up and with Sir J. Minnes, Sir W. Batten, and Sir W. Penn to St. James's, where, among other things, having prepared with some industry every man a part this morning, and no sooner, for fear they should either consider of it or discourse of it one to another, Mr. Coventry did move the Duke and obtain it that one of the clerks of the clerk of the Acts should have an addition of thirty pounds a year, as Mr. Turner hath, which I am glad of, that I may give T. Hater twenty pounds and keep ten pounds towards a boy's keeping. Thence Mr. Coventry and I to the attorney's chamber at the temple, but not being there we parted and I home, and there with great joy told T. Hater what I had done, with which the poor wretch was very glad, though his modesty would not suffer him to say much. So to the coffee-house, and there all the house, full of the victory, General Souche, who is a Frenchman, a soldier of fortune, commanding part of the German army, hath had against the Turk, killing four thousand men, and taking most extraordinary spoil. Thence, taking up Harmon and his wife, carried them to Antony Joyce's, where we had my venison in a pasty well done. But, Lord, to see how much they made of it, as if they had never eaten any before. And very merry we were, but will most troublesomely so. And I find he and his wife have a most wretched life one with another. But we took no notice, but were very merry, as I could be in such company. But Mrs. Harmon is a very pretty humoured wretch, whom I could love with all my heart, being so good and innocent company. Thence to Westminster to Mr. Blagrave's, and there, after singing a thing or two over, I spoke to him about a woman for my wife, and he offered me his kinswoman, which I was glad of. But she is not at present well, but however I hope to have her. 
thence to my Lord Chancellor's, and thence with Mr. Coventry, who appointed to meet me there, and with him to the Attorney General, and there with Sir Phil Warwick, consulted of a new commission to be had through the broad seal to enable us to make this contract for Tangier Vittling. So home, and there talked long with Will about the young woman of his family which he spoke of for to live with my wife, but though she hath very many good qualities, yet being a neighbour's child, and young, and not very staid, I dare not venture of having her, because of her being able to spread any report of our family upon any discontent among the heart of our neighbours, so that my dependence is upon Mr. Blagrave, and so home to supper and to bed. Last night at twelve o'clock I was waked with knocking at Sir W. Penn's door, and what was it but people's running up and down to bring him word, that his brother, who hath been a good while, it seems sick, is dead. Second. At the office all the morning, at noon dined, and then to the change, and there walked two hours or more with Sir W. Warren, who after much discourse in general of Sir W. Batten's dealings, he fell to talk how everybody must live by their places, and that he was willing, if I desired it, that I should go shares with him in anything that he deals in. He told me again and again, too, that he confesses himself my debtor, too, for my service and friendship to him, in his present great contract of masts, and that between this and Christmas, he shall be in stock and will pay it me. This I like well, but do not desire to become a merchant, and therefore put it off, but desire time to think of it. Thence to the king's playhouse, and there saw Bartholomew Fair, which do still please me, and is, as it is acted, the best comedy in the world, I believe. I chance to sit by Tom Killigrew, who tells me that he is setting up a nursery, that is, is going to build a house in Moorfields, wherein he will have common plays acted. But four operas it shall have in the year, to act six weeks at a time, where we shall have the best scenes and machines, the best music, and everything as magnificent as is in Christendom, and to that end hath sent for voices and painters and other persons from Italy. Thence homeward called upon my Lord Marlborough, and so home into my office, and then to Sir W. Penn, and with him and our fellow officers and servants of the house, and none else, to church to lay his brother in the ground, wherein nothing handsome at all, but that he lays him under the communion table in the chancel, about nine at night, so home and to bed. Third, up betimes and set some joiners on work to new lay my floor in our wardrobe, which I intend to make a room for music. Thence abroad to Westminster, among other things to Mr. Blagrave's, and there had his consent for his kinswoman to come to be with my wife for her woman, at which I am well pleased and hope she may do well. Thence to Whitehall to meet with Sir G. Carteret about hiring some ground to make our mast dock at Dupford, but being council morning failed but met with Mr. Coventry, and he and I discoursed of the likeliness of a Dutch war, which I think is very likely now, for the Dutch do prepare a fleet to oppose us at Guinea, and he do think we shall, though neither of us have a mind to it, fall into it of a sudden, and yet the plague do increase among them, and is got into their fleet, and Opdam's own ship, which makes it strange they should be so high. Thence to the change, and thence home to dinner, and down by water to Woolwich to the rope-yard, and there visited Mrs. Faulkner, who tells me odd stories of how Sir W. Penn was rewarded by her husband with a gold watch, but seems not certain of what Sir W. Batten told me, of his daughter having a life given her in eighty pounds per annum, for his helping him to his place, and yet cost him a hundred and fifty pounds to Mr. Coventry besides. He did much advise, it seems, Mr. Faulkner not to marry again, expressing that he would have him make his daughter his heir, or words to that purpose, and that that makes him, she thinks, so cold in giving her any satisfaction, and that W. Bodham hath publicly said, since he came down thither to be clerk of the rope-yard, that it hath this week cost him a hundred pounds, and would be glad that it would cost him but half as much more for the place, and that he was better before than now, and that if he had been to have bought it, he would not have given so much for it. Now I am sure that Mr. Coventry hath again and again said that he would take nothing, but would give all his part in it freely to him, that so the widow might have something. What the meaning of this is, I know not, but that Sir W. Penn do get something by it. Thence to the dockyard, and there saw the new ship in great forwardness. So home and to supper, and then to the office where late, Mr. Bland and I talking about Tangier business, and so home to bed. Fourth, up betimes and to the office, fitting myself against a great dispute about the East India Company, which spent afterwards with us all the morning. At noon dined with Sir W. Penn, a piece of beef only, and I counterfeited a friendship and mirth which I cannot have with him. Yet out with him by his coach, and he did carry me to a play and pay for me at the king's house, which is the rival ladies, a very innocent and most pretty, witty play. I was much pleased with it, and it being given me, I look upon it as no breach to my oath. 
here we hear that clun one of their best actors was the last night going out of town after he had acted the alchemist wherein was one of his best parts that he acts to his country house set upon and murdered one of the rogues taken an irish fellow it seems most cruelly butchered and bound the house will have a great miss of him thence visited my lady sandwich who tells me my lord fitzharding is to be made a marquis thence home to my office late and so to supper and to bed fifth up very betimes and set my plasterer to work about whiting and colouring my music room which having with great pleasure seen done about ten o'clock i dressed myself and so mounted upon a very pretty mare sent me by sir w warren according to his promise yesterday and so through the city not a little proud god knows to be seen upon so pretty a beast and to my cousin w joyce's who presently mounted too and he and i out of town toward highgate in the way at kentish town showing me the place and manner of clun's being killed and laid in a ditch and yet was not killed by any wounds having only one in his arm but bled to death through his struggling he told me also the manner of it of his going home so late from drinking with his whore and manner of having it found out thenceforward to barnet and there drank and so by night to stevenage it raining a little but not much and there to my great trouble find that my wife was not come nor any stamford coach gone down this week so that she cannot come so vexed and weary and not thoroughly out of pain neither in my old parts i after supper to bed and after little sleep w joyce comes in his shirt into my chamber with a note and a messenger from my wife that she was come by york coach to bigglesworth and would be with us to-morrow morning so mightily pleased at her discreet action in this business i with peace to sleep again till next morning so up and sick here lay dean honeywood last night i met and talked with him this morning and a simple priest he is though a good well-meaning man w joyce and i to a game at bowls on the green there till eight o'clock and then comes my wife in the coach and a coach full of women only one man riding by gone down last night to meet a sister of his coming to town so very joyful drank there not lighting and we mounted and away with them to welling and there light and dine very well and merry and glad to see my poor wife here very merry as being weary i could be and after dinner out again and to london in our way all the way the mightiest merry that a couple of young gentlemen come down to meet the same gentlewoman that ever i was in my life and so w joyce too to see how one of them was horsed upon a hard trotting sorrel horse and both of them soundly weary and galled but it is not to be set down how merry we were all the way we light in hoban and by another coach my wife and maid home and i by horseback and found all things well and most mighty neat and clean so after welcoming my wife a little to the office and so home to supper and then weary and not very well to bed seventh lord's day lay long caressing my wife and talking she telling me sad stories of the ill improvident disquiet and sluttish manner that my father and mother and paul live in the country which troubles me mightily and i must seek to remedy it so up and ready and my wife also and then down and i showed my wife to her great admiration and joy mr gordon's present of plate the two flagons which indeed are so noble that i hardly can think that they are yet mine so blessing god for it we down to dinner mighty pleasant and so up after dinner for a while and then to whitehall walked thither having at home met with a letter of captain cook's with which he had sent a boy for me to see whom he did intend to recommend to me i therefore went and there met and spoke with him he gives me great hopes of the boy which pleases me and at chapel i there met mr blagrave who gives a report of the boy and he showed me him, and I spoke to him, and the boy seems a good willing boy to come to me, and I hope will do well. I am to speak to Mr. Townsend to hasten his clothes for him, and then he is to come. So I walked homeward and met with Mr. Spong, and he with me as far as the old exchange, talking of many ingenuous things, music, and at last of glasses, and I find him still the same ingenuous man that ever he was, and do among other fine things tell me that by his microscope of his own making, he do discover that the wings of a moth is made just as the feathers of the wing of a bird, and that most plainly and certainly. While we were talking came by several poor creatures carried by, by constables, for being at a conventicle. They go like lambs without any resistance. I would to God they would either conform or be more wise and not be catched. Thence parted with him, mightily pleased with his company, and away homeward, calling at Dan Rawlinson, and supped there with my uncle White, and then home and eat again for form's sake with her, and then to prayers and to bed eighth up and abroad with sir w batten by coach to st james's where by the way he did tell me how sir j minnes would many times arrogate to himself the doing of that that all the board have equal share in 
and more that to himself which he hath had nothing to do in, and particularly the late paper given in by him to the duke, the translation of a Dutch print concerning the quarrel between us and them, which he did give as his own when it was Sir Richard Ford's holy. Also he told me how Sir W. Penn, it falling in our discourse touching Mrs. Faulkner, was at first very great for Mr. Coventry to bring him in guests, and that at high rates for places, and very open was he to me therein. After business done with the Duke, I home to the coffee-house, and so home to dinner, and after dinner to hang up my fine pictures in my dining-room, which makes it very pretty. And so my wife and I abroad to the King's Playhouse, she giving me her time of the last month, she having not seen any then, so my vow is not broke at all, it costing me no more money than it would have done upon her, had she gone both her times that were due to her. Here we saw Flora's figuries. I never saw it before, and by the most ingenuous performance of the young jade Flora, it seemed as pretty a pleasant play as ever I saw in my life. So home to supper, and then to my office late, Mr. Andrews and I to talk about our victualling commission, and then he being gone, I to set down my four days past journals and expenses, and so home to bed. Ninth, up into my office, and there we sat all the morning. At noon home, and there by appointment, Mr. Blagrave came and dined with me, and brought a friend of his of the chapel with him. Very merry at dinner, and then up to my chamber, and there we sung a psalm or two of Laws's. Then he and I a little talk by ourselves of his kinswoman, that is, to come to live with my wife, who is to come about ten days hence, and I hope will do well. They gone, I to my office, and there my head being a little troubled, with the little wine I drank, though mixed with beer, but it may be a little more than I used to do, and yet I cannot say so. I went home and spent the afternoon with my wife talking, and then in the evening a little to my office, and so home to supper and to bed. This day comes the news that the emperor hath beat the Turk, killed the Grand Vizier and several great Bassas, with an army of eighty thousand men killed and routed, with some considerable loss of his own side, having lost three generals and the French forces all cut off almost, which is thought as good a service to the Emperor as beating the Turk almost, for had they conquered they would have been as troublesome to him. Tenth, up and being ready abroad to do several small businesses, among others to find out one to engrave my tables upon my new sliding rule with silver plates, it being so small that Brown that made it cannot get one to do it. So I find out Cocker, the famous writing-master, and get him to do it, and I set an hour by him to see him design it all. And strange it is to see him with his natural eyes to cut so small at his first designing it, and read it all over, without any missing, when for my life I could not, with my best skill, read one word or letter of it. But it is use. But he says that the best light for his life to do a very small thing by, contrary to Chaucer's words to the sun, that he should lend his light to them that small seal's grave, it should be by an artificial light of a candle set to advantage, as he could do it. I find the fellow by his discourse very ingenuous, and among other things a great admirer and well-read in all our English poets, and undertakes to judge of them all, and that not impertinently. Well pleased with his company, and better with his judgment upon my rule. I left him, and home, whither Mr. Dean by agreement came to me and dined with me, and by chance Gunner Batters's wife. After dinner, Dean and I had great discourse again about my Lord Chancellor's timber, out of which I wish I may get well. Then I to Cocker's again, and sat by him with good discourse again for an hour or two, and then left him, and by agreement with Captain Silas Taylor, my old acquaintance at the Exchequer, to the post officer, to hear some instrument music of Mr. Birchenshaw's before my Lord Brunkard and Sir Robert Murray. I must confess whether it be that I hear it but seldom, or that really voice is better, but so it is that I found no pleasure at all in it, and methought two voices were worth twenty of it. So home to my office a while, and then to supper, and to bed. Eleventh. Up, and through pain, to my great grief, forced to wear my gown to keep my legs warm. At the office all the morning, and there a high dispute against Sir W. Batten and Sir W. Penn about the breadth of canvas again, they being for the making of it narrower, I and Mr. Coventry and Sir J. Minnes for the keeping it broader. So home to dinner, and by and by comes Mr. Creed, lately come from the Downs, and dined with me. I show him a good countenance, but love him not for his base ingratitude to me. However, abroad, carried my wife to buy things at the new exchange, and so to my lady sandwiches, and there merry, talking with her a great while, and so home, whither comes Cocker with my rule, which she hath engraved to admiration, for goodness and smallness of work. It cost me fourteen shillings the doing, and mightily pleased I am with it. By and by, he gone, comes Mr. Moore, and stayed talking with me a great while about my lord's businesses, which I fear will be in a bad condition for his family, if my lord should miscarry at sea. 
He gone, I lay to my office, and cannot forbear admiring and consulting my new rule, and so home to supper and to bed. This day, for a wager before the king, my lords of Castlehaven and Arran, a son of my lord of Ormond's, they two alone did run down and kill a stout buck in St. James's Park. Twelfth, up and all the morning busy at the office with Sir W. Warren about a great contract for New England masts, where I was very hard with him, even to the making him angry, but I thought it fit to do it as well as just for my own and the king's behalf. At noon to the change a little, and so to dinner, and then out by coach, setting my wife and maid down, going to Stevens the silversmith, to change some old silver lace, and to go buy a new silk lace for a petticoat. I to Whitehall, and did much business at a Tangier committee, where, among other things, speaking about propriety of the houses there, and how we ought to let the Portugueses I have right done them, as many of them as continue, or did sell the houses while they were in possession, and something further in their favour, the Duke, in an anger I never observed in him before, did cry, says he, All the world rides us, and I think we shall never ride anybody. Thence home, and though late, yet Pedro being there, he sang a song and parted. I did give him five shillings, but find it burdensome, and so will break up the meeting. At night is brought home our poor fancy, which to my great grief continues lame still, so that I wish she had not been brought ever home again, for it troubles me to see her. Thirteen. Up, and before I went to the office comes my tailor, with a coat I have made to wear within doors, purposely to come no lower than my knees, for by my wearing a gown within doors comes all my tenderness about my legs. There comes also Mr. Reeve, with a microscope and scotoscope. For the first I did give him five pounds ten shillings, a great price, but a most curious bauble it is, and he says as good, nay, the best he knows in England, and he makes the best in the world. The other he gives me, and is of value, and a curious curiosity it is to look objects in a dark room with. Mightily pleased with this, I to the office where all the morning. There offered by Sir W. Penn his coach to go to Epsom and carry my wife, I stepped out and bade my wife make her ready, but being not very well and other things advising me to the contrary, I did forbear going, and so Mr. Creed dining with me, I got him to give my wife and me a play this afternoon, lending him money to do it, which is a fallacy that I have found now once to avoid my vow with, but never to be more practised, I swear, and to the new play at the Duke's house of Henry V, a most noble play, writ by my Lord Orrery, wherein Betterton, Harris, and Ianthus parts are most incomparably wrote and done, and the whole play the most full of height and raptures of wit and sense that have I heard, having but one incongruity, or what did not please me in it, that is, that King Harry promises to plead for Tudor to their mistress, Princess Catherine of France, more than when it comes to it he seems to do, and Tudor refused by her with some kind of indignity, not with a difficulty and honour, that it ought to have been done in to him. Thence home and to my office, wrote by the post, and then to read a little in Dr. Power's book of discovery by the microscope, to enable me a little how to use, and what to expect from my glass. So to supper and to bed. Fourteenth, Lord's Day. After long lying discoursing with my wife, I up, and comes Mr. Holliard to see me, who concurs with me that my pain is nothing but cold in my legs breeding wind, and got only by my using to wear a gown, and that I am not at all troubled with any ulcer, but my thickness of water comes from my overheat in my back. He gone comes Mr. Herbert, Mr. Honeywood's man, and dined with me, a very honest, plain, well-meaning man I think him to be, and by his discourse and manner of life, the true emblem of an old, ordinary serving man. After dinner up to my chamber, and made an end of Dr. Power's book of the microscope, very fine and to my content, and then my wife and I with great pleasure, but with great difficulty, before we could come to find the manner of seeing anything by my microscope. At last did, with good content, though not so much as I expect when I come to understand it better. By and by comes W. Joyce in his silk suit and cloak lined with velvet. Stayed talking with me, and I very merry at it. He supped with me, but a cunning, crafty fellow he is, and dangerous to displease, for his tongue spares nobody. After supper, I up to read a little, and then to bed. Fifteenth. Up, and with Sir Jaminus by coach to St. James's, and there did our business with the Duke, who tells us more and more signs of a Dutch war, and how we must presently set out a fleet for Guinea, for the Dutch are doing so, and there, I believe, the war will begin. Thence home with him again, in our way he talking of his cures abroad, while he was with the king as a doctor, and above all men, the pox. And among others, Sir J. Denham, he told me he had cured, after was come to an ulcer all over his face, to a miracle. 
To the coffee-house I, and so to the change a little, and then home to dinner with Creed, whom I met at the coffee-house, and after dinner by coach set him down at the temple, and I and my wife to Mr. Blagrave's. They being none of them at home, I to the hall, leaving her there, and thence to the trumpet, whither came Mrs. Lane, and there begins the sad story how her husband, as I feared, proves not worth a farthing, and that she is with child and undone if I do not get him a place. I had my pleasure here of her, and she, like an impudent jade, depends upon my kindness to her husband, but I will have no more to do with her, let her brew as she has baked, seeing she would not take my counsel about Hawley. After drinking be parted, and I to Blagrave's, and there discourse with Mrs. Blagrave about her kinswoman, who it seems is sickly even to franticness sometimes, and among other things chiefly from love and melancholy upon the death of her servant, insomuch that she telling us all most simply and innocently, I fear she will not be able to come to us with any pleasure, which I am sorry for, for I think she would have pleased us very well. In comes he, and so to sing a song, and his niece with us, but she sings very meanly, so through the hall and thence by coach home, calling by the way at Charon Cross, and there saw the great Dutchman that is come over, under whose arm I went with my hat on, and could not reach higher than his eyebrows with the tip of my fingers, reaching as high as I could. He is a comely and well-made man, and his wife a very little but pretty comely Dutch woman. It is true he wears pretty high-heeled shoes, but not very high, and do generally wear a turban which makes him show yet taller than really he is, though he is very tall, as I have said before. Home to my office, and then to supper, and then to my office again late, and so home to bed. My wife and I troubled, that we do not speed better in this business of her woman. 16th. Wakened about two o'clock this morning with the noise of thunder, which lasted for an hour, with such continued lightnings, not flashes, but flames, that all the sky and air was light, and that for a great while, not a minute's space between new flames all the time, such a thing as I never did see, nor could have believed had ever been in nature and being put into a great sweat with it, could not sleep till all was over, and that accompanied with such a storm of rain as I never heard in my life. I expected to find my house in the morning overflowed with the rain breaking in, and that much hurt must needs have been done in the city with this lightning, but I find not one drop of rain in my house, nor any news of hurt done. But it seems it has been here, and all up and down the country hereabouts, the like tempest, Sir W. Batten saying much of the greatness thereof at Epsom. Up and all the morning at the office, at noon busy at the change about one business or other, and then home to dinner, and so to my office all the afternoon very busy, and so to supper anon, and then to my office again a while, collecting observations out of Dr. Power's book of microscopes, and so home to bed, very stormy weather to-night for wind. This day we had news that my Lady Pen is landed and coming hither, so that I hope the family will be in better order and more neat than it hath been. 17th up and going to sir w batten to speak to him about business he did give me three bottles of his epsom water which i drank and it wrought well with me and did give me many good stools and i found myself mightily cooled with them and refreshed thence i to mr honeywood and my father's old house but he was gone out and there i stayed talking with his man herbert who tells me how langford and his wife are very foul-mouthed people and will speak very ill of my father calling him old rogue in reference to the hard pennyworths he sold him of his goods, where the rogue need not have bought any of them, so that I am resolved he shall get no more money by me, but it vexes me to think that my father should be said to go away in debt himself, but that I will cause to be remedied whatever comes of it. Thence to my lord Crewe, and there with him a little while. Before dinner talked of the Dutch war, and find that he do much doubt that we shall fall into it without the money or consent of Parliament, that is expected, or the reason of it that is fit to have for every war. Dined with him, and after dinner talked with Sir Thomas Crew, who told me how Mr. Edward Montague is for ever blown up, and now quite out with his father again, to whom he pretended that his going down was, not that he was cast out of the court, but that he had leave to be absent a month, but now he finds the truth. Thence to my lady Sandwich, where by agreement my wife dined, and after talking with her I carried my wife to Mr. Pierce's and left her there, and so to Captain Cook's, but he was not at home. But I there spoke with my boy Tom Edwards, and directed him to go to Mr. Townsend, with whom I was in the morning, to have measure taken of his clothes to be made him there out of the wardrobe, which will be so done, and then I think he will come to me. Thence to Whitehall, and after long staying, there was no committee of the fishery, as was expected. Here I walked long with Mr. Pierce, who tells me the king do still sup every night with my Lady Castlemaine, who he believes has lately slunk a great belly away, for from very big she is come to be down again. 
thence to mrs pierce's and with her and my wife to see mrs clark where with him and her very merry discoursing of the late play of henry v which they conclude the best that ever was made but confess with me that tudor's being dismissed in the manner he is is a great blemish to the play i am mightily pleased with the doctor for he is the only man i know that i could learn to pronounce by which he do the best that ever i heard any man then home and to the office late and so to supper and to bed my lady pen came hither first to-night to sir w pen's lodgings eighteenth lay too long in bed till eight o'clock then up and mr reeve came and brought an anchor and a very fair lodestone he would have had me bought it and a good stone it is but when he saw that i would not buy it he said he would leave it for me to sell for him by and by he comes to tell me that he had present occasion for six pounds to make up a sum and that he would pay me in a day or two but i had the unusual wit to deny him and so by and by we parted and i to the office where busy all the morning sitting dined alone at home my wife going to-day to dine with mrs pierce and thence with her and mrs clark to see a new play the court secret i busy all the afternoon toward evening to westminster and there in the hall a while and then to my barber willing to have any opportunity to speak to jane but wanted it so to mrs pierce's who was come home and she and mrs clark busy at cards so my wife being gone home i home calling by the way at the wardrobe and met mr townsend mr moore and others at the tavern thereby and thither i to them and spoke with mr townsend about my boy's clothes which he says shall be soon done and then i hope i shall be settled when i have one in the house that is musical so home and to supper and then a little to my office and then home to bed my wife says the place she saw is the worst that ever she saw in her life nineteenth up into the office where mr coventry and sir w pen and i sat all the morning hiring of ships to go to guinea where we believe the war with holland will first break out at noon dined at home and after dinner my wife and i to sir w pen's to see his lady the first time who is a well-looked fat short old dutchwoman but one that hath been heretofore pretty handsome and is now very discreet and i believe hath more wit than her husband here we stayed talking a good while and very well pleased i was with the old woman at first visit so away home and i to my office my wife to go see my aunt white newly come to town creed came to me and he and i out among other things to look out a man to make a case for to keep my stone that i was cut off in and he to buy daniel's history which he did but i missed of my end so parted upon ludgate hill and i home and to the office where busy till supper and home to supper to a good dish of fritters which i bespoke and were done much to my mind then to the office a while again and so home to bed the news of the emperor's victory over the turks is by some doubted but by most confessed to be very small though great of what was talked which was eighty thousand men to be killed and taken of the turk side twentieth up and to the office a while but this day the parliament meeting only to be adjourned to november which was done accordingly we did not meet and so i forth to bespeak a case to be made to keep my stone in which will cost me twenty-five shillings thence i walked to cheapside there to see the effect of a fire there this morning since four o'clock which i find in the house of mr bois that married dr fuller's niece who are both out of town leaving only a maid and man in town it begun in their house and hath burned much and many houses backward though none forward and that in the great uniform pile of buildings in the middle of cheapside i am very sorry for them for the doctor's sake thence to the change and so home to dinner and thence to sir w batten's whither sir richard ford came the sheriff who hath been at this fire all the while and he tells me upon my question that he and the mayor were there as it is their duties to be not only to keep the peace but they have power of commanding the pulling down of any house or houses to defend the whole city by and by comes in the common crier of the city to speak with him and when he was gone says he you may see by this man the constitution of the magistracy of this city that this fellow's place i dare give him if he will be true to me one thousand pounds for his profits every year and expect to get five hundred pounds more to myself thereby when says he i and myself am forced to spend many times as much by and by came mr coventry and so we met at the office to hire ships for guinea and that done broke up i to sir w batten's there to discourse with mrs falkner who hath been with sir w pen this evening after mr coventry had promised her half what w bottom had given him for his place but sir w pen though he knows that and that mr bottom hath said that his place hath cost him one hundred pounds and would a hundred pounds more yet is he so high against the poor woman that he will not hear to give her a farthing but it seems to listen after a lease where he expects mr falkner hath put in his daughter's life and he is afraid that that is not done and did tell mrs falkner that he would see it and know what is done therein in spite of her 
when poor wretch, she neither do nor can hinder him the knowing it. Mr. Coventry knows of this business of the lease, and I believe do think of it as well as I, but the poor woman is gone home without any hope, but only Mr. Coventry's own nobleness. So I to my office and wrote many letters, and so to supper, and to bed. 21st. Lord's Day. Waked about four o'clock with my wife, having a looseness, and people's coming in the yard to the pump to draw water several times, so that fear of this day's fire made me fearful, and called Bess and sent her down to sea, and it was Griffin's maid for water to wash her house. So to sleep again, and then lay talking till nine o'clock. So up and drunk three bottles of Epsom water, which wrought well with me. I all the morning and most of the afternoon after dinner putting papers to rights in my chamber, and the like in the evening till night at my office, and renewing and writing fair over my vows. So home to supper, prayers, and to bed. Mr. Coventry told us the Duke was gone ill of a fit of an egg to bed, so we sent this morning to see how he do. 22nd. Up and abroad, doing very many errands to my great content, which lay as burdens upon my mind and memory. Home to dinner, and so to Whitehall, setting down my wife at her father's, and I to the Tangier Committee, where several businesses I did to my mind, and with hopes thereby to get something. So to Westminster Hall, where by appointment I had made I met with Dr. Tom Pepys, but avoided all discourse of difference with him, though much against my will. And he, like a doting coxcomb as he is, said he could not but demand his money, and that he would have his right, and that let all anger be forgot, and such sorry stuff, nothing to my mind, but only I obtained this satisfaction. That he told me about Sturbridge last was twelve months or two years he was at Brampton, and there my father did tell him that what he had done for my brother in giving him his goods and setting him up as he had done, was upon condition that he should give my brother John twenty pounds per annum, which he charged upon my father, he tells me an answer, as a great deal of hard measure that he should expect that with him that had a brother so able as I am to do that for him. This is all that he says he can say as to my father's acknowledging that he had given Tom his goods. He says his brother Roger will take his oath that my father hath given him thanks for his counsel for his giving of Tom his goods, and setting him up in the manner that he hath done, but the former part of this he did not speak fully so bad nor is certain what he could say. So we walked together to my cousin Joyce's, where my wife stayed for me, and then I home and her by coach, and so to my office, then to supper and to bed. 23rd. Lay long, talking with my wife, and angry a while about her desiring to have a French maid, all of a sudden, which I took to arise from yesterday's being with her mother. But that went over, and friends again, and so she be well qualited, I care not much whether she be French or no, so a Protestant. Thence to the office, and at noon to the change, were very busy getting ships for Guinea and for Tangier. So home to dinner, and then abroad all the afternoon doing several errands, to comply with my oath of ending many businesses before Bartholomew's day, which is two days hence. Among others I went into New Bridewell, in my way to Mr. Cole, and there I saw the new model, and it is very handsome. Several at work, among others, one pretty whore brought in last night, which works very lazily. I did give them sixpence to drink, and so away, to graze in, but miss Mr. Cole, and so home we'd called at Harmon's, and there bespoke some chairs for a room, and so home, and busy late, and then to supper, and to bed. The Dutch East India fleet are now come home safe, which we are sorry for. Our fleets on both sides are hastening out to Guinea. 24th. Up by six o'clock, and to my office with Tom Hayter, dispatching business in haste. At nine o'clock to Whitehall, about Mr. Mays's business at the council, which stands in an ill condition still. Thence to Gray's Inn, but missed of Mr. Cole, the lawyer. And so walked home, calling among the joiners in Wood Street, to buy a table, and bade in many places, but did not buy it, till I come home to see the place where it is to stand, to judge how big it must be. So, after change, home, and a good dinner, and then to Whitehall to a committee of the fishery, where my Lord Craven and Mr. Gray mightily against Mr. Creed's being joined in the warrant for secretary with Mr. Duke. However, I did get it put off till the Duke of York was there, and so broke up doing nothing. So walked home, and there saw one suit of clothes made for my boy, and linen set out, and I think to have him the latter end of this week, and so home, Mr. Creed walking the greatest part of the way with me, advising what to do in his case about his being secretary to us, in conjunction with Duke, which I did give him the best I could, and so home into my office, where very much business, and then home to supper, and to bed. 25th. Up and to the office, after I had spoke to my tailor, Langford, who came to me about some work, desiring to know whether he knew of any debts that my father did owe of his own in the city. He tells me, no, not any. I did on purpose try him, because of what words he and his wife have said of him, as Herbert told me the other day, and further did desire him, 
that if he knew of any, or could hear of any, that he should bid them come to me, and I would pay them. For I would not that, because he do not pay my brother's debts, that therefore he should be thought to deny the payment of his own. All the morning at the office busy, at noon to the change, among other things busy to get a little by the hire of a ship for Tangier. So home to dinner, and after dinner comes Mr. Cook to see me. It is true he was kind to me at sea, in carrying messages to and fro to my wife from sea, but I did do him kindnesses too, and therefore I matter not much to compliment or make any regard of his thinking me to slight him, as I do for his folly about my brother Tom's mistress. After dinner and some talk with him, I to my office, there busy, till by and by Jack Noble came to me, to tell me that he had cave in prison, and that he would give me and my father good security, that neither we nor any of our family should be troubled with the child, for he could prove that he was fully satisfied for him, and that if the worst came to the worst, the parish must keep it. That cave did bring the child to his house, but they got it carried back again, and that thereupon he put him in prison. When he saw that I would not pay him the money, nor made anything of being secured against the child, he then said that then he must go to law, not himself, but come in as a witness for cave against us. I could have told him that he could bear witness that cave is satisfied, or else there is no money due to himself, but I let alone any such discourse, only getting as much out of him as I could. I perceive he is a rogue, and hath inquired into everything, and consulted with Dr. Pepys, and that he thinks as Dr. Pepys told him that my father, if he could, would not pay a farthing of the debts, and yet I made him confess that, in all his lifetime, he never knew my father to be asked for money twice, nay, not once, all the time he lived with him, and that for his own debts he believed he would do so still, but he meant only for those of Tom. He said now that Randall and his wife and the midwife could prove from my brother's own mouth that the child was his, and that Tom had told them the circumstances of time, upon November 5th at night, that he got it on her. I offered him, if he would secure my father against being forced to pay the money again, I would pay him, which at first he would do, give his own security, and when I asked more than his own, he told me yes he would, and those able men, subsidy men, but when we came by and by to discourse of it again, he would not then do it, but said he would take his course, and join with Cave and release him, and so we parted. However, this vexed me so as I could not be quiet, but took coach to go speak with Mr. Cole, but met him not within, so back, buying a table by the way, and at my office late, and then home to supper and to bed, my mind disordered about this roguish business. In everything else, I thank God, well at ease. 26th. Up by five o'clock, which I have not been many a day, and down by water to Deptford, and there took in Mr. Pumpfield, the rope-maker, and down with him to Woolwich to view Clothier's cordage, which I found bad, and stopped the receipt of it. Then to the rope-yard, and there, among other things, discourse with Mrs. Faulkner, who tells me that she has found the writing, and Sir W. Penn's daughter is not put into the lease for her life as he expected, and I am glad of it. Thence to the dockyard, and there saw the new ship in very great forwardness, and so by water to Deptford a little, and so home and shifting myself to the change, and there did business, and thence down by water to Whitehall by the way, at the Three Cranes, putting into an alehouse, and eat a bit of bread and cheese. There I could not get into the park, and so was fain to stay in the gallery over the gate to look to the passage into the park, into which the king hath forbid of late anybody's coming, to watch his coming that had appointed me to come, which he did by and by with his lady, and went to Gardener's Lane, and there, instead of meeting with one that was handsome and could play well, as they told me, she is the ugliest beast, and plays so basely as I never heard anybody, so that I should loathe her being in my house. However, she took us by and by, and showed us indeed some pictures at one Heisman's, a picture-drawer, a Dutchman, which is said to exceed Lily, and indeed there is both of the queens and maids of honour, particularly Mrs. Stewart's in a buff doublet like a soldier, as good pictures, I think, as ever I saw. The queen is drawn in one like a shepherdess, and the other like St. Catherine, most like and most admirably. I was mightily pleased with this sight indeed, and so back again to their lodgings where I left them. But before I went, this mare that carried me, whose name I know not, but that they call him Sir John, a pitiful fellow, whose face I have long known, but upon what score I know not, but he could have the confidence to ask me to lay down money for him to renew the lease of his house, which I did give ear to there, because I was there receiving a civility from him, but shall not part with my money. There I left them, and I by water home, where at my office busy late, then home to supper, and so to bed. This day my wife tells me Mr. Penn, Sir William's son, is come back from France, and come to visit her. A most modish person grown, she says, a fine gentleman. 27th. Up and to the office, where all the morning. At noon to the change, and there almost made my bargain about a ship for Tangier, which will bring me in a little profit with Captain Taylor. Off the change with Mr. Cutler and Sir W. Ryder to Cutler's house, and there had a very good dinner, and two or three pretty young ladies of their relations there. Thence to my case-maker for my stone case, and had it to my mind, and cost me twenty-four shillings, which is a great deal of money, 
but it is well done and pleases me. So, doing some other small errands, I home, and there find my boy Tom Edwards come, sent me by Captain Cook, having been bred in the King's Chapel these four years. I propose to make a clerk of him, and if he deserves well, to do well by him. Spent much of the afternoon to set his chamber in order, and then to the office, leaving him at home, and late at night, after all business was done, I called Will, and told him my reason of taking a boy, and that it is of necessity, not out of any unkindness to him, nor should be to his injury, and then talked about his landlord's daughter to come to my wife, and I think it will be. So home, and find my boy a very schoolboy that talks innocently and impertinently, but at present it is a sport to us, and in a little time he will leave it. So sent him to bed, he saying that he used to go to bed at eight o'clock, and then all of us to bed, myself pretty well pleased with my choice of a boy. All the news this day is that the Dutch are, with twenty-two sail of ships of war, cruising up and down about Ostend, at which we are alarmed. My Lord Sandwich has come back into the Downs with only eight sail, which is, or may be a prey to the Dutch, if they knew our weakness and inability to set out any more speedily. 28th, Lord's Day. Up the first time I have had great while. Home to dine, and with my boy alone to church, anybody to attend me to church or dinner, and there met Creed, who, and we marry together, as his learning is such and judgment that I cannot but be pleased with it. After dinner I took him to church, into our gallery with me, but slept the best part of the sermon, which was a most silly one. So he and I to walk to the change a while, talking from one pleasant discourse to another, and so home, and thither came my uncle White and aunt, and supped with us mighty merry and Creed lay with us all night, and so to bed, very merry to think how Mr. Holliard, who came in this evening to see me, makes nothing but proving as a most clear thing that Rome is Antichrist. Twenty-ninth, up betimes, intending to do business at my office by five o'clock, but going out met at my door Mr. Hughes come to speak with me about office business, and told me that as he came this morning from Deptford he left the King's Yard a fire. So I presently took a boat and down, and there found by God's providence the fire out, but if there had been any wind, it must have burned all our stores, which is a most dreadful consideration. But leaving all things well, I home, and out abroad doing many errands, Mr. Creed also out, and my wife to her mother's, and Creed and I met at my lady Sandwich's, and there dined. But my lady is become as handsome, I think, as ever she was, and so good and discreet a woman I know not in the world. After dinner I to Westminster to Jervis's a while, and so doing many errands by the way, and necessary ones, I home and thither came the woman with her mother, which our will recommends to my wife. I like her well, and I think will please us. My wife and they agreed, and she is to come the next week, at which I am very well contented, for then I hope we shall be settled. But I must remember that never since I was housekeeper I ever lived so quietly, without any noise or one angry word almost, as I have done since my present maids Bess, Jane, and Susan came and were together. Now I have taken a boy, and I am taking a woman, I pray God we may not be worse. But I will observe it." After being at my office a while, home to supper, and to bed. 30th. Up and to the office, where sat long, and at noon to dinner at home. After dinner comes Mr. Penn to visit me, and stayed an hour talking with me. I perceive something of learning he hath got, but a great deal, if not too much, of the vanity of the French garb and affected manner of speech and gait. I fear all real profit he hath made of his travel will signify little. So he gone, I to my office, and there very busy till late at night, and so home to supper, and to bed. 31st, up by five o'clock, and to my office, where T. Hater and Will met me, and so we dispatched a great deal of my business as to the ordering my papers and books which were behind hand. All the morning very busy at my office, at noon home to dinner, and there my wife hath got me some pretty good oysters, which is very soon, and the soonest, I think, I ever eat any. After dinner I up to hear my boy play upon a lute, which I have this day borrowed of Mr. Hunt and indeed the boy would, with little practice, play very well upon the lute, which pleases me well. So by coach to the Tangier Committee, and there have another small business, by which I may get a little small matter of money. Stayed but little there, and so home into my office, where late casting up my monthly accounts, and blessed be God, find myself worth one thousand and twenty pounds, which is still the most I ever was worth. So home into bed. Prince Rupert, I hear this day, is to go to command this fleet going to Guinea against the Dutch, I doubt few will be pleased with his going, being accounted an unhappy man. My mind at good rest, only my father's troubles with Dr. Pepys and my brother Tom's creditors in general do trouble me. I have got a new boy that understands music well, as coming to me from the King's Chapel, and I hope will prove a good boy, and my wife and I are upon having a woman, which for her content I am contented to venture upon the charge of again, and she is one that our will finds out for us, and understands a little music, and I think will please us well, only her friends live too near us. 
pretty well in health, since I left off wearing of a gown within doors all day, and then go out with my legs into the cold, which brought me daily pain. End of August September of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664, by Samuel Pepys. September, 1664. September 1st. A sad rainy night. Up and to the office, we're busy all the morning. At noon to the change, and thence brought Mr. Pierce, the surgeon, and Creed, and dined very merry and handsomely. But my wife not being well of those, she not with us. And we cut up the great cake Moorcock lately sent us, which is very good. They gone, I to my office, and they're very busy till late at night, and so home to supper and to bed. Second, up very betimes, and walked, my boy with me, to Mr. Cole's. And after long waiting below, he being under the barber's hands, I spoke with him. And he did give me much hopes of getting my debt that my brother owed me, and also that things would go well with my father. But going to his attorneys, that he directed me to, they tell me both that though I could bring my father to a confession of a judgment, yet he knowing that there are specialties out against him, he is bound to plead his knowledge of them to me before he pays me, or else he must do it in his own wrong. I took a great deal of pains this morning in the thorough understanding hereof, and hope that I know the truth of our case, though it be but bad, yet better than to run spending money and all to no purpose. However, I will inquire a little more. Walked home, doing very many errands by the way to my great content, and at the change met and spoke with several persons about serving us with pieces of eight at Tangier. So home to dinner above stairs, my wife not being well of those, in bed. I dined by her bedside, but I got her to rise and abroad with me by coach to Bartholomew Fair, and our boy with us, and there shewed them and myself the dancing on the ropes, and several other the best shows, but pretty it is to see how our boy carries himself so innocently clownish as would make one laugh. Here till late and dark, then up and down to buy combs for my wife to give her maids, and then by coach home, and there at the office set down my day's work, and then home to bed. Third, I have had a bad night's rest to-night, not sleeping well, as my wife observed, and once or twice she did wake me, and I thought myself to be mightily bit with fleas, and in the morning she chid her maids for not looking the fleas a days, but when I rose, I found that it is only the change of the weather from hot to cold, which, as I was two winters ago, do stop my pores, and so my blood tingles and itches all day all over my body, and so continue to-day all the day long, just as I was then, and if it continues to be so cold, I fear I must come to the same pass. But sweating cured me then, and I hope, and am told, will this also. At the office, sat all the morning, dined at home, and after dinner to Whitehall, to the fishing committee, but not about four of us met, which could do nothing. And a sad thing it is to see so great a work so ill followed, for at this pace it can come to anything at first sight. Mr. Hill came to tell me that he had got a gentlewoman for my wife, one Mrs. Ferrabosco, that sings most admirably. I seem glad of it, but I hear she is too gallant for me, and I am not sorry that I miss her. Thence to the office, setting some papers right, and so home to supper, and to bed, after prayers. Fifth. Up and to St. James's, and there did our business with the Duke, where all our discourse of war in the highest measure. Prince Rupert was with us, who is fitting himself to go to sea in the Henrietta. And afterwards in Whitehall I met him and Mr. Gray, and he spoke to me, and in other discourse says he, God damn me, I can answer but for one ship, and in that I will do my part, for it is not in that as in an army, where a man can command everything. By and by to a committee for the fishery, the Duke of York there, where... After Duke was made secretary, we fell to name a committee, whereof I was willing to be one, because I would have my hand in the business to understand it, and be known in doing something in it. And so, after cutting out work for the committee, we rose, and I to my wife to unthanks, and with her from shop to shop, laying out near ten pounds this morning in clothes for her. And so I to the change, where a while, and so home and to dinner, and thither came W. Bowyer, and dined with us, but strange to see how he could not endure onions in sauce to lamb, but was overcome with the sight of it, and so was forced to make his dinner of an egg or two. He tells us how Mrs. Lane is undone by her marrying so bad, and desires to speak with me, which I know is wholly to get me to do something for her, to get her husband a place, which he is in no wise fit for. After dinner, down to Woolwich with a galley, 
and then to Deptford, and so home, all the way reading Sir J. Suckling's Aglora, which methinks is but a mean play, nothing of design in it. Coming home, it is strange to see how I was troubled to find my wife, but in a necessary compliment, expecting Mr. Penn to see her, who had been there, and was by her people denied, which, he having been three times, she thought not fit he should be any more, but yet even this did raise my jealousy presently, and much vex me. However, he did not come, which pleased me, and I to supper and to the office till nine o'clock or thereabouts, and so home to bed. My aunt James had been here to-day with Kate Joyce twice to see us. The second time my wife was at home, and they, it seems, are going down to Brampton, which I am sorry for, for the charge that my father will be put to. But it must be borne with, and my mother has a mind to see them. But I do condemn myself mightily for my pride and contempt of my aunt and kindred, that are not so high as myself, that I have not seen her all this while, nor invited her all this while. Sixth, up and to the office where we sat all the morning, at noon home to dinner, then to my office, and there waited, thinking to have had Bagwell's wife come to me about business, that I might have talked with her, but she came not. So I to Whitehall by coach with Mr. Andrews, and there I got his contract for the victualling of Tangier signed and sealed by us there, so that all the business is well over, and I hope to have made a good business of it, and to receive one hundred pounds by it the next week, for which God be praised. Thence to W. Joyce's and Antony's, to invite them to dinner to meet my Aunt James at my house, and the rather because they are all to go down to my father the next week, and so I would be a little kind to them before they go. So home, having called upon Doll, our pretty changewoman, for a pair of gloves trimmed with yellow ribbon, to match the petticoat my wife bought yesterday, which cost me twenty shillings, but she is so pretty that, God forgive me, I could not think it too much, which is a strange slavery that I stand in to beauty, that I value nothing near it. So going home, and my coach stopping in Newgate Market over against a poulterer's shop, I took occasion to buy a rabbit, but it proved a deadly old one when I came to eat it, as I did do after an hour being at my office, and after supper again there till past eleven at night. So home and to bed. This day Mr. Coventry did tell us how the Duke did receive the Dutch ambassador the other day, by telling him that, whereas they think us in jest, he believes that the prince, Rupert, which goes in this fleet to Guinea, will soon tell them that we are in earnest, and that he himself will do the like here, in the head of the fleet here at home, and that for the méchants, which he told the duke there were in England, which did hope to do themselves good by the king's being at war, says he, the English have ever united all this private difference to attend foreign, and that Cromwell, notwithstanding the méchants in his time, which were the cavaliers, did never find them interrupt him in his foreign businesses, and that he did not doubt but to live to see the Dutch as fearful of provoking the English under the government of a king, as he remembers them to have been under that of a coquin. I writ all this story to my Lord Sandwich to-night into the Downs, it being very good and true, word for word from Mr. Coventry to-day. 7th. Lay long to-day, pleasantly discoursing with my wife about the dinner we are to have for the Joyces a day or two hence, then up and with Mr. Margetts to Limehouse to see his ground and rope-yard there, which is very fine, and I believe we shall employ it for the navy, for the king's grounds are not sufficient to supply our defence if a war comes. Thence back to the change, where great talk of the forwardness of the Dutch, which puts us all to a stand, and particularly myself for my lord Sandwich, to think him to lie where he is for a sacrifice, if they should begin with us. So home and creed with me, and to dinner, and after dinner I out to my office, taking in Bagwell's wife, who I knew waited for me, but company came to me so soon that I could have no discourse with her, as I intended, of pleasure. So anon abroad with Creed, walked to Bartholomew Fair, this being the last day, and there saw the best dancing on the ropes that I think I ever saw in my life, and so all say. And so by coach home, where I find my wife hath had her head dressed by her woman Mercer, which is to come to her to-morrow, but my wife being to go to a christening to-morrow, she came to do her head up to-night. So a while to my office, and then to supper, and to bed." Eighth, up and to the office, where busy all the morning. At noon, dined at home, and I by water down to Woolwich by a galley, and back again in the evening. All haste made in setting out this guinea fleet, but yet not such as will ever do the king's business if we come to a war. My wife this afternoon, being very well dressed by her new woman, Mary Mercer, a decayed merchant's daughter that our will helps us to, did go to the christening of Mrs. Mills, the parson's wife's child, where she never was before. After I was come home, Mr. Povey came to me, and took me out to supper to Mr. Bland's, who is making now all haste to be gone for Tangier. Here pretty merry, and good discourse, fain to admire the knowledge and experience of Mrs. Bland, 
for I think as good a merchant as her husband. I went home, and there find Mercer, whose person I like well, and I think will do well, at least I hope so. So to my office a while, and then to bed. Ninth. Up, and to put things in order against dinner, I out and bought several things, among others a dozen of silver salts. Home, and to the office, where some of us met a little, and then home, and at noon comes my company, namely Antony and Will Joyce and their wives, my Aunt James, newly come out of Wales, and my cousin Sarah Giles. Her husband did not come, and by her I did understand afterwards that it was because he was not yet able to pay me the forty shillings she had borrowed a year ago of me. I was as merry as I could, giving them a good dinner, but W. Joyce did so talk that he made everybody else dumb, but only laugh at him. I forgot there was Mr. Harmon and his wife, my aunt, a very good harmless woman. All their talk is of her and my two she-cousin, Joyce's and Will's little boy Will, who was also here to-day, down to Brampton to my father's next week, which will be trouble and charge to them. But, however, my father and mother desire to see them, and so let them. They eyed mightily my great cupboard of plate, I this day putting my two flagons upon my table, and indeed it is a fine sight, and better than ever I did hope to see of my own. Mercer dined with us at table, this being her first dinner in my house. After dinner left them and to Whitehall, where a small Tangier committee, and so back again home, and there my wife and Mercer and Tom and I sat till eleven at night, singing and fiddling. And a great joy it is to see me master of so much pleasure in my house, that it is, and will be still, I hope, a constant pleasure to me to be at home. The girl plays pretty well upon the harpsichord, but only ordinary tunes, but hath a good hand, sings a little, but hath a good voice and ear. My boy, a brave boy, sings finely, and is the most pleasant boy at present, while his ignorant boy's tricks last, that ever I saw. So to supper, and with great pleasure, to bed. 10th. Up into the office, where we sat all the morning, and I am much troubled to think what the end of our great sluggishness will be, for we do nothing in this office like people able to carry on a war. We must be put out, or other people put in. Dined at home, and then my wife and I and Mercer to the Duke's house, and there saw the rivals, which is no excellent play, but good acting in it, especially Gosnell comes, and sings and dances finely, but for all that fell out of the key, so that the music could not play to her afterwards, and so did Harris also go out of the tune to agree with her. Thence home, and late writing letters, and this night I received by will a hundred and five pounds, the first fruits of my endeavours in the late contract for victualling of Tangier, for which God be praised, for I can with a safe conscience say that I have therein saved the king five thousand pounds per annum, and yet got myself a hope of three hundred pounds per annum, without the least wrong to the king. So to supper, and to bed. Eleventh, Lord's Day. Up into church in the best manner I have gone a good while, that is to say, with my wife and her woman Mercer along with us, and Tom my boy waiting on us. A dull sermon. Home, dined, left my wife to go to church alone, and I walked in haste being late to the abbey at Westminster, according to promise to meet Jane Welsh, and there wearily walked, expecting her till six o'clock from three, but no Jane came, which vexed me. Only part of it I spent with Mr. Blagrave walking in the abbey, he telling me the whole government and discipline of Whitehall Chapel, and the caution now used against admitting any debauched persons, which I was glad to hear, though he tells me there are persons bad enough. Thence going home went by Jarvis's, and there stood Jane at the door, and so I took her in and drank with her, her master and mistress being out of doors. She told me how she could not come to me this afternoon, but promised another time. So I walked home contented with my speaking with her, and walked to my Uncle White's, where they were all at supper, and among others comes fair Mrs. Margaret White, who indeed is very pretty. So after supper, home to prayers and to bed. This afternoon, it seems, Sir J. Minnis fell sick at church, and going down the gallery stairs, fell down dead, but came to himself again, and is pretty well. Twelfth. Up and to my cousin Antony Joyce's, and there took leave of my Aunt James and both cousins, their wives, who are this day going down to my father's by coach. I did give my aunt twenty shillings to carry as a token to my mother, and ten shillings to Paul. Thence by coach to St. James's, and there did our business as usual with the Duke, and saw him with great pleasure play with his little girl, like an ordinary private father of a child. Thence walked to Joseph's, where I took Jane in the shop alone, and there heard of her, her master and mistress were going out. So I went away, and came again half an hour after. In the meantime went to the abbey, and there went in to see the tombs with great pleasure. Back again to Jane, and there upstairs and drank with her, and stayed two hours with her, kissing her, but nothing more. Anon took boat, and by water to the neat houses over against Foxhall, to have seen greater ex dive, which Jervis and his wife were gone to see, and there I found them, and did it the rather for a pretence for my having been so long at their house. But being disappointed of some necessaries to do it, I stayed not, but back to Jane, 
but she would not go out with me. So I to Mr. Creed's lodgings, and with him walked up and down in the new exchange, talking mightily of the convenience and necessity of a man's wearing good clothes, and so after eating a mess of cream I took leave of him, he walking with me as far as Fleet Conduit, he offering me upon my request to put out some money for me into Backwell's hands at six per cent interest, which he seldom gives, which I will consider of being doubtful of trusting any of these great dealers because of their mortality, but then the convenience of having one's money at an hour's call is very great. Thence to my uncle White's, and there supped with my wife, having given them a brave barrel of oysters of Povey's giving me. So home and to bed. Thirteenth. Up and to the office, where sat busy all morning, dined at home, and after dinner to Fishmonger's Hall, where we met the first time upon the fishery committee, and many good things discoursed of concerning making of farthings, which was proposed as a way of raising money for this business, and then that of lotteries, but with great confusion. But I hope we shall fall into greater order. So home again into my office, where after doing business, home, and to a little music, after supper, and so to bed. Fourteenth. Up, and wanting some things that should be laid ready for my dressing myself, I was angry, and one thing after another made my wife give best warning to be gone, which the jade, whether out of fear or ill-nature or simplicity, I know not, but she took it and asked leave to go forth to look a place, and did, which vexed me to the heart, she being as good a natured wench as ever we shall have, but only forgetful. At the office all the morning, and at noon to the change, and there went off with Sir W. Warren, and took occasion to desire him to lend me a hundred pounds, which he said he would let me have with all his heart presently, as he had promised me a little while ago to give me for my pains in his two great contracts for masts one hundred pounds, and that this should be it. To which end I did move it to him, and by this means I hope to be possessed of the hundred pounds presently within two or three days. So home to dinner, and then to the office, and down to Blackwall by water to view a place found out for laying of masts, and I think it will be most proper. So home, and there find Mr. Penn come to visit my wife, and stayed with them till sent for to Mr. Bland's, whither by appointment I was to go to supper, and against my will left them together, but, God knows, without any reason of fear in my conscience of any evil between them, but such is my natural folly. Being thither come, they would needs have my wife, and so Mr. Bland and his wife, the first time she was ever at my house or my wife at hers, very civilly went forth and brought her and W. Penn, and there Mr. Povey and we supped nobly and very merry, it being to take leave of Mr. Bland, who is upon going soon to Tangier. So late home, and to bed. 15th. At the office all the morning, then to the change, and so home to dinner, where Llewellyn dined with us, and after dinner many people came in and kept me all the afternoon, among other the master and wardens of Surgeon's Hall, who stayed arguing their cause with me. I did give them the best answer I could, and after their being two hours with me, parted, and I to my office to do business, which is much on my hands, and so late home to supper, and to bed. Sixteenth. Up betimes and to my office, where all the morning very busy putting papers to rights. And among other things, Mr. Gordon coming to me, I had a good opportunity to speak to him about his present, which hitherto hath been a burden to me that I could not do it, because I was doubtful that he meant it as a temptation to me to stand by him in the business of Tangier Vittling. But he clears me it was not, and that he values me and my proceedings therein very highly, being but what became me, and that what he did was for my old kindnesses to him in dispatching of his business, which I was glad to hear, and with my heart in good rest and great joy parted and to my business again. At noon to the change, where by appointment I met Sir W. Warren, and afterwards to the Sun Tavern, where he brought to me, being all alone, one hundred pounds in a bag, which I offered him to give him my receipt for, but he told me, no, it was my own, which he had a little while since promised me, I was glad that, as I had told him two days since, it would now do me courtesy, and so most kindly he did give it me, and I, as joyfully, even out of myself, carried it home in a coach, he himself expressly taking care that nobody might see this business done, though I was willing enough to have carried a servant with me to have received it, but he advised me to do it myself. So home with it, and to dinner. After dinner I forth with my boy to buy several things, stools and andirons and candlesticks, etc., household stuff, and walked to the mathematical instrument maker in Moorfields, and bought a large pair of compasses, and there met Mr. Pargeter, and he would needs have me drink a cup of horse-radish ale, which he and a friend of his troubled with the stone have been drinking of, which we did, and then walked into the fields as far almost as Sir G. Whitmore's, all the way talking of Russia, which he says is a sad place, and though Moscow is a very great city, yet it is from the distance between house and house, and few people compared with this, and poor sorry houses, 
the emperor himself living in a wooden house, his exercise only flying a hawk at pigeons, and carrying pigeons ten or twelve miles off, and then laying wages which pigeon shall come soonest home to her house. All the winter within doors, some few playing at chess, but most drinking their time away. Women live very slavishly there, and it seems in the emperor's court no room hath above two or three windows, and those the greatest not a yard wide or high for warmth in winter time, and that the general cure for all diseases there is their sweating-houses, or people that are poor they get into their ovens being heated, and there lie. Little learning among things of any sort, not a man that speaks Latin unless the secretary of state by chance. Mr. Pargerton and I walked to the change together, and there parted, and so I to buy more things, and then home, and after a little at my office, home to supper and to bed. This day old Hardwick came, and redeemed a watch he had left with me in pawn for forty shillings, seven years ago, and I let him have it. Great talk that the Dutch will certainly be out this week, and will sail directly to Guinea, being convoyed out of the channel with forty-two sail of ships. 17th. Up and to the office, where Mr. Coventry very angry to see things go so coldly as they do, and I must needs say it makes me fearful every day of having some change of the office, and the truth is, I am of late a little guilty of being remiss myself of what I used to be, but I hope I shall come to my old pass again, my family being now settled again. Dined at home and to the office, where late busy in setting all my businesses in order, and I did a very great and a very contenting afternoon's work. This day my Aunt White sent my wife a new scarf, with a compliment for the many favours she had received of her, which is the several things we have sent her. I am glad enough of it, for I see my uncle is so given up to the Whites that I hope for little more of them. So home to supper and to bed. 18th, Lord's Day. Up and to church, all of us. At noon comes Antony and W. Joyce, their wives being in the country with my father, and dined with me very merry as I can be in such company. After dinner walked to Westminster, tiring them by the way, and so left them, Antony in Cheapside, and the other in the Strand, and there spent all the afternoon in the cloisters as I had agreed with Jane Welsh, but she came not, which vexed me, staying till five o'clock, and then walked homeward, and by coach to the old exchange, and thence to my Aunt White's, and invited her and my uncle to supper, and so home. And by and by they came, and we eat a brave barrel of oysters Mr. Povey sent me this morning, and very merry at supper, and so to prayers and to bed. Last night it seems my Aunt White did send my wife a new scarf, laced, as a token for her many givings to her. It is true now and then we give them some toys, as oranges, etc., but my aim is to get myself something more from my uncle's favour than this. 19th. Up, my wife and I having a little anger about her woman already, she thinking that I take too much care of her at table to mind her, my wife, of cutting for her, but it's soon over, and so up, and with Sir W. Batten and Sir W. Penn to St. James's, and there did our business with the Duke, and thence homeward straight, calling at the coffee-house, and there had very good discourse with Sir Blunt and Dr. Whistler about Egypt and other things. So home to dinner, my wife having put on to-day her winter new suit of moi, which is handsome, and so after dinner I did give her fifteen pounds to lay out in linen and necessaries for the house, and to buy a suit for Paul, and I myself to Whitehall to a Tangier committee, where Colonel Reams hath brought us so full and methodical an account of all matters there, that I never have no hope to see the like of any public business while I live again. The committee up, I to Westminster to Jervis's and spoke with Jane, who I find cold and not so desirous of a meeting as before, and it is no matter, I shall be the freer from the inconvenience that might follow thereof, besides offending God Almighty and neglecting my business. So by coach home and to my office where late, and so to supper and to bed. I met with Dr. Pierce to-day, who, speaking of Dr. Fraser's being so earnest to have such a one, one Collins, go surgeon to the prince's person, will have him go in his terms, and with so much money put into his hands, he tells me, when I was wondering that Fraser should order things with the prince in that confident manner, that Fraser is so great with my Lady Castlemaine and Stuart and all the ladies at court, in helping to slip their calves when there is occasion, and with the great men, in curing of their claps, that he can do what he please with the king, in spite of any man, and upon the same score with the prince, they all having more or less occasion to make use of him. Sir G. Carteret tells me this afternoon that the Dutch are not yet ready to set out, and by that means to lose a good wind which would carry them out and keep us in, and moreover he says that they begin to boggle in the business, and he thinks may offer terms of peace for all this, and seems to argue that it will be well for the king too, and I pray God send it. Colonel Reams did, among other things, this day tell me how it is clear that, 
if my lord Tiviot had lived, he would have quite undone Tangier, or designed himself to be master of it. He did put the king upon most great, chargeable, and unnecessary works there, and took the course industriously to deter all other merchants but himself to deal there, and to make both king and all others pay what he pleased for all that was brought thither. Twentieth. Up into the office, where we sat all the morning, at noon to the change, and there met by appointment with Captain Points, who hath some place or title to a place, belonging to gaming, and so I discoursed with him about the business of our improving of the lotteries to the king's benefit, and that of the fishery, and had some light from him in the business, and shall, he says, have more in writing from him. So home to dinner, and then abroad to the fishing committee at Fishmongers Hall, and there sat and did some business considerable, and so up and home, and there late at my office doing much business, and I find with great delight that I am come to my good temper of business again. God continue me in it. So home to supper, it being washing day, and to bed. 21st. Up and by coach to Mr. Povey's, and there got him to sign the payment of Captain Taylor's bills for the remainder of freight for the Eagle, wherein I shall be gainer about thirty pounds. Thence with him to Westminster by coach to Houseman's, the great picture-drawer, and saw again very fine pictures, and have his promise for Mr. Povey's sake to take pains in what picture I shall set him about, and I think to have my wife's. But it is a strange thing to observe, and fit for me to remember, that I am at no time so unwilling to part with money as when I am concerned in the getting of it most, as I thank God of late I have got more in this month, viz. near two hundred and fifty, than ever I did in half a year before in my life, I think. Thence to Whitehall with him, and so walked to the old exchange, and back to Povey's to dinner, where great and good company. Among others, Sir John Skeffington, whom I knew at Magdalen College, a fellow commoner, my fellow pupil, but one with whom I had no great acquaintance, he being then, God knows, much above me. Here I was afresh delighted with Mr. Povey's house and pictures of perspective, being strange things to think how they do delude one's eye, that methinks it would make a man doubtful of swearing that ever he saw anything. Thence with him to St. James's, and so to Whitehall, to a Tangier committee, and hope I have light of another opportunity of getting a little money, if Sir W. Warren will use me kindly for deals to Tangier, and with the hopes went joyfully home, and there received Captain Taylor's money, received by will to-day, out of which, as I said above, I shall get above thirty pounds. So with great comfort to bed after supper. By discourse this day, I have great hopes from Mr. Coventry that the Dutch and we shall not fall out. 22nd. Up and at the office all the morning. To the change at noon, and among other things, discourse with Sir William Warren, what I might do to get a little money by carrying of deals to Tangier, and told him the opportunity I have there of doing it, and he did give me some advice, though not so good as he would have done at any other time of the year, but such as I hope to make good use of, and get a little money by. So to Sir G. Carteret's to dinner, and he and I and Captain Cock all alone and good discourse, and thence to a committee of Tangier at Whitehall, and so home, where I found my wife not well, and she tells me she thinks she is with child, but I neither believe nor desire it. But God's will be done. So to my office late, and home to supper and to bed, having got a strange cold in my head by flinging off my hat at dinner and sitting with the wind in my neck. 23rd. My cold and pain in my head increasing, and the palate of my mouth falling. I was in great pain all night. My wife also was not well, so that a maid was fain to sit up by her all night. Lay long in the morning, at last up, and amongst others comes Mr. Fuller, that was the wit of Cambridge, and prevaricator in my time and stayed all the morning with me, discoursing, and his business to get a man discharged, which I did do for him. Dined with little heart at noon, in the afternoon, against my will to the office, where Sir G. Carteret and we met about an order of the council, for the hiring him a house, giving him a thousand pound fine, and seventy pounds per annum for it. Here Sir J. Minnes took occasion, in the most childish and most unbeseeming manner, to reproach us all, but most himself, that he was not valued as controller among us, nor did anything but only set his hand to paper, which is but too true, and everybody had a palace, and he no house to lie in, and wished he had, but as much to build him a house with, as we have laid out in carved work. It was to no end to oppose, but all bore it, and after laughed at him for it. So home, and late reading The Siege of Rhodes to my wife, and then to bed, my head being in great pain, and my palate still down. 24th. Up and to the office, where all the morning busy, then home to dinner, and so after dinner comes one Phillips, who is concerned in the lottery, and from him I collected much concerning that business. I carried him in my way to Whitehall, and set him down at Somerset House. 
Among other things he told me that Monsieur Dupuis, that is so great a man at the Duke of York's, and this man's great opponent, is a knave and by quality but a tailor. To the Tangier Committee, and there I opposed Colonel Legg's estimate of supplies of provisions to be sent to Tangier, till all were ashamed of it, and he fain, after all his good husbandry and seeming ignorance and joy to have the king's money saved, yet afterwards he discovered all his design to be to keep the furnishing of these things to the officers of the ordnance. But Mr. Coventry seconded me, and between us we shall save the king some money in the year. In one business of deals, in five hundred and twenty pounds, I offer to save a hundred and seventy-two pounds, and yet purpose getting money to myself by it. So home and to my office, and business being done, home to supper and so to bed, my head and throat being still out of order mightily. This night Prior of Brampton came and paid me forty pounds, and I find this poor painful man is the only thriving and purchasing man in the town almost. We were told to-day of a Dutch ship of three or four hundred tons, where all the men were dead of the plague, and the ship cast ashore at Gottenburg. Twenty-fifth, Lord's Day. Up, and my throat being yet very sore, and my head out of order, we went not to church, but I spent all the morning reading of The Mad Lovers, a very good play. And at noon comes Harmon and his wife, whom I sent for to meet the Joyces, but they came not. It seems Will has got a fall off his horse and broke his face. However, we were as merry as I could in their company, and we had a good chine of beef, but I had no taste nor stomach through my cold, and therefore little pleased with my dinner. It raining, they sat talking with us all the afternoon. So anon they went away, and then I to read another play, The Custom of the Country, which is a very poor one, methinks. Then to supper, prayers, and bed. 26. Up pretty well again, but my mouth very scabby, my cold being gone away, so that I was forced to wear a great black patch, but that would not do much good, but it happens we did not go to the Duke to-day. And so I stayed at home busy all the morning. At noon after dinner to the change, and thence home to my office again, where busy, well employed till ten at night, and so home to supper and to bed. My mind a little troubled, that I have not of late kept up myself so brisk in business, but mind my ease a little too much, and my family upon the coming of Mercer and Tom, so that I have not kept company, nor appeared very active with Mr. Coventry. But now I resolve to settle to it again, not that I have idled all my time, but as to my ease something. So I have looked a little too much after Tangier and the fishery, and that in the sight of Mr. Coventry, but I have good reason to love myself for serving Tangier, for it is one of the best flowers in my garden. 27th. Lay long, sleeping, it raining and blowing very hard, then up and to the office, my mouth still being scabby and a patch on it, at the office all the morning, at noon dined at home, and so after dinner, Llewellyn dining with me, and in my way talking about Deering, to the fishing committee, and had there very many fine things argued, and I hope some good will come of it. So home, where my wife having, after all her merry discourse of being with child, her months upon her, is gone to bed. I to my office, very late doing business, then home to supper, and to bed. To-night Mr. T. Trice and Piggott came to see me, and desire my going down to Brampton Court, where, for Piggott's sake, for whom it is necessary I should go, I would be glad to go, and will, contrary to my purpose, endeavour it. But having now almost one thousand pounds, if not above, in my house, I know not what to do with it, and that will trouble my mind to leave in the house, and I not at home. 28th. Up and by water with Mr. Tucker down to Woolwich, first to do several businesses of the King's, then on board Captain Fisher's ship, which we hire to carry goods to Tangier. All the way, going and coming, I reading and discoursing over some papers of his, which he, poor man, having some experience, but greater conceit of it than is fit, did at the King's first coming over make proposals of, ordering in a new manner the whole revenue of the kingdom, but God knows, a most weak thing." However, one paper I keep wherein he do state the main branches of the public revenue fit to consider and remember. So home, very cold and fearful of having got some pain, but thanks be to God, I was well after it. So to dinner, and after dinner by coach to Whitehall, thinking to have met at a committee of Tangier, but nobody being there but my Lord Rutherford, he would needs carry me and another Scotch lord to a play, and so we saw, coming late, part of the general, my Lord Orrery's, Broghill, second play. But Lord! To see how no more either in word, sense, or design it is to his Harry V is not imaginable, and so poorly acted, though in finer clothes, is strange. And here I must confess breach of a vow in appearance. But I not desiring it, but against my will, and my oath being to go neither at my own charge nor at another's, as I had done by becoming liable to give them another, as I am to Sir W. Penn and Mr. Creed. But here I neither know which of them paid for me, nor, if I did, am I obliged ever to return the like, 
or did it by desire or with any willingness, so that with a safe conscience I do think my oath is not broke, and judge God Almighty will not think it otherwise. Thence to W. Joyce's, and there found my aunt and cousin Mary come home from my father's with great pleasure and content, and thence to Kate's, and found her also mightily pleased with her journey, and their good usage of them, and so home, troubled in my conscience at my being at a play. But at home I found Mercer playing on her viol, which is a pretty instrument, and so I to the viol and singing till late, and so to bed. My mind at a great loss how to go down to Brampton this week to satisfy Pigot, but what with the fears of my house, my money, my wife, and my office, I know not how in the world to think of it, Tom Hater being out of town, and I having near a thousand pounds in my house. Twenty-ninth. Up and to the office, where all the morning, dined at home, and creed with me. After dinner, I to Sir G. Carteret, and with him to his new house, he is taking in Broad Street, and there surveyed all the rooms and bounds, in order to the drawing up a lease thereof. And that done, Mr. Cutler, his landlord, took me up and down, and showed me all his ground and house, which is extraordinary great, he having bought all the Augustan friars, and many, many a thousand pounds he hath and will bury there. So home to my business, clearing my papers and preparing my accounts against to-morrow for a monthly and a great audit. So to supper and to bed. Fresh news come of our beating the Dutch at Guinea, quite out of all their castles almost, which will make them quite mad here at home, sure. And Sir G. Carteret did tell me that the king do joy mightily at it, but asked him laughing, But, says he, how shall I do to answer this to the ambassador when he comes? Nay, they say that we have beat them out of the new Netherlands too, so that we have been doing them mischief for a great while in several parts of the world, without public knowledge or reason. Their fleet for Guinea is now, they say, ready and abroad, and will be going this week. Coming home to-night, I did go to examine my wife's house accounts, and finding things that seemed somewhat doubtful, I was angry, though she did make it pretty plain, but confess that when she do miss a sum, she do add something to other things to make it, and upon my being very angry, she do protest she will here lay up something for herself to buy her a necklace with, which maddered me, and do still trouble me, for I fear she will forget by degrees the way of living cheap, and under a sense of want. Thirtieth. Up and all day, both morning and afternoon, at my accounts, it being a great month, both for profit and layings out, the last being eighty-nine pounds for kitchen and clothes for myself and wife, and a few extraordinaries for the house, and my profits besides salary two hundred and thirty-nine pounds, so that I have this week, notwithstanding great layings out, and preparations for laying out, which I make as paid this month, my balance to come to a thousand two hundred and three pounds, for which the Lord's name be praised. Dine at home at noon, staying long looking for Kate Joyce and my Aunt James and Mary, but they came not. So my wife abroad to see them, and took Mary Joyce to a play. Then in the evening came, and sat working by me at the office, and late home to supper and to bed, with my heart in good rest for this day's work. Though troubled to think that my last month's negligence, besides the making me neglect business and spend money, and lessen myself both as to business and the world and myself, I am fain to preserve my vow by paying twenty shillings dry money into the poor's box, because I had not fulfilled all my memorandums and paid all my petty debts, and received all my petty credits of the last month, but I trust in God I shall do so no more. End of September October of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Nicole Lee the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664, by Samuel Pepys, October, 1664. October 1st. Up and at the office, both forenoon and afternoon very busy, and with great pleasure in being so. This morning Mrs. Lane, now Martin, like a foolish woman, came to the horseshoe hard by, and sent for me while I was at the office, to come to speak with her, by a note sealed up. I know to get me to do something for her husband, but I sent her an answer that I would see her at Westminster, and so I did not go, and she went away, poor soul. At night, home to supper, weary, and my eyes sore with writing and reading, and to bed. We go now on with great vigour in preparing against the Dutch, who, they say, will now fall upon us without doubt upon this high news come of our beating them so wholly in Guinea. Second, Lord's Day. My wife not being well to go to church, I walked with my boy through the city, putting in at several churches, among others at Bishopsgate, and there saw the picture usually put before the king's book, put up in the church, but very ill-painted, though it were a pretty piece to set up in a church. 
I intended to have seen the Quakers, who they say do meet every Lord's Day at the mouth at Bishopsgate, but I could see none stirring, nor was it fit to ask for the place, so I walked over Moorfields, and thence to Clerkenwell Church, and there, as I wished, sat next pew to the fair butler, who indeed is a most perfect beauty still, and one I do very much admire myself for my choice of her for a beauty, she having the best lower part of her face that ever I saw all days of my life. After church I walked to my Lady Sandwich's, through my Lord Southampton's new buildings in the fields behind Gray's Inn, and indeed they are a very great and a noble work. So I dined with my lady, and the same innocent discourse that we used to have, only after dinner being alone, she asked me my opinion about Creed, whether he would have a wife or no, and what he was worth, and proposed Mrs. Wright for him, which she says she heard he was once inquiring after. She desired I would take a good time and manner of proposing it, and I said I would, though I believed he would love nothing but money, and much was not to be expected there, she said. So away back to Clerkenwell Church, thinking to have got sight of La Belle Butler again, but failed. And so after church walked all over the fields home, and there my wife was angry with me for not coming home and for gadding abroad to look after beauties, she told me plainly. So I made all peace, and to supper. This evening came Mrs. Lane, now Martin, with her husband, to desire my help about a place for him. It seems poor Mr. Daniel is dead of the victualling office, a place too good for this puppy to follow him in. But I did give him the best words I could, and so after drinking a glass of wine sent them going, but with great kindness. So to supper, prayers, and to bed. Third, up with Sir J. Minnes by coach to St. James's, and there all the news now of very hot preparations for the Dutch, and being with the Duke, he told us he was resolved to make a trip himself, and that Sir W. Penn should go in the same ship with him, which honour, God forgive me, I could grudge him, for his knavery and dissimulation, though I do not envy much the having the same place myself. Talk also of great haste in the getting out another fleet and building some ships, and now it is likely we have put one another by each other's dalliance past a retreat. Thence, with our heads full of business, we broke up, and I to my barber's, and there only saw Jane, and stroked her under the chin, and away to the exchange, and there along about several businesses, hoping to get money by them, and thence home to dinner, and there found Hawley. But meeting Bagwell's wife at the office before I went home, I took her into the office, and there kissed her only. She rebuked me for doing it, saying that, did I do so much to many bodies else, it would be a stain to me. But I do not see but she takes it well enough, though in the main I believe she is very honest. So after some kind discourse we parted, and I home to dinner, and after dinner down to Deptford, where I found Mr. Coventry. And there we made an experiment of Holland's and our cordage, and ours outdid it a great deal, as my book of observations tells particularly. Here we were late, and so home together by water, and I to my office, where late, putting things in order. Mr. Bland came this night to me, to take his leave of me, he going to Tangier, wherein I wish him good success. So home to supper and to bed, my mind troubled at the businesses I have to do, that I cannot mind them as I ought to do, and get money, and more that I have neglected by frequenting and seeming more busy publicly than I have done of late in this hurry of business, but there is time left to recover it, and I trust in God I shall. Fourth, up and to the office, where we sat all the morning, and this morning Sir W. Penn went to Chatham to look after the ships now going out thence, and particularly that wherein the Duke can himself go. He took Sir G. Askew with him, whom I believe he hath brought into play. At noon to the change, and thence home, where I found my Aunt James and the two she Joyces. They dined and were merry with us. Thence after dinner to a play to see the general, which is so dull and so ill-acted, that I think it is the worst I ever saw or heard in all my days. I happened to sit near to Sir Charles Sedley, who I find a very witty man, and he did at every line take notice of the dullness of the pert and badness of the action, that most pertinently which I was mightily taken with, and among others whereby Altamira's command Claremont, the general, is commanded to rescue his rival, whom she loved, Lucidor, he, after a great deal of demur, broke out, Well, I'll save my rival, and make her confess that I deserve while he do but possess. By what pox, says Sir Charles Sedley, would he have him have more, or what is there more to be had of a woman than the possessing her? Then setting all them at home, I home with my wife and Mercer, vexed at my losing my time and above twenty shillings in money, and neglecting my business to see so bad a play. Tomorrow, they told us, should be acted, or the day after, a new play called The Parson's Dream, acted all by women. So to my office, and there did business, and so home to supper, and to bed. Fifth. 
up betimes and to my office and thence by coach to new bridewell to meet with mr points to discourse with him be master of the workhouse there about making of bupers for us but he was not within however his clerk did lead me up and down through all the house and there i did with great pleasure see the many pretty works and the little children employed every one to do something which was a very fine sight and worthy encouragement i cast away a crown among them and so to the change and among the linen wholesale drapers to inquire about calicoes to see what can be done with them for the supplying our want of bupers for flags and i think i shall do something therein to good purpose for the king so to the coffee-house and there fell in discourse with the secretary of the virtuosi of gresham college and had very fine discourse with him he tells me of a new invented instrument to be tried before the college anon and i intend to see it so to trinity house and there i dined among the old dull fellows and so home and to my office a while and then comes mr cocker to see me and i discoursed with him about his writing and ability of sight and how i shall do to get some glass or other to help my eyes by candlelight and he tells me he will bring me the helps he hath within a day or two and shew me what he do thence to the music meeting at the post office where i was once before and thither and on come all the gresham college and a great deal of noble company and the new instrument was brought called the arched vial where being tuned with lute-strings and played on with keys like an organ a piece of parchment is always kept moving and the strings which by the keys are pressed down upon it are grated in imitation of a bow by the parchment and so it is intended to resemble several vials played on with one bow but so basely and harshly that it will never do but after three hours stay it could not be fixed in tune and so they were fain to go to some other music of instruments which i am grown quite out of love with and so i after some good discourse with mr spong hill grant and dr whistler and others by turns i home to my office and there late and so home where i understand my wife has spoke to jane and ended matters of difference between her and her and she stays with us which i am glad of for her fault is nothing but sleepiness and forgetfulness otherwise a good-natured quiet well-meaning honest servant and one that will do as she's bid so one called upon her and will see her do it this morning by three o'clock the prince and king and duke with him went down the river and the prince under sail the next tide after and so is gone from the hope god give him better success than he used to have this day mr bland went away hence towards his voyage to tangier this day also i had a letter from an unknown hand that tells me that jack angier he believes is dead at lisbon for he left him there ill sixth up into the office where busy all the morning among other things about this of the flags and my bringing in of calicoes to oppose young and whistler at noon by promise mr pierce and his wife and madam clark and her niece came and dined with me to a rare chine of beef and spent the afternoon very pleasantly all the afternoon and then to my office in the evening they being gone and late at business and then home to supper and to bed my mind coming to itself in following of my business seventh lay pretty while with some discontent a bed even to the having bad words with my wife and blows too about the ill serving up of our victuals yesterday but all ended in love and so i rose and to my office busy all the morning at noon dined at home and then to my office again and then abroad to look after calicoes for flags and hope to get a small matter by my pains therein and yet save the king a great deal of money and so home to my office and there came mr cocker and brought me a globe of glass and a frame of oiled paper as i desired to show me the manner of his gaining light to grave by and to lessen the glaringness of it at pleasure by an oiled paper this i bought of him giving him a crown for it and so well satisfied he went away and i to my business again and so home to supper prayers and to bed eighth all the morning at the office and after dinner abroad and among other things contracted with one mr bridges at the white bear on cornhill for one hundred pieces of calico to make flags and as i know i shall save the king money so i hope to get a little for my pains and venture of my own money myself late in the evening doing business and then comes captain taylor and he and i till twelve o'clock at night arguing about the freight of his ship eagle hired formerly by me to tangier and at last we made an end and i hope to get a little money is some small matter by it so home to bed being weary and cold but contented that i have made an end of that business ninth lord's day lay pretty long but however up time enough with my wife to go to church then home to dinner and mr fuller my cambridge acquaintance coming to me about what he was with me lately to release a waterman he told me he was to preach at barking church and so i to hear him and he preached well and neatly thence it being time enough to our own church 
and there stayed wholly privately at the great door to gaze upon a pretty lady, and from church dogged her home, whither she went to a house near Tower Hill, and I think her to be one of the prettiest women I ever saw. So home, and at my office a while busy, then to my uncle White's, with it seems my wife went after sermon, and there supped, but my aunt and uncle in a very ill humour one with another, but I made shift with much ado to keep them from scolding, and so after supper home and to bed without prayers, it being cold, and to-morrow washing day. 10th. Up, and it being rainy, in Sir W. Penn's coach to St. James's, and there did our usual business with the Duke, and more and more preparations every day appear against the Dutch, and, which I must confess, do a little move my envy, Sir W. Penn do grow every day more and more regarded by the Duke, because of his service heretofore in the Dutch war, which I am confident is by some strong obligations he hath laid upon Mr. Coventry, for Mr. Coventry must needs know that he is a man of very mean parts, but only a bred seaman. Going home in coach with Sir W. Batten, he told me how Sir J. Minnes, by the means of Sir R. Ford, was the last night brought to his house, and did discover the reason of his so long discontent with him, and now they are friends again, which I am sorry for, but he told it me so plainly that I see there is no thorough understanding between them nor love, and so I hope there will be no great combination in anything. Nor do I see Sir J. Minnes very fond as he used to be. But Sir W. Batten do raffle still against Mr. Turner and his wife, telling me he is a false fellow, and his wife a false woman, and has rotten teeth, and false, set him with wire, and, as I know they are so, so I am glad he finds it so. To the coffee-house, and thence to the change, and therewith Sir W. Warren to the coffee-house behind the change, and sat alone with him till four o'clock, talking of his businesses first, and then of business in general, and discourse how I might get money, and how to carry myself to advantage, to contract no envy, and yet make the world see my pains, which was with great content to me, and a good friend and help I am like to find him, for which God be thanked. So home to dinner at four o'clock, and then to the office, and there late, and so home to supper and to bed, having sat up till past twelve at night, to look over the account of the collections for the fishery, and the loose and base manner that money so collected are disposed of in would make a man never part with a penny in that manner, and above all the inconvenience of having a great man, though never so seeming pious as my Lord Pembroke is. He is too great to be called to an account, and is abused by his servants, and yet obliged to defend them for his own sake. This day, by the blessing of God, my wife and I have been married nine years, but my head being full of business, I did not think of it to keep it in any extraordinary manner. But bless God for our long lives and loves and health together, which the same God long continue, I wish, from my very heart. 11th. Up into the office, where we sat all the morning. My wife this morning went, being invited to my lady Sandwich, and I alone at home at dinner, till by and by Llewellyn comes and dines with me. He tells me what a bawdy loose play this parson's wedding is, that is acted by nothing but women at the king's house, and I am glad of it. Thence to the fishery in Thames Street, and there are several good discourses about the letting of the lotteries, and among others, one Sir Thomas Clifford, whom yet I knew not, do speak very well and neatly. Thence I to my cousin Will Joyce, to get him to go to Brampton with me this week, but I think he will not, and I am not a whit sorry for it, for his company both chargeable and troublesome. So home into my office, and then to supper, and then to my office again till late, and so home, with my head and heart full of business, and so to bed. My wife tells me the sad news of my Lady Castlemaine's being now become so decayed that one would not know her, at least far from a beauty, which I am sorry for. This day, with great joy, Captain Titus told us the particulars of the French's expedition against Giggory upon the Barbary coast in the Straits with six thousand chosen men. They have taken the fort of Giggory, wherein were five men and three guns, which makes the whole story of the King of France's policy and power to be laughed at. Twelfth. This morning all the morning at my office, ordering things against my journey to-morrow. At noon to the coffee-house, where very good discourse. For news, all say de Reuter is gone to Guinea before us. Sir J. Lawson is come to Portsmouth, and our fleet is hastening all speed. I mean this new fleet. Prince Rupert with his is got into the Downs. At home dined with me W. Joyce and a friend of his. W. Joyce will go with me to Brampton. After dinner I out to Mr. Bridges, the linen draper, and evened with him four hundred pieces of calico, and did give him two hundred and eight pounds eighteen shillings, which I now trust the king for, but hope both to save the king money, and to get a little by it to boot. 
thence by water up and down all the timber yards to look out some dram timber but can find none for our turn at the price i would have and so i home and there my office late doing business against my journey to clear my hands of everything for two days so home and to supper and bed thirteenth after being at the office all the morning i home and dined and taking leave of my wife with my mind not a little troubled how she would look after herself or house in my absence especially too leaving a considerable sum of money in the office i by coach to the red lion in aldersgate street and there by agreement met w joyce and tom trice and mounted i upon a very fine mare that sir w warren helps me to and so very merrily rode till it was very dark i leading the way through the dark to welling and there not being very weary to supper and to bed but very bad accommodation at the swan in this day's journey i met with mr white cromwell's chaplain that was and had a great deal of discourse with him among others he tells me that richard is and hath long been in france and is now going into italy he owns publicly that he do correspond and return him all his money that richard hath been in some straits at the beginning but relieved by his friends that he goes by another name but do not disguise himself nor deny himself to any man that challenges him he tells me for certain that offers had been made to the old man of marriage between the king and his daughter to have obliged him but he would not he thinks with me that it never was in his power to bring in the king with the consent of any of his officers about him and that he scorned to bring him in as monk did to secure himself and deliver everybody else when i told him of what i found writ in a french book of one monsieur sorbiere that gives an account of his observations here in england among other things he says that it is reported that cromwell did in his lifetime transpose many of the bodies of the kings of england from one grave to another and that by that means it is not known certainly whether the head that is now set up upon a post be that of cromwell or of one of the kings mr white tells me that he believes he never had so poor a low thought in him to trouble himself about it he says the hand of god is much to be seen that all his children are in good condition enough as to estate and that their relations that betrayed their family are all now either hanged or very miserable fourteenth up by break of day and got to brampton by three o'clock where my father and mother overjoyed to see me my mother ready to weep every time she looked upon me after dinner my father and i to the court and there did all our business to my mind as i have set down in a paper particularly expressing our proceedings at this court so home where w joyce full of talk and pleased with his journey and after supper i to bed and left my father mother and him laughing fifteenth my father and i up and walked alone to hinchingbrook and among the other late chargeable works that my lord hath done there we saw his water-works and the oral which is very fine and so is the house all over but i am sorry to think of the money at this time spent therein back to my father's mr shepley being out of town and there breakfasted after making an end with barton about his businesses and then my mother called me into the garden and there but all to no purpose desiring me to be friends with john but i told her i cannot nor indeed easily shall which afflicted the poor woman but i cannot help it then taking leave w joyce and i set out calling t trice at bugden and thence got by night to stevenage and there mighty merry though i in bed more weary than the other two days which i think proceeded from our galloping so much my other weariness being almost all over but i find that a coney skin in my breeches preserves me perfectly from galling and that eating after i come to my inn without drinking do keep me from being stomach sick which drink do presently make me we lay all in several beds in the same room and w joyce full of his impertinent tricks and talk which then made us merry as any other fool would have done so to sleep sixteenth lord's day it raining we set out and about nine o'clock got to hatfield in church time and i light and saw my simple lord salisbury sit there in his gallery stayed not in the church but thence mounted again and to barnet by the end of sermon and there dined at the red lion very weary again but all my weariness yesterday night and to-day in my thighs only the rest of my weariness in my shoulders and arms being quite gone thence home parting company at my cousin antony joyce's by four o'clock weary but very well to bed at home where i find all well and on my wife came to bed but for my ease rose again and lay with her woman seventeenth rose very well and not weary and with sir w batten to st james's there did our business i saw sir j lawson since his return from sea first this morning and hear that my lord sandwich is come from portsmouth to town thence i to him and finding him at my lord crew's i went with him home to his house and much kind discourse 
Thence my lord to court, and I with creed to the change, and thence with Sir W. Warren to a cook's shop, and dined, discoursing and advising him about his great contract he is to make to-morrow, and do every day receive great satisfaction in his company, and a prospect of a just advantage by his friendship. Thence to my office doing some business, but it being very cold, I, for fear of getting cold, went early home to bed, my wife not being come home from my lady Jemima, with whom she hath been at a play and at court to-day. 18th. Up and to the office, where, among other things, we made a very great contract with Sir W. Warren for three thousand load of timber. At noon dined at home. In the afternoon to the fishery, where, very confused and very ridiculous, my Lord Craven's proceedings, especially his finding fault with Sir J. Colleton and Colonel Griffin's report in the accounts of the lottery men. Thence I with Mr. Gray in his coach to Whitehall, but the King and Duke being abroad, we returned to Somerset House. In discourse I find him a very worthy and studious gentleman in the business of trade, and among other things he observed well to me, how it is not the greatest wits, but the steady man, that is a good merchant. He instanced in Ford and Cock, the last of whom he values above all men as his oracle, as Mr. Coventry do Mr. Jolliffe. He says that it is concluded among merchants, that where a trade hath once been, and do decay, it never recovers again, and therefore that the manufacture of cloth of England will never come to esteem again that, among other faults, Sir Richard Ford cannot keep a secret, and that it is so much the part of a merchant to be guilty of that fault, that the Duke of York is resolved to commit no more secrets to the merchants of the royal company, that Sir Ellis Layton is, for a speech of forty words, the wittiest man that ever he knew in his life, but longer he is nothing, his judgment being nothing at all, but his wit most absolute. At Somerset House he carried me in, and there I saw the Queen's new rooms, which are most stately and nobly furnished, and there I saw her, and the Duke of York and Duchess were there. The Duke espied me and came to me, and talked with me a very great while about our contract this day with Sir W. Warren, and among other things did with some contempt ask whether we did accept polyards, which Sir W. Batten did yesterday, in spite, as the Duke, I believe, by my Lord Barclay do well enough know, among other things in writing propose. Thence home by coach, it raining hard, and to my office, where late, then home to supper and to bed, this night the Dutch ambassador desired and had an audience of the king. What the issue of it was I know not. Both sides, I believe, desire peace, but neither will begin, and so I believe a war will follow. The prince is with his fleet at Portsmouth, and the Dutch are making all preparations for war. 19th. Up into my office all the morning. At noon dined at home, then abroad by coach to buy for the office Hearn upon the statute of charitable uses in order to the doing something better in the chest than we have done, for I am ashamed to see Sir W. Batten possess himself so long of so much money as he hath done. Coming home, weighed my two silver flagons at Stevens's. They weigh two hundred and twelve ounces, twenty-seven pennyweight, which is about fifty pounds at five shillings per ounce, and then they judge the fashion to be worth above five shillings pounds more, nay, some say ten shillings an ounce the fashion, but I do not believe, but yet am sorry to see that the fashion is worth so much, and the silver come to no more. So home and to my office, where very busy late. My wife at Mercer's mother's, I believe, W. Hewer with them, which I do not like, that he should ask my leave to go about business, and then to go and spend his time in sport, and leave me here busy. To supper and to bed, my wife coming in by and by, which though I know there was no hurt in it, I do not like. Twentieth. Up and to the office, where all the morning. At noon my uncle Thomas came, dined with me, and received some money of me. Then I to my office, where I took in with me Bagwell's wife, and there I caressed her, and find her every day more and more coming with good words and promises of getting her husband a place, which I will do. So we parted, and I to my Lord Sandwich at his lodgings, and after a little stay away with Mr. Chumley to Fleet Street, in the way he telling me that Tangier is like to be in a bad condition with this same Fitzgerald, he being a man of no honour, nor presence, nor little honesty, and endeavours to raise the Irish and suppress the English interest there, and offend everybody, and do nothing that I hear of well, which I am sorry for. Thence home, by the way taking two silver tumblers home, which I have bought, and so home, and there late busy at my office, and then home to supper and to bed. 21st. Up and by coach to Mr. Coles, and there conferred with him about some law business, and so to Sir W. Turner's, and there bought my cloth, coloured for a suit and cloak, to line with plush the cloak, which will cost me money, but I find that I must go handsomely, whatever it costs me, and the charge will be made up in the fruit it brings. Thence to the coffee-house and change, and so home to dinner, and then to the office all the afternoon, whither comes W. Howe to see me, 
being come from and going presently back to sea with my lord. Among other things, he tells me Mr. Creed is much out of favour with my lord, from his freedom of talk and bold carriage, and other things with which my lord is not pleased, but most, I doubt, his not lending my lord money, and Mr. Moore's reporting what his answer was, I doubt, in the worst manner. But, however, a very unworthy rogue he is, and therefore let him go for one good for nothing, though wise to the height above most men I converse with. In the evening, W. Howe being gone, comes Mr. Martin, to trouble me again to get him a lieutenant's place, for which he is as fit as a fool can be. But I put him off like an ass, as he is, and so setting my papers and books in order, I home to supper and to bed. 22nd. Up and to the office, where we sat all the morning. At noon comes my uncle Thomas and his daughter Mary, about getting me to pay them the thirty pounds due now, but payable in law to her husband. I did give them the best answer I could, and so parted, they not desiring to stay to dinner. After dinner I down to Deptford, and there did business, and so back to my office, where very late busy, and so home to supper and to bed. 23rd, Lord's Day. Up into church. At noon comes unexpected Mr. Fuller, the minister, and dines with me, and also I had invited Mr. Cooper, with one I judge come from sea, and he and I spent the whole afternoon together, he teaching me some things in understanding of plates. At night to the office doing business, and then home to supper, then a psalm, to prayers, and to bed. 24th. Up and in Sir J. Minnes coach, alone with Mrs. Turner as far as Paternoster Row, where I set her down, to St. James's, and there did our business, and I had the good luck to speak what pleased the Duke about our great contract in hand with Sir W. Warren against Sir W. Batten, wherein the Duke is very earnest, for our contracting. Then home to the office till noon, and then dined, and to the change, and off with Sir W. Warren for a while, consulting about managing his contract. Thence to a committee at Whitehall of Tangier, where I had the good luck to speak something to very good purpose about the mole at Tangier, which was well received even by Sir J. Lawson and Mr. Chumley, the undertakers, against whose interests I spoke, that I believe I shall be valued for it. Thence into the galleries to talk with my Lord Sandwich, among other things, about the Prince's writing up to tell us of the danger he and his fleet lie in at Portsmouth, of receiving affronts from the Dutch, which my Lord said he would never have done, had he lain there with one ship alone, nor is there any great reason for it, because of the sands. However, the fleet will be ordered to go and lay themselves up at the cows, much beneath the prowess of the prince, I think, and the honour of the nation, at the first to be found to secure themselves. My lord is well pleased to think that, if the duke and the prince go, all the blame of any miscarriage will not light on him, and that if anything goes well, he hopes he shall have the share of the glory, for the prince is by no means well esteemed of by anybody. Thence home, and though not very well, yet up late about the fishery business, wherein I hope to give an account how I find the collections to have been managed, which I did finish to my great content, and so home to supper and to bed. This day the great O'Neill died, I believe to the content of all the Protestant pretenders in Ireland. 25th. Up into the office where we sat all the morning, and finished Sir W. Warren's great contract for timber, with great content to me, because just in the terms I wrote last night to Sir W. Warren, and against the terms proposed by Sir W. Batten, at noon home to dinner, and there found Creed and Hawley. After dinner comes in Mrs. Ingram, the first time to make a visit to my wife. After a little stay I left them, and to the committee of the fishery, and there did make my report of the late public collections for the fishery, much to the satisfaction of the committee, and I think much to my reputation, for good notice was taken of it, and much it was commended. So home, in my way taking care of a piece of plate for Mr. Christopher Pett, against the launching of his new great ship to-morrow at Woolwich which I singly did move to his royal highness, and did obtain it for him to the value of twenty pieces, and he under his hand do acknowledge to me that he did never receive so great a kindness from any man in the world as from me herein. So to my office, and then to supper, and then to my office again, we're busy late, being very full nowadays of business to my great content, I thank God, and so home to bed, my house being full of a design to go to-morrow, my wife and all her servants, to see the new ship launched. 26th. Up, my people rising mighty betimes, to fit themselves to go by water, and my boy, he could not sleep, but wakes about four o'clock, and in bed lay playing on his lute till daylight, and it seems did the like last night till twelve o'clock. About eight o'clock, my wife, she and her woman, and Bess and Jane, and W. Hewer and the boy, to the water side, and there took boat, and by and by I out of doors to look after the flagon, to get it ready to carry to Woolwich. That being not ready, I stepped aside and found out Nelson, he that Whistler buys his bupers off, 
and did there buy five pieces at their price, and am in hopes thereby to bring them down, or buy ourselves all we spend of Nelson at the first hand. This job was greatly to my content, and by and by the flagon being finished at the burnishers, I home, and there fitted myself, and took a hackney coach I hired, it being a very cold and foul day, to Woolwich. All the way reading in a good book touching the fishery, and that being done in the book upon the statute of charitable uses, mightily to my satisfaction. At Woolwich, I there up to the king and duke, and they liked the plate well. Here I stayed above with them while the ship was launched, which was done with great success, and the king did very much like the ship, saying she had the best bow that ever he saw. But, Lord, the sorry talk and discourse among the great courtiers around about him, without any reverence in the world, but with so much disorder. By and by the queen comes, and her maids of honour, one whereof, Mrs. Boynton, and the Duchess of Buckingham, had been very sickly coming by water in the barge, the water being very rough, but what silly sport they made with them in very common terms, methought, was very poor, and below what people think these great people say and do. The launching being done, the king and company went down to take barge, and I sent for Mr. Pett and put the flagon into the duke's hand, and he, in the presence of the king, did give it, Mr. Pett taking it upon his knee. This Mr. Pett is wholly beholding to me for, and he do know, and I believe will acknowledge it. Thence I to Mr. Ackworth, and there eat and drank with Commissioner Pett and his wife, and thence to Sheldon's, where Sir W. Batten and his lady were. By and by I took coach, after I had inquired for my wife or her boat, but found none. Going out of the gate, an ordinary woman prayed me to give her room to London, which I did, but spoke not to her all the way, but read, as long as I could see, my book again. Dark when we came to London, and a stop of coaches in Southwark. I stayed above half an hour, and then light, and finding Sir W. Batten's coach, heard they were gone into the bear at the bridge foot, and thither I to them. Presently the stop is removed, and then going out to find my coach, I could not find it, for it was gone with the rest. So I fare to go through the dark and dirt over the bridge, and my leg fell in a hole broke on the bridge, but the constable standing there to keep people from it, I was catched up, otherwise I had broke my leg, for which mercy the Lord be praised. So at Fenchurch I found my coach staying for me, and so home, where the little girl hath looked to the house well, but no wife come home, which made me begin to fear for her the water being very rough and cold and dark. But by and by she and her company come in all well, at which I was glad, though angry. Then I to Sir W. Batten's, and there sat late with him, Sir R. Ford and Sir John Robinson, the last of whom continues still the same fool he was, crying up what power he has in the city, in knowing their temper, and being able to do what he will with them. It seems the city did last night very freely lend the king a hundred thousand pounds without any security but the king's word, which was very noble, but this loggerhead and Sir R. Ford would make us believe that they did it. Now Sir R. Ford is a cunning man, and makes a fool of the other, and the other believes whatever the other tells him. But, Lord, to think that such a man should be lieutenant of the tower, and so great a man as he is, is a strange thing to me. With them late, and then home, and with my wife to bed, after supper. 27th. Up and to the office, where all the morning busy. At noon, Sir G. Carteret, Sir J. Minnes, Sir W. Batten, Sir W. Penn, and myself, were treated at the Dolphin by Mr. Foley, the ironmonger, where a good plain dinner, but I expected music, the missing of which spoiled my dinner, only very good merry discourse at dinner. Thence with Sir G. Carteret by coach to Whitehall to a committee of Tangier, and thence back to London, and light in Cheapside, and I to Nelson's, and there met with a rub at first, but took him out to drink, and there discoursed to my great content so far with him that I think I shall agree with him for bupers to serve the navy with. So with great content home and to my office, where late, and having got a great cold in my head yesterday, home to supper and to bed. 28th. Slept ill all night, having got a very great cold the other day at Woolwich in my head, which makes me full of snot. Up in the morning, and my tailor brings me home my fine new coloured cloth suit, my cloak lined with plush, as good a suit as ever I wore in my life, and mighty neat, to my great content. To my office, and there all the morning. At noon to Nelson's, and there bought twenty pieces more of bupers, and hoped to go on with him to a contract. Thence to the change a little, and thence home with Llewellyn to dinner, where Mr. Dean met me by appointment. And after dinner he and I up to my chamber, and there hard at discourse, and advising him what to do in his business at Harwich, and then to discourse of our old business of ships, and taking new rules of him to my great pleasure. And he being gone, I to my office a little, and then to see Sir W. Batten, who is sick of a greater cold than I, and thither comes to me Mr. Holyard, and into the chamber to me, and poor man, beyond all I ever saw of him, was a little drunk, and there sat talking and finding acquaintance with Sir W. Batten and my lady by relations on both sides, 
that there we stayed very long. At last broke up, and he home, much overcome with drink, but well enough to get well home. So I home to supper and to bed. Twenty ninth, Up, and it being my Lord Mayor's show, my boy and three maids went out. But it being a very foul rainy day from morning till night, I was sorry my wife let them go out. All the morning at the office, at dinner at home, in the afternoon to the office again, and about nine o'clock by appointment to the King's Head Tavern upon Fish Street Hill, with a Mr. Wolf and Parham by his means, met me to discourse about the fishery, and great light I had by Parham, who is a little conceited, but a very knowing man in his way, and in the general fishing trade of England. Here I stayed three hours, and eat a barrel of very fine oysters or wolf's giving me, and so it raining hard, home into my office, and then home to bed. All the talkers that De Reuter is come overland home with six or eight of his captains to command here at home, and their ships kept abroad in the straits, which sounds as if they had a mind to do something with us. 30th, Lord's Day. Up, and this morning put on my new fine coloured cloth suit with my cloak lined with plush, which is a dear and noble suit, costing me about seventeen pounds, to church and then home to dinner, and after dinner to a little music with my boy, and so to church with my wife, and so home, and with her all the evening reading, and at music with my boy with great pleasure, and so to supper, prayers, and to bed. 31st. Very busy all the morning, at noon creed to me, and dined with me, and then he and I to Whitehall, there to a committee of Tangier, where it is worth remembering when Mr. Coventry proposed the retrenching some of the charge of the horse, the first word asked by the Duke of Albemarle was, Let us see who commands them, there being three troops. One of them he calls to mind was by Sir Toby Bridges. Oh, says he, there is a very good man. If you must reform two of them, be sure let him command the troop that is left. Thence home, and there came presently to me Mr. Young and Whistler, who find that I have quite overcome them in their business of flags, and now they come to entreat my favour, but I will be even with them. So late to my office, and there till past one in the morning, making up my month's accounts, and find that my expense this month in clothes has kept me from laying up anything. But I am no worse, but a little better than I was, which is one thousand two hundred and five pounds, a great sum, the Lord be praised for it. So home to bed, with my mind full of content therein, and vexed for my being so angry in bad words to my wife to-night, she not giving me a good account of her layings out to my mind to-night. This day I hear young Mr. Stanley, a brave young gentleman, that went out with young German, with Prince Rupert, is already dead of the smallpox at Portsmouth. All preparations against the Dutch, and the Duke of York fitting himself with all speed, to go to the fleet which is hastening for him, being now resolved to go in the Charles. End of October November of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664, by Samuel Pepys. November, 1664. November 1st. Up and to the office, where busy all the morning, at noon, my wife being invited to my lady sandwiches, all alone, dined at home, upon a good goose, with Mr. Wade, discussing of business. Thence I to the committee of the fishery, and there we sat with several good discourses, and some bad and simple ones, and with great disorder, and yet by the men of business of the town. But my report in the business of the collections is mightily commended, and will get me some reputation, and indeed is the only thing looks like a thing well done since we sat. Then with Mr. Parham to the tavern, but I drank no wine, only he did give me another barrel of oysters, and he brought one Major Green, an able fishmonger, and good discourse to my information. So home, and late at business at my office, then to supper, and to bed. Second. Up betimes, and down with Mr. Castle to Redriff, and there walked to Deptford to view a parcel of brave knees of his, which indeed are very good, and so back again home, I seeming very friendly to him, though I know him to be a rogue, and one that hates me with his heart home and to dinner, and so to my office all the afternoon, when in some pain in my back which troubled me, but I think it comes only with stooping, and from no other matter. At night to Nelson's, and up and down about business, and so home to my office, then home to supper, and to bed. Third, up and to the office, where strange to see how Sir W. Penn is flocked to by people of all sorts against his going to sea. At the office did much business, among other an end of that that has troubled me long, the business of the bupers and flags, 
at noon to the change and thence by appointment was met with bagwell's wife and she followed me into moorfields and there into a drinking-house and all alone eat and drank together i did there caress her but though i did make some offer did not receive any compliance from her in what was bad but very modestly she denied me which i was glad to see and shall value her the better for it and i hope never tempt her to any evil more thence back to the town and we parted and i home and then at the office late where sir w pen came to take his leave of me being to-morrow which is very sudden to us to go on board to lie on board but i think we'll come ashore again before the ship the charles can go away so home to supper and to bed this night sir w batten did among other things tell me strange news which troubles me that my lord sandwich will be sent governor to tangier which in some respects indeed i should be glad of for the good of the place and the safety of his person but i think his honour will suffer and it may be his interest fail by his distance fourth waked very betimes and lay long awake my mind being so full of business then up and to st james's where i find mr coventry full of business packing up for his going to sea with the duke walked with him talking to whitehall where to the duke's lodgings who is gone thither to lodge lately i appeared to the duke and thence mr coventry and i an hour in the long gallery talking about the management of our office he tells me the weight of dispatch will lie chiefly on me and told me freely his mind touching sir w batten and sir j minnes the latter of whom he most aptly said was like a lapwing that all he did was to keep a flutter to keep others from the nest that they would find he told me an old story of the former about the lighthouses how just before he had certified to the duke against the use of them and what a burden they are to trade and presently after at his being at harwich comes to desire that he might have the setting one up there and gets the usefulness of it certified also by the trinity house after long discoursing and considering all our stores and other things as how the king hath resolved upon captain taylor and colonel middleton the first to be commissioner for harwich and the latter for portsmouth i away to the change and there did very much business so home to dinner and mr duke our secretary for the fishery dined with me after dinner to discourse of our business much to my content and then he away and i by water among the smiths on the other side and to the alehouse with one and was near buying four or five anchors and learned something worth my knowing of them and so home into my office where late with my head very full of business and so away home to supper and to bed fifth up into the office where all the morning at noon to the change and thence home to dinner and so with my wife to the duke's house to a play macbeth a pretty good play but admirably acted thence home the coach being forced to go round by london wall home because of the bonfires the day being mightily observed in the city to my office late at business and then home to supper and to bed sixth lord's day up and with my wife to church dined at home and i all the afternoon close at my office drawing up some proposals to present to the committee for the fishery to-morrow having a great good intention to be serviceable in the business if i can at night to supper with my uncle white where very merry and so home to prayers and to bed seventh up and with sir w batten to whitehall where mighty thrusting about the duke now upon his going we were with him long he advised us to follow our business close and to be directed in his absence by the committee of the council for the navy by and by a meeting of the fishery where the duke was but in such haste and things looked so superficially over that i had not a fit opportunity to propose my paper that i wrote yesterday but i had chewed it to mr gray and wren before who did like it most highly as they said and i think they would not dissemble in that manner in a business of this nature but i see the greatest businesses are done so superficially that i wonder anything succeeds at all among us that is public then somewhat vexed to see myself frustrated in the good i hope to have done and a little reputation to have gained and thence to my barber's but jane not being in the way i to my lady sandwiches and there met my wife and dined but i find that i dine as well myself that is as neatly and my meat as good and well dressed as my good lady do in the absence of my lord thence by water i to my barber's again and did meet in the street my jane but could not talk with her but only a word or two and so by coach call my wife and home where at my office late and then it being washing day to supper and to bed eighth up into the office where by and by mr coventry come and after doing a little business took his leave of us being to go to sea with the duke to-morrow at noon i and sir j minnes and lord berkeley who with sir j duncombe and mr chichley are made masters of the ordnance to the office of the ordnance to discourse about wadding for guns thence to dinner all of us to the lieutenants of the tower where a good dinner but disturbed in the middle of it by the king's coming into the tower and so we broke up and to him 
and went up and down the storehouses and magazines, which are, with the addition of the new great storehouse, a noble sight. He gone, I to my office, where Bagwell's wife stayed for me, and together with her a good while, to meet again shortly. So all the afternoon at my office till late, and then to bed, joyed in my love and ability to follow my business. This day Mr. Lever sent my wife a pair of silver candlesticks, very pretty ones. The first man that ever presented me, to whom I have not only done little service, but apparently did him the greatest disservice in his business of accounts, as purser general, of any man at the board. Ninth, called up, as I had appointed, by H. Russell, between two and three o'clock, and I and my boy Tom by water with a galley down to the Hope, it being a fine starry night. Got thither by eight o'clock, and there, as expected, found the Charles, her main mast setting. Commissioner Pett aboard. I up and down to see the ship I was so well acquainted with, and a great work it is, the setting so great a mast. Thence the Commissioner and I on board, Sir G. Askew in the Henry, who likes men mightily, which makes me think that there is more belief to be in a man that hath heretofore been employed than truly there is, for one would never have thought a month ago that he would have wanted a thousand men at his heels. Nor do I think he hath much of a seaman in him, for he told me, says he, heretofore we used to find our ships clear and ready, everything to our hands in the downs. Now I come and must look to see things done like a slave, things that I never minded, nor cannot look after. And by his discourse I find that he hath not minded anything in her at all. Thence, not staying, the wind blowing hard, I made use of the jemmy yacht and returned to the tower in her, my boy being a very droll boy and good company. Home and eat something, and then shifted myself and to Whitehall, and there the king being in his cabinet council, I desiring to speak with Sir G. Carteret, I was called in, and demanded by the king himself many questions, to which I did give him full answers. There were at this council my Lord Chancellor, Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Treasurer, the two secretaries, and Sir G. Carteret not a little contented at this chance of being made known to these persons, and called often by my name by the king, I to Mr. Pierce's to take leave of him, but he not within, but saw her, and made very little stay, but straight home to my office, where I did business, and then to supper and to bed. The Duke of York is this day gone away to Portsmouth. 10th. Up, and not finding my things ready, I was so angry with Bess as to bid my wife for good and all to bid her provide herself a place, for though she be very good-natured, she hath no care nor memory of her business at all. So to the office, where vexed at the malice of Sir W. Batten and folly of Sir J. Minnes against Sir W. Warren, but I prevented and shall do, though to my own disquiet and trouble. At noon dined with Sir W. Batten and the auditors of the Exchequer at the Dolphin by Mr. Waith's desire, and after dinner fell to business relating to Sir G. Carteret's account, and so home to the office, where Sir W. Batten begins too fast, to shew his knavish tricks in giving what price he pleases for commodities. So abroad, intending to have spoke with my Lord Chancellor about the old business of his wood at Clarendon, but could not, and so home again and late at my office, and then home to supper and bed. My little girl Susan is fallen sick of the measles, we fear, or at least of a scarlet fever. 11th. Up, and with Sir J. Minnes and Sir W. Batten to the council chamber at Whitehall, to the Committee of the Lords for the Navy where we were made to wait an hour or two before called in. In that time, looking upon some books of heraldry of Sir Edward Walker's making, which are very fine, there I observed the Duke of Monmouth's arms are neatly done, and his title, the most noble and high-born prince, James Scott, Duke of Monmouth, etc. Nor could Sir J. Minnes, nor anybody there, tell whence he should take the name of Scott. And then I found my Lord Sandwich, his title and his arms is, the most noble and mighty Lord Edward, Earl of Sandwich, etc., Sir Edward Walker afterwards coming in, in discourse did say that there was none of the families of princes in Christendom that do derive themselves so high as Julius Caesar, nor so far by a thousand years, that can directly prove their rise. Only some in Germany do derive themselves from the patrician families of Rome, but that uncertainly, and among other things did much inveigh against the writing of romances, that five hundred years hence being wrote of matters in general, true as the romance of Cleopatra, the world will not know which is the true and which the false. Here was a gentleman attending here, that told us he saw the other day, and did bring the draught of it to Sir Francis Pridgen, of a monster born of an hostless wife at Salisbury, two women children, perfectly made, joined at the lower part of their bellies, and every part perfect as two bodies, and only one pair of legs coming forth on one side from the middle where they were joined. It was alive twenty-four hours, and cried, and did as all hopeful children do but being showed too much to people, was killed. By and by we were called in, where a great many lords, Annesley in the chair, but lord, to see what work they will make us. 
and what trouble we shall have to inform men in a business they are to begin to know, when the greatest of our hurry is, is a thing to be lamented, and I fear the consequence will be bad to us. Then I by coach to the change, and thence home to dinner, my head aching mightily with much business. Our little girl better than she was yesterday. After dinner, out again by coach to my Lord Chancellor's, but could not speak with him. Then up and down to seek Sir Philip Warwick, Sir G. Carteret, and my Lord Barclay, but failed in all. And so home, and there late at business. Among other things, Mr. Turner making his complaint to me, how my clerks do all the work and get all the profit, and he hath no comfort, nor cannot subsist. I did make him apprehend how he is beholding to me more than to anybody, for my suffering him to act as purveyor of petty provisions, and told him so largely my little value of anybody's favour, that I believe he will make no complaints again a good while. So home to supper and to bed, after prayers, and having my boy and mercer give me some, each of them some music. Twelfth. Up, being frighted that Mr. Coventry was come to town and now at the office, so I run down without eating or drinking or washing to the office, and it proved my Lord Barclay. There all the morning, at noon to the change, and so home to dinner, Mr. Waith with me, and then to the office, where mighty busy till very late. But I bless God I go through with it very well, and hope I shall. Thirteenth. Lord's Day. This morning to church, where mighty sport, to hear our clerk sing out of tune, though his master sits by him that begins, and keeps the tune aloud for the parish. Dined at home very well, and spent all the afternoon with my wife within doors, and getting a speech out of Hamlet, to be or not to be, without book. In the evening to sing psalms, and in come Mr. Hill to see me, and then he and I and the boy finally to sing, and so anon broke up after much pleasure, he gone, I to supper, and so prayers, and to bed. Fourteenth. Up, and with Sir W. Batten to Whitehall, to the Lords of the Admiralty, and there did our business betimes. Then to Sir Philip Warwick about navy business, and my Lord Ashley, and afterwards to my Lord Chancellor, who is very well pleased with me, and my carrying of his business. And so to the change, where mighty busy, and so home to dinner, where Mr. Creed and more. And after dinner I to my Lord Treasurer's, to Sir Philip Warwick there, and then to Whitehall, to the Duke of Albemarle, about Tangier, and then homeward to the coffee-house, to hear news. And it seems the Dutch, as I afterwards found by Mr. Coventry's letters, have stopped a ship of masts of Sir W. Warren's, coming for us in a Swede ship, which they will not release upon Sir G. Downing's claiming her, which appears as the first act of hostility, and is looked upon as so by Mr. Coventry. The Elias, coming from New England, Captain Hill commander, is sunk. Only the captain and a few men saved. She foundered in the sea. So home, we're infinite busy till twelve at night, and so home to supper and to bed. Fifteenth. That I might not be too fine for the business I intend this day, I did leave off my fine new cloth suit, lined with plush, and put on my poor black suit, and after off is done, where much business but little done, I to the change, and then Bagwell's wife, with much ado, followed me through Moorfields to a blind alehouse, and there I did caress her, and eat and drink, and many hard looks and sooth the poor wretch did give me, and I think verily was troubled at what I did. But at last, after many protestings, by degrees I did arrive at what I would, with great pleasure, and then in the evening, it raining, walked into town, to where she knew where she was, and then I took coach and to Whitehall to a committee of Tangier, where, and everywhere else, I thank God, I find myself growing in repute. And so home, and late, very late, at business, nobody minding it but myself, and so home to bed, weary and full of thoughts. Businesses grow high between the Dutch and us on every side. Sixteenth. My wife not being well, waked in the night, and strange to see how dead sleep our people sleep, that she was fain to ring an hour before anybody would wake. At last one rose and held my wife, and so to sleep again. Up into my business, and then to Whitehall, there to attend the Lord's Commissioners, and so directly home and dine with Sir W. Batten and my lady, and after dinner had much discourse tending to profit with Sir W. Batten, how to get ourselves into the prize office, or some other fair way of obliging the king to consider us in our extraordinary pains, then to the office, and there all the afternoon very busy, and so till past twelve at night, and so home to bed. This day my wife went to the burial of a little boy of W. Joyce's. Seventeenth. Up into my office, and there all the morning mighty busy, and taking upon me to tell the controller how ill his matters were done, and I think indeed if I continue thus, all the business of the office will come upon me, whether I will or no. At noon to the change, and then home with Creed to dinner, and then I to the office, where close at it all the afternoon till twelve at night, and then home to supper and to bed. This day I received from Mr. Foley, 
but for me to pay for it, if I like it, and I in chest, having now received back some money I had laid out for the king. And I hope to have a good sum of money by me thereby in a few days, I think above eight hundred pounds. But when I come home at night, I could not find the way to open it. But, which is a strange thing, my little girl Susan could carry it alone from one table clear from the ground and set upon another, for neither I nor any one in my house but Jane the cookmaid could do it. 18th. Up into the office, and thence to the committee of the fishery at Whitehall, where so poor simple doings about the business of the lottery, that I was ashamed to see it, that a thing so low and base should have anything to do with so noble an undertaking. But I had the advantage this day to hear Mr. Williamson discourse, who come to be a contractor with others for the lotteries, and indeed I find he is a very logical man and a good speaker. But it was so pleasant to see my Lord Craven, the chairman, before many persons of worth and grave, use this comparison in saying that certainly these that would contract for all the lotteries would not suffer us to set up the Virginia lottery for plate before them. For, says he, if I occupy a wench first, you may occupy her again your heart out, you can never have her maidenhead after I have once had it, which he did more loosely, and yet as if he had fetched a most grave and worthy instance. They made mirth, but I and others were ashamed of it. Thence to the change, and thence home to dinner, and thence to the office a good while, and thence to the council chamber at Whitehall to speak with Sir G. Carteret, and here by accident heard a great and famous cause between Sir G. Lane and one Mr. Phil Hoare, an Irish business about Sir G. Lane's endeavouring to reverse a decree of the late commissioners of Ireland in a rebel's case for his land, which the king had given as forfeited to Sir G. Lane, for whom the solicitor did argue most angel-like, and one of the commissioners, Baron, did argue for the other and for himself and his brethren who had decreed it. But the solicitor do so pay the commissioners, how four all along did act for the papists, and three only for the protestants, by which they were overvoted. But at last one word, which was omitted in the solicitor's repeating of an act of parliament in the case, being insisted on by the other part, the solicitor was put to a great stop, and I could discern he could not tell what to say, but was quite out. Thence home, well pleased with this accident, and so home to my office, where late, and then to supper and to bed. This day I had a letter from Mr. Coventry that tells me that my Lord Brunkard is to be one of our commissioners, of which I am very glad, if any more must be. 19th. All the morning at the office, and without dinner down by galley up and down the river to visit the yards and ships now ordered forth, with great delight, and so home to supper, and then to office late to write letters, then home to bed. 20th. Lord's Day. Up and with my wife to church, wear Peg Pen very fine in her new coloured silk suit laced with silver lace. Dine at home, and Mr. Shepley lately come to town with me. A great deal of ordinary discourse with him. Among other things, praying him to speak to Stanks to look after our business. With him, and in private with Mr. Bottom, talking of our rope-yard stores at Woolwich, which are mighty low, even to admiration. They gone, in the evening comes Mr. Andrews and sings with us, and he gone, I to Sir W. Batten's, where Sir J. Minnes and he and I, to talk about our letter to my Lord Treasurer, where his folly and simple confidence so great in a report so ridiculous that he hath drawn up to present to my Lord, nothing of it being true, that I was ashamed, and did roundly and in many words for an hour together talk boldly to him, which pleased Sir W. Batten and my lady, but I was in the right, and was the willinger to do so before them, that they might see that I am somebody, and shall serve him so in his way another time. So home, vexed at this night's passage, for I had been very hot with him, so to supper and to bed, out of order with this night's vexation. 21st. Up and with them to the lords at Whitehall, where they do single me out to speak to and to hear, much to my content, and receive their commands, particularly in several businesses. Thence by their order to the Attorney General's about a new warrant for Captain Taylor, which I shall carry for him to be Commissioner in spite of Sir W. Batten. And yet, indeed, it is not I, but the ability of the man, that makes the Duke and Mr. Coventry stand by their choice. I to the change, and there stayed long doing business, and this day for certain news is come that Teddyman hath brought in eighteen or twenty Dutchmen, merchants, their Bordeaux fleet, and two men of war to Portsmouth. And I had letters this afternoon that three are brought into the Downs and Dover, so that the war is begun. God give a good end to it. After dinner, at home all the afternoon busy and at night with Sir W. Batten and Sir J. Minnes looking over the business of stating the accounts of the Navy charge to my Lord Treasurer, where Sir J. Minnes's paper served us in no stead almost, but was all false, and after I had done it with great pains, he being by, I am confident he understands not one word in it. At it till ten at night, almost, thence by coach to Sir Philip Warwick's, 
by his desire to have conferred with him, but he being in bed, I to Whitehall to the secretaries, and there wrote to Mr. Coventry, and so home by coach again. A fine clear moonshine night, but very cold. Home to my office a while, it being past twelve at night, and so to supper, and to bed. 22nd. At the office all the morning, Sir G. Carteret, upon a motion of Sir W. Batten's, did promise, if we would write a letter to him, to shew it to the King on our behalf, touching our desire of being commissioners of the prize office. I wrote a letter to my mind, and, after eating a bit at home, Mr. Shepley dining and taking his leave of me, abroad, and to Sir G. Carteret with the letter, and thence to my Lord Treasurer's, where with Sir Philip Warwick, long studying, all we could, to make the last year swell as high as we could. And it is much to see how he do study for the King, to do it to get all the money from the Parliament all he can, to help him to heads upon which to enlarge the report of the expense. He did observe to me how obedient this Parliament was for a while, and the last sitting how they begun to differ and to carpet the king's officers, and what they will do now, he says, is to make agreement for the money, for there is no guess to be made of it. He told me he was prepared to convince the Parliament that the subsidies are a most ridiculous tax, the four last not rising to forty thousand pounds, and unequal. He talks of a tax of assessment of seventy thousand pounds for five years, the people to be secured, that it shall continue no longer than those really a war, and the charges thereof to be paid. He told me that one year of the late Dutch war cost one million six hundred and twenty-three thousand pounds. Thence to my Lord Chancellor's, and there stayed long with Sir W. Batten and Sir J. Minnes, to speak with my Lord about our prize office business. But being sick and full of visitants, we could not speak with him, and so away home. Where Sir Richard Ford did meet us with letters from Holland this day, that it is likely the Dutch fleet will not come out this year. They have not victuals to keep them out, and it is likely they will be frozen before they can get back. Captain Cock is made steward for sick and wounded seamen. So home to supper, where trouble to hear my poor boy Tom has a fit of the stone, or some other pain like it. I must consult Mr. Holliard for him. So at one in the morning, home to bed. 23rd. Up into my office, where close all the morning about my Lord Treasurer's accounts, and at noon home to dinner, and then to the office all the afternoon, very busy, till very late at night, and then to supper and to bed. This evening Mr. Holliard came to me, and told me that he hath searched my boy, and he finds he hath a stone in his bladder, which grieves me to the heart, he being a good-natured and well-disposed boy, and more that it should be my misfortune to have him come to my house. Sir G. Carteret was here this afternoon, and strange to see how we plot to make the charge of this war to appear greater than it is, because of getting money. 24th. Up into the office, where all the morning busy answering of people. About noon, out with Commissioner Pett, and he and I to a coffee-house, to drink chocolate, very good, and so by coach to Westminster, being the first day of the Parliament's meeting. After the House had received the King's speech, and what more he had to say, delivered in writing, the Chancellor being sick, it rose, and I with Sir Philip Warwick home, and conferred our matters about the charge of the Navy, and have more to give him in the excessive charge of this year's expense. I dined with him, and Mr. Povey with us, and Sir Edmund Pooley, a fine gentleman, and Mr. Chichley, and fine discourse we had, and fine talk, being proud to see myself accepted in such company, and thought better than I am. After dinner, Sir Philip and I to talk again, and then away home to the office, where I sat late, beginning our sittings now in the afternoon, because of the Parliament, and they being rose, I to my office, where late till almost one o'clock, and then home to bed. 25th. Up and at my office all the morning, to prepare an account of the charge we have been put to extraordinary by the Dutch already and I have brought it to appear £852,700, but God knows this is only a scare to the Parliament to make them give them more money. Thence to the Parliament House, and there did give it to Sir Philip Warwick, the House being hot upon giving the King a supply of money, and I by coach to the change, and took up Mr. Jennings along with me, my old acquaintance, he telling me the mean manner that Sir Samuel Morland lives near him, in a house he hath bought and laid out money upon, in all to the value of £1,200, but is believed to be a beggar, and so I ever thought he would be. From the change with Mr. Deering and Llewellyn to the White Horse Tavern in Lombard Street, and there dined with them, he giving me a dish of meat to discourse in order to my serving Deering, which I am already obliged to do, and shall do it, and would be glad he were a man trusty that I might venture something along with him. Thence home, and by and by in the evening took my wife out by coach, leaving her at unthanks, while I to Whitehall and to Westminster Hall, where I have not been to talk a great while, and there hear that Mrs. Lane and her husband live a sad life together, and he is gone to be a paymaster to a company to Portsmouth to serve at sea. 
she big with child. Thence I home, calling my wife, and at Sir W. Batten's hear that the house have given the king two million five hundred thousand pounds to be paid for this war, only for the navy, in three years' time, which is a joyful thing to all the king's party, I see, but was much opposed by Mr. Vaughan and others, that it should be so much. So home, and to supper, and to bed. 26th. Up into the office, where busy all the morning. Home a while to dinner, and then to the office, where very late busy, till quite weary, but contented well with my dispatch of business, and so home to supper, and to bed. 27th. Lord's Day. To church in the morning, then dined at home, and to my office, and there all the afternoon setting right my business of flags, and after all my pains find reason not to be sorry, because I think it will bring me considerable profit. In the evening come Mr. Andrews and Hill. And we sung with my boy Ravenscroft's four-part psalms, most admirable music. Then, Andrews not staying, we to supper, and after supper fell into the rarest discourse with Mr. Hill about Rome and Italy, but most pleasant that I ever had in my life. At it very late, and then to bed. 28th. Up, and with Sir J. Minnes and W. Batten to Whitehall, but no committee of lords, which is like to do the king's business well. So to Westminster, and there to Jervis's, and was a little while with Jane, and so to London by coach, and to the coffee-house, where certain news of our peace made by Captain Allen with Argier, which is good news, and that the Dutch have sent part of their fleet round by Scotland, and resolved to pay off the rest half pay, promising the rest in the spring, hereby keeping their men. But how true this, I know not. Home to dinner, then come Dr. Clark to speak with me about sick and wounded men, wherein he is like to be concerned. After him Mr. Cutler, and much talk with him, and with him to Whitehall, to have waited on the Lords by order, but no meeting, neither to-night, which will spoil all. I think I shall get something by my discourse with Cutler. So home, and after being at my office an hour with Mr. Povey, talking about his business of Tangier, getting him some money allowed him for freight of ships, wherein I hope to get something too. He gone, home hungry, and almost sick for want of eating, and so to supper and to bed. Twenty-ninth. Up, and with Sir W. Batten to the Committee of Lords at the Council Chamber, where Sir G. Carteret told us what he had said to the King, and how the King inclines to our request of making us commissioners of the prize office. But meeting him anon in the gallery, he tells me that my Lord Barclay is angry we should not acquaint him with it. So I found out my Lord and pacified him. But I know not whether he was so in earnest or no, for he looked very frowardly. Thence to the Parliament House, and with Sir W. Batten home, and dined with him, my wife being gone to my lady sandwiches, and then to the office, where we sat all the afternoon, and I at my office till past twelve at night, and so home to bed. This day I hear that the king should say that the Dutch do begin to comply with him. Sir John Robinson told Sir W. Batten that he heard the king say so. I pray God it may be so. 30th. Up and with Sir W. Batten and Sir J. Minnes to the Committee of the Lords, and there did our business. But, Lord, what a sorry dispatch these great persons give to business! Thence to the change, and there hear the certainty and circumstances of the Dutch having called in their fleet, and paid their men half pay, the other to be paid them upon their being ready upon beat of drum to come to serve them again, and in the meantime to have half pay. This is said. Then home to dinner, and so to my office all the afternoon. In the evening my wife and Sir W. Warren with me to Whitehall, sending her with the coach to see her father and mother. He and I up to Sir G. Carteret, and first I alone and then both had discourse with him about things of the navy, and so I and he calling my wife at unthanks home again, and long together talking how to order things in a new contract for Norway goods, as well to the king's as to his advantage. He gone, I to my monthly accounts, and bless God, I find I have increased my last balance, though but little, but I hope ere long to get more. In the meantime, praise God for what I have, which is one thousand two hundred and nine pounds. So with my heart glad to see my accounts fall so right in this time of mixing of monies and confusion, I home to bed. End of November December of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, The Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664, by Samuel Pepys, December 1664. December 1st. Up betimes, sent to Whitehall to a committee of Tangier, and so straight home, and hard to my business at my office till noon, then to dinner, and so to my office, 
and by and by we sat all the afternoon, then to my office again till past one in the morning, and so home to supper and to bed. Second. Lay long in bed. Then up into the office, where busy all the morning. At home dined. After dinner with my wife and Mercer to the Duke's house, and there saw the rivals, which I had seen before, but the play not good, nor anything but the good actings of Betterton and his wife and Harris. Thence homeward, and the coach broke with us in Lincoln's Inn Fields, and so walked to Fleet Street, and there took coach and home, and to my office. Whither by and by comes Captain Cock, and then Sir W. Batten, and we all to Sir J. Minnes, and I did give them a barrel of oysters I had given to me, and so there sat and talked, where good discourse of the late troubles, they knowing things all of them very well, and Cock from the king's own mouth, being then entrusted himself much, do know particularly that the king's credulity to Cromwell's promises, private to him, against the advice of his friends, and the certain discovery of the practices and discourses of Cromwell in council, by Major Huntington, did take away his life and nothing else. Then to some loose atheistical discourse of Cox, when he was almost drunk, and then about eleven o'clock broke up, and I to my office to fit up an account for Povey, wherein I hope to get something. At it till almost two o'clock, then to supper and to bed. Third. Up and at the office all the morning, and at noon to Mr. Cutler's, and there dined with Sir W. Ryder and him, and then Sir W. Ryder and I by coach to Whitehall to a committee of the fishery, there only to hear Sir Edward Ford's proposal about farthings, wherein, oh, God, to see almost everybody interested for him, only my Lord Annesley, who is a grave, serious man. My Lord Barclay was there, but is the most hot, fiery man in discourse, without any cause, that ever I saw, even to breach of civility to my Lord Anglesey, in his discourse opposing to my Lord's. At last, though without much satisfaction to me, it was voted that it should be requested of the King, and that Sir Edward Ford's proposal is the best yet made. Thence by coach home, the Duke of York being expected to-night with great joy from Portsmouth, after his having been abroad at sea three or four days with the fleet, and the Dutch are all drawn into their harbours. But it seems like a victory, and a matter of some reputation to us it is, and blemish to them. But in no degree like what it is esteemed at, the weather requiring them to do so home and at my office late, and then to supper and to bed. Fourth, Lord's Day. Lay long in bed, and then up into my office, there to dispatch a business in order to the getting something out of the Tangier business, wherein I have an opportunity to get myself paid upon the score of freight. I hope a good sum. At noon home to dinner, and then in the afternoon to church. So home, and by and by comes Mr. Hill and Andrews, and sung together long and with great content. Then to supper and broke up pretty discourse, very pleasant and ingenious, and so to my office a little, and then home, after prayers, to bed. This day I hear the Duke of York is come to town, though expected last night, as I observed, but by what hindrance stopped, I can't tell. Fifth. Up into Whitehall with Sir J. Minnes, and there, among an infinite crowd of great persons, did kiss the Duke's hand, but had no time to discourse. Thence up and down the gallery, and got my Lord of Albemarle's hand to my bill for Povey, but afterwards was asked some scurvy questions by Povey about my demands, which troubled me, but will do no great hurt, I think. Thence vexed home, and there by appointment comes my cousin Roger Pepys and Mrs. Turner, and dined with me, and very merry we were. They stayed all the afternoon till night, and then after I had discoursed an hour with Sir W. Warren plainly declaring my resolution to desert him, if he goes on to join with Castle, who with his family I for great provocation love not, which he takes with some trouble, but will concur in everything with me, he says. Now I am loath, I confess, to lose him, he having been the best friend I have had ever in this office. So he being gone, we all, it being night, in Madame Turner's coach to her house, there to see, as she tells us, how fat Mrs. Thee is grown. And so I find her, but not as I expected, but mightily pleased I am to hear the mother commend her daughter Betty, that she is like to be a great beauty, and she sets much by her. Thence I to Whitehall, and there saw Mr. Coventry come to town, and with all my heart am glad to see him, but could have no talk with him, he being but just come. Thence back, and took up my wife, and home, where a while, and then home to supper, and to bed. Fifth. Up, and in Sir W. Batten's coach to Whitehall, but the Duke being gone forth, I to Westminster Hall, and there spent much time till towards noon, to and fro with people. So by and by Mrs. Lane comes, and plucks me by the cloak to speak to me, and I was fain to go to her shop, and pretending to buy some bands made her go home, and by and by followed her, and there did what I would with her, and so after many discourses, and her entreating me to do something for her husband, which I promised to do, and buying a little band of her, which I intend to keep to, I took leave, there coming a couple of footboys to her with a coach to fetch her abroad I know not to whom, 
She is great with child, and she says I must be godfather, but I do not intend it. Thence by coach to the old exchange, and there hear that the Dutch are fitting their ships out again, which puts us to new discourse, and to alter our thoughts of the Dutch as to their want of courage or force. Thence by appointment to the White Horse Tavern in Lombard Street, and there dined with my Lord Rutherford, Povey, Mr. Gordon, Creed, and others, and very merry, and after dinner, among other things, Povey and I withdrew, and I plainly told him that I was concerned in profit, but very justly, in this business of the bill that I have been these two or three days about, and he consents to it, and it shall be paid. He tells me how he believes, and in part knows, Creed to be worth ten thousand pounds, nay, that now and then he hath three or four thousand pounds in his hands, for which he gives the interest that the king gives, which is ten per cent, and that Creed do come and demand it every three months the interest to be paid him, which Povey looks upon as a cunning and mean trick of him, but for all that he will do, and is very rich. Thence to the office, where we sat, and where Mr. Coventry came the first time after his return from sea, which I was glad of. So after office to my office, and then home to supper, and to my office again, and then laid home to bed. 7th. Lay long, then up, and among others Bagwell's wife coming to speak with me, put new thoughts of folly into me which I am troubled at. Thence, after doing business at my office, I by coach to my lady Sandwiches, and there dined with her, and found all well and merry. Thence to Whitehall, and we waited on the Duke, who looks better than he did, methinks, before his voyage, and I think a little more stern than he used to do. Thence to the temple to my cousin Roger Pepys, thinking to have met the doctor to have discoursed our business, but he came not, so I home, and there by agreement came my Lord Rutherford, Povey, Gordon, Creed, Alderman Backwell, about Tangier business of accounts between Rutherford and Gordon. Here they were with me an hour or more, then after drinking away, and Povey and Creed stayed and eat with me. But I was sorry I had no better cheer for Povey, for the fool may be useful, and is a cunning fellow in his way, which is a strange one, and that, that I meet not in any other man, nor can describe in him. They late with me, and when gone, my boy and I to music, and then to bed. Eighth. Up into my office, where all the morning busy. At noon, dined at home, and then to the office, where we sat all the afternoon. In the evening comes my aunt and Uncle White, Mrs. Norbury, and her daughter, and after them Mr. Norbury, where no great pleasure, my aunt being out of humour in her fine clothes, and it raining hard. Besides, I was a little too bold with her about her doting on Dr. Venner. Anon they went away, and I till past twelve at night at my office, and then home to bed. Ninth. Up betimes and walked to Mr. Povey's, and there, not without some few troublesome questions of his, I got a note and went and received a hundred and seventeen pounds five shillings of Alderman Viner upon my pretended freight of the William for Tangier, which overbears me on one side with joy, and on the other to think of my condition if I shall be called into examination about it, and, though in strictness it is due, not be able to give a good account of it. Home with it, and there comes Captain Taylor to me, and he and I did set even the business of the ship Union, lately gone for Tangier, wherein I hope to get fifty pounds more, for all which the Lord be praised. At noon home to dinner, Mr. Hunt and his wife with us, and very pleasant. Then in the afternoon I carried them home by coach, and I to Westminster Hall, and then to Jervis's, and there find I cannot prevail with Jane to go forth with me. But though I took a good occasion of going to the trumpet, she declined coming, which vexed me. J'avais grand envie envers elle, avec vrai amour et passion. Then home, and to my office till one in the morning, setting to rights in writing this day's two accounts of Povey and Taylor, and then quietly to bed. This day I had several letters from several places, of our bringing in great numbers of Dutch ships. Tenth, lay long, at which I am ashamed, because of so many people observing it that know not how late I sit up, and for fear of Sir W. Batten speaking of it to others, he having stayed for me a good while. At the office all the morning, where comes my Lord Brunkard, with his patent in his hand, and delivered it to Sir J. Minnes and myself, we alone being there all the day. And at noon I in his coach with him to the change, where he set me down, a modest, civil person he seems to be, but wholly ignorant in the business of the navy as possible. But I hope to make a friend of him, being a worthy man. Then, after hearing the great news of so many Dutchmen being brought into Portsmouth and elsewhere, which it is expected will either put them upon present revenge or despair, I with Sir W. Ryder and Cutler to dinner all alone to the great James, where good discourse, and I hope, occasion of getting something hereafter. After dinner to Whitehall to the fishery, where the Duke was with us. So home, and late at my office, writing many letters, then home to supper and to bed. Yesterday come home, and this night I visited Sir W. Penn, 
who dissembles great respect and love to me, but I understand him very well. Major Holmes is come from Guinea and is now at Plymouth with great wealth, they say. 11th, Lord's Day. Up into church alone in the morning, dined at home mighty pleasantly. In the afternoon I to the French church were much pleased with the three sisters of the parson, very handsome, especially in their noses, and sing prettily. I heard a good sermon of the old man, touching duty to parents. Here were Sir Samuel Morland and his lady very fine, with two footmen in new liveries, the church taking much notice of them, and going into their coach after sermon with great gazing. So I home, and my cousin, Mary Pepys's husband, comes after me, and told me that out of the money he received some months since, he did receive eighteen pence too much, and did now come and give it me, which was very pretty. So home, and there found Mr. Andrews and his lady, a well-bred and a tolerable pretty woman, and by and by Mr. Hill, and to singing, and then to supper, then to sing again, and so good night. To prayers, and to night. It is a little strange how these psalms of Ravenscroft, after two or three times singing, prove but the same again, though good. No diversity appearing at all, almost. Twelfth. Up and with Sir W. Batten by coach to Whitehall, where all of us with the Duke. Mr. Coventry privately did tell me the reason of his advice against our pretenses to the prize office in his letter from Portsmouth, because he knew that the King and the Duke had resolved to put in some Parliament men that have deserved well, and that would needs be obliged, by putting them in. Thence homeward, called at my booksellers, and bespoke some books against the years out, and then to the change, and so home to dinner, and then to the office, where my Lord Brunkard comes and reads over part of our instructions in the Navy, and I expounded it to him, so he is become my disciple. He gone, comes Cutler, to tell us that the King of France hath forbid any canvas to be carried out of his kingdom, and I to examine, went with him to the East India House to see a letter, but came too late. So home again, and there late till twelve at night at my office, and then home to supper and to bed. This day, to see how things are ordered in the world, I had a command from the Earl of Sandwich at Portsmouth, not to be forward with Mr. Chumley and Sir J. Lawson about the mole at Tangier, because that what I do therein will, because of his friendship to me known, redound against him, as if I had done it upon his score. So I wrote to my lord my mistake, and am contented to promise never to pursue it more, which goes against my mind with all my heart. Thirteenth. Lay long in bed, then up, and many people to speak with me. Then to my office, and dined at noon at home, then to the office again, where we sat all the afternoon, and then home at night to a little supper, and so after my office again at twelve at night, home to bed. Fourteenth. Up. And after a while at the office, I abroad in several places, among others to my booksellers, and there spoke for several books against New Year's Day, I resolving to lay out about seven or eight pounds, God having given me some profit extraordinary of late, and bespoke also some plate, spoons, and forks. I pray God keep me from too great expenses, though these will still be pretty good money. Then to the change, and I home to dinner, where Creed and Mr. Caesar, my boy's lute master, who plays indeed mighty finely, and after dinner I abroad, parting from Creed, and away to and fro, laying out or preparing for laying out more money, but I hope and resolve not to exceed therein, and to-night spoke for some fruit for the country for my father against Christmas, and where shall I do it? But at the pretty woman's that used to stand at the door in Fenchurch Street, I having a mind to know her. So home, and late at my office, evening reckonings with Shergal, hoping to get money by the business, and so away home to supper and to bed, not being very well through my taking cold of late, and so troubled with some wind. Fifteenth. Called up very betimes by Mr. Chumley, and with him a good while about some of his Tangier accounts, and discoursing of the condition of Tangier, he did give me the whole account of the differences between Fitzgerald and Norwood, which were very high on both sides, but most imperious and base on Fitzgerald's, and yet through my lord Fitzharding's means, the Duke of York is led rather to blame Norwood, and to speak that he should be called home, than be sensible of the other. He is a creature of Fitzharding's, as a fellow that may be done with what he will, and himself certainly pretending to be general of the king's armies, when Monk dieth, desires to have as few great or wise men in employment as he can now, but such as he can put in and keep under, which he do this coxcomb Fitzgerald. It seems of all mankind there is no man so led by another as the duke is by Lord Muskerry, and this Fitzharding. Insomuch as when the king would have him to be privy purse, the duke wept and said, But, sir, I must have your promise. If you will have my dear Charles from me, 
that if ever you have occasion for an army again, I may have him with me, believing him to be the best commander of an army in the world. But Mr. Chumley thinks, as all other men I meet with do, that he is a very ordinary fellow. It is strange how the Duke also do love naturally and affect the Irish above the English. He, of the company he carried with him to sea, took above two-thirds Irish and French. He tells me the King do hate my Lord Chancellor, and that they, that is the King and my Lord Fitzharding, do laugh at him for a dull fellow, and in all this business of the Dutch war do nothing by his advice, hardly consulting him. Only he is a good minister in other respects, and the King cannot be without him. But above all, being the Duke's father-in-law, he is kept in. Otherwise Fitzharding were able to fling down two of him. This all the wise and grave lords see, and cannot help it, but yield to it. But he bemoans what the end of it may be, the king being ruled by these men, as he hath been all along since his coming, to the raising all the strongholds in Scotland, and giving liberty to the Irish in Ireland, whom Cromwell had settled all in one corner, who are now able, and it is feared every day a massacre again among them. He being gone, I abroad to the carriers to see some things sent away to my father against Christmas, and thence to Moorfields, and there up and down to several houses to drink to look for a place pour rencontrer la femme de je sais quoi against next Monday, but could meet none. So to the coffee-house, where a great talk of the comet seen in several places, and among our men at sea, and by my lord Sandwich, to whom I intend to write about it to-night. Thence home to dinner, and then to the office, where all the afternoon, and in the evening home to supper, and then to the office late, and so to bed. This night I begun to burn wax candles in my closet at the office, to try the charge, and to see whether the smoke offends like that of tallow candles. Sixteenth. Up and by water to Deptford, thinking to have met La Femme de Baguel, but failed, and having done some business at the yard, I back again, it being a fine fresh morning to walk. Back again, Mr. Waith walking with me to Halfway House, talking about Mr. Castle's fine knees lately delivered in, in which I am well informed that they are not as they should be to make them knees, and I hope shall make good use of it to the King's service. Thence home, and having dressed myself to the change, and thence home to dinner, and so abroad by coach with my wife, and bought a looking-glass by the old exchange, which cost me five pounds, five shillings, and sixpence, for the hooks. A very fair glass. So toward my cousin Scott's, but meeting my lady Sandwich's coach, my wife turned back to follow them, thinking they might, as they did, go to visit her, and I light, and to Mrs. Harmon, and there stayed and talked in her shop with her, and much pleased I am with her. We talked about Anthony Joyce's giving over trade, and that he intends to live in lodgings, which is a very mad, foolish thing. She tells me she hears and believes it is because he, being now begun to be called on officers, resolves not to take the new oath, he having formerly taken the covenant or engagement. But I think he do very simply, and will endeavour for his wife's sake to advise him therein. Thence to my cousin Scott's, and there met my cousin Roger Pepys, and Mrs. Turner, and Thee, and Joyce, and prated all the while, and so with the corps to church, and heard a very fine sermon of the parson of the parish, and so homeward with them in their coach, but finding it too late to go home with me, I took another coach, and so home, and after a while at my office, home to supper, and to bed. Seventeenth. Up into the office, where we sat all the morning, at noon I to the change, and there, among others, had my first meeting with Mr. Lestrange, who hath endeavoured several times to speak with me, it is to get now and then some news of me which I shall, as I see cause, give him. He is a man of fine conversation, I think, but I am sure most courtly and full of compliments. Then home to dinner, and then come the looking-glass man to set up the looking-glass I bought yesterday in my dining-room, and very handsome it is. So I brought by coach to Whitehall, and there to the committee of Tangier, and then the fishing. Mr. Povey did in discourse give me a rub about my late bill for money that I did get of him, which vexed me and stuck in my mind all this evening, though I know very well how to clear myself at the worst. So home into my office, where late, and then home to bed. Mighty talk there is of this comet that is seen a nights, and the king and queen did sit up last night to see it, and did, it seems. And to-night I thought to have done so too, but it is cloudy, and so no stars appear. But I will endeavour it. Mr. Gray did tell me to-night for certain that the Dutch, as high as they seem, do begin to buckle, and that one man in this kingdom did tell the king that he is offered forty thousand pounds to make a peace, and others have been offered money also. It seems the taking of their Bordeaux fleet thus arose from a printed gazette of the Dutch's boasting of fighting and having beaten the English, in confidence whereof, it coming to Bordeaux, all the fleet comes out, and so falls into our hands. 
18th, Lord's Day. To church, where, God forgive me, I spent most of my time in looking on my new morena at the other side of the church, an acquaintance of Peg Penn's. So home to dinner, and then to my chamber to read Ben Johnson's Catiline, a very excellent piece, and so to church again, and thence we met at the office to hire ships, being in great haste, and having sent for several masters of ships to come to us. Then home, and there Mr. Andrews and Hill come, and we sung finely, and by and by Mr. Fuller, the parson, and supped with me, he and a friend of his, but my music friends would not stay supper. At and after supper Mr. Fuller and I told many stories of apparitions and delusions thereby, and I out with my stories of Tom Mallard. He gone, I a little to my office, and then to prayers, and to bed. 19th. Going to bed betimes last night, we waked betimes, and from our people's being forced to take the key to go out to light a candle, I was very angry and begun to find fault with my wife for not commanding her servants as she ought. Thereupon, she giving me some cross answer, I did strike her over her left eye, such a blow as the poor wretch did cry out and was in great pain, but yet her spirit was such as to endeavour to bite and scratch me. But I, coying with her, made her leave crying, and sent for butter and parsley, and friends presently one with another, and I up, vexed at my heart to think what I had done, for she was forced to lay a poultice or something to her eye all day, and is black, and the people of the house observed it. But I was forced to rise, and up and with Sir J. Minnes to Whitehall, and there we waited on the Duke. And among other things, Mr. Coventry took occasion to vindicate himself before the Duke and us, being all there, about the choosing of Taylor for Harwich, upon which the Duke did clear him, and did tell us that he did expect that, after he had named a man, none of us shall then oppose or find fault with the man, but if we had anything to say, we ought to say it before he had chose him. Sir G. Carteret thought himself concerned, and endeavoured to clear himself, and by and by Sir W. Batten did speak, knowing himself guilty, and did confess that being pressed by the council, he did say what he did, that he was accounted a fanatic, but did not know that at that time he had been appointed by his royal highness, to which the duke replied that it was impossible, but he must know that he had appointed him, and so it did appear that the duke did mean all this while, Sir W. Batten. So by and by we parted, and Mr. Coventry did privately tell me that he did this day take this occasion to mention the business, to give the Duke an opportunity of speaking his mind to Sir W. Batten in this business, of which I was heartily glad. Thence home, and not finding Bagwell's wife as I expected, I to the change, and there walked up and down, and then home, and she being come, I bid her go and stay at Moorgate for me, and after going up to my wife, whose eye is very bad, but she is in very good temper to me, and after dinner I to the place, and walked round the fields again and again, but not finding her, I to the change, and there found her waiting for me, and took her away, and to an alehouse, and there I made much of her, and then away thence, and to another, and endeavoured to caress her, but elle ne voulait pas, which did vex me, but I think it was chiefly not having a good easy place to do it upon. So we broke up, and parted, and I to the office, where we sat hiring of ships an hour or two, and then to my office, and thence, with Captain Taylor, home to my house, to give him instructions and some notice of what to his great satisfaction had happened to-day, which I do, because I hope his coming into this office will a little cross Sir W. Batten, and may do me good. He gone, I to supper with my wife, very pleasant, and then a little to my office, and to bed. My mind, God forgive me, too much running upon what I can ferre avec la femme de Baguel demain, having promised to go to Deptford, and à aller à sa maison avec son mari, when I come thither. 20th. Up and walked to Deptford, where, after doing something at the yard, I walked, without being observed, with Bagwell home to his house, and there was very kindly used, and the poor people did get a dinner for me in their fashion, of which I also eat very well. After dinner I found occasion of sending him abroad, and then alone, avec elle, je tente à faire ce que je voudrais, et contre sa force, Je le faisais bien que passe à mon contentement. By and by, he coming back again, I took leave and walked home, and then there to dinner, where Dr. Fairbrother come to see me and Llewellyn. We dined, and I to the office, leaving them, where we sat all the afternoon, and I late at the office. To supper, and to the office again very late, then home to bed. 21st. Up, and after evening reckonings to this day with Mr. Bridges, the linen draper for calicoes, I out to Doctor's Commons, where by agreement my cousin Roger and I did meet my cousin Dr. Tom Pepys, and there a great many and some high words on both sides, but I must confess I was troubled. First, to find my cousin Roger such a simple but well-meaning man as he is. Next, to think that my father, out of folly and vainglory, should now and then, as by their words I gather, be speaking how he had set up his son Tom with his goods and house, and now these words are brought against him. 
I fear to the depriving him of all the profit the poor man intended to make of the lease of his house and sale of his own goods. I intend to make a quiet end if I can with the doctor, being a very foul-tongued fool, and of great inconvenience to be at difference with such a one that will make the base noise about it that he will. Thence very much vexed to find myself so much troubled about other men's matters, I to Mrs. Turner's in Salisbury Court, and with her a little, and carried her, the porter staying for me, our eagle, which she desired the other day, and we were glad to be rid of her, she fouling our house of office mightily. They are much pleased with her. And thence I home, and after dinner to the office, where Sir W. Ryder and Cutler come, and in dispute I very high with them against their demands. I hope to know her to myself, for I was very plain with them to the best of my reason. So they gone, I home to supper, then to the office again, and so home to bed. My Lord Sandwich this day writes me word that he hath seen at Portsmouth the comet, and says it is the most extraordinary thing that ever he saw. 22nd. Up and betimes to my office, and then out to several places, among others to Hoven, to have spoke with one Mr. Underwood about some English hemp. He lies against Gray's Inn. Thereabouts I to a barber's shop to have my hair cut, and there met with a copy of verses, mightily commended by some gentlemen there, of my Lord Mordaunt's, in excuse of his going to see this late expedition with the Duke of York. But, Lord, they are but sorry things. Only a Lord made them. Thence to the change, and there among the merchants I hear fully the news of our being beaten to dirt at Guinea, by De Reuter with his fleet. The particulars, as much as by Sir G. Carteret afterwards I heard. I have said in a letter to my Lord Sandwich this day at Portsmouth, it being most holy to the utter ruin of our royal company, and reproach and shame to the whole nation, as well as justification to them in their doing wrong to no man as to his private property, only taking whatever is found to belong to the company and nothing else. Dined at the Dolphin, Sir G. Carteret, Sir J. Minnes, Sir W. Batten and I, with Sir W. Borman and Sir Theophilus Biddulph and others, commissioners of the sewers, about our place below to lay masts in. But coming a little too soon, I out again and took boat down to Redriff, and just in time within two minutes, and saw the new vessel of Sir William Petty's launched, the King and Duke being there. It swims and looks finely, and I believe will do well. The name, I think, is Twilight, but I do not know certainly. Coming away back immediately to dinner, where a great deal of good discourse, and Sir G. Carteret's discourse of this guinea business, with great displeasure at the loss of our honour there, and do now confess that the trade brought all these troubles upon us, between the Dutch and us. Thence to the office, and there sat late, then I to my office, and there till twelve at night, and so home to bed, weary. 23rd. Up into my office, then come by appointment, cousin Tom tries to me, and I paid him the twenty pounds remaining due to him upon the bond of a hundred pounds given him by agreement November 1663, to end the difference between us about my aunt's, his mother's money. And here, being willing to know the worst, I told him, I hope now there's nothing remaining between you and I of future dispute. No, says he, nothing at all that I know of, but only a small matter of about twenty or thirty shillings. That my father Pepys received for me, of rent due to me in the country, which I will in a day or two bring you an account of. And so we parted. Dined at home upon a good turkey which Mr. Shepley sent us, then to the office all the afternoon, Mr. Cutler and others coming to me about business. I hear that the Dutch have prepared a fleet to go the back way to the Straits, where without doubt they will master our fleet. This put to that of Guinea makes me fear them mightily. And certainly they are most wise people and careful of their business, the King of France, they say, do declare himself obliged to defend them, and lays claim by his ambassador to the wines we have taken from the Dutch Bordeaux men, and more. It is doubted whether the Swede will be our friend or no. Pray God deliver us out of these troubles. This day Sir W. Batten sent, and afterward spoke to me, to have me and my wife come and dine with them on Monday next, which is a mighty condescension in them, and for some great reason, I am sure, or else it pleases God by my late care of business to make me more considerable even with them than I am sure they would willingly own me to be. God make me thankful and careful to preserve myself so, for I am sure they hate me, and it is hope or fear that makes them flatter me. It being a bright night, which it has not been a great while, I purpose to endeavour to be called in the morning to see the comet, though I fear we shall not see it, because it rises in the east but sixteen degrees, and then the houses will hinder us. 24th. Having sat up all night to pass two o'clock this morning, our porter, being appointed, comes and tells us that the bellman tells him that the star is seen upon Tower Hill. So I, that had been all night setting in order all my old papers in my chamber, did leave off all, and my boy and I to Tower Hill, it being a most fine, bright, moonshine night, 
and a great frost, but no comet to be seen. So after running once round the hill, I and Tom, we home and then to bed. Rose about nine o'clock and then to the office, where sitting all the morning. At noon to the change, to the coffee-house, and there heard Sir Richard Ford tell the whole story of our defeat at Guinea, wherein our men are guilty of the most horrid cowardice and perfidiousness, as he says and tells it, that ever Englishmen were. Captain Reynolds, that was the only commander of any of the king's ships there, was shot at by De Reuter, with a bloody flag flying. He, instead of opposing, which indeed had been to no purpose, but only to maintain honour, did poorly go on board himself, to ask what De Reuter would have, and so yielded, to whatever Reuter would desire. The king and duke are highly vexed at it, it seems, and the business deserves it. Then home to dinner, and then abroad to buy some things, and among others to my booksellers, and there saw several books I spoke for, which are finely bound, and good books to my great content. So home and to my office were late. This evening I being informed did look and saw the comet, which is now, whether worn away or no, I know not, but appears not with a tail, but only is larger and duller than any other star, and is come to rise betimes, and to make a great arch, and is gone quite to a new place in the heavens than it was before. But I hope in a clearer night something more will be seen. So home to bed. 25th. Lord's Day and Christmas Day. Up, my wife's eye being ill still of the blow I did in a passion give her on Monday last, to church alone, where Mr. Mills, a good sermon. To dinner at home, where very pleasant with my wife and family. After dinner, I to Sir W. Batten's, and there received so much good usage, as I have of late done, from him and my lady, obliging me and my wife, according to promise, to come and dine with them to-morrow with our neighbours, that I was in pain all the day and night too after, to know how to order the business of my wife's not going, and by discourse receive fresh instances of Sir J. Minnes' folly in complaining to Sir G. Carteret of Sir W. Batten and me for some family offences, such as my having of a stopcock to keep the water from them, which vexes me, but it would more but that Sir G. Carteret knows him very well. Thence to the French church, but coming too late, I returned, and to Mr. Rawlinson's church, where I heard a good sermon of one that I remember was at Paul's with me, his name Maggot. A very great store of fine women there is in this church, more than I know anywhere else about us. So home into my chamber, looking over and setting in order my papers and books, and so to supper, and then to prayers and to bed. 26th. Up, and with Sir W. Penn to Whitehall, and there with the rest did our usual business before the Duke, and then with Sir W. Batten back into his house, where I by sickness excuse my wife's coming to them to-day. Thence I to the coffee-house, where much good discourse, and all the opinion now is that the Dutch will avoid fighting with us at home, but do all the hurt they can to us abroad, which it may be they may for a while, but that, I think, cannot support them long. Thence to Sir W. Batten's, where Mr. Coventry and all our families here, women and all, and Sir R. Ford and his, and a great feast and good discourse and merry, there all the afternoon and evening till late, only stepped in to see my wife, then to my office to enter my day's work, and so home to bed, where my people and wife innocently at cards very merry, and I to bed, leaving them to their sport and blindman's buff. 27th. My people came to bed after their sporting at four o'clock in the morning, I up at seven, and to Deptford and Woolwich in a galley, the Duke calling to me out of the barge in which the King was with him going down the river, to know whither I was going. I told him to Woolwich, but was troubled afterward, I should say no further, being in a galley, lest he think me too profuse in my journeys. Did several businesses, and then back again by two o'clock to Sir J. Minnes, to dinner, by appointment, where all yesterday's company but Mr. Coventry, who could not come. Here Mary, and after an hour's chat, I down to the office, where busy late, and then home to supper and to bed. The comet appeared again to-night, but duskishly. I went to bed, leaving my wife and all her folks, and will also, too, come to make Christmas gambols to-night. 28th. I waked in the morning about six o'clock, and my wife not come to bed. I liked a pot, but there was none, and bitter cold, so was forced to rise and piss in the chimney, and to bed again. Slept a little longer, and then hear my people coming up, and so I rose, and my wife to bed at eight o'clock in the morning, which vexed me a little. But I believe there was no hurt in it all but only mirth. Therefore took no notice. I abroad with Sir W. Batten to the council chamber, where all of us to discourse about the way of measuring ships and the freight fit to give for them by the ton, where it was strange, methought, to hear so poor discourses among the lords themselves, and most of all to see how a little empty matter, delivered gravely by Sir W. Penn, was taken mighty well, though nothing in the earth to the purpose. But clothes, I perceive, more and more every day, is a great matter. Thence home with Sir W. Batten by coach, and I home to dinner, finding my wife still in bed. 
After dinner abroad, and among other things, visited my lady Sandwich, and was there with her and the young ladies, playing at cards till night. Then home and to my office late, then home to bed, leaving my wife and people up to more sports, but without any great satisfaction to myself therein. 29th. Up and to the office, where we sat all the morning. Then, whereas I should have gone and dined with Sir W. Penn and the rest of the officers at his house, I pretended to dine with my lady Sandwich, and so home, where I dined well, and began to wipe and clean my books in my chamber, in order to the settling of my papers and things there thoroughly, and then to the office, where all the afternoon sitting, and in the evening home to supper, and then to my work again. Thirtieth. Lay very long in bed with my wife, it being very cold, and my wife very full of a resolution to keep within doors, not so much as to go to church or see my lady Sandwich before Easter next, which I am willing enough to, though I seem the contrary. This and other talk kept me abed till almost ten o'clock. Then up, and made an end of looking over all my papers and books, and taking everything out of my chamber to have all made clean. At noon dined, and after dinner forth to several places to pay away money, to clear myself in all the world, and, among others, paid my bookseller six pounds for books I had from him this day, and the silversmith twenty-two pounds eighteen shillings for spoons, forks, and sugar-box, and being well pleased with seeing my business done to my mind as to my meeting with people, and having my books ready for me, I home and to my office, and there did business late, and then home to supper, prayers, and to bed. 31st. At the office all the morning, and after dinner there again, dispatch first my letters, and then to my accounts, not of the month, but of the whole year also, and was at it till past twelve at night, it being bitter cold. But yet I was well satisfied with my work, and above all, to find myself by the great blessing of God, worth one thousand three hundred and forty-nine pounds, by which, as I have spent very largely, so I have laid up above five hundred pounds this year above what I was worth this day twelvemonth. The Lord make me forever thankful to his holy name for it. Thence home to eat a little, and so to bed. Soon as ever the clock struck one, I kissed my wife in the kitchen by the fireside, wishing her a merry new year, observing that I believe I was the first proper wisher of it this year, for I did it as soon as ever the clock struck one. So ends the old year, I bless God, with great joy to me, not only for my having made so good a year of profit, as having spent four hundred and twenty pounds, and laid up five hundred and forty pounds, and upwards, but I bless God, I never have been in so good plight as to my health, in so very cold weather, as this is, nor indeed in any hot weather, these ten years, as I am at this day, and have been, these four or five months. But I am at a great loss to know whether it be my hair's foot, or taking every morning of a pill of turpentine, or my having left off the wearing of a gown. My family is my wife, in good health, and happy with her, her woman Mercer, a pretty, modest, quiet maid, her chambermaid, Bess, her cookmaid, Jane, the little girl, Susan, and my boy, which I have had about half a year, Tom Edwards, which I took from the King's Chapel, and a pretty and loving, quiet family I have as any man in England. My credit in the world and my office grows daily, and I am in good esteem with everybody, I think. My troubles of my uncle's estate pretty well over, but it comes to be but of little profit to us, my father being much supported by my purse. But great vexations remain upon my father and me for my brother Tom's death and ill condition, both to our disgrace and discontent, though no great reason for either. Public matters are all in a hurry about a Dutch war, our preparations great, our provocations against them great, and, after all our presumption, we are now afeard as much of them as we lately contemn them. Everything else in the state quiet, blessed be God. My Lord Sandwich at sea with the fleet at Portsmouth, sending some about to cruise for taking of ships, which we have done to a great number. This Christmas I judged it fit to look over all my papers and books, and to tear all that I found either boyish or not to be worth keeping, or fit to be seen, if it should please God to take me away suddenly. Among others I found these two or three notes, which I thought fit to keep. End of December End of the Diary of Samuel Pepys, 1664 By Samuel Pepys